Celtic Folklore, Welsh and Manx. By John Rees. Note on Transcription. This book was formatted using the text from sacred texts. In the original book the voiceless L was written with a special glyph, it has been consistently replaced with a double L. The voice TH, as in this, was written with the symbol D or, this has been transcribed as double D. All other letters have been transcribed identical to the original, except for circumflex W, which I write W caret herein, since there is no direct equivalent in the HTML character set. In one case there is an I with a subscript circumflex, this is transcribed as I, underlined. In the very rare instance where this system of transcription might produce an ambiguous reading, the consonant transcribed with two letters are italicized, for instance where the consonant combination D occurs, it is transcribed as, DDD. This should be close to the conventional modern Welsh orthography, however, note that there are plenty of archaic spellings, in Welsh, English and other languages, in this book. As usual, accuracy of transcription takes precedence over standard orthography. However, I have taken no steps to confirm any particular Welsh spelling. Welsh spelling can look daunting at first, however it is fairly easy to get accustomed to. CH is pronounced as in the German Bach, FF, and sometimes PH, is pronounced as English F, F is pronounced as English V, TH is always voiceless, as in thimble, not this. And W and Y, when not part of a diphthong, are vowels which are similar to the English OO, as in pool, and EE, as in free. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Volume 1 Preface Towards the close of the 70s I began to collect Welsh folklore. I did so partly because others had set the example elsewhere, and partly in order to see whether Wales could boast of any storytellers of the kind that delight the readers of Campbell's popular tales of the West Highlands. I soon found what I was not wholly unprepared for, that as a rule I could not get a single story of any length from the mouths of any of my fellow countrymen, but a considerable number of bits of stories. In some instances these were so scrappy that it took me years to discover how to fit them into their proper context, but, speaking generally, I may say, that, as the materials, such as they were, accumulated, my initial difficulties disappeared. I was, however, always a little afraid of refreshing my memory with the legends of other lands lest I should read into those of my own, ideas possibly foreign to them. While one is busy collecting, it is safest probably not to be too much engaged in comparison, when the work of collecting is done that of comparing may begin. But, after all I have not attempted to proceed very far in that direction, only just far enough to find elucidation here and there for the meaning of items of folklore brought under my notice. To have gone further would have involved me in excursions hopelessly beyond the limits of my undertaking, for comparative folklore has lately assumed such dimensions, that it seems best to leave it to those who make it their special study. It is a cause of genuine regret to me that I did not commence my inquiries earlier, when I had more opportunities of pursuing them, especially when I was a village schoolmaster in Anglesey and could have done the folklore of that island thoroughly. But my education, such as it was, had been of a nature to discourage all interest in anything that savoured of heathen lore and superstition. Nor is that all, for the schoolmasters of my early days took very little trouble to teach their pupils to keep their eyes open or take notice of what they heard around them. So I grew up without having acquired the habit of observing anything, except the Sabbath. It is to be hoped that the younger generation of schoolmasters trained under more auspicious circumstances, when the baleful influence of Robert Lowe has given way to a more enlightened system of public instruction, will do better. And succeed in fostering in their pupils habits of observation. At all events there is plenty of work still left to be done by careful observers and skillful inquirers. As will be seen from the geographical list showing approximately the provenance of the more important contributions to the Kimrick folklore in this collection, the counties will be found to figure very unequally. Thus the anglicizing districts have helped me very little, 
while the more Welsh county of Carnarvon easily takes the lead, but I am inclined to regard the anomalous features of that list as in a great measure due to accident. In other words, some neighborhoods have been luckier than others in having produced or attracted men who paid attention to local folklore. And if other counties were to be worked equally with Carnarvonshire, some of them would probably be found not much less rich in their yield. The anglicizing counties in particular are apt to be disregarded both from the Welsh and the English points of view, in folklore just as in some other things, and in this connection I cannot help mentioning the premature death of the Rev. Elias Owen as a loss which Welsh folklorists will not soon cease to regret. My information has been obtained partly viva voce, partly by letter. In the case of the stories written down for me in Welsh, I may mention that in some instances the language is far from good, but it has not been thought expedient to alter it in any way, beyond introducing some consistency into the spelling. In the case of the longest specimen of the written stories, Mr. J. C. Hugh's Curse of Pantanas, it is worthy of notice in passing, that the rendering of it into English was followed by a version in blank verse by Sir Lewis Morris, who published it in his Songs of Britain. With regard to the work generally, my original intention was to publish the materials, obtained in the way described, with such stories already in print as might be deemed necessary by way of setting for them. And to let any theories or deductions in which I might be disposed to indulge follow later. In this way the first six chapters and portions of some of the others appeared from time to time in the publications of the Honorable Society of Simradorian and in those of the Folklore Society. This would have allowed me to divide the present work into the two well-marked sections of materials and deductions. But, when the earlier part came to be edited, I found that I had a good deal of fresh material at my disposal, so that the chapters in question had in some instances to be considerably lengthened and in some others modified in other ways. Then as to the deductive half of the work, it may be mentioned that certain portions of the folklore, though ever apt to repeat themselves, were found when closely scrutinized to show serious lacunae, which had to be filled in the course of the reasoning suggested by the materials in hand. Thus the idea of the whole consisting of two distinctly defined sections had to be given up or else allowed to wait till I should find time to recast it. But I could no more look forward to any such time than to the eventual possibility of escaping minor inconsistencies by quietly stepping through the looking glass and beginning my work with the index instead of resting content to make it in the old-fashioned way at the end. There was, however, a third course, which is only mentioned to be rejected, and that was to abstain from all further publication, but what reader of books has ever known any of his authors to adopt that? To crown these indiscretions I have to confess that even when most of what I may call the raw material had been brought together, I had no clear idea what I was going to do with it. But I had a hazy notion, that, as in the case of an inveterate talker whose stream of words is only made the more boisterous by obstruction, once I sat down to write I should find reasons and arguments flowing in. It may seem as though I had been secretly conjuring with Virgil's words Beresked Quirit Yundo. Nothing so deliberate, the world in which I live swarms with busybodies dying to organize everybody and everything, and my instinctive opposition to all that order of tyranny makes me inclined to cherish a somewhat wild sort of free will. Still the cursory reader would be wrong to take for granted that there is no method in my madness, should he take the trouble to look for it, he would find that it has a certain unity of purpose, which has been worked out in the later chapters. But to spare him that trouble I venture to become my own expositor and to append the following summary. The materials crowded into the earlier chapters mark out the stories connected with the fairies, whether of the lakes or of the dry land. As the richest load to be exploited in the mine of Celtic folklore. That work is attempted in the later chapters. And the analysis of what may briefly be described as the fairy lore given in the earlier ones carries with it the means of forcing the conviction that the complex group of ideas identified with the little people is of more origins than one. In other words, that it is drawn partly from history and fact, and partly from the world of imagination and myth. The latter element proves on examination to be inseparably connected with certain ancient beliefs in divinities and demons associated, for instance, with lakes, rivers, and floods. Accordingly, this aspect of fairy lore has been dealt with in chapters 6 and 7, the former is devoted largely to the materials themselves. 
while the latter brings the argument to a conclusion as to the intimate connection of the fairies with the water world. Then comes the turn of the other kind of origin to be discussed, namely, that which postulates the historical existence of the fairies as a real race on which have been lavishly superinduced various impossible attributes. This opens up a considerable vista into the early ethnology of these islands, and it involves a variety of questions bearing on the fortunes here of other races. In the series which suggests itself the fairies come first as the oldest and lowest people, then comes that which I venture to call Pictish, possessed of a higher civilization and of warlike instincts. Next come the earlier Celts of the Goidelic branch, the traces, linguistic and other, of whose presence in Wales have demanded repeated notice. And last of all come the other Celts, the linguistic ancestors of the Welsh and all the other speakers of Brythonic. The development of these theses, as far as folklore supplies materials, occupies practically the remaining five chapters. Among the subsidiary questions raised may be instanced those of magic and the origin of Druidism. Not to mention a neglected aspect of the Arthurian legend, the intimate association of the Arthur of Welsh folklore and tradition with Snowdon, and Arthur's attitude towards the Goidelic population in his time. Lastly, I have the pleasant duty of thanking all those who have helped me, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Whether by reference to already printed materials or by assistance in any other way, the names of many of them will be found recorded in their proper places. As a rule my inquiries met with prompt replies, and I am not aware that any difficulties were purposely thrown in my way. Nevertheless I have had difficulties in abundance to encounter, such as the natural shyness of some of those whom I wish to examine on the subject of their recollections. And above all the unavoidable difficulty of cross-questioning those whose information reached me by post. For the precise value of any evidence bearing on Celtic folklore is almost impossible to ascertain, unless it can be made the subject of cross-examination. This arises from the fact that we Celts have a knack of thinking ourselves in complete accord with what we fancy to be in the inquirer's mind, so that we are quite capable of misleading him in perfect good faith. A most apposite instance, deserving of being placed on record, came under my notice many years ago. In the summer of 1868 I spent several months in Paris, where I met the historian Henri Martin more than once. On being introduced to him he reminded me that he had visited South Wales not long before, and that he had been delighted to find the peasantry there still believing in the transmigration of souls. I expressed my surprise, and remarked that he must be joking. Nothing of the kind, he assured me, as he had questioned them himself, the fact admitted of no doubt. I expressed further surprise, but as I perceived that he was proud of the result of his friendly encounters with my countrymen I never ventured to return to the subject, though I always wondered what in the world it could mean. A few years ago, however, I happened to converse with one of the most charming and accomplished of Welsh ladies, when she chanced to mention Henri Martin's advent, it turned out that he had visited Dr. Charles Williams, then the principal of Jesus College, and that Dr. Williams introduced him to his friends in South Wales. So M. Martin arrived among the hospitable friends of the lady talking to me, who had in fact to act as his interpreter, I never understood that he could talk much English or any Welsh. Now I have no doubt that M. Martin, with his fixed ideas about the Druids and their teaching, propounded palpably leading questions for the Welsh people whom he wished to examine. His fascinating interpreter put them into terse Welsh, and the whole thing was done. I could almost venture to write out the dialogue, which gave back to the great Frenchman his own exact notions from the lips of simple peasants in that subtle non-Aryan syntax. Which no Welsh barrister has ever been able to explain to the satisfaction of a bewildered English judge trying to administer justice among a people whom he cannot wholly comprehend. This will serve to illustrate one of the difficulties with which the collector of folklore in Wales has to cope. I have done my best to reduce the possible extent of the error to which it might give rise. And it is only fair to say that those whom I plagued with my questionings bore the tedium of it with patience, and that to them my thanks are due in a special degree. Neither they, however, nor I, could reasonably complain, if we found other folklorists examining other witnesses on points which had already occupied us. For in such matters one may say with confidence, that in the multitude of counsellors there is safety. John Rees
Jesus College, Oxford. Christmas, 1900. We are too hasty when we set down our ancestors in the gross for fools, for the monstrous inconsistencies, as they seem to us, involved in their creed of witchcraft. In the relations of this visible world we find them to have been as rational, and shrewd to detect an historic anomaly, as ourselves. But when once the invisible world was supposed to be opened, and the lawless agency of bad spirits assumed, what measures of probability, of decency, or fitness, or proportion of that which distinguishes the likely from the palpable absurd could they have to guide them in the rejection or admission of any particular testimony? That maidens pined away, wasting inwardly as their waxen images consumed before a fire that corn was lodged. And cattle lamed that whirlwinds up tore in diabolic revelry the oaks of the forest or that spits and kettles only danced a fearful innocent vagary about some rustic's kitchen when no wind was stirring were all equally probable where no law of agency was understood. There is no law to judge of the lawless, or canon by which a dream may be criticized. Charles Lamb's Essays of Elia a geographical list of authorities and sources of the more important contributions to the Welsh folklore. Anglesey. Aberfra, E. S. Roberts, after Hugh Francis, 240, 241. Landifrydog, E. S. Roberts, after Robert Roberts, 239, 240. Llynyrwythidian, No Particulars, 429. Minded Y C N W C, a writer in the Britain for 1859, 457, 458. Minded Mitchell, Morris Evans, from his grandmother, 203, 204. Towen Truran, John Roberts, 36 to 8. Lewis Morris, in the Gwiley did, 450 to 2. Breck Nockshire. C W M Taw, Road L. Davies. 256, 257. After J. Davies, 251 to 6. Langors, Geraldus, in his Itinerarium Cambri, 72. Walter Mapes, in his book De Nugis, 70 to 2. The Britain for 1863, 73, 74. LLYN CWM LLWCH NEGH Ivor James, 21. 430, 445. Ed. Davies, in his Mythology and Rites, 20, 21. Cardiganshire. Atpar, John Rees, from Joseph Powell, 648, 649. Bronant, D. L. Davies, 248, 249. Catabowan, J. Gwenegvern Evans, 603, 604. Lanwinog, 648. Llyn Idwen, J. E., Rogers of Abermurick, 578. Moden Howells, in his Cambrian Superstitions, 245. Sylvan Evans, in his Isin Sionade, 271 3. Ponterwid, John Rees, 294, 338, 378, 391, 392. Mary Lewis, Madrib Mari, 601, 602. SWIDD Finnan, DLL. Davies, 246, 247, 250. Cardiganshire, continued. Tregeron and Enia GHBURHOD, John Rees, from John Jones and others, 577 9. Trode YRAUR and Verwig, Benjamin Williams, Gwynionid, 166 to 8. Gwynionid, in the Britain for 1858 and 1860, 151 to 5, 158 to 60, 163, 164, 464 to 6. Istrad Murich, Isaac Davies, 245. A farmer, 601. A writer in the Britain for 1861, 690. Kamathinsha. Senarth, B. Davies, in the Britain, 1858, 161, 162. Landello, D. Lafer Thomas, in Y. Jeninen for 1896, 469. 
Mr. Stepney Gulston, in the Arch Cam. For 1893, 468. Landyby, John Fisher, 379, 380. Howells, in his Cambrian Superstitions, 381. John Fisher and J. P. Owen, 468. M. Y. A. D. D. F. A., William Rees of Taun, in the Physicians of Midvi, 2 to 15. The Bishop of St. Azaph, 15, 16. John Rees, 16. Joseph Joseph of Brecon, 16. Wirt Sykes, in his British Goblins, 17, 18. Minid Y. Banwin, Y. Wirch Reynolds, 18, 19, 428 to 30. I. Craig Fryn Hughes, 487. Carnarvonshire. Aber S.O.C.H., Margaret Edwards, 231. A Blacksmith in the Neighborhood, 232. Edward L.L.W.I.D., see the Brithen for 1860, 233, 234. M.S. 134 in the Peniarth Collection, 572, 573. Aberdaran, Mrs. Williams and another, 228. Evan Williams of Rose Herwin, 230. Bedgelert, William Jones, 49, 80, 81, 94 to 7, 99, 100 to 5. In the Brithen for 1861 to 2, 86 to 9, 98 to 9. The Brithen for 1861, 470, 473, 474. Bethesda, David Evan Davies, Dewey Glan Fridlas, 60 to 4, 66. Bet was Y. Coed, Edward LLWID, see the Cambrian Journal for 1859, 130 to 3. Crickyeth N. G. H. B. R. H. O. O. D., Edward Llewellyn, 219 to 21. Edward LLWID, see the Cam. Journal for 1859, 201, 202. Dinerwig, E. Lloyd Jones, 234 to 7. Dalban Main, W. Evans Jones, 107 to 9. Dalwithilan, C. B. D. D. G. L. E. R. T. C. Gwy Bernant. D. R. W. S. Y. Coed, S. R. Williams, from M. Williams and another, 38 to 40. 89, 90. Edern, John Williams, A Law Lane, 275 to 9. For Crosses, Lewis Jones, 222 to 5. Glass for Nutchaff, John Jones, Merton Fard, 367,368. Mr. and Mrs. William Zellis, 368 to 72. Glynlafon, William Thomas Solomon, 208 to 14. Guy Bernant, Ellis Pierce, Ellis O. R. Nant, 476 to 9. Lanel Helhern, R. Hughes of Uchlo R. Finnan, 214, 215, 217 to 9. Lanbaris, Mrs. Reese and her relatives, 31 to 6, 604. M. N. O. Reese, 229. A correspondent in the Liverpool Mercury, 366, 367. Howell Thomas, from G. B. Gaddy, 125 to 30. Pennant, in his Tours in Wales, 125. Landagai, H. Durfel Hughes, 52 to 60, 68. In his Antiquities, 471, 472. E. Owen, in the Powisland Club's Collections, 237, 238. Landrog, Hugh Evans and others, 207. Lanfaglin, T. E. Morris, from Mrs. Roberts, 362,363. Langibe, John Jones, Merton Fard, 366. Mrs. William Zellis, 366, 471. Laney Eston, Evan Williams, 228,229, 584. Lanelechid, Owen Davies, Eos Lechid, 41 to 6, 50 to 2. Neffin, Laurie Hughes and another woman, 226, 227. 
John Williams, A Law Lane, 228. A Writer in the Brithen for 1860, 164. Penmachno, Gethin Jones, 204-6. RHYDDDU, Mrs. Reese, 604. Trefry, Morris Hughes and J.D. McLaren, 198-201. Pierce Williams, 30. Tremadoc, Jane Williams, 221-222. R.I. Jones, from his mother and Ellis Owen, 105-7. Ellis Owen, cited by William Jones, 95. Wayne F.A.W.R., Owen Davies, 41. Glassonies, in Simru Fu, 91-3, 110-23. In the Brithen for 1863, 40, 41. A London Estethvod, 1887, competitor, 361, 362. John Jones, Merton Fard, 361, 362, 364 to 8. Owen Jones, quoted in the Brithen for 1861, 414, 415. Ispiti Ifen, a Liverpool Estethvad, 1900, competitor, 692. Denbyshire. Brian Gawise, E. S. Roberts, from Mrs. Davies, 241, 242. Egoiseg, E. S. Roberts, after Thomas Morris, 238. Finn and Eileen, Mrs. Sylvan Evans, 357. Isaac Fawkes, in his Enwogen Simru, 396. Dan B. continued. Finn and Eileen, Lewis, in his Topographical Dictionary, 395, 396. P. Roberts, in his Cam. Popular Antiquities, 396. A Writer in Wynoflid, 396. Langollen, Highwell, William Davies, 148. Penter Voelas, Elias Owen, in his Welsh Folklore, 222. Flintshire. Nil. Glamorganshire. Bridgend, J. H. Davies, D. Brynmore Jones, J. Rees, 354,355. Crimlin, Cadrod, in the South Wales Daily News, 405,406. Wirt Sykes, in his British Goblins, 191, 192, 405. Kenfig, Iolo Morganwg, in the Iolo MSS. 403, 404. David Davies, 402. Lanfabon, I. Craig Fryn Hughes, 257-268. Lanwino, Glanford, in his PLWIF Lanwino, 26. Merthyr Tidfill, Lywarch Reynolds, from his mother, 269. Quaker's Yard, I. Craig Fryn Hughes, 173-91. Rhonda Fession, Llewellyn Williams, 24-25. J. Probert Evans, 25, 27. L. L. Reynolds, from D. Evans and others, 27 to 9. Rhonda Valley, D. J. Jones, 356. Daffod Morganwg, in his Haynes Morganwg, 356. Waring, in his Recollections of Edward Williams, 458 to 61. Mirionethshire. Aberdovey, J. Pug, in the Arch Cam. For 1853, 142-6, 428. Mrs. Prosser Powell, 416. M. B., in the Monthly Packet for 1859, 416, 417. Ardedwy, Highwell, William Davies, 147, 148. Bala, David Jones of Trefry, C. Sifail Year Elwood, 376, 377. William Davies and Owen M. Edwards, 378. Humphreys LLYFR Gwybadith Jafredinol, 408-10. J. H. Roberts, in Edward Simru for 1897, 148-51. Dolgely, 
Lucy Griffith, From a Dolgely Man, 243-244. Landrillo, E. S. Roberts, From A. Evans and Mrs. Edwards, 138-41. Lanegren, Mr. Williams and Mr. Rollins, 243. A Lanegren Man, After William Pritchard, 242. Another Lanegren Man, 242, 243. LLNUWCHLOYN, Owen M. Edwards, 147. J. H. Roberts, in Edward Simru for 1897, 215 7, 457. Glassonese, in the Brithen for 1862, 137. In the Taliesin for 1859 60, 215, 216, 456, 457. Monmouthshire. Aberystruth, EDM. Jones, in his parish of Aberystruth, 195, 196. Landilo Cresceny, Elizabeth Williams, 192, 193. Lenovo Wynn. Williams and other gardeners there, 193, 194. Mrs. Gardener of Ty Uchaf Lenova, 194, 195. Professor Sace, 602. Riska, I. Craig Fryn Hughes, from Hearsay in the District between Lanfaban and Curlean, 462 4, 487, 593 6. Montgomeryshire. Lanadlos, Elias Owen, in his Welsh folklore, 275. Pembrokeshire. Fishguard, E. Perkins of Penisquorn, 172, 173. Ferrer Fenton, in the Pembroke County Guardian, 160. Landilo Wydarth, The Melchior Family, 398. Benjamin Gibby, 399, 400. Nevern, J. Thomas of Bancaw Bryn Berrien, 689. Trevine, Ancient Mariner, in the Pembroke County Guardian, 171. Farrer Fenton, in the Pembroke County Guardian, 171. Abnadal, in the Brithen for 1861, 165. Southey, in his Maddock, 170. Radnershire. Nil. List of Bibliographical References A. B. Gwillem, Bardoniath Daffod of Gwillem, edited by Sindel, Liverpool, 1873, 206, 233, 439, 444, 671. Adamnan, The Life of St. Columba, written by Adamnan, edited by William Reeves, Dublin, 1857, 545. Agrippa, H. Cornelius Agrippa de Occulta Philosophia, Paris, 1567, 213. Anurin, The Book of Anurin, C. Skeen, 226, 281, 543. Antiquary, The, a magazine devoted to the study of the past, published by Elliot Stock, London, 1880, 467. The Scottish, C. Stevenson. Archaeologia Cambrensis, The Journal of the Cambrian Archaeological Association, London, 1846, 73, 141 6, 233, 366, 403, 468, 528, 532, 533, 542, 566, 570, 579. Athenaeum, the, a journal of English and foreign literature, science, fine arts, music, and the drama, London, 1828, 335, 612. Atkinson, The Book of Balamote, a collection of pieces, prose and verse, in the Irish language, compiled about the beginning of the 15th century, published by the Royal Irish Academy, with introduction, analysis of contents. An index by Robert Atkinson, Dublin, 1887, 375. The Book of Leinster, sometimes called the Book of Glendala, a collection of pieces, prose and verse, in the Irish language, compiled, in part, about the middle of the 12th century, 
published by the Royal Irish Academy. With Introduction, Analysis of Contents, an Index by Robert Atkinson, Dublin, 1880, 381, 390, 392, 528, 531, 616, 618, 635, 657. Aubrey, Miscellanies Collected by John Aubrey, London, 1696, the last chapter is on second-sighted persons in Scotland, 273. Bastion, Zeitschrift für Ethnology, edited by A. Bastion and others, Berlin, 1869, 684. Bathurst, Roman Antiquities at Lydney Park, c. 445, 446. Barons, Zeitschrift für Französisch Sprach und Literator, edited by D. Barons, Appeln and Leipzig, 1879, 480. Bell, Early Ballads, edited by Robert Bell, London, 1877, 317. Bertrand, La Religion de Gaulle, Les Druides et le Druidism, by Alexander Bertrand, Paris, 1897, 552, 622, 623. Bible, The Holy Bible, Revised Version, Oxford, 1885, 583. The Manx Bible, printed for the British and Foreign Bible Society, London, 1819, 288, 297, 348. Boschet, La Vie du Père Malmoire, by Boschet, Paris, 1697, 386. Burke, The Bull Ineffabilis, in Four Languages, translated and edited by the Reverend Ulick J. Burke, Dublin, 1868, 606. Boyd Dawkins, Professor Boyd Dawkins' Address on the Place of a University in the History of Wales, Bangor, 1900, 388, 389. Bray, The Borders of the Tamar and the Tavi, Their Natural History, Manners, Customs, Superstitions, and C. In a Series of Letters to the Late Robert Southey, by Mrs. Bray, New Edition, London, 1879, 213. Biarrazi, La Legend de la Mort en Basse Bretagne, Croyances, Traditions et Usages de Bretons Armoricains, by A. Le Bras, Paris, 1892, 273. British Archaeological Association, The Journal of the, C. 674. British Association for the Advancement of Science, Report of the, John Murray, London, 1833, 103, 310, 346, 590. Brynmore Jones, The Welsh People, by John Rees and David Brynmore Jones, London, 1900, 421, 448, 454, 488, 548, 554, 613, 656, 661. Brithen, Y. C. Sylvan Evans. Cambrian, The Cambrian Biography, C. Owen. The Cambrian Journal, published under the auspices of the Cambrian Institute, the first volume appeared in 1854 in London, and eventually the publication was continued at Tenby by R. Mason, who went on with it till the year 18641, 81, 130, 201, 202, 480, 564. The Cambrian Newspaper, published at Swansea, 468. The Cambrian Popular Antiquities, C. Roberts. The Cambrian Quarterly Magazine, London, 1829-33, 202. The Cambrian Register, printed for E. and T. Williams, London, 1796-1818, 217. Campbell, Popular Tales of the West Highlands, with a translation, by J. F. Campbell, Edinburgh, 1860-2, 433, 434, 690. Caradoc, The Gwentian Chronicle of Caradoc of Lancarvan, 404. The History of Wales written originally in British by Caradoc of Lancarvan, Englished by Dr. Powell and augmented by W. Wynne, London, 1774, 476, 480. Carmarthen, The Black Book of Carmarthen, C. Skeen, 543. 
Carnarvon, Registrum Vulgariter Nuncupatum, The Record of Carnarvon, Ecod Ice Msto Descriptum, London, 1838, 701 201, 488, 567 9, 693. Carrington, Report of the Royal Commission on Land in Wales and Monmouthshire, Chairman, The Earl of Carrington, London, 1896, 488. Chambers, Popular Rhymes of Scotland, by Robert Chambers, Edinburgh, 1841, 1858, 585. Charency, H. De, in the Bulletin de la Société de Linguistique de Paris, 664. Chaucer, The Complete Works of Geoffrey Chaucer, edited from numerous manuscripts by the Reverend Professor Skeet, Oxford, 1894, 75. CHRTEN, Eric Und Enid von Christian von Trois, published by Wendell and Forster, Halley, 1890, 375, 672. Cicero, Over Completes de Ciceron, the Didot edition, Paris, 1875, 652. Clark, Limbus Patra Morganii et Glamorganii, being the genealogies of the older families of the lordships of Morgan and Glamorgan, by George T. Clark, London, 1886, 26. Claude, Tom Tit Tot, An Essay on Savage Philosophy and Folklore, by Edward Claude, London, 1886, 584, 598, 607, 627, 628, 630. Cochrane, The Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland, Robert Cochrane, Secretary, Hodges, Figgis and Company. Dublin, 546. Cockane, Leechdoms, Wirt Cunning and Starcraft of Early England, by the Rev. Oswald Cockane, Rolls Series, London, 1864 to 6, 293. Cormac, Cormac's Glossary, translated and annotated by John Donovan, edited with notes and indices by Whitley Stokes, Calcutta, 1868, 51, 310, 521, 629, 632. Cornet, Lucid, by P. Cornet, edited by J. Budd, London, 1889. 655. Koskin, Cant Populaires de Lorraine, by Emmanuel Cosquin, Paris, 1860, 520. Kothai, The Poetical Works of Louis Glyn Kothai, a Welsh bard who flourished in the reigns of Henry VI, Edward IV, Richard III, and Henry VII, edited for the Simmerdorian Society by the Rev. John Jones, Tejid, and the Rev. Walter Davies, Walter McCain, Oxford, 1837, 74, 134, 135, 201. Collanges, La Cite Antique, by N. D. Fustel de Collanges, Paris, 1864, 649, 650. Corson, Cartelaire de la Baie de Redon en Bretagne, published by M. Aurelien de Corson, Paris, 1863, 544. C.R.A. G.F.R.Y.N., Y. Firk O. Jeff Nidfa, by Isaac Craig Hughes, Cardiff, 1881, 173. Cregeen, A Dictionary of the Manx Language, by Archibald Cregeen, Douglas, 1835, 288. Coming, The Isle of Man, Its History, Physical, Ecclesiastical, Civil, and Legendary, by Joseph George Cumming, London, 1848, 34. Curry, The Battle of Maf Lena, Together with the Courtship of Mamera, with Translation and Notes, by Eugene Curry, Later Okery, Dublin, 1855, 393, see also Okery. Sindel, Simru Fu, A Selection of Welsh Histories, Traditions, and Tales, published by Hughes and Son, Wrexham, 1862, this was originally issued in parts, and it has never borne the editor's name. But it is understood to have been the late poet and antiquary, the Rev. Robert Ellis Sindel, 66, 91, 109, 123, 155, 1156, 481. Daliel, The Darker Superstitions of Scotland Illustrated Front History in Practice, by John Graham Daliel, Edinburgh, 1834, 273. 
Davies, The Mythology and Rites of the British Druids, by Edward Davies, London, 1809-20. Davies, Antiqui Lingum Britannicae et Lingui Latini Dictionarium Duplex, by Dyar. John Davies, London, 1632-13. Durful Hughes, Heine Fiathal Landegai a Landlicid, Antiquities of Landegai and Landlicid, by Hugh Durful Hughes, Bethesda, 1866, 52, 480. Dionysius, Dionysii Halicarnassensis Antiquitatum Romanorum qua Supersunt, the Didot edition, Paris, 1886, 650. Doomsday, facsimile of Doomsday Book, the Cheshire volume, including a part of Flintshire and Leicestershire, Southampton, 1861 to 5, 650. Devastin, John F. M. Devastin's poetical works appear to have been published in 1825, but I have not seen the book, 410 to 3. Doyle, Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, by A. Conan Doyle, London, 1893, 690. Drayton, The Batale of Agincourt, by Michael Drayton, London, 1627, 164. Dugdale, Monasticon Anglicanum, A History of the Abbeys and Other Monasteries in England and Wales, by Sir William Dugdale, Volume 5, London, 1825, 443, 469, 479. Edwards, Simru, a monthly magazine edited by Owen M. Edwards, Welsh National Press, Carnarvon, 148. Elfied, Sifail Year Elwood A. R. Frythones, edited by Elfied, the Reverend H. Elvet Lewis, and Cadrod, Mr. T. C. Evans, and published by Williams and Son, Hlanehli, 23, 376, 418. Elton, Origins of English History, by Charles Elton, London, 1882, 615. Elworthy, The Evil Eye, An Account of This Ancient and Widespread Superstition, by Frederick Thomas Elworthy, London, 1895, 346. Evans, The Beauties of England and Wales, published in London in 1801-15, and comprising two volumes, 17 and 18, devoted to Wales, the former of which, by the Rev. J. Evans, published in London in 1812, Treats of North Wales, 563. Folklore, Transactions of the Folklore Society, published by David Nutt, 270 Strand, London, 273, 338, 341, 344, 346, 356, 358 to 60, 584, 585, 593, 608. Falks, Dear Life of Biography at all Owen Wojan Simru, published and printed by Isaac Falks, Liverpool, 1870, 396. Fook, Undine, Ein Erzelung von Friedrich Baron de la Motte Fook, 11th edition, Berlin, 1859, 1, 2, 27, 437, 661. Fraser, The Golden Bow, A Study in Comparative Religion, by Dr. J. G. Fraser, London, 1890, 638, 662. The Origin of Totemism, in the Fortnightly Review for April, 1899, 662, 663. Froissart, Over de Froissart, Chroniques, edited by Curvin de Lettenhove, Brussels, 1870-7, 489. Chroniques de J. de Froissart, published for the Société de l'Histoire de France, by Simeon Luce, Paris, 1869, 489-91. Lord Berner's Translation, in Black Letter, published in London in 1525, and Thomas John's, in 1805-6, 490. Gaidas, Revue Celtique, Fondi Parham, Henri Gaidas, 1870-85, since then it has been edited by H. Darbois de Jubinville, and it is now published by Bouillon in Paris, 67 Rue de Richelieu, 60, 374, 375, 387, 389, 390, 427, 432, 435, 480, 519, 
546, 573, 580, 581, 603, 618, 619, 629,631, 649. Jeffrey, Gottfried's von Monmouth Historia Regum Britanniae und die Brut Tessilio, published by San Marte, Halley, 1854, for 280, 281, 374, 406, 448, 503, 507, 547, 562, 611. Gilbert, Liebhar na H. Wiedry, a collection of pieces in prose and verse in the Irish language, compiled and transcribed about d. 1100 by Moel Muri Mac Silichar, published by the Royal Irish Academy, and printed from a lithograph of the original by Olongan and Aluni, preface signed by J. T. Gilbert, Dublin, 1870, 381, 387, 414, 424, 435, 498, 537, 547, 611, 613, 618, 620, 624, 654, 657, 661. Gillen, The Native Tribes of Central Australia, by Baldwin Spencer and F. J. Gillen, London, 1899, 662, 663. Geraldus, Geraldi Cambrensis Itinerarium Cambrii et Descriptio Cambrii, edited by James F. Dimmock, Roll Series, London, 1868, 72, 90, 269 to 71, 303, 389, 414, 441, 507, 509, 660. Glanford, PLWIF Lanwino, Year Hen Amser, Year Hen Babel, A. R. Hen Droyan, by Glanford, the Reverend W. Glanford Thomas, Pontypridd, 1888, 26. Gottingen, Gottingisch Gelerd and Zeigen, Unter der Aufsicht der Konigel. Gesellschaft der Wissenschaften, Gottingen, 1890, 544. Gregor, Notes on the Folklore of the Northeast of Scotland, by the Reverend Walter Gregor, published for the Folklore Society, London, 1881, 103. Griffin, The Poetical and Dramatic Works of Gerald Griffin, Dublin, 1857, 205, 418. Gruber, Grundriss der Romanischen Philology, Unter Mitwerking von 25 Fachgenossen, edited by Gustav Grober, Strasbourg, 1886, 563. Zeitschrift für Romanische Philology, edited by Gustav Grober, Halley, 1877, 563. Grutter, Iani Grutteri Corpus Inscriptionum, Part 2 of Volume 1, Amsterdam, 1707, 580. Guest, the Mabinogen, from the LLYFR Cock O Hergest and other ancient Welsh manuscripts, with an English translation and notes by Lady Charlotte Guest, London, 1849, 69, 123, 196, 386, 442, 502, 507, 509, 538, 553, 560, 613, 620, 629, 645 to 7, 649, 672. Gwenigvrin, facsimile of the Black Book of Carmarthen, reproduced by the autotype mechanical process, with a paleographical note by J. Gwenigvrin Evans, Oxford, 1888, 216, 217, 383, 384, 413, 432, 478, 513, 527, 543, 545, 563, 565, 619, 621. Report on Manuscripts in the Welsh Language, published by the Historical Mises Commission, Volume 1, London, 1898 to 9, 280, 330, 487, 573. The text of the Brutes from the Red Book of Her Jest, edited by John Rees and J. Gwenigvren Evans, Oxford, 
1890, 163, 201, 442, 506, 512, 562. The text of the Vimabinogen and other Welsh tales from the Red Book of Her Jest, edited by John Rees and J. Gwenedvrin Evans, Oxford, 1887, 69, 142, 196, 207, 208, 217, 218, 225, 226, 233, 264, 280, 287, 315, 386, 388, 425, 430, 439, 440, 442, 498, 500, 502, 506, 507, 509 to 16, 519 to 27, 529 to 34, 536, 537, 543, 546 to 8, 550, 551, 553, 560, 561, 565, 580, 608 to 10, 613, 619, 620, 622, 628 to 30, 636, 637, 644, 645, 647, 649, 657, 672. The text of the Book of Land DAV, reproduced from the Gwysony Manuscript by J. G. Evans, with the cooperation of John Rees, Oxford, 1893, this is also known as the Liber Landavensis, 163, 398, 476, 478, 528, 531, 568, 691. Hancock, Sentius Moore, Volume 1, prefaced by W. Nielsen Hancock, Dublin, 1805, 617. Hardy, Descriptive Catalogue of Materials Relating to the History of Great Britain and Ireland, by Thos Duffus Hardy, Volume 1, London, 1862, 476. Hartland, The Legend of Perseus, A Study of Tradition in Story, Custom, and Belief, by Edwin Sidney Hartland, London, 1894-6, 6, 662. Hartland, The Science of Fairy Tales, An Inquiry into Fairy Mythology, by Edwin Sidney Hartland, London, 1891, 18, 268, 583. Henderson, Fled Brykrand, edited with translation, introduction, and notes, by George Henderson, London, 1899, 501. Henderson, Notes on the Folklore of the Northern Counties of England and the Borders, by William Henderson, London, 1879, 340, 346. Herbert, Herbordi Vita Atonis E. P. Bambergensis, in Volume. 14 of Pert's Monumenta Germani Historica Scriptorum, Equal Script. Volume 12, edited by G. H. Pertz, Hanover, 1826 85, 553. Hergist, The Red Book of Hergest, C. Guest, Gwenigvrin, Skeen. Haywood, The Dramatic Works of Thomas Haywood, London, 1874. 694. Higdon, Polychronic and Renolfi Higdon Monici Sestrensis, together with the English translations of John Trevisa and an unknown writer of the 15th century, edited by C. H. Babington, Rolls Series, London, 1865-86, 330, 331. Holder, Altseltischer Spratschatz, by Alfred Holder, Leipzig, 1896, 533, 622, 659. Howells, Cambrian Superstitions, Comprising Ghosts, Omens, Witchcraft, and Traditions, by W. Howells, Tipton, 1831, 74, 155, 160, 173, 204, 245, 268, 331, 424, 453. 469, 576-9. Hbner, Das Heiligtum de Nodon, C 446. 
Inscriptions Britanniae Latini, edited by Emilius Hubner and published by the Berlin Academy, Berlin, 1873, 535. Humphreys, Gallad Year OES, a Welsh magazine published by H. Humphreys, Volume 1, Carnarvon, 1863, 493. LLYFR Gwybadith Jafredinol, a collection of Humphreys Penny series, Carnarvon, no date, 408. IOLO, IOLO Manuscripts, a selection of ancient Welsh manuscripts in prose and verse from the collection made by Edward Williams, IOLO Morganwg, with English translations and notes by his son, Taliesin Williams of IOLO. And published for the Welsh MSS. Society, Landovery, 1848, 564, 565, 569, 619. IOLO GOCH, Gwythio Iolo Gotch Gaida no Diada Hainsidol a Berniadol, by Charles Ashton, published for the Simradorian Society, Oswestry, 1896, 281, 367. Jacobs, Celtic Fairy Tales, selected and edited by Joseph Jacobs, London, 1892, 567. Jameson, an etymological dictionary of the Scottish language, by John Jameson, New Edition, Paisley, 1881-2, 591. Jameson, Popular Ballads and Songs, by Robert Jameson, Edinburgh, 1806, 592. Jenkins, Bed Jellert, Its Facts, Fairies, and Folklore, by D. E. Jenkins, Portmadoc, 1899, 450, 453, 469, 533, 567. John Stone, Antiquitate Celta Normanicae, Containing the Chronicle of Man in the Isles, abridged by Camden, edited by James John Stone, Copenhagen, 1786, 334. Jones, C. P. 195 for Edmund Jones' account of the parish of Aberystruth, Treveca, 1779, 195, 196. See page 195 as to his spirits in the county of Monmouth, Newport, 1813, 195, 217, 350. Jones, The Elucidarium and Other Tracts in Welsh from LLYVYR Agger Landa D. 1346, Jesus College MS 119, edited by J. Morris Jones and John Rees, Oxford, 1894, 529, 693. Jones, The Myverian Archaeology of Wales, Collected Out of Ancient Manuscripts, by Owen Jones, MYVYR, Edward Williams, and William Owen, London, 1801, reprinted in one volume by Thomas G. Denby, 1870, 441, 469, 529, 560, 610, 619. Jones, A History of the County of Brecknock, by the Rev. Theophilus Jones, Brecknock, 1805, 1809, 516-8. Joyce, Old Celtic Romances, translated from the Gaelic by P. W. Joyce, London, 1879, 94, 376, 381, 437, 662. Jubinville, Le Cycle Mythologique Hollande et la Mythologie Celtique, by H. Darbois de Jubinville, Paris, 1884, 616, 617, 620. Essay d'un catalogue de la littérature épique de l'Irlande, by H. Darbois de Jubinville, Paris, 1883, 549, 616, 617, 620. Calusa, Le Beaux Desconis, edited by Max Calusa, Leipzig, 1890, 562. Keating, Forest Fisa Air Aaron, Keating's History of Ireland, Book A, Part 1, edited, with a literal translation, by P. W. Joyce, Dublin, 1880, 375. Kelly, Facklier Mananac as Barlack, a Manx English Dictionary by John Kelly, edited by William Gill, and printed for the Manx Society, Douglas, 1866, Y6, 349. Kermode, Y.N. Lyre Mananac, 
The Journal of the Isle of Man Natural History in Antiquarian Society, edited by P. M. C. Commode, Douglas, 1889, 284, 24, 311, 334, 434. Kuhn, Beitrage zur Verglichenden Sprachforschung auf dem GBE der Erischen, Celtischen und Slawischen Sprachen, edited by Kuhn and others, Berlin, 1858-76, 629. Zeitschrift für Vergleichen Sprachforschung auf dem GBE der Indogermanischen Sprachen, edited by Kuhn and others, Berlin, 1854, 625. Lampeter, The Magazine of St. David's College, Lampeter. 156. LEM, Canudi Limii de la Ponibus Finmarchiae Commentatio, Copenhagen, 1767, 658, 663. Ledger, Cyril E.T. Method, Etude Historique sur la Conversion de Slaves and Christianism, by Louis Ledger, Paris, 1868, 553. Lewis, A Topographical Dictionary of Wales, by Samuel Lewis, 3rd edition, London, 1844, 395, 397, 470. Leiden, The Poetical Works of John Leiden, Edinburgh, 1875, 466. LHUID, Commentarioli Britannicae Descriptionis Fragmentum, by Humphrey Lloyd, Cologne, 1572, 412. Lindsay, the Latin Language, An Historical Account of Latin Sounds, Stems, and Flexions, by Wallace Martin Lindsay, Oxford, 1894, 629. L.O. Teach, Les Mots Latins dans les Longs Britanniques, by J. Loth, Paris, 1892, 383. Lays Y. Lad, a newspaper published at Bangor, N., Wales, 234. Mabinogen, C. Guest and G. W. N. O. G. V. R. Y. N. McBain, The Celtic Magazine, edited by Alexander McBain, Inverness, 1866, 520. Malmesbury, The Gestus Pontificum Anglorum Libri Quinqua, edited by N. E. S. A. Hamilton, Rolls Series, London, 1870, 547. Mallory, Le Mort d'Arthur, by Sir Thomas Mallory, the original Caxton edition reprinted and edited with an introduction and glossary by H. Oscar Sommer, Nutt, London, 1889, 476,562. Sir Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, with a preface by John Rees, published by J. M. Danton Company, London, 1893, 543, 565. Mapes, Gualtieri Mapes de Nugis Curialium Distinctions Quinqua, Edited by Thomas Wright and printed for the Camden Society, 1850, at the last moment a glance at the original Bodley MS. 851 forced me to deviate somewhat from Wright's reading owing to its inaccuracy, 72, 496. Marquardt, Das Privatalben der Romer, by J. Marquardt, Leipzig, 1886, 650. Martin, A Description of the Western Islands of Scotland, by M. Martin, London, 1703, 615, 691, 692. Maspero, C. 682. Maximus, Valerie Maximi Factorum Dictorunc Memorabilium Libri Novum ad Tiberium Caesarum Augustum, the Didot edition, Paris, 1871, 623. Mela, Pomponiae Meli de Choreographia Libri Trace, ed. Gustavus Parve, Berlin, 1867, 331, 550. Meyer, Festschrift Whitley Stokes, dedicated by Kuno Meyer and others, Leipzig, 1900, 645. The Vision of Mackenglin, edited with a translation by Kuno Meyer, London, 1892, 393, 501. Meyer, Zeitschrift für Keltische Philology, Edited by Kuno Meyer and L. C. Stern, Halley, 1897, 500. Meyer, Romania, Recule Trimestrial Consacre à l'étude de longues et de littératures romaines, edited by Paul Meyer and Gaston Paris, Vol. 28, Paris, 1899, 690, 693, 
694. Merrick, The History and Antiquities of the County of Cardigan, by Samuel Rush Merrick, London, 1808, 579. Milton, English Poems, by John Milton, 2W. Mind, A Quarterly Review of Psychology and Philosophy, edited by G. F. Stout, London, 1876, 633. Monson, Heurtology, Antiquarisch Untersuchungen über die Stadtischen Fest der Athener, by August Monson, Leipzig, 1864, 310. Monthly Packet, the, now edited by C. R. Coleridge and Arthur Innes, London, 1851, 416, 417. Moore, The Folklore of the Isle of Man, by A. W. Moore, London, 1891, 284. The Surnames and Place Names of the Isle of Man, by A. W. Moore, London, 1890, 311, 332, 334. Morgan, An Antiquarian Survey of East Gower, Glamorganshire, by W. L. L. Morgan, London, 1899, 404. Morganwalk, Haynes Morganwalk, by Daffod Morganwalk, D. W. Jones, P. G. S. Aberdare, 1874, an octavo volume issued to subscribers, and so scarce now that I had to borrow a copy, 356. Morris, Celtic Remains, by Lewis Morris, edited by Sylvan Evans and printed for the Cambrian Archaeological Association, London, 1878, 148, 413, 564, 566, 694. Murden, Profidolieth Murden Willie, c. 485. Nennius, Nennius und Gildas, edited by San Marte, Berlin, 1844, 281, 406, 407, 537 to 9, 570. New English Dictionary, edited by Dr. James H. Murray and Henry Bradley, London and Oxford, 1884, 317. Nicholson, Galsby, Contributions to its Folklore, collected and edited by Edward W. B. Nicholson, London, 1897, 317. Nicholson, The Poetical Works of William Nicholson, 3rd edition, Castle Douglas, 1878, 325. Notes and Queries, Bream's Buildings, Chancery Lane, E.C., 563. Choice Notes from Notes and Queries, Consisting of Folklore, London, 1859, 140, 213, 217, 325, 418, 453, 454, 494, 596, 601, 611, 612. Nut, The Voyage of Brand Son of Feeble to the Land of the Living, by Kuno Meyer and Alfred Nutt, London, 1895-1897, 618, 620, 622, 657, 662. Studies on the Legend of the Holy Grail, by Alfred Nutt, London, 1888, 287, 438, 548. Oakery, On the Manners and Customs of the Ancient Irish, a series of lectures delivered by the late Eugene Oakery, London, 1873, 375, 392, 617, 632, see also Curry. A Donovan, Annals of the Kingdom of Ireland by the Four Masters, from the earliest period to the year 1616, edited by John O'Donovan, 2nd edition, Dublin, 1856, 414, 426-8, 433, 546, 569. O'Grady, Silva Gadelica, a collection of tales in Irish, with extracts illustrating persons and places, edited from manuscripts and translated by Drive S. H. O'Grady, London, 1892, 381, 437. O'Reilly, an Irish-English dictionary, by Edward O'Reilly, with a supplement by John O'Donovan, Dublin, 1864, 142. Oliver, Monumenta de Insula Manii, being Volume 4 of the Publications of the Manx Society, by J. R. Oliver, 
Douglas, 1860, 314, 334. Owen, Ancient Laws and Institutes of Wales, edited by Anurin Owen for the Public Records Commission, London, 1841, for 21. Owen, Welsh Folklore, a collection of the folk tales and legends of North Wales, being the prize essay of the National Esteathwad in 1887, by the Reverend Elias Owen, Oswestry in Wrexham, 1806, 222, 275, 690. Owen, the Poetical Works of the Rev. Goran Wee Owen, with his Life and Correspondence, edited by the Reverend Robert Jones, London, 1876, 84. Owen, The Description of Pembrokeshire, by George Owen of Henleys, edited with notes and an appendix by Henry Owen, London, 1892, 506, 513, 515. Owen, The Cambrian Biography, or Historical Notices of Celebrated Men Among the Ancient Britons, by William Owen, London, 1803, 169, 170. Paris, Merlin, Roman and Prose du XIIe siècle, edited by Gaston Paris and Jacob Ulrich, Paris, 1886, 563. Parthi, Itinerarium Antonini Augusti ed Hierosolimitanum ex Libris Manuscripts, edited by G. Parve and M. Pinder, Berlin, 1848, 54. Pembroke County Guardian, the a newspaper owned and edited by H. W. Williams and published at Solva, 160, 171, 172. Pennant, A Tour in Scotland, by Thomas Pennant, Warrington, 1774, 310. Tour in Scotland and a Voyage to the Hebrides, MDCCLXXI, by Thomas Pennant, Chester, 1774, 692. Tours in Wales, by Thomas Pennant, edited by J. Rees, Carnarvon, 1883, 125, 130, 532. Fillimore, Annals Cambry, and Old Welsh Genealogies from Harleian MS 3859, edited by Edgerton Fillimore, in volume. 9 of the Simrador, 408, 476, 480, 551, 570. Phillips, The Book of Common Prayer in Manx Gaelic, being translations made by Bishop Phillips in 1610 and by the Manx clergy in 1765, edited by A. W. Moore, assisted by John Rees, and printed for the Manx Society, Douglas, 1893, 1894, 320. Plautus, T. Machi Plauti Asinaria, from the text of Getz and Scholl, by J. H. Gray, Cambridge, 1894, 535. Plutarch, The Defectu Oraculorum, The Die.ed. Paris, 1870, 331, 456, 493, 494. Powysland, Collections, Historical and Archaeological, Relating to Montgomeryshire and Its Borders, issued by the Powysland Club, London, 1868, 237. Preller, Griechisch Mythology, Vaughan L. Preller, Beert Offlage von Karl Robert, Berlin, 1887, 310. Price, Haines Simru a Chenital y Kimri or Sinoisod Hyde at Farwalu F. Luelin A. P. Gruffied, by the Rev. Thomas Price, Carnoanock, Crickhowell, 1842, 490. Ptolemy, Claudii Plaulame Geographia, e Cotisibus Recognovit Carolus Mullerus, Volume 1, Paris, 1883. 385, 387, 388, 445, 581. Pug, The Physicians of Midvi, Medigon Midfay, translated by John Pug of Aberdovi, and edited by the Rev. John Williams of Bethel, Landovery, 1861. This volume has an introduction consisting of the legend of Llyny Fan Falk, contributed by Mr. William Rees of Taun, who collected it in the year 1841, from various sources named, 2, 12. Pug, A Dictionary of the Welsh Language Explained in English, by Dr. William Owen Pug, 2nd edition, Denby, 1832, 383, 502. Rastel, A.C., Mary Tollis, 
printed by John Rastell, reprinted in Hazlitt's Shakespeare Jest Books, London, 1844, 599. Rees, an essay on the Welsh saints or the primitive Christians usually considered to have been the founders of churches in Wales, by the Reverend Rice Rees, London and Landovery, 1836, 163, 217, 396, 534. Refs, Lives of the Cambro British Saints, by the Reverend W. J. Rees, published for the Welsh Mises Society, Landovery, 1853, 693. Wren, Annals de Britannia Publis par la Faculte de Lettres de Rennes, Rennes, 1886, 50. -0. Review Archaeologique, New Series, Volume 23, Paris, 1800, 386. RHYS, Celtic Britain, by John Rees, Second Edition, London, 1884, 72. Lectures on Welsh Philology, by John Rees, Second Edition, London, 1879, 566. Hibbert Lectures, 1886, On the Origin and Growth of Religion as Illustrated by Celtic Heathendom, by John Rees, London, 1888, 310, 321, 328, 331, 373, 387, 432, 435, 444, 447, 511, 542, 570, 613, 654, 657, 694. RHYS, Studies in the Arthurian Legend, by John Rees, Oxford, 1891, 217, 287, 331, 375, 382, 387, 435, 438-41, 466, 494. 496, 561, 573, 610, 613. RHYS, Cambro Britannici Sim Reeve Lingua Institutions et Rudimenta. Conscripta a Joan Died Riso, Menensi Lanueth Leo Cambro Britano, Medico Sinensi, London, 1592, 22, 225. Richard, The Poetical Works of the Reverend Edward Richard. London, 1811, 577. Richards, A Welsh and English Dictionary, by Thomas Richards, Treffry, 1815, 378. Roberts, The Cambrian Popular Antiquities, by Peter Roberts, London, 1815, 396. Rosalini, C. 682. Reimer, Federa, Conventions, Literary, ed cujuscunc generis acta publica inter regis anglii, ed alios quasvis imperators, regis, pontifices, principes, vel communitates, edited by Thomas Reimer, Volume 8, London, 1709, 490. Sale, the Quran, translated into English with explanatory notes and a preliminary discourse, by George Sale, London, 1877, 608. Sampson, Osha Merciana, The Publication of the Arts Faculty of University College, Liverpool, edited by John Sampson, London, 393, 451. S. Anne Marte, Beitridge zur Bretonischen und celtisch germanischen Heldensage, by San Marte, Quedlinburg, 1847, 611. Schwann, Grammatic de Altfanzosistchen, by Edward Schwann, Leipzig, 1888, 563. Scotland. Proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, Edinburgh, 244. Scott, The Works of Sir Walter Scott, 320, 643, 689. Spillet, Traditions et Superstitions de la Haute Bretagne, by Paul Sebelot, Paris, 1882, 273. Shakespeare, The Plays and Poems of Shakespeare, 197, 636, 694. Sykes, British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions, by Wirt Sykes, London, 1880, 17, 18, 99, 155, 160, 173, 191, 192. 
Sylvan Evans, Dictionary of the Welsh Language, Gyriadur Simrig, by D. Sylvan Evans, Carmarthen, 1888, 387, 431, 539, 580, 620, 621. Why Britain, a periodical in Welsh for Welsh Antiquities and Folklore, edited by the Rev. D. S. Evans, and published by Robert Isaac Jones at Tremadoc, in quarto for 1858 and 1859, in octavo for 1862, 40, 73, 86, 98, 34, 137, 141, 151 to 5, 158 to 60, 202, 321, 413, 442, 456, 464, 470, 481, 690. Isin Sionade, by D. Sylvan Evans, Aberystwyth, 1882, 271 3. Simrock, Die Edda, Die Altir und die Jungere, Nebst den Mythischen Erzelungen der Skalde, translated and explained by Karl Simrock, Stuttgart, 1855, 652. Sinclair, The Statistical Account of Scotland, drawn up from the communications of the ministers of the different parishes, by Sir John Sinclair, Edinburgh, 1794, 310. Skeen, Chronicles of the Picts, Chronicles of the Scots, and Other Memorials of Scottish History, edited by Wynn. F. Skeen, Edinburgh, 1867, 374. Skeen, The Four Ancient Books of Wales, by William F. Skeen, Edinburgh, 1868, Volume. 2 contains, besides notes and illustrations, the Text of the Black Book of Carmarthen, 3-61, the Book of Anurin, 62-107, the Book of Taliesin, 108-217, and some of the poetry in the Red Book of Hergest, 218-308. These four texts are to be found translated in Volume 1, 226, 233, 269, 281, 387, 442, 541, 543, 550, 614 to 7. South Wales Daily News, Duncan, Cardiff, 376. Southey, Maddock, a poem by Robert Southey, London, 1815, 169, 171. Speed, The Theatre of the Empire of Great Britain, by John Speed, Not Speed, London, 1611, 208. Estianimuiar, Die Althoch Deutschen Glossen, collected and elaborated by Elias Steinmeier and Edward Sievers, Berlin, 1879-98, 683. Stengel, Lee Romans de Dermart le Galois, Altfranzosisches Rittergedicht, published for the first time by Edmund Stengel, Tübingen, 1873, 438. Stevens, The Goddeden of Anurin Guadrid, with an English translation and copious notes, by Thomas Stevens, edited by Professor Powell, and printed for the Simradorian Society, London, 1888, 310, 543, 647. Stevenson, The Scottish Antiquary or Northern Notes and Queries, edited by J. H. Stevenson, Edinburgh, 1886, 693. Stokes, Cormac's Glossary, C. Cormac. Goidelica, Old and Early Middle Irish Glosses, Prose and Verse, edited by Whitley Stokes, Second Edition, London, 1872, 295, 374. Iris Che Text MIT Übersetzung and UND Wörterbuch, edited by Whitley Stokes and E. Windisch, Third Series, Leipzig, 1891, 631. The Tripartite Life of Patrick, edited, with translations and indexes, by Whitley Stokes, Rolls Series, London, 1887, 535. Urkel Tischer Spratschatz von Whitley Stokes, Übersetzt, Überarbeitet und Herausgeben von Adelbert Besenberger. Forming the second part of the fourth edition of Fix für Gleichens Wörterbuch der Indogermanischen Sprachen, Gottingen, 1894, 671. Strabo, Strabonis Geographica Recognovit Augustus Meinecke Strabo, 
Strabonis Geographica Recognovit Augustus Meinecke, Leipzig, 1852-3, 654. Stirlis, Edis Norunis Stirlii, Copenhagen, 1848, 652. Tacitus, Cornelii Tacidi de Origine Situ Germanorum Liber, edited by Alfred Holder, Freiburg I, B., and Tübingen, 1882, 271. Taliesin, a Welsh periodical published at Rithin in 1859-60, 135 to 7, 269. Taliesin, the Book of Taliesin, C. Skeen, 550, 614 to 7. Tejid, Gwaith Bardenal y Diverbark. John Jones, Tejid, also called Joan Tejid, edited by the Reverend Henry Roberts, Landovery, 1859. 445. Triads, the so-called historical triads, referred to in this volume, are to be found in the Myverian Archaeology, London, 1801, Series I and II in Volume 2, 1-22, and, the later, Series III in the same volume, 57-80. In the single-volume edition of the Myverian, Denby, 1870, they occupy continuously pages 388-444. Series 2 comes from the Red Book of Her Jest, and will be found also in the volume of the Oxford Mabinogen, pp. 297-309, 170, 281, 326, 382, 429-31, 433, 441, 443-5, 498, 500, 501, 503-9. 565, 569. Tyler, Primitive Culture, Researches into the Development of Mythology, Philosophy, Religion, Language, Art, and Custom, by Edward Tyler, 2nd ed. London, 1873, 290, 329, 601, 603, 641, 658. TWINE, Thomas Twine's Brewery of Britain, a translation of Humphrey Lewitt's Fragmentum, London, 1573, 412. Ulphilas, Ulphilas, Text, Grammar, and Dictionary, elaborated and edited by F. L. Stam, Potterborn, 1869, 626. Vigfussen, an Icelandic dictionary, enlarged and completed by Gudbrand Vigfussen, Oxford, 1874, 288, 652. Weising, C. 563. Waldron, A Description of the Isle of Man, by George Waldron, being volume. 11 of the Manx Society's Publications, Douglas, 1865, 290. Waring, Recollections and Anecdotes of Edward Williams, by Elijah Waring, London, 1850, 458. Westermark, the History of Human Marriage, by Edward Westermark, London, 1894, 654. Wayman, From the Memoirs of a Minister of France, by Stanley Wayman, London, 1895, 690. Williams, The English Works of Eliezer Williams, with a memoir of his life by his son, St. George Armstrong Williams, London, I-840, 493. Williams, Brute Y. Tywisogen, or the Chronicle of the Princes, edited by John Williams of Bethel, Rolls Series, London, 1860, 79, 513. Williams, a biographical dictionary of eminent Welsh men, by the Reverend Robert Williams, Landovery, 1852, 534. Y. St. Greel, edited with a translation and glossary by the Reverend Robert Williams, London, 1876, 438, 514, 580. Williams, The Doom of Colin Dolphin, by Taliesin Williams, London, 1837, 561. Tradehod A. R. Gyrand Glyn Ned, by Taliesin Williams, c. 439. Williams, Observations on the Snowdon Mountains, by William Williams of Landagai, London, 1802, 48, 673, 674. Windisch, Iris J. Text MIT Wörterbuch, by Ernst Windisch, Leipzig, 1880, 
501, 657. Kurzgefasst Iris J. Grammatic, Leipzig, 1879, 291, 501, 502, 531, 546, 547, 603, 613, 618, 691. Uber die Iris J. Sage Neunden Olad, in the Berichter K. Sachs. Gesellschaft der Wissenschaften, Phil, Historisch Class, December 1884, 654. Woodall, Bygones, a periodical reissue of notes, queries, and replies on subjects relating to Wales and the borders, published in the columns of the Border Counties Advertiser, by Messrs. Woodall, Minchel and Company. Of the Caxton Press, Oswestry, 169, 378. Wood Martin, Pagan Ireland, by W. G. Wood Martin, London, 1895, 612. Worth, A History of Devonshire, with Sketches of Its Leading Worthies, by R. N. Worth, London, 1895, 307. Wright, The English Dialect Dictionary, edited by Professor Joseph Wright, London and Oxford, 1898. 66. Wynn, The History of the Gwider Family, published by Angherit LLWID in the year 1827, and by Askew Roberts at Oswestry in 1878, 490, 491, 670. Why Simrador, the magazine embodying the transactions of the Simridorian Society of London, Secretary, E. Vincent Evans, 64, Chancery Lane, W.C., 374, 384, 480, 510, 513, 520, 600, 610, 690, 693, 694. Why Dear YCH, a newspaper published at Utica in the United States of North America, 234. Why Gordafigen, an extinct Welsh periodical, see page 450. Why Gwiley did, a magazine of useful knowledge intended for the benefit of monoglot Welsh men, Bala, 1823 37, 450. Why Nofled, a Welsh periodical published by Mr. Aubrey, of Lanarch Y. Med, 396. Chapter 1 Undine's Kimrick Sisters. Undine, Liebes Bilde Ben Du. Seid ich zuerst aus Alten Kunden. Dein Seltsam looked in Aufschfunden. We sangst du oft main hers in Rue. De L.A. Mott Fook. The chief object of this and several of the following chapters is to place on record all the matter I can find on the subject of Welsh Lake legends, what I may have to say of them is merely by the way and sporadic. And I should feel well paid for my trouble if these contributions should stimulate others to communicate to the public bits of similar legends, which, possibly, still linger unrecorded among the mountains of Wales. For it should be clearly understood that all such things bear on the history of the Welsh, as the history of no people can be said to have been written so long as its superstitions and beliefs in past times have not been studied. And those who may think that the legends here recorded are childish and frivolous, may rest assured that they bear on questions which could not themselves be called either childish or frivolous. So, however silly a legend may be thought, let him who knows such a legend communicate it to somebody who will place it on record, he will then probably find that it has more meaning and interest than he had anticipated. I. I find it best to begin by reproducing a story which has already been placed on record, this appears desirable on account of its being the most complete of its kind, and the one with which shorter ones can most readily be compared. I allude to the legend of the Lady of Llyny Fan Fock in Camothensha, which I take the liberty of copying from Mr. Rees of Ton's version in the introduction to the Physicians of Midvi 1, published by the Welsh Manuscript Society, at Landovery, in 1861. There he says that he wrote it down from the oral recitations, which I suppose were in Welsh, of John Evans, Tyler, of Midfay, David Williams, Morpha, near Midfay, who was about ninety years old at the time, and Elizabeth Morgan, of Henley's Lodge near Landovery, who was a native of the same village of Midfay. To this it may be added that he acknowledges obligations also to Joseph Joseph, E.S.Q., F.S.A., Brecon, for collecting particulars from the old inhabitants of the parish of Landuzent. 
The legend, as given by Mr. Rees in English, runs as follows, and strongly reminds one in certain parts of the story of Undine as given in the German of de la Motte Fouque, with which it should be compared. When the eventful struggle made by the princes of South Wales to preserve the independence of their country was drawing to its close in the twelfth century, there lived at Blainsod two near Landuzant. Kamadensha, a widowed woman, the relict of a farmer who had fallen in those disastrous troubles. The widow had an only son to bring up, but Providence smiled upon her, and despite her forlorn condition, her livestock had so increased in course of time, that she could not well depasture them upon her farm. So she sent a portion of her cattle to graze on the adjoining Black Mountain, and their most favorite place was near the small lake called Llyn Y Fan Fok, on the northwestern side of the Kamathansha Fans. The son grew up to manhood, and was generally sent by his mother to look after the cattle on the mountain. One day, in his peregrinations along the margin of the lake, to his great astonishment, he beheld, sitting on the unruffled surface of the water, a lady. One of the most beautiful creatures that mortal eyes ever beheld, her hair flowed gracefully in ringlets over her shoulders, the tresses of which she arranged with a comb. Whilst the glassy surface of her watery couch served for the purpose of a mirror, reflecting back her own image. Suddenly she beheld the young man standing on the brink of the lake, with his eyes riveted on her, and unconsciously offering to herself the provision of barley bread and cheese with which he had been provided when he left his home. Bewildered by a feeling of love and admiration for the object before him, he continued to hold out his hand towards the lady, who imperceptibly glided near to him, but gently refused the offer of his provisions. He attempted to touch her, but she eluded his grasp, saying, Cross dy fara. Nid hod fy nala. Hard baked is thy bread. Tis not easy to catch me three. And immediately dived under the water and disappeared, leaving the love stricken youth to return home, a prey to disappointment and regret that he had been unable to make further acquaintance with one. In comparison with whom the whole of the fair maidens of Landuzant and Midfay for whom he had ever seen were as nothing. On his return home the young man communicated to his mother the extraordinary vision he had beheld. She advised him to take some unbaked dough or toes the next time in his pocket, as there must have been some spell connected with the hard-baked bread, or barakras, which prevented his catching the lady. Next morning, before the sun had gilded with its rays the peaks of the fans, the young man was at the lake, not for the purpose of looking after his mother's cattle, but seeking for the same enchanting vision he had witnessed the day before. But all in vain did he anxiously strain his eyeballs and glance over the surface of the lake, as only the ripples occasioned by a stiff breeze met his view, and a cloud hung heavily on the summit of the fan, which imparted an additional gloom to his already distracted mind. Hours passed on, the wind was hushed, and the clouds which had enveloped the mountain had vanished into thin air before the powerful beams of the sun. When the youth was startled by seeing some of his mother's cattle on the precipitous side of the acclivity, nearly on the opposite side of the lake. His duty impelled him to attempt to rescue them from their perilous position, for which purpose he was hastening away, when, to his inexpressible delight, the object of his search again appeared to him as before. And seemed much more beautiful than when he first beheld her. His hand was again held out to her, full of unbaked bread, which he offered with an urgent proffer of his heart also, and vows of eternal attachment. All of which were refused by her, saying, Lathe dy fara. Tni finna. Unbaked is thy bread. I will not have thee five. But the smiles that played upon her features as the lady vanished beneath the waters raised within the young man a hope that forbade him to despair by her refusal of him, and the recollection of which cheered him on his way home. His aged parent was made acquainted with his ill success, and she suggested that his bread should next time be but slightly baked, as most likely to please the mysterious being of whom he had become enamored. Impelled by an irresistible feeling, the youth left his mother's house early next morning, and with rapid steps he passed over the mountain. He was soon near the margin of the lake, and with all the impatience of an ardent lover did he wait with a feverish anxiety for the reappearance of the mysterious lady. The sheep and goats browsed on the precipitous sides of the fan. 
The cattle strayed amongst the rocks and large stones, some of which were occasionally loosened from their beds and suddenly rolled down into the lake, rain and sunshine alike came and passed away. But all were unheeded by the youth, so wrapped up was he in looking for the appearance of the lady. The freshness of the early morning had disappeared before the sultry rays of the noonday sun, which in its turn was fast verging towards the west as the evening was dying away and making room for the shades of night. And hope had well nigh abetted of beholding once more the lady of the lake. The young man cast a sad and last farewell look over the waters, and, to his astonishment, beheld several cows walking along its surface. The sight of these animals caused hope to revive that they would be followed by another object far more pleasing, nor was he disappointed, for the maiden reappeared, and to his enraptured sight, even lovelier than ever. She approached the land, and he rushed to meet her in the water. A smile encouraged him to seize her hand, neither did she refuse the moderately baked bread he offered her. And after some persuasion she consented to become his bride, on condition that they should only live together until she received from him three blows without a cause. Try Urgia Diachos. Three causeless blows. And if he ever should happen to strike her three such blows she would leave him forever. To such conditions he readily consented, and would have consented to any other stipulation, had it been proposed, as he was only intent on then securing such a lovely creature for his wife. Thus the lady of the lake engaged to become the young man's wife, and having loosed her hand for a moment she darted away and dived into the lake. His chagrin and grief were such that he determined to cast himself headlong into the deepest water, so as to end his life in the element that had contained in its unfathomed, depths the only one for whom he cared to live on earth. As he was on the point of committing this rash act, there emerged out of the lake two most beautiful ladies, accompanied by a hoary-headed man of noble mien and extraordinary stature, but having otherwise all the force and strength of youth. This man addressed the almost bewildered youth in accents calculated to soothe his troubled mind, saying that as he proposed to marry one of his daughters, he consented to the union. Provided the young man could distinguish which of the two ladies before him was the object of his affections. This was no easy task, as the maidens were such perfect counterparts of each other that it seemed quite impossible for him to choose his bride, and if perchance he fixed upon the wrong one all would be forever lost. Whilst the young man narrowly scanned the two ladies, he could not perceive the least difference betwixt the two, and was almost giving up the task in despair, when one of them thrust her foot a slight degree forward. The motion, simple as it was, did not escape the observation of the youth, and he discovered a trifling variation in the mode with which their sandals were tied. This at once put an end to the dilemma, for he, who had on previous occasions been so taken up with the general appearance of the lady of the lake, had also noticed the beauty of her feet and ankles. And on now recognizing the peculiarity of her shoe tie he boldly took hold of her hand. Thou hast chosen rightly, said her father, be to her a kind and faithful husband, and I will give her, as a dowry, as many sheep, cattle, goats, and horses as she can count of each without heaving or drawing in her breath. But remember, that if you prove unkind to her at any time, and strike her three times without a cause, she shall return to me, and shall bring all her stock back with her. Such was the verbal marriage settlement, to which the young man gladly assented, and his bride was desired to count the number of sheep she was to have. She immediately adopted the mode of counting by fives, thus, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, as many times as possible in rapid succession, till her breath was exhausted. The same process of reckoning had to determine the number of goats, cattle, and horses respectively, and in an instant the full number of each came out of the lake when called upon by the father. The young couple were then married, by what ceremony was not stated, and afterwards went to reside at a farm called Esgare Lefty, somewhat more than a mile from the village of Midfay, where they lived in prosperity and happiness for several years, and became the parents of three sons, who were beautiful children. Once upon a time there was a christening to take place in the neighborhood, to which the parents were specially invited. When the day arrived the wife appeared very reluctant to attend the christening, alleging that the distance was too great for her to walk. Her husband told her to fetch one of the horses which were grazing in an adjoining field. I will, said she, 
if you will bring me my gloves which I left in our house. He went to the house and returned with the gloves, and finding that she had not gone for the horse jocularly slapped her shoulder with one of them, saying, Go. Go. Dos, dos, when she reminded him of the understanding upon which she consented to marry him, that he was not to strike her without a cause, and warned him to be more cautious for the future. On another occasion, when they were together at a wedding, in the midst of the mirth and hilarity of the assembled guests, who had gathered together from all the surrounding country, she burst into tears and sobbed most piteously. Her husband touched her on her shoulder and inquired the cause of her weeping, she said, Now people are entering into trouble, and your troubles are likely to commence, as you have the second time stricken me without a cause. Years passed on, and their children had grown up, and were particularly clever young men. In the midst of so many worldly blessings at home the husband almost forgot that there remained only one causeless blow to be given to destroy the whole of his prosperity. Still he was watchful lest any trivial occurrence should take place which his wife must regard as a breach of their marriage contract. She told him, as her affection for him was unabated, to be careful that he would not, through some inadvertence, give the last and only blow, which, by an unalterable destiny, over which she had no control, would separate them for ever. It, however, so happened that one day they were together at a funeral, where, in the midst of the mourning and grief at the house of the deceased, she appeared in the highest and gayest spirits, and indulged in immoderate fits of laughter. Which so shocked her husband that he touched her, saying, Hush! Hush! Don't laugh! She said that she laughed, because people when they die go out of trouble, and, rising up, she went out of the house, saying, The last blow has been struck, our marriage contract is broken, and at an end. Farewell. Then she started off towards Esgare Lefty, where she called her cattle and other stock together, each by name. The cattle she called thus. Mu Wolfrech, Molfrech. Mu Alfrech, Gwynfrech. Pader Cae Tonfrech. Yer Hen Weinwen. A.R. Las Gagan. Guidar Tar Gwyn. O. Lis Y. Brennan. A.R. Lo Du Bach. S.Y.L.L.A.R. Y. Bach. Dear Ditha, Wayan Ayak Otter. Brindled Cow, White Speckled. Spotted Cow, Bold Freckled. The Four Field Sward Mottled. The Old White Faced. And the Grey Jinjin. With the White Bull. From the Court of the King and the little black calf, though suspended on the hook. Come thou also, quite well home. They all immediately obeyed the summons of their mistress. The little black calf, although it had been slaughtered, became alive again, and walked off with the rest of the stock at the command of the lady. This happened in the spring of the year, and there were four oxen ploughing in one of the fields. To these she cried. Pedwar eat I on glass. S Y D D A R Y Maze. Dutch Twitho. Y N I A K Otter. The four grey oxen. That are on the field. Come you also. Quite well home. Away the whole of the livestock went with the lady across Midfay Mountain, towards the lake from whence they came, a distance of above six miles, where they disappeared beneath its waters, leaving no trace behind except a well marked furrow which was made by the plough the oxen drew after them into the lake, and which remains to this day as a testimony to the truth of this story. What became of the affrighted ploughman whether he was left on the field when the oxen set off, or whether he followed them to the lake, has not been handed down to tradition. Neither has the fate of the disconsolate and half-ruined husband been kept in remembrance. But of the sons it is stated that they often wandered about the lake and its vicinity, hoping that their mother might be permitted to visit the face of the earth once more, as they had been apprised of her mysterious origin. Her first appearance to their father, and the untoward circumstances which so unhappily deprived them of her maternal care. In one of their rambles, at a place near Dole Howell, at the mountain gate, still called Lydiat Y. Medigon, the physician's gate, the mother appeared suddenly, and accosted her eldest son, whose name was Rywallan and told him that his mission on earth was to be a benefactor to mankind by relieving them from pain and misery, through healing all manner of their diseases. 
for which purpose she furnished him with a bag full of medical prescriptions and instructions for the preservation of health. That by strict attention thereto he and his family would become for many generations the most skillful physicians in the country. Then, promising to meet him when her counsel was most needed, she vanished. But on several occasions she met her sons near the banks of the lake, and once she even accompanied them on their return home as far as a place still called Pantwimedagon, the dingle of the physicians. Where she pointed out to them the various plants and herbs which grew in the dingle, and revealed to them their medicinal qualities or virtues. And the knowledge she imparted to them, together with their unrivaled skill, soon caused them to attain such celebrity that none ever possessed before them. And in order that their knowledge should not be lost, they wisely committed the same to writing, for the benefit of mankind throughout all ages. To the legend Mr. Rees added the following notes, which we reproduce also at full length. And so ends the story of the physicians of Midfay, which has been handed down from one generation to another, thus. Year Hen W R L L W I D O R Cornell. Gon E I Dad a Glywad Chwedel 6. A Chan E I Dad Fay Glywad in Tau. A C A R E I O L Me Gofiais in All. The Grey Old Man in the Corner. Of his father heard a story. Which from his father he had heard. And after them I have remembered. As stated in the introduction of the present work, i.e., the physicians of Midvai, Rywallan and his sons became physicians to Rhys Gryg, Lord of Landovery and Dynefor Castles, who gave them rank, lands, and privileges at Midfay for their maintenance in the practice of their art and science. And the healing and benefit of those who should seek their help, thus affording to those who could not afford to pay, the best medical advice and treatment gratuitously. Such a truly royal foundation could not fail to produce corresponding effects. So the fame of the physicians of Midfay was soon established over the whole country, and continued for centuries among their descendants. The celebrated Welsh bard, Daffod A. P. Gwilym, who flourished in the following century, and was buried at the Abbey of Tawailaicha 7, in Camothenshire, about the year 1368, says in one of his poems, as quoted in Dr. Davies' Dictionary. Medigani ne mod y gunneth. Midfay, O chai ddy and medfeeth. A physician he would not make. As Midfay made, if he had a mead fostered man. Of the above lands bestowed upon the Medigon, there are two farms in Midfay parish still called LLWIN Han Fedig, the grove of Evan the physician, and LLWIN Meredith Fedig, the grove of Meredith the physician. Esgare Lefty, mentioned in the foregoing legend, was formerly in the possession of the above descendants, and so was Ty Nuid, near Midfay, which was purchased by Mr. Halford, of Silguin, from the Rev. Charles Lloyd, vicar of Landafall, Breckenshire, who married a daughter of one of the Medigon, and had the living of Landafall from a Mr. Vaughan, who presented him to the same out of gratitude, because Mr. Lloyd's wife's father had cured him of a disease in the eye. As Mr. Lloyd succeeded to the above living in 1748, and died in 1800, it is probable that the skillful oculist was John Jones, who is mentioned in the following inscription on a tombstone at present fixed against the west end of Midfay Church. Here. Leith the body of Mr. David Jones, of Mothvay, surgeon. Who was an honest, charitable, and skillful man. He died September 14th, Anno Dom 1719, aged 61. John Jones, surgeon. Eldest son of the said David Jones, departed this life. The 25th of November, 1739, in the 44th year. Of his age, and also lies interred hereunder. These appear to have been the last of the physicians who practiced at Midfay. The above John Jones resided for some time at Landovery, and was a very eminent surgeon. One of his descendants, named John Lewis, lived at Cumbran, Midfay, at which place his great-grandson, Mr. John Jones, now resides. Dar. Morgan Owen, Bishop of Landaff, who died at Glasalt, parish of Midfay, in 1645, was a descendant of the Medigon, and an inheritor of much of their landed property in that parish, the bulk of which he bequeathed to his nephew, Morgan Owen 
who died in 1667, and was succeeded by his son Henry Owen. And at the decease of the last of whose descendants, Robert Lewis, E.S.Q., the estates became, through the will of one of the family, the property of the late D.A.S. Davies, E.S.Q., M.P. for Commodentia. Bishop Owen bequeathed to another nephew, Morgan A.P. Rees, son of Rees A.P. John, a descendant of the Medigon, the farm of Riblet, and some other property. Morgan A. P. Rees' son, Samuel Rice, resided at Lutter, in Gower, Glamorganshire, and had a son, Morgan Rice, who was a merchant in London, and became lord of the manor of Tooting Gravenay, and high sheriff in the year 1772, and deputy lieutenant of the county of Surrey, 1776. He resided at Hill House, which he built. At his death the whole of his property passed to his only child, John Rice, E.S.Q., whose eldest son, the Reverend John Morgan Rice, inherited the greater portion of his estates. The head of the family is now the Reverend Horatio Morgan Rice, rector of South Hill with Callington, Cornwall, and J.P. for the county, who inherited, with other property, a small estate at Lahar. The above Morgan Rice had landed property in Lanmadoc and Langeneth, as well as Lahar, in Gower, but whether he had any connection with Howell the Physician, A.P. Rees A.P. Lywell and A.P. Philip the Physician, and lineal descendant from Inion A.P. Rywallen, who resided at Silgrid in Gower, is not known. Amongst other families who claimed descent from the physicians were the Bowens of C.W.M.Y.D.W., Midfay, and Jones of Dalgarig in Penrhoch, in the same parish, the latter of whom are represented by Charles Bishop, of Dalgarig, E.S.Q. Clerk of the Peace for Camothenshire, and Thomas Bishop, of Brecon, E.S.Q. Rees Williams of Midfay is recorded as one of the Medigon. His great-grandson was the late Rice Williams, M.D. of Aberystwyth, who died May 16, 1842, aged 85, and appears to have been the last, although not the least eminent, of the physicians descended from the mysterious Lady of Llyny Fan 8. This brings the legend of the Lady of the Fan Lake into connection with a widely spread family. There is another connection between it and modern times, as will be seen from the following statement kindly made to me by the Reverend A. G. Edwards, Warden of the Welsh College at Landovery, since then appointed Bishop of St. Azaf, an old woman from Midfay, who is now, that is to say in January 1881, about eighty years of age, tells me that she remembers thousands and thousands of people visiting the Lake of the Little Fan on the first Sunday or Monday in August. And when she was young she often heard old men declare that at that time a commotion took place in the lake, and that its waters boiled, which was taken to herald the approach of the lake lady and her oxen. The custom of going up to the lake on the first Sunday in August was a very well-known one in years gone by, as I have learned from a good many people, and it is corroborated by Mr. Joseph Joseph of Brecon, who kindly writes as follows, in reply to some queries of mine, on the first Sunday in the month of August, Llyny Fan Fock is supposed to be boiling, were we. I have seen scores of people going up to see it, not boiling though, on that day. I do not remember that any of them expected to see the Lady of the Lake. As to the boiling of the lake I have nothing to say. And I am not sure that there is anything in the following statement made as an explanation of the yearly visit to the lake by an old fisherwoman from Landovery, the best time for eels is in August, when the northeast wind blows on the lake. And makes huge waves in it. The eels can then be seen floating on the waves. Last summer I went myself to the village of Midfay, to see if I could pick up any variants of the legend, but I was hardly successful. For though several of the farmers I questioned could repeat bits of the legend, including the lake lady's call to her cattle as she went away, I got nothing new, except that one of them said that the youth, when he first saw the lake lady at a distance, thought she was a goose he did not even rise to the conception of a swan but that by degrees he approached her, and discovered that she was a lady in white, and that in due time they were married. And so on. My friend, the warden of Landovery College, seems, however, to have found a bit of a version which may have been still more unlike the one recorded by Mr. Rees of Tawn, it was from an old man at Midfay last year, from whom he was, nevertheless, only able to extract the statement that the lake lady got somehow entangled in a farmer's gambo, 
and that ever after his farm was very fertile. A gambo, I ought to explain, is a kind of a cart without sides, used in South Wales, both the name and the thing seem to have come from England, though I cannot find such a word as gambo or gambo in the ordinary dictionaries. Among other legends about lake fairies, there are, in the third chapter of Mr. Sykes' British Goblins, two versions of this story, the first of them differs but slightly from Mr. Rees, in that the farmer used to go near the lake to see some lambs he had bought at a fair, and that whenever he did so three beautiful damsels appeared to him from the lake. They always eluded his attempts to catch them, they ran away into the lake, saying, Cross dy fara, and but one day a piece of moist bread came floating ashore, which he ate, and the next day he had a chat with the lake maidens. He proposed marriage to one of them, to which she consented, provided he could distinguish her from her sisters the day after. The story then, so far as I can make out from the brief version which Mr. Sykes gives of it, went on like that of Mr. Rees. The former gives another version, with much more interesting variations, which omit all reference however, to the physicians of Midfay. And relate how a young farmer had heard of the lake maiden rowing up and down the lake in a golden boat with a golden skull. He went to the lake on New Year's Eve, saw her, was fascinated by her, and left in despair at her vanishing out of sight, although he cried out to her to stay and be his wife. She faintly replied, and went her way, after he had gazed at her long yellow hair and pale melancholy face. He continued to visit the lake, and grew thin and negligent of his person, owing to his longing. But a wise man, who lived on the mountain, advised him to tempt her with gifts of bread and cheese, which he undertook to do on Midsummer Eve, when he dropped into the lake a large cheese and a loaf of bread. This he did repeatedly, until at last his hopes were fulfilled on New Year's Eve. This time he had gone to the lake clad in his best suit, and at midnight dropped seven white loaves and his biggest and finest cheese into the lake. The lake lady by and by came in her skiff to where he was, and gracefully stepped ashore. The scene need not be further described, Mr. Sykes gives a picture of it, and the story then proceeds as in the other version. It is a pity that Mr. Rees did not preserve the Welsh versions out of which he pieced together the English one, but as to Mr. Sykes, I cannot discover whence his has been derived, for he seems not to have been too anxious to leave anybody the means of testing his work, as one will find on verifying his references, when he gives any. See also the allusions to him in Hartland's Science of Fairy Tales, pages 64, 123, 137, 165, 278. Since writing the foregoing notes the following communication has reached me from a friend of my undergraduate days at Jesus College, Oxford, Mr. Lywarch Reynolds of Merthyr Tidfil. Only the first part of it concerns the legend of Llyny Fan Falk. But as the rest is equally racy I make no apology for publishing it in full without any editing. Except the insertion of the meaning of two or three of the Welsh words occurring in it. Tell Rhys that I have just heard a sequel to the Metagon Midface story, got from a rustic on Mynyddy Banwan, between Glynd and Glintaw. On a ramble recently with David Lewis the barrister and Sidney Hartland the folklorist. It was to the effect that after the disappearance of Thiforn, the damsel, into the lake, the disconsolate husband and his friend set to work to drain the lake in order to get at her, if possible. They made a great cutting into the bank, when suddenly a huge hairy monster of hideous aspect emerged from the water and stormed at them for disturbing him, and wound up with this threat. O.S. Na Cha I Loaned Y.N.Y.M. Lee. Fi Fada Dre, Barandu. If I get no quiet in my place. I shall drown the town of Brecon. It was evidently the last break, arm, of a triban Morganwg, but this was all my informant knew of it. From the allusion to Tre, Barandu, it struck me that there was here probably a tale of Llyn Safadan, which had migrated to Llyn Y. Fan. Because of course there would have to be a considerable change in the levels before Llyny Fan and the Sod could put Brecon in any great jeopardy 9. We also got another tale about a Kumshur, Kunjur, who once lived in Istragerlis, as the rustic pronounced it. The wizard was a Dain Laharn, a man with an iron hand. 
and it being reported that there was a great treasure hidden in Mynyddy drum, the wizard said he would secure it, if he could but get some plucky fellow to spend a night with him there. John Gethin was a plucky fellow, Dine Isbridal, and he agreed to join the Dine Laharn in his diablery. The wizard traced two rings on the sword touching each other, like a number eight. He went into one, and Gethin into the other, the wizard strictly charging him on no account to step out of the ring. The Laharn then proceeded to Trafford I Lifrau, or, busy himself with his books. And there soon appeared a monstrous bull, bellowing dreadfully, but the plucky Gethin held his ground, and the bull vanished. Next came a terrible object, a flywheel of fire, which made straight for poor Gethin and made him swerve out of the ring. Thereupon the wheel assumed the form of the Dial, devil, who began to haul Gethin away. The law harn seized hold of him and tried to get him back. The devil was getting the upper hand, when the law harn begged the devil to let him keep Gethin while the piece of candle he had with him lasted. The devil consented, and let go his hold of Gethin, where? Upon the kumsher immediately blew out the candle, and the devil was discomfited. Gethin preserved the piece of candle very carefully, stowing it away in a cool place. But still it wasted away although it was never lighted. Gethin got such a fright that he took to his bed, and as the candle wasted away he did the same, and they both came to an end simultaneously. Gethin vanished and it was not his body that was put into the coffin, but a lump of clay which was put in to save appearances. It is said that the wizard's books are in an oaken chest at Wongerlai's farmhouse to this day. We got these tales on a ramble to see Main Wygwedio, on the mountain near Colbrand Junction Station on the Neath and Brecon Railway, marked on the ordnance map, but we had to turn back owing to the fearful heat. Before dismissing Mr. Reynolds' letter I may mention a story in point which relates to a lake on the Brecon side of the mountains. It is given at length by the Reverend Edward Davies in his Mythology and Rites of the British Druids, London, 1809, pages 155-7. According to this legend a door in the rock was to be found open once a year on May Day, as it is supposed and from that door one could make one's way to the Garden of the Fairies, which was an island in the middle of the lake. This paradise of exquisite bliss was invisible, however, to those who stood outside the lake, they could only see an indistinct mass in the center of the water. Once on a time a visitor tried to carry away some of the flowers given him by the fairies, but he was thereby acting against their law, and not only was he punished with the loss of his senses, but the door has never since been left open. It is also related that once an adventurous person attempted to drain the water away, in order to discover its contents, when a terrific form arose from the midst of the lake, commanding him to desist, or otherwise he would drown the country. This form is clearly of the same species as that which, according to Mr. Reynolds' story, threatened to drown the town of Brecon. Subsequent inquiries have elicited more information, and I am more especially indebted to my friend Mr. Ivor James, who, as Registrar of the University of Wales, has of late years been living at Brecon. He writes to the following effect, the lake you want is LLYN cum LLWCH, and the legend is very well known locally, but there are variants. Once on a time men and boys dug a gully through the dam in order to let the water out. A man in a red coat, sitting in an armchair, appeared on the surface of the water and threatened them in the terms which you quote from Mr. Reynolds. The red coat would seem to suggest that this form of the legend dates possibly from a time since our soldiers were first clothed in red. In another case, however, the spectre was that of an old woman. And I am told that a somewhat similar story is told in connection with a well in the castle wall in the parish of Landu, to the north of this town Geraldus Cambrensis parish. A friend of mine is employing his spare time at present in an inquiry into the origin of the lakes of this district and he tells me that LLY and Coom LLWCH is of glacial origin, its dam being composed, as he thinks, of glacial debris through which the water always percolates into the valley below. But storm water flows over the dam, and in the course of ages has cut for itself a gully, now about ten feet deep at the deepest point, through the embankment. The story was possibly invented to explain that fact. There is no cave to be seen in the rock, and probably there never was one, as the formation is the old red sandstone, 
and the island was perhaps equally imaginary. That is the substance of Mr. James' letter, in which he, moreover, refers to J.D. Rees' account of the lake in his Welsh introduction to his grammar, published in London in 1592, under the title Cambro Britannici, Sim Reeve Lingua, Institutions et Rudimenta. There the grammarian, in giving some account of himself, mentions his frequent sojourns at the hospitable residence of a nobleman, named M. Morgan Merited, near Y. Bugildy Yn Nyphryn Tabata O B H Y W N S W Y D H Basibhead, that is, near the Bugildy in the valley of the team within the county of Radnor. Then he continues to the following effect, but the latter part of this book was thought out under the bushes and green foliage in a bit of a place of my own called Y. Clunhir, at the top of Coombe Y. L. L. W. C. H. Below the spurs of the mountain of Banach Denny, which some call Ban Arthur and others Mole Arthur. Below that mole and in its lap there is a lake of pretty large size, unknown depth, and wondrous nature. For as the stories go, no bird has ever been seen to repair to it or towards it, or to swim on it, it is wholly avoided, and some say that no animals or beasts of any kind are wont to drink of its waters. The peasantry of that country, and especially the shepherds who are wont to frequent these moles and bands, relate many other wonders concerning it and the exceeding strange things beheld at times in connection with this lock. This lake or lock is called LLYN Cum Y L L W C H 10. 2. Before dismissing the story of LLYN Y Fan Fock, I wish to append a similar one from the parish of Istrad Dyfodwg in Glamorganshire. The following is a translation of a version given in Welsh in Cyphale Year Elwood A. R. Frythones, edited by Elfied and Cadrod, and published by Messrs. Williams and Son, Hlanehli. The version in question is by Cadrod, and it is to the following effect see the volume for 1892, p. 59. LLYNY Forwin, the damsel's pool, is in the parish of Istrad Typhadwg, the inhabitants call it also LLYN Nelferch. It lies about halfway between the farmhouse of Rhonda Feshin, Little Rhonda, and the Vale of Safuch. The ancient tradition concerning it is somewhat as follows. Once on a time a farmer lived at the Rhonda Feshin, he was unmarried. And as he was walking by the lake early one morning in spring he beheld a young woman of beautiful appearance walking on the other side of it. He approached her and spoke to her, she gave him to understand that her home was in the lake, and that she owned a number of milch cows, that lived with her at the bottom of the water. The farmer fancied her so much that he fell in love with her over head and ears, he asked her on the spot for her hand and heart, and he invited her to come and spend her life with him as his wife at the Ronde Fession. She declined at first, but as he was importunate she consented at last on the following conditions, namely, that she would bring her cattle with her out of the lake, and live with him until he and she had three disputes with one another, then. She said, she and the cattle would return into the lake. He agreed to the conditions, and the marriage took place. They lived very happily and comfortably for long years. But the end was that they fell out with one another, and, when they happened to have quarreled for the third time, she was heard early in the morning driving the cattle towards the lake with these words. PRW Dre, PRW Dre. PRWR Gordheg I Dre. PRW Milfak A Malfak, Pader Lulfak. Alfak A C Ali, Pader Lady. Windwen Dwinog. Tiro I R Wan Lidiog. Trek L L Y N Y Wan Aden, Tear Pence Thin. Tear Kaseg D D U Draw Y N Year I Thin Eleven. And into the lake they went out of sight, and there they live to this day. And some believe that they had heard the voice and cry of Nelferch in the whisper of the breeze on the top of the mountain hard by many a time after that as an old story, Wed Dal, will have it. From this it will be seen that the fairy wife's name was supposed to have been Nelferch, and that the piece of water is called after her. But I find that great uncertainty prevails as to the old name of the lake, as I learned from a communication in 1894 from Mr. Llewellyn Williams, living at Porth, only some five miles from the spot, that one of his informants assured him that the name in use among former generations was Llyn Alfak. Mr. Williams made inquiries at the Ronda Fession about the lake legend. He was told that the water had long since been known as LLYNY Forwin, 
from a Morwen, or damsel, with a number of cattle having been drowned in it. The story of the man who mentioned the name as Llyn Alfak was similar, the maid belonged to the farm of Penrice, he said, and the young man to the Ronde Fession, and it was in consequence of their third dispute, he added. That she left him and went back to her previous service, and afterwards, while taking the cattle to the water, she sank accidentally or purposely into the lake, so that she was never found any more. Here it will be seen how modern rationalism has been modifying the story into something quite uninteresting but without wholly getting rid of the original features, such as the three disputes between the husband and wife. Lastly, it is worth mentioning that this water appears to form part of a bit of very remarkable scenery, and that its waves strike on one side against a steep rock believed to contain caves, supposed to have been formerly inhabited by men and women. At present the place, I learn, is in the possession of Messrs. Davis and Sons, owners of the Ferndale Collieries, who keep a pleasure boat on the lake. I have appealed to them on the question of the name Nelferch or Alfak, in the hope that their books would help to decide as to the old form of it. Replying on their behalf, Mr. J. Probert Evans informs me that the company only got possession of the lake and the adjacent land in 1862, and that Llyn Y. Vorwin is the name of the former in the oldest plan which they have. Inquiries have also been made in the neighborhood by my friend, Mr. Reynolds, who found the old tenants of the Ronde Fession farm gone, and the neighboring farmhouse of Dyffryn Safuch supplanted by Collier's cottages. But he calls my attention to the fact, that perhaps the old name was neither Nelferch nor Alfak, as Elfarch, which would fit equally well, was once the name of a petty chieftain of the adjoining hundred of Senganid. For which he refers me to Clark's Glamorgan Genealogies, p. 511, but I have to thank him more especially for a longer version of the fairy wife's call to her cattle, as given in Glanford's PLWIF Lanwino, the parish of Lanwino, Pontypridd, 1888, p. 117, as follows. PRW me, PRW me. PRW, Nguartha Gaidre. PRW Melon a Ioko. Tegwen a Ruddo. Rudfrek a Molfrek. Pider Lianfrek. Lianfrek a G Eli. A Fider Wen Lady. Lady a Chornwen. A Fider Winewen. Nepwen a Wynog. Tali Lainiog. Breck Yn Y Glyn. Dal Yn Dine. Tair Ligeatin. Tair Jefredin. Tair Kaseg Ddu, Draw Yn Yer Ithin. Dutch I G Y D I Lis Y Brennan. Blah, Blah. Safe Yn Flina. Saf Yn O L Y Ray Go R Tifry. F Y D H N I S Godri and Gwar the Guy. The last line slightly mended may be rendered. Bull, bull. Stand thou foremost. Back. Thou wife of the house uphill. Never shalt thou milk my cows. This seems to suggest that the quarrel was about another woman, and that by the time when the fairy came to call her livestock into the lake she had been replaced by another woman who came from the Typhry, or the house uphill twelve. In that case this version comes closer than any other to the story of Undine supplanted by Bertalda as her knight's favorite. Mr. Probert Evans having kindly given me the address of an aged farmer who formerly lived in the valley, my friend, Mr. Lywarch Reynolds, was good enough to visit him. Mr. Reynolds shall report the result in his own words, dated January 9, 1899, as follows. I was at Pentarch this morning, and went to see Mr. David Evans, formerly of Sefton Colston. The old man is a very fine specimen of the better class of Welsh farmer, is in his eighty-third year, hale and hearty, intelligent, and in full possession of his faculties. He was born and bred in the Ronda Fession Valley, and lived there until some forty years ago. He had often heard the lake story from an old aunt of his who lived at the Marty Farm, a short distance north of the lake, and who died a good many years ago, at a very advanced age. He calls the lake Llyn Elferch, and the story, as known to him, has several points in common with the Llyn Y fan legend, which, however, he did not appear to know. He could not give me many details, but the following is the substance of the story as he knows it, the young farmer, 
who lived with his mother at the neighboring farm, one day saw the lady on the bank of the lake, combing her hair. Which reached down to her feet. He fell in love at first sight, and tried to approach her, but she evaded him, and crying out, Dali di dim o fi, cross dy fara. Thou wilt not catch me, thou of the crimped bread, she sank into the water. He saw her on several subsequent occasions, and gave chase, but always with the same result, until at length he got his mother to make him some bread which was not baked, or not baked so hard, and this he offered to the lady. She then agreed to become his wife, subject to the condition that if he offended her, or disagreed with her three times, A.R. Yer Ahmed, O.S. Bissa, F.A.Y.N. I. Cresi Hai Der Gwaith, she would leave him and return into the lake with all her belongings. 1. The first disagreement, Crows, was at the funeral of a neighbor, a man in years, at which the lady gave way to excessive weeping and lamentation. The husband expressed surprise and annoyance at this excessive grief for the death of a person not related to them, and asked the reason for it. And she replied that she grieved for the defunct on account of the eternal misery that was in store for him in the other world. 2. The second, Crows, was at the death of an infant child of the lady herself, at which she laughed immoderately. And in reply to the husband's remonstrance, she said she did so for joy at her child's escape from this wicked world and its passage into a world of bliss. 3. The third, Crows, Mr. Evans was unable to call to mind, but equally with the other two it showed that the lady was possessed of preternatural knowledge, and it resulted in her leaving her husband and returning into the lake, taking the cattle, and, with her. The accepted explanation of the name of the lake was LLYN Elferk 13, equals Hela, R. Firk, because of the young man chasing the damsel, Hela, R. Firk. The following is the cattle call, as given to me by Mr. Evans aged housekeeper, who migrated with the family from Rhonda Fession to Penturch. PRWI, PRWE 14. PRW, Ngwarthig Shah, equals Tua, THRE. Mil a mole a melon gooda. Milfak a malfak. Peder equals peder, lirfak. Lirfak a g a li. Peder a lafi. Lafi a chornwan equals win. Nepwan druinog. Drotwan equals drodwen, liliog. Teir bin sethin. Teir jifritin. Teir kasig ddu. Draw wyan yer ithin equals ithin. Dutch I G Y D I Lis Y Brennan. Mr. Evans told me that DYFFRYN Safuch was considered to be a corruption of DYFFRYN Safni or HWCH, Valley of the Sow's Mouth. So that the explanation was not due to a minister with whom I foregathered on my tramp near the lake the other day, and from whom I heard it first. The similarity between Mr. Evans' version of this legend and that of LLYN Y Fan Fock, tends to add emphasis to certain points which I had been inclined to treat as merely accidental. In the Fan Fock legend the young man's mother is a widow, and here he is represented living with his mother. Here also something depends on the young man's bread, but it is abruptly introduced, suggesting that a part of the story has been forgotten. Both stories, however, give one the impression that the bread of the fairies was regarded as always imperfectly baked. In both stories the young man's mother comes to his help with her advice. Mr. Evans' version ascribes supernatural knowledge to the fairy, though his version fails to support it, and her moralizings read considerably later than those which the fan legend ascribes to the fairy wife. Some of these points may be brought under the reader's notice later, when he has been familiarized with more facts illustrative of the belief in fairies. 3. On returning from South Wales to Carnarvonshire in the summer of 1881, I tried to discover similar legends connected with the lakes of North Wales, beginning with Gurionid, the waters of which form a stream emptying itself into the Conwy. Near Trefry, a little below Lanawest. I only succeeded, however, in finding an old man of the name of Pierce Williams, about seventy years of age, who was very anxious to talk about Bonis Wars, but not about Lake Ladies. I was obliged, in trying to make him understand what I wanted, to use the word morphowin, that is to say in English, mermaid. He then told me, 
that in his younger days he had heard people say that somebody had seen such beings in the Trefri River. But as my questions were leading ones, his evidence is not worth much. However, I feel pretty sure that one who knew the neighborhood of Gurionid better would be able to find some fragments of interesting legends still existing in that wild district. I was more successful at Lanberis, though what found, at first, was not much, but it was genuine, and to the point. This is the substance of it, an old woman, called Sion 15 Daffod, lived at Helfa 4, in the dingle called Coom. Buainog, along the left side of which you ascend as you go to the top of Snowden, from the village of Lower Lanberis, or Coed Wydal, as it is there called. She was a curious old person, who made nice distinctions between the virtues of the respective waters of the district, thus, no other would do for her to cure her of the deaf aid Gwilshin 16, or cancerous warts. Which she fancied that she had in her mouth, than that of the spring of Tai Bok, near the lake called Llyn Finan Y Gwas, though she seldom found it out, when she was deceived by a servant who cherished a convenient opinion of his own. That a drop from a nearer spring would do just as well. Old Sion has been dead over thirty-five years, but I have it, on the testimony of two highly trustworthy brothers, who are of her family, and now between sixty and seventy years of age, that she used to relate to them how a shepherd, once on a time, saw a fairy maiden, unortylwyth tag, on the surface of the tarn called Llyn Duar Ardu, and how, from bantering and joking, their acquaintance ripened into courtship. When the father and mother of the lake maiden appeared to give the union their sanction, and to arrange the marriage settlement. This was to the effect that the husband was never to strike his wife with iron, and that she was to bring her great wealth with her, consisting of stock of all kinds for his mountain farm. All duly took place, and they lived happily together until one day, when trying to catch a pony, the husband threw a bridle to his wife, and the iron in that struck her. It was then all over with him, as the wife hurried away with her property into the lake, so that nothing more was seen or heard of her. Here I may as well explain that the Lanbera side of the steep, near the top of Snowden, is called Clogwin Duar Ardu, or the Black Cliff of the Ardu, at the bottom of which lies the tarn alluded to as the Black Lake of the Ardu. And near it stands a huge boulder, called Main Duar Ardu, all of which names are curious, as involving the word Du, Black. Ardu itself has much the same meaning, and refers to the whole precipitous side of the summit with its dark shadows, and there is a similar Ardu near Nanmore on the Miryanefshire side of Bejlert. One of the brothers, I ought to have said, doubts that the lake here mentioned was the one in Old Sion's tale, but he has forgotten which it was of the many in the neighborhood. Both, however, remembered another short story about fairies, which they had heard another old woman relate, namely, Mari Domo's Shaun. Who died some thirty years ago, it was merely to the effect that a shepherd had once lost his way in the mist on the mountain on the land of Ko Gwynion, towards Quellan Seventeen Lake. And got into a ring where the Tylwyth Teg were dancing, it was only after a very hard struggle that he was able, at length, to get away from them. To this I may add the testimony of a lady, for whose veracity I can vouch, to the effect that, when she was a child in Kumbuinog, from thirty to forty years ago, she and her brothers and sisters used to be frequently warned by their mother not to go far away from the house when there happened to be thick mist on the ground, lest they should come across the Tylwyth Teg dancing, and be carried away to their abode beneath the lake. They were always, she says, supposed to live in the lakes, and the one here alluded to was Llyndwythwch, which is one of those famous for its Torgokayade or characters. The mother is still living. But she seems to have long since, like others, lost her belief in the fairies. After writing the above, I heard that a brother to the foregoing brothers, namely, Mr. Thomas Davies, of Moor Mar, Lanberis, remembered a similar tale. Mr. Davies is now sixty-four, and the persons from whom he heard the tale were the same Sion Daffod of Helfa IV, and Mari Domo's Shaun of Tin 18 Gadlas, Lanberis, the two women were about seventy years of age when he as a child heard it from them. At my request, a friend of mine, Mr. Hugh D. Jones, of Tin Gadlas, also a member of this family, which is one of the oldest perhaps in the place, has taken down from Mr. Davy's mouth all he could remember, 
word for word, as follows. Why en perthen I farm brawn why fed we year o dine I fank weddy kale e I fagu, n I s quidden faint c y n e u hamzer highway. Arthur I pan y n hogan f wen de I r m y n y d d y n cum dry when it a m y n y d d y fed way r ochre oral when all y widfa I fugilio, a bid I y n taro a r hogan y n y m y n y d d a c w r t h finitu gweld e u gilid ethent y n frindiomar. Arfrent jifar fad eu gilid mun li nilduol yn cum dry wenid, li ar od hier hogan ar tolu yn byw, li y bid i pob dantiathian, chwer we die a thaw a chan a die hafel, on den i fit i ar hogan yn gunid i fini a ne bahanint on hier hogan. Dived y frindiath fu kariath, a fan soniad yer hogan am idi briodi, n i ne on ar an amoth, Sef y by we i hi hefo fo hide ness y terra y ef hi a hiron. Pride with highway, a buant byw guide you gilid m nifer o flynidod, a bu in blant. A c a r d d y d d march nad y n gernerfon your od your g w r a r raid y n metal m y n d i r farch nad a r jeff merlet, fell pob farmer your amzer h w n n w. A W D I R M N Y D D I Dal Merlin Baban. A R Wailet M N Y D D Y Fed Wume L L Y N O R Y W Dara Yugain New Gone Lath O Hide A C Yugain New Deg Lath A R Hugain O Led A C Y May A R An Ochre Ido Loteg Ford Y Bid I R Cephalo Y N Redeg. Daliad Y G W R Furlan Arose E F I R Reg I W Dal Heb F F R W Y N Tra bid I E F Y N Dal Merlin Arrow A R O L Roy F F R W Y N Y N Hen E I Furlan E I Hun Taflod An Arrow I R Reg I Roy Y N Hen E I Merlin Hitho A C W R T H E I The Flu Terrawood Bit Y F F R W Y N High Y N E I Law Golengod Y Reg Y Merlin A C E T H A R E I Fen I R L L Y N A Dina Diwed Y Briodas to the farm of Braun Y fed with there belonged a son, who grew up to be a young man, the women knew and not how long before their time. He was in the habit of going up the mountain to Coombe Dry when at nineteen and MYNYDDY fed, on the west side of Snowden, to do the shepherding, and there he was wont to come across a lass on the mountain. So that as the result of frequently meeting one another, he and she became great friends. They usually met at a particular spot in Coombe Dry when it, where the girl and her family lived, and where there were all kinds of nice things to eat, of amusements, and of incomparable music, but he did not make up to anybody there except the girl. The friendship ended in courtship, but when the boy mentioned that she should be married to him, she would only do so on one condition, namely, that she would live with him until he should strike her with iron. They were wedded, and they lived together for a number of years, and had children. Once on a time it happened to be market day at Carnarvon, whither the husband and wife thought of riding on ponies, like all the farmers of that time. So they went to the mountain to catch a pony each. At the bottom of MYNYDDY fed there is a pool some sixty or one hundred yards long by twenty or thirty broad, and on one side of it there is a level space along which the horses used to run. The husband caught a pony, and gave it to the wife to hold fast without a bridle, while he should catch another. When he had bridled his own pony, he threw another bridle to his wife for her to secure hers. But as he threw it, the bit of the bridle struck her on one of her hands. The wife let go the pony, and went headlong into the pool, and that was the end of their wedded life. The following is a later tale, which Mr. Thomas Davies heard from his mother, who died in 1832, she would be ninety years of age had she been still living. Han ode hyen hogan yen yer hafad, lan baris, yer ode hogan at ei hode hyen kale ei magu yen cumblas, lan baris, a c r for it wade. Pan yen hogan a thra y b u b y w, y bid i yen kale arian gon y t y l w y t h teg yen cum cumblas. Yer ode yen dwade y bid i a r foro niliog, t y w y l l. Yamamwendi i lopina dal yn cum cumblas guided sigiat o lefrith or fuchas a thywal glan, a c y n e i rodi a r garech. a c y n mwendi eno drachafn, a c y n kale y lester y n wag, 
Dida darn duswalt mu hanner koran a c wythio f w y w r t h e i ochre. When she was a girl, living at Yerhafid, Lanbaris, there was a girl of her age being brought up at Cumblas in the same parish. The latter was in the habit of saying, when she was a girl and so long as she lived, that she used to have money from the TYLWYTH tag in the Cumblas hollow. Her account was, that on dark, misty mornings she used to go to a particular spot in that hollow with a jugful of sweet milk from the milking place, and a clean towel, and then place them on a stone. She would return, and find the jug empty, with a piece of money placed by its side, that is, two shillings or half a crown, or at times even more. A daughter of that woman lives now at a farm, Mr. Davies observes, called Plas Pennant, in the parish of Lanfahangel Yn Hennant, in Carnarvonshire, and he adds, that it was a tale of a kind that was common enough when he was a boy. But many laughed at it, though the old people believed it to be a fact. To this I may as well append another tale, which was brought to the memory of an old man who happened to be present when Mr. Jones and Mr. Davies were busy with the foregoing. His name is John Roberts, and his age is seventy-five, his present home is at Capel Shown, in the neighboring parish of Lanthanyalen. Year old EF Pan Yn Hogan Yn Gwaini Yn Tawan Truern, Yn Agosai Gerjibi, Gaida Hen WR Oren W Owen Owens. Ode year Adag Hano at E I O E D E F Y N Bresenol. Year Edent Unwaith Mun Hen Adialad A R Y Farm, a die wedded year Hen W R E I Fod E F Weddy Kale Lar O Arian Y N Y Lee H W N N W Pan Y N Hogan, a Boisai Weddy Kale Ich One Agoni by E I Dad. Year Ode Weddy Cuddio Year Arian Y N Y Tai, on Death E I Fam O Hi Didn't, a die wedded year Hanes W R T H E I Dad. Afni e i fod y n fachchin d r w g my e u ladrada year old. Di wad i e i dad y n i ido dwaid y n malu year old y n e u kale new y tenai e i grown tross e i ben a c eth allen a thorod y l n burpasol at orchwell or faf. Year old y bok gen y n grando a r year and didn't r h w n g e i dad a i fam. A C year old Y N Bender final O Guduar Peth Y N Dirjaluch Fell Year old Wedi E I Rebuddy Ogan Y T Y L W Y T H Tag Eth I R Tai A Decroad Y Lad E I Holy A C In Tau Y N Girth at Ateb Imbili I A I Dad A Diwad I E U Bod Y N Burfith Onest Ido E F A C Y Kai E F H One Egg O S Cadwear Peth Y N Dirjaluch On O S Diwad I Nat o dim ich one egg i w gale. Mod bin ag and i ran away y tad a r e i escusion na i resuma, a r y l orfu. Die wedded y bok gen my gone y t wail w y t h teg your ode y n e u kale, h one n y a r yer a moth nat ode i dwade w r t h neb. Mar ode edifert yer hen bobble m lad yer w y d d ode y n dot we. Eth y bok gen i r hen adialad lar gwaith a r o l h y n, on den i chaffed b y t h h one egg o arianino. When a lad, he was a servant at Tawan Truorn, near Holyhead, to an old man about his own age at present. They were one day in an old building on the farm, and the old man told him that he had had much money in that place when he was a lad, and that he would have had more had it not been for his father. He had hidden the money at home, where his mother found it and told his father of the affair, she feared he was a bad boy, and that it was by theft he got it. His father said that he would make him say where he got it, or else that he would strip him of the skin of his back, at the same time that he went out and cut a rod fit for effecting a purpose of the kind. The boy heard all this talk between his father and his mother, and felt determined to keep the matter a secret, as he had been warned by the TYLWYTH tag. He went into the house, and his father began to question him, while he refused to answer. He supplicatingly protested that the money was honestly got, and that he should get more if he kept it a secret, but that, if he did not, there would be no more to be got. However, the father would give no ear to his excuses or his reasons, and the rod prevailed, so that the boy said that it was from the TYLWYTH tag he used to get it, and that on condition of his not telling anybody. Greatly did the old folks regret having killed the goose that laid the eggs. 
The boy went many a time afterwards to the old building, but he never found any more money there. 4. Through the Rev. Daniel Lewis, incumbent of Betwas Garman, I was directed to Mr. Samuel Reese Williams, of the post office of that place, who has kindly given me the result of his inquiries when writing on the subject of the antiquities of the neighborhood for a competition at a literary meeting held there a few years ago. He tells me that he got the following short tale from a native of DRWSY Coed, whose name is Margaret Williams. She has been living at Betwas Garman for many years, and is now over eighty. He does not know whether the story is in print or not, but he is certain that Margaret Williams never saw it, even if it be. He further thinks he has heard it from another person, to wit a man over seventy-seven years of age, who has always lived at DRWSY Coed, in the parish of Bedgelert. Why may Haynes M. Fab I Amathura Braswili I Y N Year Istrad 20, Betus Garman 21. Pan Y N Dyquilid Adref O Daith Y N H W I R Unnaswaith, Darfod Ido Weld Cumni or T Y L W Y T H Teg Inganal E U Hafiath A U Gladist. Sifrenwood Y Lank Y N Y Fan Gond Deg Wuchang Gimaral and O R Ryanod H Y N. Fell Y Badiad Nidio I Ganel Y C Y L C H, a Chimerid E I Island Jidag E F. Wedi Idi Fod Y N Trigo Jidag E F Y N E I Gartref M Isbade, Kafid Gandhi Ada Bod Y N Reg Ido A R Amada Nildol. Un O R Amada H Y N Idod, Na Bid I Ido G Y F F W R D D Indi A G Un Math O Hyern. Bu Y N Reg Ido, a Ganwididin Dow O Blant. Un dionad year old y g w r y n y maze y n c z o dal y cephal w r t h e i weld y n failu eth y reg auto i w guy north y o a fan ode y march y n carlo mahibio galangod in tau y f f r w y n o i law or m w y n c z o e i atal hibio a p h w y a derawad on di i reg year hana de flananod y n y fan allen o i olic the story goes, that the son of a farmer, who lived at the Istrad in Betwas Garman, when returning home from a journey, late in the evening, beheld a company of fairies in the middle of their mirth and jollity. The youth was at once bewildered by the incomparable beauty of one of these ladies, so that he ventured to leap into the circle and take his idol away with him. After she had tarried a while with him at his home, he prevailed on her, on special conditions, to become his wife. One of these conditions was that he should not touch her with iron of any description. She became his wife, and two children were born to them. One day the husband was in the field trying to catch the horse. Seeing him unsuccessful, the wife went to him to help him, and, when the horse was galloping past him, he let go the bridle at him in order to prevent him from passing. But whom should he strike but his wife, who vanished out of his sight on the spot? Just as I was engaged in collecting these stories in 1881, a correspondent sent me a copy of the Istrad tale as published by the late bard and antiquary, the Rev. Owen Wynne Jones, better known in Wales by his bardic name of Glassenese 22, in the Brithen 23 for 1863, page 1931 will not attempt to translate Glassenese poetic prose with all its compound adjectives, but it comes to this in a few words. One fine sunny morning, as the young heir of Istrad was busied with his sheep on the side of Mole Ilio, he met a very pretty girl, and when he got home he told the folks there of it. A few days afterwards he met her again, and this happened several times, when he mentioned it to his father, who advised him to seize her when he next met her. The next time he met her he proceeded to do so, but before he could take her away, a little fat old man came to them and begged him to give her back to him, to which the youth would not listen. The little man uttered terrible threats, but the heir of Istrad would not yield, so an agreement was made between them, that the latter was to have the girl to wife until he touched her skin with iron. And great was the joy both of the son and his parents in consequence. They lived together for many years. But once on a time, on the evening of the bet was fair, the wife's horse became restive, and somehow, as the husband was attending to the horse, the stirrup touched the skin of her bare leg, and that very night she was taken away from him. She had three or four children, and more than one of their descendants, as Glassenes maintains, were known to him at the time he wrote in 1863. 
Glassonese regards this as the same tale which is given by Williams of Landegai, to whom we shall refer later, and he says that he heard it scores of times when he was a lad. Lastly, I happened to mention these legends last summer among others to the Reverend Owen Davies, curate of Lanberis, a man who is well versed in Welsh literature, and thoroughly in sympathy with everything Welsh. Mr. Davies told me that he knew a tale of the sort from his youth, as current in the parishes of Lanlakid and Landegai, near Bangor. Not long afterwards he visited his mother at his native place, in Lanlakid, in order to have his memory of it refreshed. And he also went to the Wayne Four, on the other side of Carnarvon, where he had the same legend told him with the different localities specified. The following is the Wayne Four version, of which I give the Welsh as I have had it from Mr. Davies, and as it was related, according to him, some forty years ago in the valley of Nant y Betus, near Carnarvon. A. R. Bridnongwe Thichwe Afar Y. D. Y. N. Hefen, Eth Lank Uint Groldur A. C. N. Turiethis, S. E. F. Edifed of Frechenegir Istrad. Ilan Afan Gwerfe, Heb Fad Y. N. Nepal O. I. Chiquiniad O. Lin Colin, A. C. A. M. Gudiad Eno Mun D. Y. R. W. S. L. W. Y. N. S. E. F. Gur Y. Fan Y. Bid I. Pablock Y. Kosho Kakian Y. T. Y. L. W. Y. T. H. Teg Y. N. R. For Doncio. Year I. Dod Y. N. Naswe Thichwe Afar Y. D. Lower Ganog. Heb un C W M W L I Gau Ligade Y Lower, A C Anian Y N Dista Dodog, Otagerth Murmuriad Ledf Y Werfe, S W N Year Allis Gaffendroad Y N Rodeo Brigo Didiog Y Coet. N I B U Y N E I M Gudfa on Droz Ikadig Amzer, C Y N Kale Deferu O Hano E I Oligon Adons Y Tolu Deadwit. W R T H Silu A R Gyren Awiti Dons, Y Chwim Droda C Y F L Y M, Yer M Jinawiriad Iskafendridiog, Terawood E I Ligade A R Los Lodes Yuink, Glysaf, Harddaf, Luniadiafa Wellid Ur E I Febit. Yer Ode E I Chwim Droda A Lednizerwit E I Hagwedian Wedi Tanio E I Search 2 A G A T I I R Fath Rada, Fel A G Yer Ode Y N Barad I Unry and Turiath Ur M W Y N E I Henel Y N Jidimath Ido E I Hun. Oi M Gudfa D Y W Y L L. Year Ode Y N Gwilio Pa Biscogiad Ur M W Y N E I Jai Flustra E I Hun. Mian Minad, Y N Decimeth Digan, R H W N G Prider A C Afn, Lamniadiat Fel Lugrol I Ganel C Y L C H Y T Y L W Y T H Teg, A C Imafilat A Dwila Carriad Y N Y Fun Luniad A Daniad E I Search, A H Y N Y, Pen Ode Y T Y L W Y T H Deadwood Y N Ganon Y Fiant E U Dons. Kofleediat high y n dinner gerdig y n e i finwis resog, a c eth a high i w gartra fi r istrat. On diflanad e i c h y d donsidian fell anadal gorfanaf, or e i croc dolfa m gad e i ridha, a i hymegnian difliho i diank o a failure h w n a i hafad. Mun anwilder mar, indigod y lank y n dinner odiethel 2 a g at y fun deg, a C year ode Y N Orowitis I W Chad Y N E I Oleg A C Y N E I Fediant. Uwid Dod D R W Y E I Dinaruch 2 A G A T I I Gale Gandhi Ada Difod Y N Forwin Ido Y N Year Istrad. A Morwin Ragarol Ode Hi. Godry Dirgwaith Y S W M Arforol O Laith Audier Bob Booch A C year ode Year Iman and Heb B W Y S Arno. Ander E I Hall Derny. Nis Gaulai Mun Un Mod Gael Gandhi Diwed E I Henworthu. Gunath Law or Kais, On Y N G W B L Ofer. Y N Dam Y Nile R Y W Duro, W R T H Uru. Breathe N A R Benwen I R Borfa. A High Y N Naswaith Lower Gan, Effa Eth I R Man Li Yer Arfari Y T Y L W Y L H Teg Fine D R W Y E U Compau In Goluniar Lower One. Y Tiro H W N Edo, Effa and Gudiad Mun D Y R S L W Y N, A Clywood Y T Y L W Y T H Teg Y N Diwooded Y Nail W R T H Y Lol Pan Edim N I Y N Y Lee H W N Y Tiro Diwed Daf, D Y G W Y D E I N Chwer Penelope Adiernam Gon Un O R Marwalian. A R H W N N Y, Dyqueled Y Lenson Adref, A I Finwees Y N Lawn O Falchter Carriot, O Herwood Ido Gad Gwybod E N W E I Hoff Forwin, 
Johannes Sinnet Wienerruf, Pan Glywad EI Meister Junk Wien EI Gull WRTHEI Hen. ACMEI Bod Wien Odiethel Blows, Aluniade, Wien Fiwia Gwythgar, Amedris AR Bob Gwaith, Abod Popeth Wien Widow Dan EI Law, Sinigiat EI Hun Idi Wien WRY Seelai Fod Wien Feisters Your Istrad, Wien Lee Bod Wien Forwin. On den I Chitsinii Hi AI Guys AR Uncyphrif, on Bod Braid Wien Bendrist O Herwid Ido Y Bod EI Hen. Fod Binag, Guidi Maith Amzer, a THRWY EI Dereneb Deflino, Sitsiniat, on Wien Amidol. Adawad Difod Wien Reg Ido, AR Yura Moth Kanlanol, SEF, Pa Bride Binag Y Terra Y EF Hi A Hiron, Yura Laya Maith Adirithu, AC na ditchwal I BYTH auto MWI. Sikrahoid yura moth o I do in tau guida ferrita would carry it. Buant yn sid FYW a u gilid yn hapus a kaisuris lawr o flinidot, a ganwit idin fab a merch, y re edin blisaf a luniidif yn yer hull freud. AC yn rinwed ei medrisurwid ai di herwid fell grade gaff, rinwed ol. Ethent yn gyfothog yon yn gyfothicac na neb yn yer hull lad. Hebla ei eta fedith ei hun yer istrad, yer od yn farmio hull ogledbarth nant y betuz, ac adi eno i ben yer widfa, wen ghyd a hull gwm bwynog, yn mhlwyf lanbaris. And, rw dyrnod, yn anfortunus digan eth y dow ir dal i dal y sefil, a chan fod y cephalin braid y n w y l l t a c n naf, y n redeg adi arnant, taf lod y g w r y f f r w y n myung gwilteneb y n e i urban, ur e i atal, a c a r b w y y disjined y f f r w y n. And a r penelope, y reg. Diflanid penelope y n y fan, a c n i welled b y t h m o honey. On RYW Naswaith, ARGWYNT YN Chwithu YN OR OR Gogold, Death Penelope at Fenestri I Istafel Wheelie, a die wedded Rithul M. Jimmerid Gofal OR Plant YN Y Girio HYN. Rag Bod Enwid ARFY Mab. YN Rod Roach Arno Gob EI Dad. Rag Bod Enuid AR LIWR Can. Rod Wuch Arni Bays EI Man. AC Ina Ciliad. A C N I C H L Y W Y D Na So Na M I W B Y T H Y N E T C H L C H. For the sake of an occasional reader who does not know Welsh, I add a summary of it in English. One fine evening in the month of June, a brave, adventurous youth, the heir of Istrad, went to the banks of the Gwerfe, not far from where it leaves Quellan Lake, and hid himself in the bushes near the spot where the folks of the red coats the fairies were wont to dance. The moon shone forth brightly without a cloud to intercept her light, all was quiet save where the Gwerfe gently murmured on her bed, and it was not long before the young man had the satisfaction of seeing the fair family dancing in full swing. As he gazed on the subtle course of the dance, his eyes rested on a damsel, the most shapely and beautiful he had seen from his boyhood. Her agile movements and the charm of her looks inflamed him with love for her, to such a degree that he felt ready for any encounter in order to secure her to be his own. From his hiding place he watched every move for his opportunity. At last, with feelings of anxiety and dread, he leaped suddenly into the middle of the circle of the fairies. There, while their enjoyment of the dance was at its height, he seized her in his arms and carried her away to his home at Istrad. But, as she screamed for help to free her from the grasp of him who had fallen in love with her, the dancing party disappeared like one's breath in July. He treated her with the utmost kindness, and was ever anxious to keep her within his sight and in his possession. By dint of tenderness he succeeded so far as to get her to consent to be his servant at Istrad. And such a servant she turned out to be. Why, she was wont to milk the cows thrice a day, and to have the usual quantity of milk each time, so that the butter was so plentiful that nobody thought of weighing it. As to her name, in spite of all his endeavors to ascertain it, she would never tell it him. Accidentally, however, one moonlight night, when driving two of his cows to the spot where they should graze, he came to the place where the fairies were wont to enjoy their games in the light of the moon. 
This time also he hid himself in a thicket, when he overheard one fairy saying to another, When we were last here our sister Penelope was stolen from us by a man. As soon as he heard this off he went home, full of joy because he had discovered the name of the maid that was so dear to him. She, on the other hand, was greatly astonished to hear him call her by her own name. As she was so charmingly pretty, so industrious, so skilled in every work, and so attended by luck in everything she put her hand to, he offered to make her his wife instead of being his servant. At first she would in no wise consent, but she rather gave way to grief at his having found her name out. However, his importunity at length brought her to consent, but on the condition that he should not strike her with iron. If that should happen, she would quit him never to return. The agreement was made on his side with the readiness of love, and after this they lived in happiness and comfort together for many years, and there were born to them a son and a daughter, who were the handsomest children in the whole country. Owing, also, to the skill and good qualities of the woman, as a shrewd and virtuous wife, they became very rich richer, indeed, than anybody else in the country around. For, besides the husband's own inheritance of Istrad, he held all the northern part of Nant y Batus, and all from there to the top of Snowdon, together with Cum Buynog in the parish of Lanberis. But one day, as bad luck would have it, they went out together to catch a horse in the field, and, as the animal was somewhat wild and untamed, they had no easy work before them. In his rashness the man threw a bridle at him as he was rushing past him, but alas! On whom should the bridle fall but on the wife? No sooner had this happened than she disappeared, and nothing more was ever seen of her. But one cold night, when there was a chilling wind blowing from the north, she came near the window of his bedroom, and told him in these words to take care of the children. Lest my son should find it cold. Place on him his father's coat. Lest the fair one find it cold. Place on her my petticoat. Then she withdrew, and nothing more was heard of her. In reply to some queries of mine, Mr. O. Davies tells me that Penelope was pronounced in three syllables, Penela, so he heard it from his grandfather. He goes on to say that the offspring of the lake lady is supposed to be represented by a family called Pellings. Which was once a highly respected name in those parts, and that there was a Lady Bulkeley who was of this descent, not to mention that several people of a lower rank, both in Anglesey and Arfon, claimed to be of the same origin. I am not very clear as to how the name got into this tale, nor have I been able to learn anything about the Pellings. But, as the word appears to have been regarded as a corrupt derivative from Penelope, that is, perhaps, all the connection, so that it may be that it has really nothing whatever to do with the legend. This is a point, however, which the antiquaries of North Wales ought to be able to clear up satisfactorily. In reply to queries of mine, Mr. O. Davies gave me the following particulars, I am now, June, 1881, over fifty-two years of age, and I can assure you that I have heard the legend forty years ago. I do not remember my father, as he died when I was young, but my grandfather was remarkable for his delight in tales and legends, and it was his favorite pastime during the winter nights, after getting his short black pipe ready. To relate stories about struggles with robbers, about bogies, and above all about the TYLWYTH tag. For they were his chief delight. He has been dead twenty-six years, and he had almost reached eighty years of age. His father before him, who was born about the year 1740, was also famous for his stories, and my grandfather often mentioned him as his authority in the course of his narration of the tales. Both he and the rest of the family used to look at Corian, to be mentioned presently, as a sacred spot. When I was a lad and happened to be reluctant to leave off playing at dusk, my mother or grandfather had only to say that, the Pellings were coming, in order to induce me to come into the house at once, indeed. This announcement had the same effect on persons of a much riper age than mine then was. Further, Mr. Davies kindly called my attention to a volume, entitled Observations on the Snowdon Mountains, by Mr. William Williams, of Landegai, published in London in 1802. In that work this tale is given somewhat less fully than by Mr. Davies informant, but the author makes the following remarks with regard to it, pp. 37, 40, a race of people inhabiting the districts about the foot of Snowdon, 
were formerly distinguished and known by the nickname of Pellings, which is not yet extinct. There are several persons and even families who are reputed to be descended from these people. These children, Penelopes, and their descendants, they say, were called Pellings, a word corrupted from their mother's name, Penelope. The late Thomas Rowlands, E.S.Q., of Caro, in Anglesey, the father of the late Lady Bulkeley, was a descendant of this lady, if it be true that the name Pellings came from her. And there are still living several opulent and respectable people who are known to have sprung from the Pellings. The best blood in my own veins is this fairy's. Lastly, it will be noticed that these last versions do not distinctly suggest that the lake lady ran into the lake, that is into Quellen. But rather that she disappeared in the same way as the dancing party by simply becoming invisible like one's breath in July. The fairies are called in Welsh, Ytylwyth Teg, or the fair family. But the people of Arfon have been so familiarized with the particular one I have called the lake lady, that, according to one of my informants, they have invented the term Y Dilwyth's Deg, or even Y Dilwythin Deg, to denote her. But it is unknown to the others, so that the extent of its use is not very considerable. This is, perhaps, the place to give another tale, according to which the man goes to the lake maiden's country, instead of her settling with him at his home. I owe it to the kindness of Mr. William Jones, of Regent Place, Langollen, a native of Bedgelert. He heard it from an old man before he left Bedgelert, but when he sent a friend to inquire some time afterwards, the old man was gone. According to Mr. Jones, the details of the tale are, for that reason, imperfect, as some of the incidents have faded from his memory. But such as he can still remember the tale, it is here given in his own words. Ryww no son lawn lower ac un o phibian llwyn on yn nant y betus yn mind i geru i glogwin y gwin. F a welled y t y l w y t h y n m ladestu a doncio e i hoc hi a r weirglod w r t h lan l l y n coelan. F a nesid tu agatint, a c o dipen i beth fe i lithuid gon baridra swine all e u canu a hender a biwiagruid e u chweru, nes mind o hano tu fun i r c y l c h, a c y n fuan fe death r h y w ha drosto, fel y kalad ad nabidieth o bobman. A chaffed e i hun mun glad hardaf a welled ariod, liar od pob y n trulio e u hamzer muna fieth a gorfold year od wedi bod eno m seth mind, a c edo n i d o dim on mejus brudwid nos. And death adgoff i w fettel m e i negs, a hiraith indo m weld e i anwilit. Feli f a offenad ganiatad i ditchwilid a dref. Your h way a rodwid wen g h y d a lu o jim dethian i w arwin tua i lad. a c y n decimeth kafid e i hun fel y n def fro o froidwid a r y dal, li gwelid y t y l w y t h teg y n chweru. Trod e i y neb tua agadref. On wedi mind e no year od popeth wedi nuid, he i rieni wedi miru, e i froder y n felu e i adnabod. A I Gariad Wedi Priodi an Errol A R O L Y Fath Gifna Widiad A F Adorad E I Gallon A C A Fu Far Mun Lai Nag Withnos A R O L E I Dequiliad. One bright moonlight night, as one of the sons of the farmer who lived at L L W Y N on in Nant Y Bet was was going to pay his addresses to a girl at Clogwin Y Gwyn. He beheld the T Y L W Y T H Teg enjoying themselves in full swing on a meadow close to Quellen Lake. He approached them and little by little he was led on by the enchanting sweetness of their music and the liveliness of their playing until he had got within their circle. Soon some kind of spell passed over him, so that he lost his knowledge of the place, and found himself in a country, the most beautiful he had ever seen, where everybody spent his time in mirth and rejoicing. He had been there seven years, and yet it seemed to him but a night's dream, but a faint recollection came to his mind of the business on which he had left home, and he felt a longing to see his beloved one. So he went and asked for permission to return home, which was granted him, together with a host of attendants to lead him to his country. And, suddenly, he found himself, as if waking from a dream, on the bank where he had seen the fair family amusing themselves. He turned towards home, but there he found everything changed, his parents were dead, his brothers could not recognize him, and his sweetheart was married to another man. 
In consequence of such changes he died broken-hearted in less than a week after coming back. V. The Reverend O. Davies regarded the Lanlacid legend as so very like the one he got about Quellen Lake and the Wayne Four, that he has not written the former out at length, but merely pointed out the following differences, one, instead of Quellen. The lake in the former is the Pool of Corian, in the parish of Landegai, near Bangor. Two, what the lake lady was struck with was not a bridle, but an iron fetter, the word used is lie feather, which probably means a long fetter connecting a forefoot and a hind foot of a horse together. In Arfon, the word is applied also to a cord tying the two forefeet together, but in Cardiganshire this would be called a hule, the other word, there pronounced loathir, being confined to the long fetter. In books, the word is written liwathir, lefathir and lifathir or lifathar, which is possibly the pronunciation in parts of North Wales, especially Arfon. This is an interesting word, as it is no other than the English term long fetter, borrowed into Welsh. As, in fact, it was also into Irish early enough to call for an article on it in Cormac's Irish Glossary, where langfighter is described as an English word for a fetter between the fore and the hind legs, in Anglomanx it is become lankater. 3. The field in which they were trying to catch the horse is, in the Lanlacid version, specified as that called Maze Maddock, at the foot of the Lathen. 4. When the fairy wife ran away, it was headlong into the pool of Corian, calling after her all her milch cows, and they followed her with the utmost readiness. Before going on to mention bits of information I have received from others about the Lanlacid legend, I think it best here to finish with the items given me by Mr. O. Davies, whom I cannot too cordially thank for his readiness to answer my questions. Among other things, he expresses himself to the following effect, it is to this day a tradition and I have heard it a hundred times that the dairy of Corian excelled all other dairies in those parts, that the milk was better and more plentiful. And that the cheese and butter were better there than in all the country round, the reason assigned being that the cattle on the farm of Corian had mixed with the breed belonging to the fairy who had run away after being struck with the iron fetter. However that may be, I remember perfectly well the high terms of praise in which the cows of Corian used to be spoken of as being remarkable for their milk and the profit they yielded. And, when I was a boy, I used to hear people talk of Taru Penwin Corian, or, the white-headed bull of Corian, as derived from the breed of cattle which had formed the fairy maiden's dowry. My next informant is Mr. Hugh Durfel Hughes, of Pendinas, Landegai 24, who has been kind enough to give me the version, of which I here give the substance in English, premising that Mr. Hughes says that he has lived about thirty-four years within a mile of the pool and farmhouse called Corian, and that he has refreshed his memory of the legend by questioning separately no less than three old people, who had been bred and born at or near that spot. He is a native of Marianeth, but has lived at Landegai for the last thirty-seven years, his age now being sixty-six. I may add that Mr. Hughes is a local antiquary of great industry and zeal, and that he published a book on the antiquities of the district, under the title of Heinefiatha Landegai a Lanlakid, that is, The Antiquities of Landegai and Lanlakid, Bethesda, 1866. But it is out of print, and I have had some trouble to procure a copy. In old times, when the fairies showed themselves much oftener to men than they do now, they made their home in the bottomless pool of Corian, in Upper Arlichwed. In that wild portion of Gwynet called Arfon. On fine mornings in the month of June these diminutive and nimble folk might be seen in a regular line vigorously engaged in mowing hay, with their cattle in herds busily grazing in the fields near Corian. This was a sight which often met the eyes of the people on the sides of the hills around, even on Sundays, but when they hurried down to them they found the fields empty, with the sham workmen and their cows gone, all gone. At other times they might be heard hammering away like miners, shoveling rubbish aside, or emptying their carts of stones. At times they took to singing all the night long, greatly to the delight of the people about, who dearly loved to hear them. And, besides singing so charmingly, they sometimes formed into companies for dancing, and their movements were marvelously graceful and attractive. But it was not safe to go too near the lake late at night, for once a brave girl, who was troubled with toothache, 
got up at midnight and went to the brink of the water in search of the root of a plant that grows there full of the power to kill all pain in the teeth. But, as she was plucking up a bit of it, there burst on her ear, from the depths of the lake, such a shriek as drove her back into the house breathless with fear and trembling. But whether this was not the doing of a stray fairy, who had been frightened out of her wits at being suddenly overtaken by a damsel in her nightdress, or the ordinary fairy way of curing the toothache, tradition does not tell. For sometimes, at any rate, the fairies busied themselves in doing good to the men and women who were their neighbors, as when they tried to teach them to keep all promises and covenants to which they pledged themselves. A certain man and his wife, to whom they wished to teach this good habit, have never been forgotten. The husband had been behaving as he ought, until one day, as he held the plow, with the wife guiding his team, he broke his covenant towards her by treating her harshly and unkindly. No sooner had he done so, than he was snatched through the air and plunged in the lake. When the wife went to the brink of the water to ask for him back, the reply she had was, that he was there, and that there he should be. The fairies when engaged in dancing allowed themselves to be gazed at, a sight which was wont greatly to attract the young men of the neighborhood. And once on a time the son and heir of the owner of Corian fell deeply in love with one of the graceful maidens who danced in the fairy ring, for she was wondrously beautiful and pretty beyond compare. His passion for her ere long resulted in courtship, and soon in their being married, which took place on the express understanding, that firstly the husband was not to know her name, though he might give her any name he chose. And, secondly, that he might now and then beat her with a rod, if she chanced to misbehave towards him, but he was not to strike her with iron on pain of her leaving him at once. This covenant was kept for some years, so that they lived happily together and had four children, of whom the two youngest were a boy and a girl. But one day as they went to one of the fields of Bryn Twrw in the direction of Pennard Gran, to catch a pony, the fairy wife, being so much nimbler than her husband, ran before him and had her hand in the pony's mane in no time. She called out to her husband to throw her a halter, but instead of that he threw towards her a bridle with an iron bit, which, as bad luck would have it, struck her. The wife at once flew through the air, and plunged headlong into Corian Pool. The husband returned sighing and weeping towards Bryn Twrw, Noise Hill, and when he had reached it, the Twrw, Noise, there was greater than had ever been heard before, namely that of weeping after, Beline. And it was then, after he had struck her with iron, that he first learnt what his wife's name was. Beline never came back to her husband, but the feelings of a mother once brought her to the window of his bedroom, where she gave him the following order. OSBYDD Anwid ARFY MAB RO WCH M DANO GA BI DAD OS NWI DOG FYDD KIN 25 RO WCH M DANNY BAYS EI MAM if my son should feel it cold, let him wear his father's coat. If the fair one feel the cold, let her wear my petticoat. As years and years rolled on a grandson of Belen's fell in love with a beautiful damsel who lived at a neighboring farmhouse called Titoriate, and against the will of his father and mother they married. But they had nothing to stock their land with. So one morning what was their astonishment, when they got up, to see grazing quietly in the field six black cows and a white-headed bull, which had come up out of the lake as stock for them from old Granny Baleen. They served them well with milk and butter for many a long year, but on the day the last of the family died, the six black cows and the white-headed bull disappeared into the lake, never more to be seen. Mr. Hughes referred to no less than three other versions, as follows, one, according to one account, the husband was plowing, with the wife leading the team, when by chance he came across her and the accident happened. The wife then flew away like a wood hen, yargoed, into the lake. 2. Another says that they were in a stable trying to bridle one of the horses, when the misfortune took place through inadvertence. 3. A third specifies the field in front of the house at Corian as the place where the final accident took place, when they were busied with the cows and horses. To these I would add the following traditions, which Mr. Hughes further gives. Sometimes the inhabitants, who seem to have been on the whole on good terms with the fairies, used to heat water and leave it in a vessel on the hearth overnight for the fairies to wash their children in it. 
This they considered such a kindness that they always left behind them on the hearth a handful of their money. Some pieces are said to have been sometimes found in the fields near Corian, and that they consisted of coins which were smaller than our halfpennies, but bigger than farthings, and had a harp on one side. But the tradition is not very definite on these points. Here also I may as well refer to a similar tale which I got last year at Lanbaris from a man who is a native of the Lanlicked side of the mountain, though he now lives at Lanbaris. He is about fifty-five years of age, and remembers hearing in his youth a tale connected with a house called Hephodiar Famoth, in a very lonely situation on Lanlicked Mountain, and now represented only by some old ruined walls. It was to the effect that one night, when the man who lived there was away from home, his wife, who had a youngish baby, washed him on the hearth, left the water there, and went to bed with her little one, she woke up in the night to find that the tylwyth teg were in possession of the hearth, and busily engaged in washing their children. That is all I got of this tale of a well-known type. To return to Mr. Hugh's communications, would select from them some remarks on the topography of the teeming home of the fairies. He estimated the lake or pool of Corian to be about 120 yards long, and adds that it is nearly round. But he thinks it was formerly considerably larger, as a cutting was made some eighty or a hundred years ago to lead water from it to Penahin Castle. But even then its size would not approach that ascribed to it by popular belief, according to which it was no less than three miles long. In fact it was believed that there was once a town of Corian which was swallowed up by the lake, a sort of idea which one meets with in many parts of Wales, and some of the natives are said to be able to discern the houses under the water. This must have been near the end which is not bottomless, the latter being indicated by a spot which is said never to freeze even in hard winters. Old men remember it the resort of herons, cormorants, and the water hen, Hobie One. Near the banks there grew, besides the water lily, various kinds of rushes and sedges, which were formerly much used for making mats and other useful articles. It was also once famous for eels of a large size, but it is not supposed to have contained fish until Lord Penahan placed some there in recent years. It teemed, however, with leeches of three different kinds so recently that an old man still living describes to Mr. Hughes his simple way of catching them when he was a boy, namely, by walking bare-legged in the water, in a few minutes he landed with nine or ten leeches sticking to his legs. Some of which fetched a shilling each from the medical men of those days. Corian is now a farmhouse occupied by Mr. William Griffiths, a grandson of the late bard Gidden Paris. When Mr. Hughes called to make inquiries about the legend, he found there the foundations of several old buildings, and several pieces of old quarns about the place. He thinks that there belonged to Corian in former times, a mill and a fuller's house, which he seems to infer from the names of two neighboring houses called, Y. Phelan Hen, the Old Mill, and Pandy Tregarth, the Fulling Mill of Tregarth. Respectively. He also alludes to a Jeffale or Smithy there, in which one Reese of Robert used to work, not to mention that a great quantity of ashes, such as come from a Smithy, are found at the end of the lake furthest from the farmhouse. The spot on which Corian stands is part of the ground between the Ogwen and another stream which bears the name of Afon Sejan Arthur, or the River of Arthur's Kitchen. And most of the houses and fields about have names which have suggested various notions to the people there, such are the farms called Coed Howell, whence the belief in the neighborhood that Howell Da, King of Wales, lived here. About him Mr. Hughes has a great deal to say. Among other things, that he had boats on Corian Lake, and that he was wont to present the citizens of Bangor yearly with three hundred fat geese reared on the waters of the same. I am referred by another man to a lecture delivered in the neighborhood on these and similar things by the late bard and antiquary the Reverend Robert Ellis, Sindel, but I have never come across a copy. A field near Corian is called C.A.E. Stable, or the Field of the Stable, which contains the remains of a row of stables, as it is supposed, and of a number of mangers where Howell's horses were once fed. In a neighboring wood, called Park Y Jelly or Hopier Y Jelly, my informant goes on to say, there are to be seen the foundations of seventeen or eighteen old hut circles, and near them some think they see the site of an old church. 
About a mile to the southeast of Corian is Pendinas, which Mr. Hughes describes as an old triangular Welsh fortress, on the bank of the Ogwen. And within two stone's throws or so of Corian on the south side of it, and a little to the west of Bryn Twrw mentioned in the legend, is situated Pinard Gran, a care or fort, which he describes as being, before it was raised in his time. Forty-two yards long by thirty-two wide, and defended by a sort of rampart of earth and stone several yards wide at the base. It used to be the resort of the country people for dancing, cockfighting twenty-six, and other amusements on Sundays. Near it was a cairn, which, when it was dug into, was found to cover a kistvine, a pot, and a quern, a variety of tales attaching to it are told concerning ghosts, caves, and hidden treasures. Altogether Mr. Hughes is strongly of opinion that Corian and its immediate surroundings represent a spot which at one time had great importance. And I see no reason wholly to doubt the correctness of that conclusion, but it would be interesting to know whether Penahin used, as Mr. Hughes suggests, to be called Penahin Corian. There ought, perhaps, to be no great difficulty in ascertaining this, as some of the Penahin estate appears to have been the subject of litigation in times gone by. Before leaving Mr. Hughes notes, I must here give his too brief account of another thing connected with Corian, though, perhaps, not with the legends here in question. I allude to what he calls the Lantern Ghost, Wes Bryd Y Lantar, there used to be formerly, he says, and there is still at Corian, a good-sized sour apple tree, which during the winter half of the year used to be lit up by fire. It began slowly and grew greater until the whole seemed to be in a blaze. He was told by an old woman that she formerly knew old people who declared they had seen it. In the same way the trees in Hopier Y Jelly appeared, according to them, to be also lit up with fire. This reminds me of Mr. Fitzgerald's account of the Irish Biltiniad in the Review Celtique, 4. 194. After communicating to me the notes of which the foregoing are abstracts, Mr. Hughes kindly got me a version of the legend from Mr. David Thomas, of Pont Y. Wern, in the same neighborhood, but as it contains nothing which I have not already given from Mr. Hughes' own, I pass it by. Mr. Thomas, however, has heard that the number of the houses making up the town of Corian some six or seven centuries ago was about seventy-five, but they were exactly seventy-three according to my next informant, Mr. David Evan Davies, of Trefleece, Bethesda, better known by his bardic name of Dewey Glan Fridlas. Both these gentlemen have also heard the tradition that there was a church at Corian, where there used to be every Sunday a single service, after which the people went to a spot not far off to amuse themselves. And at night to watch the fairies dancing, or to mix with them while they danced in a ring around a glowworm. According to Dewey Glan Fridlas, the spot was the Pen Y Boric, already mentioned, which means, among other things, that they chose a rising ground. This is referred to in a modern rhyme, which runs thus. A R T W A L W Y T H Teg Y N Don Sian Siank. O G W A L C H Magian Pen Y Bonk. With the fairies nimbly dancing round. The glowworm on the rising ground. Dewey Glan Fridless has kindly gone to the trouble of giving me a brief, but complete, version of the legend as he has heard it. It will be noticed that the discovering of the fairy's name is an idle incident in this version, it is brought in too late, and no use is made of it when introduced. This is the substance of his story in English at one of the dances at Pen Y Bonk, the heir of Corian's eyes fell on one of the damsels of the fair family, and he was filled with love for her. Courtship and marriage in due time ensued, but he had to agree to two conditions, namely, that he was neither to know her name nor to strike her with iron. By and by they had children, and when the husband happened to go, during his wife's confinement, to a merrymaking at Pen Y Boric, the fairies talked together concerning his wife, and in expressing their feelings of sympathy for her. They inadvertently betrayed the mystery of her name by mentioning it within his hearing. Years rolled on, when the husband and wife went out together one day to catch a colt of theirs that had not been broken in, their object being to go to Conway Fair. Now, as she was swifter of foot than her husband, she got hold of the colt by the mane, and called out to him to throw her a halter, but instead of throwing her the one she asked for, he threw another with iron in it, which struck her. 
off she went into the lake. A grandson of this fairy many years afterwards married one of the girls of Corian. They had a large piece of land, but no means of stocking it, so that they felt rather distressed in their minds. But lo and behold! One day a white-headed bull came out of the lake, bringing with him six black cows to their land. There never were the like of those cows for milk, and great was the prosperity of their owners, as well as the envy it kindled in their neighbors' breasts. But when they both grew old and died, the bull and the cows went back into the lake. Now I add the other sayings about the TYLWITH tag, which Dewey Glan Fridlas has kindly collected for me, beginning with a blurred story about changelings. Once on a time, in the fourteenth century, the wife of a man at Corian had twins. And she complained one day to a witch, who lived close by, at TYDDYNY Barkett, that the children were not getting on, but that they were always crying day and night. Are you sure that they are your children? asked the witch, adding that it did not seem to her that they were like hers. I have my doubts also, said the mother. I wonder if somebody has exchanged children with you, said the witch. I do not know, said the mother. But why do you not seek to know, asked the other. But how am I to go about it, said the mother. The witch replied, go and do something rather strange before their eyes and watch what they will say to one another. Well, I do not know what I should do, said the mother. Well, said the other, take an eggshell, and proceed to brew beer in it in a chamber aside, and come here to tell me what the children will say about it. She went home and did as the witch had directed her, when the two children lifted their heads out of the cradle to find what she was doing to watch and to listen. Then one observed to the other, I remember seeing an oak having an acorn, to which the other replied, and I remember seeing a hen having an egg. And one of the two added, but I do not remember before seeing anybody brew beer in the shell of a hen's egg. The mother then went to the witch and told her what the twins had said one to the other. And she directed her to go to a small wooden bridge, not far off, with one of the strange children under each arm, and there to drop them from the bridge into the river beneath. The mother went back home again and did as she had been directed. When she reached home this time, she found to her astonishment that her own children had been brought back. Next comes a story about a midwife who lived at Corian. One of the fairies called to ask her to come and attend on his wife. Off she went with him, and she was astonished to be taken into a splendid palace. There she continued to go night and morning to dress the baby for some time, until one day the husband asked her to rub her eyes with a certain ointment he offered her. She did so, and found herself sitting on a tuft of rushes, and not in a palace. There was no baby, all had disappeared. Some time afterward she happened to go to the town, and whom should she there see busily buying various wares, but the fairy on whose wife she had been attending. She addressed him with the question, How are you today? Instead of answering her, he asked, How do you see me? With my eyes, was the prompt reply. Which I? he asked. This one, said the woman, pointing to it. And instantly he disappeared, never more to be seen by her. This tale, as will be seen on comparison later, is incomplete, and probably incorrect. Here is another from Mr. D. E. Davies, one day Goodo, the farmer of Corian, complained to his wife that he lacked men to mow his hay, when she replied, Why fret about it? Look yonder. There you have a field full of them at it, and stripped to their shirt sleeves, why and Louise E. U. Chryso. When he went to the spot the sham workmen of the fairy family had disappeared. This same Goodo or somebody else happened another time to be ploughing, when he heard some person he could not see, calling out to him, I have got the bins, that is the vice, of my plough broken. Bring it to me, said the driver of Goodo's team, that I may mend it. When they finished the furrow, they found the broken vice, with a barrel of beer placed near it. One of the men sat down and mended the vice. Then they made another furrow, and when they returned to the spot they found there a two-eared dish filled to the brim with bara chwrw, or, bread and beer. The word vice, I may observe, is an English term, which is applied in Carnarvonshire to a certain part of the plough, it is otherwise called bins, but neither does this seem to be a Welsh word, nor have I heard either used in South Wales. 
At times one of the fairies was in the habit, as I was told by more than one of my informants, of coming out of Llyn Corian with her spinning wheel, Trollbach, on fine summer days and betaking herself to spinning. While at that work she might be heard constantly singing or humming, in a sort of round tune, the word silly frit. So that silly frit Lisa Bella may now be heard from the mouths of the children in that neighborhood. But I have not been successful in finding out what Liza Bella's silly frit exactly means, though I am, on the whole, convinced that the words are other than of Welsh origin. The last of them, frit, is usually applied in Cardiganshire to anything worthless or insignificant, and the derivative, fritten, means one who has no go or perseverance in him, the feminine is fritten. In Carnarvonshire my wife has heard fritten and fritten applied to a small man and a small woman respectively. Mr. Hughes says that in Marianeth and parts of Powys silly frit is a term applied to a small woman or a female dwarf who happens to be proud, vain. And fond of the attentions of the other sex, benai fok new goraches falch a hunanal a fidai hof o geru. But he thinks he has heard it made use of with regard to the gypsies, and possibly also to the tylwyth tag. The Reverend O. Davies thinks the word silly frit lace bella to be very modern, and that they refer to a young woman who lived at a place in the neighborhood, called Bryn Bella or Brimbola, Bella's Hill, the point being that this Bella was ahead in her time. Of all the girls in those parts in matters of taste and fashion. This however does not seem to go far enough back, and it is possible still that in Bella, that is, in English spelling, Bella, we have merely a shortening of some such a name as Isabella or Arabella. Which were once much more popular in the principality than they are now, in fact, I do not feel sure that Lisa Bella is not bodily a corruption of Isabella. As to silly frit, one might at first have been inclined to render it by small fry, especially in the sense of the French de la friture as applied to young men and boys, and to connect it with the Welsh sill and silet, which mean small fish. But the pronunciation of silly or silly being nearly that of the English word silly, it appears, on the whole, to belong to the host of English words to be found in colloquial Welsh, though they seldom find their way into books. Students of English ought to be able to tell us whether Frit had the meaning here suggested in any part of England, and how lately, also, whether there was such a phrase as silly Frit in use. After penning this, I received the following interesting communication from Mr. William Jones, of Langollen. The term silly Frit was formerly in use at Bedgelert, and what was thereby meant was a child of the TYLWITH tag. It is still used for any creature that is smaller than ordinary. Pooh, a silly frit like that. P W R H Y W silly frit felina. Mrs. So and so has a fine child. Ha, do you call a silly frit like that a fine child? Megan hana han blenton braff. Ho, a y d y c h tree and go r h y w silly frit fell hana and braff. To return to Lisa Bella and Beline. It may be that the same person was meant by both these names but I am in no hurry to identify them, as none of my correspondence knows the latter of them except Mr. Hughes, who gives it on the authority of the bard Guden Paris. And nothing further so far as I can understand, whereas Bella will come before us in another story, as it is the same name, I presume, which Glassenes has spelled Bella in Simrufu. So I wrote in 1881, since then I have ascertained from Professor Joseph Wright, who is busily engaged on his great English dialect dictionary, that Frit 27 is the same word, in the dialects of Cheshire, Shropshire, and Pembrokeshire. As fright in literary English. And that the corresponding verb to frighten is in them fritten, while a frittenin, equals the book English frightening, means a ghost or apparition. So silly frit is simply the English silly frit, and means probably a silly sprite or silly ghost, and silly frit Lisa Bella would mean the silly ghost of a woman called Liza Bella. But the silly frit found spinning near Corian Pool will come under notice again, for that fairy belongs to the Rumpelstilchen group of tales, and the fragment of a story about her will be seen to have treated silly frit as her proper name. Which she had not intended to reach the ears of the person of whom she was trying to get the better. 
These tales are brought into connection with the present day in more ways than one, for besides the various accounts of the Bulganid or bogies of Korean frightening people when out late at night, Mr. D. E. Davies knows a man, who is still living, and who well remembers the time when the sound of working used to be heard in the pool, and the voices of children crying somewhere in its depths, but that when people rushed there to see what the matter was. All was found profoundly quiet and still. Moreover, there is a family or two, now numerously represented in the parishes of Landegai and Lanlakid, who used to be taunted with being the offspring of fairy ancestors. One of these families was nicknamed Simikiade, or Smikiade. And my informant, who is not yet quite forty, says that he heard his mother repeat scores of times that the old people used to say, that the Smikiade, who were very numerous in the neighborhood, were descended from fairies. And that they came from Llyn and Korean. At all this the Smikiade were wont to grow mightily angry. Another tradition, he says, about them was that they were a wandering family that arrived in the district from the direction of Conway, and that the father's name was a Simic, or rather that was his nickname, based on the proper name Simant. Which appears to have once been the prevalent name in Landegai. The historical order of these words would in that case have been Simant, Simic, Simikiade, Smikiade. Now Simant seems to be merely the Welsh form given to some such English name as Simon, just as Edmund or Edmund becomes in North Wales a month. The objection to the nickname seems to lie in the fact, which one of my correspondents points out to me, that Simic is understood to mean a monkey, a point on which I should like to have further information. Pug gives Simic, it is true, as having the meaning of the Latin simia. A branch of the same family is said to be called, Y. Cowperiade, or the Coopers, from an ancestor who was either by name or by trade a Cooper. Mr. Hugh's account of the Smikiade was, that they are the descendants of one Simons, who came to be a bailiff at Bodisgallon, near Degenwy, and moved from there to Coetmer in the neighborhood of Corian. Simons was obnoxious to the bards, he goes on to say, and they described the Smikiade as having arrived in the parish at the bottom of a Kaywell, a creel or basket carried on the back. When chance would have it that the Kaywell cord snapped just in that neighborhood, at a place called Pont Y. Lan. That accident is described, according to Mr. Hughes, in the following doggerel, the origin of which I do not know. E. Dori, R. N. West, E. Dwan. B. R. W. N. T. Y. Lee, A. R. Bont Y. Lan. The cord would snap, feeble yarn. At that nasty spot, Pont Y. Lan. Curiously enough, the same Kaywell story used to be said of a widely spread family in North Cardiganshire, whose surname was pronounced Mason and written Mason or Mason, as my mother was of this family, I have often heard it. The Kaywell, if I remember rightly, was said, in this instance, to have come from Scotland, to which were traced three men who settled in North Cardiganshire. One had no descendants, but the other two, Mason and Peel I think his name was Peel, but I am only sure that it was not Welsh, had so many, that the Masons, at any rate, are exceedingly numerous there. But a great many of them, owing to some extent, probably, to the Kaywell story, have been silly enough to change their name into that of Jones, some of them in my time. The three men came there probably for refuge in the course of troubles in Scotland, as a Fraser and a Francis did to Anglesey. At any rate, I have never heard it suggested that they were of aquatic origin, but, taking the Kaywell into consideration, and the popular account of the Smikiade. I should be inclined to think that the Kaywell originally referred to some such a supposed descent. I only hope that somebody will help us with another, no longer Kaywell tale, which will make up for the brevity of these illusions. We may, however, assume, I think, that there was a tendency at one time in Gwynet, if not in other parts of the Principality, to believe, or pretend to believe, that the descendants of an Englishman or Scotsman, who settled among the old inhabitants, were of fairy origin, and that their history was somehow uncanny, which was all, of course, duly resented. This helps, to some extent, to explain how names of doubtful origin have got into these tales, such as Smikiade, Capuriade, Pellings, Penelope, Laysabella, or Isabella, and the like. This association of the lake legends with intruders from without is what has, perhaps, in a great measure served to rescue such legends from utter oblivion. 
As to a church at Corian, the tradition does not seem to be an old one, and it appears founded on one of the popular etymologies of the word Corian, which treats the first syllable as cor in the sense of a choir. But the word has other meanings, including among them that of an ox stall or enclosure for cattle. Taking this as coming near the true explanation, it at once suggests itself, that Krewerian in the Mabinogi of Math of Mathenwi is the same place, for Krill or Krow also meant an enclosure for animals, including swine. In Irish the word is crow, an enclosure, a hut or hovel. The passage in the Mabinogi 28 relates to Gwydion returning with the swine he had got by dint of magic and deceit from Prittery, Prince of Dyft. And runs thus in Lady Charlotte Guest's translation, so they journeyed on to the highest town of Arlichwed, and there they made a sty, crow, for the swine, and therefore was the name of Krewirian given to that town. As to Wirion or Wirion, which we find made into Ryan in Corian according to the modern habit, it would seem to be no other word than the usual plural of W.I.R., a grandson, formerly also any descendant in the direct line. If so, the name of an ancestor must have originally followed, just as one of the places called Bet was, was once because Wirian Idden, the Bet was of Idden's descendants. But it is possible that Wirian in Crow or Sior Wirian was itself a man's name, though I have never met with it. It is right to add that the name appears in the record of Carnarvon, pp. 12, 25, 26, as Cruorian, which carries us back to the first half of the 14th century. There it occurs as the name of a township containing eight gavels, and the particulars about it might, in the hand of one familiar with the tenures of that time, perhaps give us valuable information as to what may have been its status at a still earlier date. 6. Here, for the sake of comparison with the Northwalian stories in which the fairy wife runs away from her husband in consequence of his having unintentionally touched or hit her with the iron in the bridle, the fetter, or the stirrup, as on pp. 35, 40, 46, 50, 54, 61. I wish to cite the oldest recorded version, namely from Walter Mapes' curious miscellany of anecdotes and legends entitled De Nugis Curialium Distinctions Quinqua. Mapes flourished in the latter part of the 12th century, and in Distinctio II. Two of Thomas Wright's edition, published in the year 1850, one reads the following story, which serves the purpose there of giving the origin of a certain trinio. Of whom Mapes had more to say. Aeliad non miraculum sed portentum nobis whalens is referent. Wastinum wastiniac secus stagnum brecinoc, reed brecinoc, quod in circuitu duo miliaria tenet, mansis iant et vidis per tres claras a luna nox corias feminarum in campo avini, sui. Eti secutum eum eas fuis donec in aqua stagni submergerentur, unam timen corda vice retinuis. Nerabat idiom il raptor ilius quat eas noctibus singulus post submersionum irum murmurantis audiset sub aqua et dicentis, si hoc fesiset, unam de nobis sepiset, eds e abipsis adoctum quomodo hanc adepta, read, us, sit, qua. Ed consensit et nupsit ei, ed prima verba sua haec ad virum sum, libens tibi serviam, e tota obedientia devotion usqui in diem illum prosolier volens ad clamors ultra lenum, read Luini, mi freno tua percussoris. Est autumn Luini aqua vicina stagno. Quat e factum est, post plurimi, proli susceptionum ab eo freno percussa est, et in reditu sua inventum in fugientum cum prole, in secutus est, e vix unum ax filius sui eraput, nomini triunum wagelock. The Welsh relate to us another thing, not so much a miracle as a portent, as follows. They say that Gwestin of Gwestiniag dwelt beside Brecknock Mere, which has a circumference of two miles, and that on three moonlight nights he saw in his field of oats women dancing. And that he followed them until they sank in the water of the mere. But the fourth time they say that he seized hold of one of them. Her captor further used to relate that on each of these nights he had heard the women, after plunging into the mere, murmuring beneath the water and saying, if he had done so and so, he would have caught one of us. And that he had been instructed by their own words, as to the manner in which he caught her. She both yielded and became his wife, and her first words to her husband were these, Willingly will I serve thee, 
and with wholehearted obedience, until that day when, desirous of sallying forth in the direction of the cries beyond the Lifni. Thou shalt strike me with thy bridle, the Lifni is a burn near the mere. And this came to pass, after presenting him with a numerous offspring she was struck by him with the bridle, and on his returning home, he found her running away with her offspring, and he pursued her. But it was with difficulty that he got hold even of one of his sons, and he was named Trinio. Faglog. The story, as it proceeds, mentions Trinio engaged in battle with the men of a prince who seems to have been no other than Brycon of Brachiniac, supposed to have died about the middle of the 5th century. The battle was disastrous to Trinio and his friends, and Trinio was never seen afterwards, so Walter Mapes reports the fact that people believed him to have been rescued by his mother, and that he was with her living still in the lake. Geraldus calls it Lacus Isle de Brechignac Magnus Edi Famosus, Quem Edi Clamosum Dicunt, that great and famous lake of Brechnac which they also call Clamosus, suggested by the Welsh Lynn Lefni, so called from the river Lefni. Misinterpreted as if derived from Lef, a cry. With this lake he connects the legend, that at the bidding of the rightful Prince of Wales, the birds frequenting it would at once warble and sing. This he asserts to have been proved in the case of Griffith, son of Rhys, though the Normans were at the time masters of his person and of his territory 29. After dwelling on the varying colors of the lake he adds the following statement, Ad haec idium totus et officius concertus, culturis egregis, hortis ornatus et pomerius, ab aclis quand doc conspicitor. Now and then also it is seen by the neighboring inhabitants to be covered with buildings, and adorned with excellent farming, gardens, and orchards. It is remarkable as one of the few lakes in Wales where the remains of a crannog have been discovered, and while Mapes gives it as only two miles round, it is now said to be about five. So it has sometimes thirty been regarded as a stockade island rather than as an instance of pile dwellings. In the Brython for 1863, pp. 114 -15, is to be found what purports to be a copy of a version of the legend of Llyn and Sifadden, as contained in a manuscript of Hugh Thomas's in the British Museum. It is to the effect that the people of the neighborhood have a story that all the land now covered by the lake belonged to a princess, who had an admirer to whom she would not be married unless he procured plenty of gold, she did not care how. So he one day murdered and robbed a man who had money, and the princess then accepted the murderer's suit, but she felt uneasy on account of the reports as to the murdered man's ghost haunting the place where his body had been buried. So she made her admirer go at night to interview the ghost and lay it. Whilst he waited near the grave he heard a voice inquiring whether the innocent man was not to be avenged, and another replying that it would not be avenged till the ninth generation. The princess and her lover felt safe enough and were married, they multiplied and became numerous, while their town grew to be as it were another Sodom. And the original pair lived on so astonishingly long that they saw their descendants of the ninth generation. They exulted in their prosperity, and one day held a great feast to celebrate it. And when their descendants were banqueting with them, and the gaiety and mirth were at their zenith, ancestors and descendants were one and all drowned in a mighty cataclysm which produced the present lake. Lastly may be briefly mentioned the belief still lingering in the neighborhood, to the effect that there is a town beneath the waters of the lake, and that in rough weather the bells from the church tower of that town may be heard ringing. While in calm weather the spire of the church may be distinctly seen. My informant, writing in 1892, added the remark, This story seems hardly creditable to us, but many of the old people believe it. I ought to have mentioned that the 15th century poet Louis Glyn Cothite connects with Sifadden 31 Lake and a Fank legend, but this will be easier to understand in the light of the more complete one from the banks of the River Conwy. So the reader will find Glyn Cothai's words given in the next chapter. Chapter 2 The Fairy's Revenge In th old days of the King Art Hour Of which that Britain speak in great honor. Al was this land fulfilled of Fairi. The elf queen, with her jolly company. Daunced full oft in many a green mead. This was the old opinion, as I read. I speak of many hundred years ago. Chaucer. I. The best living authority I have found on the folklore of Bedgler, DRWSY Coed, and the surrounding district, is Mr. William Jones, of Langollen. 
He has written a good deal on the subject in the Britain, and in essays intended for competition at various literary meetings in Wales. I had the loan from him of one such essay, and I have referred to the Britain, and I have also had from Mr. Jones a number of letters, most of which contain some additional information. In harmony, moreover, with my usual practice, I have asked Mr. Jones to give me a little of his own history. This he has been kind enough to do. And, as I have so far followed no particular order in these jottings, I shall now give the reader the substance of his letters in English, as I am anxious that no item should be lost or left inaccessible to English students of folklore. What is unintelligible to me may not be so to those who have made a serious study of the subject. Mr. Jones' words are in substance to the following effect. I was bred and born in the parish of Bedgler, one of the most rustic neighborhoods and least subject to change in the whole country. Some of the old Welsh customs remained within my memory, in spite of the adverse influence of the Calvinistic Reformation, as it is termed, and I have myself witnessed several knitting nights and nuptial feasts, Nithiro, which, be it noticed, are not to be confounded with weddings, as they were feasts which followed the weddings, at the interval of a week. At these gatherings song and story formed an element of prime importance in the entertainment at a time when the Reformation alluded to had already blown the blast of extinction on the Merry Knights, Naswilio Lawn, and Saints Fates 3-2, Gwilio Mabsent, before the days of my youth. Though many of my aged acquaintances remembered them well, and retained a vivid recollection of scores of the amusing tales which used to be related for the best at the last-mentioned long-night meetings. I have heard not a few of them reproduced by men of that generation. As an example of the old-fashioned habits of the people of Bedgelert in my early days, I may mention the way in which wives and children used to be named. The custom was that the wife never took her husband's family name, but retained the one she had as a spinster. Thus my grandmother on my mother's side was called Ellen Hughes, daughter to Hugh Williams, of Guastad Annas. The name of her husband, my grandfather, was William Pritchard, equals W, a Brizziard, or Richard's son, son to Richard William, of the Afail Nuid. The name of their eldest son, my uncle, brother to my mother, was Hugh Hughes, and the second son's name was Richard William. The mother had the privilege of naming her firstborn after her own family in case it was a boy. But if it happened to be a girl, she took her name from the father's family, for which reason my mother's maiden name was Catherine Williams. This remained her name to the day of her death, and the old people at Bedgler persisted in calling me, so long as I was at home, William Pritchard, after my grandfather, as I was my mother's eldest child. Most of the tales I have collected, says Mr. Jones, relate to the parishes of Bedgelert and Dalwoodland. My kindred have lived for generations in those two parishes, and they are very numerous, in fact, it used to be said that the people of Dalwoodland and Bedgelert were all cousins. They were mostly small farmers, and jealous of all strangers, so that they married almost without exception from the one parish into the other. This intermixture helped to carry the tales of the one parish to the other, and to perpetuate them on the hearths of their homes from generation to generation, until they were swept away by another influence in this century. Many of my ancestors seem to have been very fond of stories, poetry, and singing, and I have been told that some of them were very skilled in these things. So also, in the case of my parents, the memory of the past had a great charm for them on both sides. And when the relatives from Dalwoodland and Bedgelert met in either parish, there used to be no end to the recounting of pedigrees and the repeating of tales for the best. By listening to them, I had been filled with desire to become an adept in pedigrees and legends. My parents used to let me go every evening to the house of my grandfather, William Abrisiart, the clerk, to listen to tales, and to hear edifying books read. My grandfather was a reader, without his rival, and he used to beat the parson hollow. Many people used to meet at Pen White Bond in the evenings to converse together, and the stories of some of them were now and then exceedingly eloquent. Of course, I listened with eager ears and open mouth, in order, if I heard anything new, to be able to repeat it to my mother. She, unwilling to let herself be beaten, would probably relate another like it, which she had heard from her mother, her grandmother, or her old aunt of Guastad Annas, who was a fairly good verse-right of the homely kind. Then my father, 
if he did not happen to be busy with his music book, would also give us a tale which he had heard from his grandmother or grandfather, the old John Jones, of Tin Land Dawidlin, or somebody else would do so. That is one source from which I got my knowledge of folklore, but this ceased when we moved from Bedgler to Carnarvon in the year 1841. My grandfather died in 1844, aged 78. Besides those, Mr. Jones goes on to say, who used to come to my grandfather's house and to his workshop to relate stories, the blacksmith's shop used to be, especially on a rainy day, a capital place for a story. And many a time did I lurk there instead of going to school, in order to hear old William Daffod, the sawyer, who, peace be to his ashes, drank many a hornful from the big court without ever breaking down, and old Iphan Owen, the fisherman, tearing away for the best at their yarns, sometimes a tissue of lies and sometimes truth. The former was funny, and a great wag, up to all kinds of tricks. He made everybody laugh, whereas the latter would preserve the gravity of a saint, however lying might be the tale which he related. Han Owen's best stories were about the water spirit, or, as he called it, Lamhagen y d w r, the water leaper. He had not himself seen the Lamhagen, but his father had seen it hundreds of times. Many an evening it had prevented him from catching a single fish in Llyn Gwynan, and, when the fisherman got on this theme, his eloquence was apt to become highly polysyllabic in its adjectives. Once in particular, when he had been angling for hours towards the close of the day, without catching anything, he found that something took the fly clean off the hook each time he cast it. After moving from one spot to another on the lake, he fished opposite the Benlon one, when something gave his line a frightful pull, and, by the gallows, I gave another pull, the fisherman used to say, with all the force of my arm, out it came. And up it went off the hook, whilst I turned round to see, as it dashed so against the cliff of Benlon that it blazed like a lightning. He used to add, if that was not the Lamhagen, it must have been the very devil himself. That cliff must be two hundred yards at least from the shore. As to his father, he had seen the water spirit many times, and he had also been fishing in the Llyn glass or Finanlas, once upon a time, when he hooked a wonderful and fearful monster, it was not like a fish, but rather resembled a toad except that it had a tail and wings instead of legs. He pulled it easily enough towards the shore, but, as its head was coming out of the water, it gave a terrible shriek that was enough to split the fisherman's bones to the marrow, and, had there not been a friend standing by, he would have fallen headlong into the lake, and been possibly dragged like a sheep into the depth. For there is a tradition that if a sheep got into the Llyn glass, it could not be got out again, as something would at once drag it to the bottom. This used to be the belief of the shepherds of Kum Dailai, within my memory, and they acted on it in never letting their dogs go after the sheep in the neighborhood of this lake. These two funny fellows, William Daffod and Ethan Owen, died long ago, without leaving any of their descendants blessed with as much as the faintest gossamer thread of the storyteller's mantle. The former, if he had been still living, would now be no less than 129 years of age, and the latter about 120. Mr. Jones proceeds to say that he had stories from sources besides those mentioned, namely, from Lori Robart, wife of Riziard Edward, the old guide, from his old aunt of Guastad Annas, from William Wumfra, husband to his grandmother's sister. From his grandmother, who was a native of Dalwidalan, but had been brought up at Poolgwarnog, in Nanmore, from her sister. And from Griffith Priziard, of Nanmore, afterwards of Glan Colwyn who gave him the legend of Owen Logok of which I shall have something to say later, and the story of the bogey of Pen Pwll Cock, which I do not know. But the chief storyteller of his time at Bedgelert, Mr. Jones goes on to say, was T.W.M. Ifan Siams, pronounced Siams or Shams, brother, I believe, to Daffod Shown Siams, of the Penerhin, who was a bard and pedigree man. T.W.M. lived at Nanmore, but I know not what his vocation was, his relatives, however, were small farmers, carpenters, and masons. It is not improbable that he was also an artisan, as he was conversant with numbers, magnitude, and letters, and left behind him a volume forming a pedigree book known at Nanmore as the Barked Mar, or Great Kite, as Griffith Priziard told me. 
The latter had been reading it many a time in order to know the origin of somebody or other. All I can remember of this character is that he was very old over ninety, and that he went from house to house in his old age to relate tales and recount pedigrees, great was the welcome he had from everybody everywhere. I remember, also, that he was small of stature, nimble, witty, exceedingly amusing, and always ready with his say on every subject. He was in the habit of calling on my grandfather in his rambles, and very cordial was the reception which my parents always gave him on account of his tales and his knowledge of pedigrees. The story of the Afank, as given in my collection, is from his mouth. You will observe how little difference there is between his version 33 and that known to Edward Llwyd in the year 1695. I had related this story to a friend of mine at Portmadoc, who was grandson or great-grandson to Daffod Shown Siams, of Penarhin, in 1858, when he called my attention to the same story in the Cambrian Journal from the correspondence of Edward Llwyd. I was surprised at the similarity between the two versions, and I went to Bedgler to Griffith Rizziart, who was related to T.W.M. Shown Siams. I read the story to him, and I found that he had heard it related by his uncle just as it was by me, and as given in the Cambrian Journal. T.W.M. Ifen Siams had funny stories about the tricks of Gratch Y. Ribbon, the Bodak 34 Glass, and the Blotch LLWID, which he localized in Nanmore and Lanfrothen. He had, also, a very eloquent tale about the courtship between a sailor from Mole Y. Jest, near Portmadoc, and a mermaid, of which I retain a fairly good recollection. I believe T. W. M. died in the year 1835-6, aged about 95. So far, I have merely translated Mr. Jones' account of himself and his authorities as given me in the letter I have already referred to, dated in June of last year, 1881. I would now add the substance of his general remarks about the fairies, as he had heard them described, and as he expressed himself in his essay for the competition on folklore at the Carnarvon Estevbot of 1880, The Traditions, he says. Respecting the TYLWYTH tag vary according to the situation of the districts with which they are connected, and many more such traditions continue to be remembered among the inhabitants of the mountains than by those of the more level country. In some places the TYLWYTH tag are described as a small folk of a thieving nature, living in summer among the fern bushes in the mountains, and in winter in the heather and gorse. These were wont to frequent the fairs and to steal money from the farmers' pockets, where they placed in its stead their own fairy money, which looked like the coin of the realm. But when it was paid for anything bought it would vanish in the pockets of the seller. In other districts the fairies were described as a little bigger and stronger folk but these latter were also of a thieving disposition. They would lurk around people's houses, looking for an opportunity to steal butter and cheese from the dairies, and they skulked about the cowyards, in order to milk the cows and the goats. Which they did so thoroughly that many a morning there was not a drop of milk to be had. The principal mischief, however, which those used to do, was to carry away unbaptized infants, and place in their stead their own wretched and peevish offspring. They were said to live in hidden caves in the mountains, and he had heard one old man asserting his firm belief that it was beneath Mole Ilio, also called Mole Ilion, a mountain lying between Lanberis and Quellen. The TYLWYTH tag of Nant Y. Bet was lived, whom he had seen many a time when he was a lad. And, if any one came across the mouth of their cave, he thought that he would find there a wonderful amount of wealth, for they were thieves without their like. There is still another species of TYLWYTH tag, very unlike the foregoing ones in their nature and habits. Not only was this last kind far more beautiful and comely than the others, but they were honest and good towards mortals. Their whole nature was replete with joy and fun, nor were they ever beheld hardly, except engaged in some merrymaking or other. They might be seen on bright moonlight nights at it, singing and caroling playfully on the fair meadows and the green slopes, at other times dancing lightly on the tops of the rushes in the valleys. They were also wont to be seen hunting in full force on the backs of their grey horses, for this kind were rich, and kept horses and servants. Though it used to be said that they were spiritual and immortal beings, still they ate and drank like human beings, they married and had children. They were also remarkable for their cleanliness, and they were wont to reward neat maidservants and hospitable wives. 
So housewives used to exhort their maids to clean their houses thoroughly every night before going to bed, saying that if the TYLWYTH tag happened to enter, they would be sure to leave money for them somewhere. But they were to tell no one in case they found any, lest the TYLWYTH should be offended and come no more. The mistresses also used to order a tinful of water to be placed at the foot of the stairs, a clean cloth on the table, with bread and its accompaniments, bara ac enlin, placed on it, so that, if the TYLWYTH came in to eat, the maids should have their recompense on the hob as well as unstinted praise for keeping the house clean, or, as Mr. Jones has it in a couplet from Gorenwi Owen C Y W Y D D Y Singerfint. KLEU rent A R Y pen ten. A F F W Y R glod O by four glan. Finding the fairies pay on the hob. With full credit for a clean floor. Thus, whether the fairies came or not to pay a visit to them during their sleep, the house would be clean by the morning, and the table ready set for breakfast. It appears that the places most frequently resorted to by this species were rushy combs surrounded by smooth hills with round tops, also the banks of rivers and the borders of lakes, but they were seldom seen at any time near rocks or cliffs. So more tales about them are found in districts of the former description than anywhere else, and among them may be mentioned Penmachno, Dalwadalan, the sides of Mol Sayabad, Landagai Mountain, and from there to Lanberis, to Nantal Lakes. To Mol Trifan 35 and Nant Y Batwus, the upper portion of the parish of Bejler from DRWS Y Coed to the Pennant, and the district beginning from there and including the level part of Ifian, on toward Selenog 4. I have very little doubt that there are many traditions about them in the neighborhood of the Eiffel and in Lane, I know but little, however, about these last. This kind of fairies was said to live underground, and the way to their country lay under hollow banks that overhung the deepest parts of the lakes, or the deepest pools in the rivers, so that mortals could not follow them further than the water. Should they try to go after them? They used to come out in broad daylight, two or three together, and now and then a shepherd, so the saying went, used to talk and chat with them. Sometimes, moreover, he fell over head and ears in love with their damsels, but they did not readily allow a mortal to touch them. The time they were to be seen in their greatest glee was at night when the moon was full, when they celebrated a merry night, Noswaith Lewin. At midnight to the minute, they might be seen rising out of the ground in every coombe and valley. Then, joining hands, they would form into circles, and begin to sing and dance with might and main until the cock crew, when they would vanish. Many used to go to look at them on those nights, but it was dangerous to go too near them, lest they should lure the spectator into their circle. For if that happened, they would throw a charm over him, which would make him invisible to his companions, and he would be detained by the fairies as long as he lived. At times some people went too near to them, and got snatched in. And at other times a love-inspired youth, fascinated by the charms of one of their damsels, rushed in foolhardily to try to seize one of them, and became instantly surrounded and concealed from sight. If he could be got out before the cock crew he would be no worse, but once the fairies disappeared without his having been released, he would never more be seen in the land of the living. The way to get the captured man out was to take a long stick of mountain ash, pren cryophol, which two or more strong men had to hold with one of its ends in the middle of the circle. So that when the man came round in his turn in the dance he might take hold of it, for he is there bodily though not visible, so that he cannot go past without coming across the stick. Then the others pull him out, for the fairies, no more than any other spirit, dare touch the mountain ash. We now proceed to give some of Mr. Jones' legends, the first is one which he published in the fourth volume of the Brithen, p. 70, whence the following free translation is made of it. In the northwest corner of the parish of Bejler there is a place which used to be called by the old inhabitants the land of the fairies. And it reaches from Coom Hafid Ruffid along the slope of the mountain of Drws Y Coed as far as Llyn Y Diwarchen. The old people of former times used to find much pleasure and amusement in this district in listening every moonlight night to the charming music of the fair family, and in looking at their dancing and their mirthful sports. Once on a time, a long while ago, there lived at Upper Drws Y Coed a youth, who was joyous and active, brave and determined of heart. 
this young man amused himself every night by looking on and listening to them. One night they had come to a field near the house, near the shore of Llyny Diwarchen, to pass a merry night. He went, as usual, to look at them, when his glances at once fell on one of the ladies, who possessed such beauty as he had never seen in a human being. Her appearance was like that of alabaster. Her voice was as agreeable as the nightingales, and as unruffled as the zephyr in a flower garden at the noon of a long summer's day, and her gait was pretty and aristocratic. Her feet moved in the dance as lightly on the grass as the rays of the sun had a few hours before on the lake hard by. He fell in love with her over head and ears, and in the strength of that passion for what is stronger than love. He rushed, when the bustle was at its height, into the midst of the fair crowd, and snatched the graceful damsel in his arms, and ran instantly with her to the house. When the fair family saw the violence used by a mortal, they broke up the dance and ran after her towards the house, but, when they arrived, the door had been bolted with iron, wherefore they could not get near her or touch her in any way. And the damsel had been placed securely in a chamber. The youth, having her now under his roof, as is the saying, endeavoured, with all his talent, to win her affection and to induce her to wed. But at first she would on no account hear of it. On seeing his persistence, however, and on finding that he would not let her go to return to her people, she consented to be his servant if he could find out her name, but she would not be married to him. As he thought that was not impossible, he half agreed to the condition, but, after bothering his head with all the names known in that neighborhood, he found himself no nearer his point, though he was not willing to give up the search hurriedly. One night, as he was going home from Carnarvon Market, he saw a number of the fair folks in a turbury not far from his path. They seemed to him to be engaged in an important deliberation, and it struck him that they were planning how to recover their abducted sister. He thought, moreover, that if he could secretly get within hearing, he might possibly find her name out. On looking carefully around, he saw that a ditch ran through the turbary and passed near the spot where they stood. So he made his way round to the ditch, and crept, on all fours, along it until he was within hearing of the family. After listening a little, he found that their deliberation was as to the fate of the lady he had carried away, and he heard one of them crying, piteously, O Penelope, O Penelope, my sister, why didst thou run away with a mortal? Penelope, said the young man to himself, that must be the name of my beloved, that is enough. At once he began to creep back quietly, and he returned home safely without having been seen by the fairies. When he got into the house, he called out to the girl, saying, Penelope, my beloved one, come here, and she came forward and asked, in astonishment, O mortal, who has betrayed my name to thee? Then, lifting up her tiny folded hands, she exclaimed, Alas, my fate, my fate! But she grew contented with her fate, and took to her work in earnest. Everything in the house and on the farm prospered under her charge. There was no better or cleanlier housewife in the neighborhood around, or one that was more provident than she. The young man, however, was not satisfied that she should be a servant to him, and, after he had long and persistently sought it, she consented to be married, on the one condition, that, if ever he should touch her with iron, she would be free to leave him and return to her family. He agreed to that condition, since he believed that such a thing would never happen at his hands. So they were married, and lived several years happily and comfortably together. Two children were born to them, a boy and a girl, the picture of their mother and the idols of their father. But one morning, when the husband wanted to go to the fair at Carnarvon, he went out to catch a filly that was grazing in the field by the house, but for the life of him he could not catch her, and he called to his wife to come to assist him. She came without delay, and they managed to drive the filly to a secure corner, as they thought, but, as the man approached to catch her, she rushed past him. In his excitement, he threw the bridle after her. But, who should be running in the direction of it, but his wife? The iron bit struck her on the cheek, and she vanished out of sight on the spot. Her husband never saw her any more. But one cold frosty night, a long time after this event, he was awakened from his sleep by somebody rubbing the glass of his window, and, after he had given a response, he recognized the gentle and tender voice of his wife saying to him, 
lest my son should find it cold. Place on him his father's coat. Lest the fair one find it cold. Place on her my petticoat. It is said that the descendants of this family still continue in these neighborhoods, and that they are easy to be recognized by their light and fair complexion. A similar story is related of the son of the farmer of Brake Y. Dinas, in Lanfihangel Y. Pennant, and it used to be said that most of the inhabitants of that neighborhood were formerly of a light complexion. I have often heard old people saying, that it was only necessary, within their memory, to point out in the fair at Penmorpha anyone as being of the breed of the TYLWYTH, to cause plenty of fighting that day at least. The reader may compare with this tale the following, for which I have to thank Mr. Samuel Rees Williams, whose words I give, followed by a translation. Year O G W R U N K O Jimido Geith D R W S Y Coed Y N Dyquilid Adref O Bedgelard A R Noswaith Lower Gan Luat. Pan A R Jifer L L Y N Y Gator Gwilai Nifer O R Bonetich Sa A L Wer Y T Y L W Y T H Teg Y N Mine T R W Y E U Chweruan Nosol. S W N W Y D Y Lank Y N Y Fan Gon Bridforth Y Ryanod H Y N A C Y N Neil Dual Un O Onant. Kalad Y Liwadreth Arno E I Hunan I R Fath Rada Fel Y Penderfinod Nidio I R C Y L C H A D W I N Y N Isbail Ido Year Han Ode Wedi Mind A I Gallon More L L W I R. Siflanod E I Friat A Die God Y Fondages Jai Dag E F Adref. Bu Y N Ray Gido, A Ganwood Plant Ident. Y N Dam Y Nile, Tra Y N Siflani R H Y W Orchwil. Digwadad ido e i thero a hyon a c a r m ranchiad di flanad e i n willid o i oleg a c n i s gwelid hy mwayak. On darfad idi difad at fenestri e i istafel wili an naswaith a r o l h y n a i anag i fad y n dirian w r t h y plant a i bod hy y n aros jirla y ty y n l l y n y diwarchim. Y may Y trado diad hefid Y N E I N hisbisu darfad I R G W R H W N simud I F Y W O D D R W S Y coed I istrad betus garmen. A young man, from the neighborhood of D R W S Y coed, was returning home one bright moonlight night, from Bedgelert. Where he came opposite the lake called L L Y N Y Gator, he saw a number of the ladies known as the T Y L W Y T H tag going through their nightly frolics. The youth was charmed at once by the beauty of these ladies, and especially by one of them. He so far lost his control over himself, that he resolved to leap into the circle and carry away as his spoil the one who had so completely robbed him of his heart. He accomplished his intention, and carried the lady home with him. She became his wife, and children were born to them. Accidentally, while at some work or other, it happened to him to strike her with iron, and, in the twinkling of an eye, his beloved one disappeared from his sight. He saw her no more, except that she came to his bedroom window one night afterwards, and told him to be tender to the children, and that she was staying, near the house, in the lake called Llyny Diwarchen. The tradition also informs us that this man moved from Drwsy Coed to live at Istrad near Betwsgarman. The name Llyny Diwarchen, I may add, means the lake of the sod or turf, it is the one with the floating island, described thus by Geraldus, 2. 9, p. 135, alter enim insulum habit erraticum, 6 venturum impolentium ad appositas plurunc lacus partis erabundum. Hic armenta pacentia non nunquam pastoris ad longinqua subito, partis translate amaranter. For one of the two lakes holds a wandering island, which strays mostly with the force of the winds impelling it to the opposite parts of the lake. Sometimes cattle grazing on it are, to the surprise of the shepherds, suddenly carried across to the more distant parts. Sheep are known to get on the floating islet, and it is still believed to float them away from the shore. Mr. S. Rhys Williams, it will be noticed, has given the substance of the legend rather than the story itself. I now proceed to translate the same tale as given in Welsh in Simru Fu, pages 474-7 of the edition published by Messrs. Hughes and Son, Wrexham, in a very different dress it is from Glasseny's pen, and, as might be expected, decked out with all the literary adornments in which he delighted. 
The language he used was his own, but there is no reason to think that he invented any of the incidents. The farmer of DRWSY Coed's son was one misty day engaged as a shepherd on the side of the mountain, a little below Coombe Marchnat, and as he crossed a rushy flat, he saw a wonderfully handsome little woman standing under a clump of rushes. Her yellow and curly hair hung down in ringed locks, and her eyes were as blue as the clear sky, while her forehead was as white as the wavy face of a snowdrift that has nestled on the side of Snowden only a single night. Her two plump cheeks were each like a red rose, and her pretty-lipped mouth might make an angel eager to kiss her. The youth approached her, filled with love for her, and, with delicacy and affection, asked her if he might converse with her. She smiled kindly, and reaching out her hand, said to him, Idol of my hopes, thou hast come at last. They began to associate secretly, and to meet one another daily here and there on the moors around the banks of Llyny Gator. At last, their love had waxed so strong that the young man could not be at peace either day or night, as he was always thinking of Bella or humming to himself a verse of poetry about her charms. The yellow-haired youth was now and then lost for a long while, and nobody could divine his history. His acquaintances believed that he had been fascinated, at last the secret was found out. There were about Llyny Dywarch and Shady in concealing copses, it was there he was wont to go, and the she-elf would always be there awaiting him, and it was therefore that the place where they used to meet got to be called Llyny Forwin. The Maiden's Grove after fondly loving for a long time, it was resolved to wed, but it was needful to get the leave of the damsel's father. One moonlight night it was agreed to meet in the wood, and the appointment was duly kept by the young man, but there was no sign of the subterranean folks coming, until the moon disappeared behind the garn. Then the two arrived, and the old man at once proceeded to say to the suitor, Thou shalt have my daughter on the condition that thou do not strike her with iron. If thou ever touch her with iron, she will no longer be thine, but shall return to her own. The man consented readily, and great was his joy. They were betrothed, and seldom was a handsomer pair seen at the altar. It was rumored that a vast sum of money as dowry had arrived with the pretty lady at DRWSY Coed on the evening of her nuptials. Soon after, the mountain shepherd of Coombe Marchnad passed for a very rich and influential man. In the course of time they had children, and no happier people ever lived together than their parents. Everything went on regularly and prosperously for a number of years, they became exceedingly wealthy, but the sweet is not to be had without the bitter. One day they both went out on horseback, and they happened to go near Llyny Gator, when the wife's horse got into a bog and sank to his belly. After the husband had got Bella off his back, he succeeded with much trouble in getting the horse out, and then he let him go. Then he lifted her on the back of his own, but, unfortunately, in trying quickly to place her foot in the stirrup, the iron part of the same slipped, and struck her or, rather, it touched her at the knee joint. Before they had made good half their way home, several of the diminutive TYLWYTH began to appear to them, and the sound of sweet singing was heard on the side of the hill. Before the husband reached DRWSY Coed his wife had left him, and it is supposed that she fled to Llyny Forwin, and thence to the world below to Fairy. She left her dear little ones to the care of her beloved, and no more came near them. Some say, however, that she sometimes contrived to see her beloved one in the following manner. As the law of her country did not permit her to frequent the earth with an earthly being, she and her mother invented a way of avoiding the one thing and of securing the other. A great piece of sod was set to float on the surface of the lake, and on that she used to be for long hours, freely conversing in tenderness with her consort on shore, by means of that plan they managed to live together until he breathed his last. Their descendants owned DRWS Y Coed for many generations, and they intermarried and mixed with the people of the district. Moreover, many a fierce fight took place in later times at the GWIL Fabsend at Dalbanmain or at Penmorpha, because the men of Iphianid had a habit of annoying the people of Pennant by calling them Belizeans. In a note, Glassenes remarks that this tale is located in many districts without much variation, except in the names of the places, this, however, could not apply to the latter part, which suits Llyn Y Diwarchin alone. 
With this account of the fairy wife frequenting a lake island to converse with her husband on shore, compare the Irish story of the children of Lyre, who, though transformed into swans, were allowed to retain their power of reasoning and speaking. So that they used to converse from the surface of the water with their friends on the dry land, see Joyce's Old Celtic Romances, pp. x. 1-36. Now I return to another tale which was sent me by Mr. William Jones, unless I am mistaken it has not hitherto been published. So I give the Welsh together with a free translation of it. Year Ode Story M. Jab Break Y. Dinas A Adradi Y. Dilder Highbark Ellis Owen O. Jeff and Y. Musid Y. N. Led D. Big I. Chwedel Mab Year Istrad Gon Glasenes. Sef Ido Hudo Un O. Furt Y. T. Y. L. W. Y. T. H. Teg I. Lor O. Full Hebog. A I C P O I Mun I R Ti Dar W Y Orthrek. A C Wedi H N N Y F A I Persuadi at I Embryodi A G E F A R Year Untelar O A G Y Gunneth Mab Year Istrad. On Clyways Hen Fondages or E N W Mrs. Roberts, on O Furt Year Iselt, O E D Lar H Y N Na Mr. Owen, Y N E I Hadrod Y N Wahano. Year Ode Year Hen Rigen Han Y N Credu Y N Nilisrawid Y Chwedel, Obliged Year Ode Hai, Y N Kofio Re O Artulu, Waith B, Dido Neb. Derwin I E I Hido Y N D Big I H W N, Y N Year Amzer Jintond O Ran H W N N Y Pan Ode Hai Y N Furk I Fank Year Ode Lar Yan O D Y L W Y T H Teg Y N Trigo Mun R H Y W Ogafa Y N Y Full O G W M Istradlin Hide I Flain Y Pennant. Year Ode Y T W L W Y T H H W N Y N Lar Yon Hardak Na Dim A Welled Mun Un Ran Errol Or Lad. Year Edent O Ran Mate Y N F W Y O Lar Na R Ray Sifredin, Y N Lon N Pier Y D 2 H W N Ti Bob, E U Gwalt Y N Oliu Fell Lin, E U Ligate Y N Loy Lesion. Year Edent Y N Im Dangos Mun R H Y W Lo New Gilad Y N Chweru, Canu A C Im Defiru Bob Nos Dag A Goliu, a bid I S W N E U canu Y N de no Y Lancio A R merch to faint I find I W Gwield. A C O S bidden Y N digwit bod O bride Goliu highway a ingomiant a H W N the on N I A to went I unperson O L I W T Y W Y L L dod Y N agosa tint ether silient a mate O Ford Y C way a far Y W on. Y R W carrot and year old Mab break Y Dinas Y N Lankhard Haney. By we are gay see, O bride glan, goli u a circuitol. Year old h w n y n hof yon o edric a r y t w l w y t h, a bid i y n kale imgum array o onant y n a m l, on y n benef a g un o r merched ode y n raggery arnant all mun glen did a swan w y r. A c o f n y c h jai farfad sir theat y dow mun carried a u gillet. Ether N I fine I high embryodi A G E F on Adawad find I W Wasoneth a kaidanad I W Jifarfad Y N Hanten I D W Y F Y N Kofio Year E N W I G Y D Dranoeth Obliged N I D Od Wu Idi Geizio Mind Jidag E F Y N N G W Y D D Y Leal Feli Dranoeth Eth I Fino I R Fol a Kai Farfadad Y Rian E F Y N O L E I Hadawid a G Eth Jidag E F Adref, A C M Jimarad A R S W D D O Lathrake, A Buen Y D Croad Popeth Widow O Dan E I Law, Year O Year Imanim A R Cos Y N Sin Hidu Bunit. Here a Thor Y B U R Lank Y N Cizio Gandhi Brioti. Ahaya Adawad, O S Medrai E F Gale Allen E I Hen. N I Wid A Misses. Roberts D R W Y B A Y S T R Y W Y L W I D D I G A L E H W N N W on H W N N Y A F U A Death E F I R T I A N A S W A T H A G A L W A D A R T S I B I A F A N G L I W A D H I E I H E N H I A E T H I L I W I G F A O N D P A N D E T H A T I E I H U N H I A I M F A D L O N A D I B R I O D I A R Y E R A M O T H N A T O D E F I G Y F F W R D D A H I A H I R N A C N A T O D B O L T H I R N I F A D A R Y D R W S N A K L O H W A T H A H W N N Y A F U P R I D W I D H W I N D A B U A N T F Y W Y N J A S U R I S M L A R O F L I N I T O D A G A N W I D I D N T A M R I B L A N T Y D I L D A F U F E L H Y N Year Ode E F Wedi Mind Un Dyer Nod I Dori Bake O F R W I N at Doi, 
a Therawood Y cry man Y N Y bake I find a draft. Fell year OED year Nisu at Y Gadlas, Reddit Sibi I W Jifarfad, a Thaflod into Y bake B R W Y N Y N Diretus 2 A G A T I, a rag ito Difod A R E I through a Ciziat E I at all A I law, year Hana Jifferdod A R cry man. A high at the flannanot or gallag yn y fan ym geisgod y bake brwyn, ni wellwood ac ni chlywyd dim otter the mwyak. There was a story respecting the son of the farmer of break y dinas, which used to be told by the late respected Mr. Ellis Owen, of Sefn y Musid, somewhat in the same way as that about the Istrad youth, as told by Glassenes. That is to say, the young man enticed one of the damsels of the fair family to come down from Mole Hebog, and then he carried her by force into the house. And afterwards persuaded her to become his wife on the same conditions as the heir of Istrad did. But I have heard an old lady called Mrs. Roberts, who had been brought up at Iselt, and who was older than Mr. Owen, relating it differently. This old woman believed in the truth of the story, as she remembered some of the family, whatever anybody may say. She used to spin her yarn somewhat as follows, in old times but, for the matter of that. When she was a young woman there were a great many of the fair family living in certain caves in the foal from Coon Strahlen 36 down to the upper part of Pennant. This TYLWYTH was much handsomer than any seen in any other part of the country. In point of stature they were much bigger than the ordinary ones, fair of complexion beyond everybody, with hair that was as light as flax, and eyes that were of a clear blue color. They showed themselves in one spot or another, engaged in playing, singing, and jollity every light night. The sound of their singing used to draw the lads and the young women to look at them. And, should they be of clear complexion, the fairies would chat with them, but they would let no person of a dark hue come near them, they moved away from such a one. Now the young man of break y Dinas was a handsome, vigorous, and lively stripling of fair, clear, and attractive complexion. He was very fond of looking at the fair family, and had a chat with some of them often, but chiefly with one of the damsels, who surpassed all the rest in beauty and good sense. The result of frequently meeting was that they fell in love with one another, but she would not marry him. She promised, however, to go to service to him, and agreed to meet him at Pant Y. I have forgotten the rest of the name the day after, as it would not do for her to go with him while the others happened to be looking on. So he went up there. Next day to the foal, and the damsel met him according to her promise, and went with him home, where she took to the duties of a dairymaid. Soon everything began to prosper under her hand, the butter and the cheese were daily growing in quantity. Long and importunately did the youth try to get her to marry him. She promised to do so provided he could find out her name. Mrs. Roberts did not know by what maneuver he succeeded in discovering it, but it was done, and he came into the house one night and called to, Sibby, and when she heard her name she fainted away. When, however, she recovered her consciousness, she consented to marry on the condition that he was not to touch her with iron, and that there was not to be a bolt of iron on the door, or a lock either. It was agreed, and they were married. They lived together comfortably many years, and had children born to them. The end came thus, he had gone one day to cut a bundle of rushes for thatching, and planted the reaping hook in the bundle to go home. As he drew towards the haggard, Sibby ran out to meet him, and he wantonly threw the bundle of rushes towards her, when she, to prevent its hitting her, tried to stop it with her hand, which touched the reaping hook. She vanished on the spot out of sight behind the bundle of rushes, and nothing more was seen or heard of her. Mr. Ellis Owen, alluded to above, was a highly respected gentleman, well known in North Wales for his literary and antiquarian tastes. He was born in 1789 at Sefn Y Musid near Tremadoc, where he continued to live till the day of his death, which was January 27, 1868. His literary remains, preceded by a short biography, were published in 1877 by Mr. Robert Isaac Jones of Tremadoc. But it contains no fairy tale so far as I have been able to find. A tale which partially reminds one of that given by Dewey Glan Fridless respecting the Corian midwife. Referred to at page 63 above, was published by Mr. W. 
Jones in the fourth volume of the Brithen, p. 251, freely rendered into English, it runs thus. Once on a time, when a midwife from Nanhuanan had newly got to the half-headed Brithian to pursue her calling, a gentleman came to the door on a fine grey steed and bade her come with him at once. Such was the authority with which he spoke, that the poor midwife durst not refuse to go, however much it was her duty to stay where she was. So she mounted behind him, and off they went, like the flight of a swallow, through Cumulton, over the BWLCH, down Nantier Aaron, and over the gator to Coombe Halfet Ruffet, before the poor woman had time even to say oh. When they reached there, she saw before her a magnificent mansion, splendidly lit up with such lamps as she had never seen before. They entered the court, and a crowd of servants in expensive liveries came to meet them, and she was at once led through the great hall into a bedchamber, the like of which she had never seen. There the mistress of the house, to whom she had been fetched, was awaiting her. The midwife got through her duty successfully, and stayed there until the lady had completely recovered, nor had she spent any part of her life so merrily, for there not but festivity went on day and night, dancing, singing. An endless rejoicing reigned there. But merry as it was, she found that she must go, and the nobleman gave her a large purse, with the order not to open it until she had got into her own house. Then he bade one of his servants escort her the same way that she had come. When she reached home she opened the purse, and, to her great joy, it was full of money, she lived happily on those earnings to the end of her life. With this ending of the story one should contrast Dewey Glan Fridla's tale to which I have already alluded, and I may here refer to Mr. Sykes' British Goblins, pp. 86-8, for a tale differing from both Dewey's and Jones, in that the fairies are there made to appear as devils to the nurse, who had accidentally used a certain ointment which she was not to place near her own eyes. Instead of being rewarded for her services she was only too glad to be deposited anyhow and near her home. But, as the story goes on to relate, very many years afterwards, being at a fair, she saw a man stealing something from a stall, and, with one corner of her eye, beheld her old master pushing the man's elbow. Unthinkingly she said, How are you, master? How are the children? He said, How did you see me? She answered, With the corner of my left eye. From that moment she was blind of her left eye, and lived many years with only her right. Such is the end of this tale given by Mr. Sykes. But the fair family did not, Mr. William Jones goes on to say, always give mortals the means of good living, sometimes they made no little fun of them. Once on a time the DRWSY co-ed man was going home from Bedgelert Fair, rather merry than sad, along the old road over the gator, when he saw, on coming near the top of the gator, a fine, handsome house near the road, in which there was a rare merrymaking. He knew perfectly well that there was no such a building anywhere on his way, and it made him think that he had lost his way and gone astray, so he resolved to turn into the house to ask for lodgings, which were given him. At once, when he entered, he took it to be a nuptial feast, Nethier, by reason of the jollity, the singing, and the dancing. The house was full of young men, young women, and children, all merry, and exerting themselves to the utmost. The company began to disappear one by one, and he asked if he might go to bed, whereupon he was led to a splendid chamber, where there was a bed of the softest down with snow-white clothes on it. He stripped at once, went into it, and slept quietly enough till the morning. The first thing to come to his mind when he lay half asleep, half awake, was the jollity of the night before, and the fact of his sleeping in a splendid chamber in the strange house. He opened his eyes to survey his bedroom, but it was too wide, he was sleeping on the bare swamp, with a clump of rushes as his pillow, and the blue sky as his coverlet. Mr. Jones mentions that, within his memory, there were still people in his neighborhood who believed that the fairies stole unbaptized children and placed their own in their stead. He gives the following story about the farmer's wife of DYFFRY and MYMBYR. Near Capel Curig, and her infant. Year old Y Reg Han Wedi Rodi Genetigeth I Blenten Iak Ahanif Yn Nekru Y Sinhuif R Y W Half Blin A Thymuslog. A C O Herwood Fod Y T Y D D Y N Geden O Fort Otterth Lawn Na Chapel, Er Hin Mor Heinet O Lawyer. As Julius would bedidio Y Plenton Y N Year Amzer Arferol, 
SEFCYNEI FOD YN WITH NIRNOD OED. RYW DIRNOD TEG YN GANAL Y SINHUF BLIN ETH Y RAG ALAN IR MAIS GAIDA R RELI OR TOLU I GAIZIO A CHUB Y SINHUF A GATAWAD Y BABAN Y N SISKU Y N E I G R Y D O DAN OFUL I NAME, YER HAN OD HEN A METHIANTIS. A C Y N ANALUOG I FIND LAUR O GUMPAS. Serthiad year hen rigan i jisku, a thra year ode hai feli, death y t wail w y t h i fyun, a chimeracent y baban or c r y d, a dotacent un arrow y n e i lo. y n hen en a d cruod h w n a rain a chwino nest def fro y nain, a c eth at y c r y d, li y gwelid glyriac hen idol crebaclid y n imstwirian y n flin. Or w c h w, eb i hai, why may your hen dyl wyth wedi bod we may? A C Y N dio twithed Y N Y corn I all Y fam, your hon a death eno Y N diatreg. A then glywad Y creo Y N Y C R Y D, redded, auto, a cho dot Y biken I fina heb silwi arno, a high A I coflediate, A I suet A C A I socrod at E I brano, on then I D O dim Y N tissio, Par ho I nadu y n dider year od nesbron a holti e i chalon. A c n i wid a b a beth i nut i w distui. Or diut hi a edricot arno, a gwelid nad od y n d big i w meben hi, a c eth y n lows i w chalon, edricot arno drachifn, on pafwyaf year edrikai arno, hilif y n y bit od hi y n e i weld. Anfinad m e i g w r or c a e, a jurid ef i am holy and wr cipher with yn rile or mwyn kale ei jinger acarol here holy diwadot ry one with a fod person tros finet yn jifar with yn gyfrinian year espridian acf a eth auto ac archod hwnnw ito jimerid raw ai gorchidio a halen a thori lun crows yn year halen Ina ei kymrid ir istafel li yer od mab y t wail w y h a c a r o l agar y fenestr ei rodi a r y ten hide ness y losgai yer halen. A highway a nathan feli, a fan eth yer halen y n irias both fe eth yer earthel crows a maith y n anwal de gidden highway, a c a r drothwi y dr w s highway a gazant y baban arrow y n iak a dianaf. This woman had given birth to a healthy and vigorous child at the beginning of the harvest, one wretched and inclement summer. As the homestead was a considerable distance from church or chapel, and the weather so very rainy, it was neglected to baptize the child at the usual thirty-seven time, that is to say, before it was eight days old. One fine day, in the middle of this wretched harvest, the mother went to the field with the rest of the family to try to save the harvest, and left her baby sleeping in its cradle in its grandmother's charge, who was so aged and decrepit as to be unable to go much about. The old woman fell asleep, and, while she was in that state, the TYLWYTH tag came in and took away the baby, placing another in its stead. Very shortly the latter began to whine and groan, so that the grandmother awoke, she went to the cradle, where she saw a slender, wizened old man moving restlessly and peevishly about. Alas! Alas, said she, the old TYLWYTH have been here. And she at once blew in the horn to call the mother home, who came without delay. As she heard the crying in the cradle, she ran towards it, and lifted the little one without looking at him. She hugged him, put him to her breast, and sang lullaby to him, but nothing was of any avail, as he continued, without stopping, to scream enough to break her heart, and she knew not what to do to calm him. At last she looked at him, she saw that he was not like her dear little boy, and her heart was pierced with agony. She looked at him again, and the more she examined him the uglier he seemed to her. She sent for her husband home from the field, and told him to search for a skilled man somewhere or other, and, after a long search, he was told by somebody that the parson of Trosfinet was skilled in the secrets of the spirits, so he went to him. The latter bade him take a shovel and cover it with salt, and make the figure of the cross in the salt. Then to take it to the chamber where the fairy child was, and, after taking care to open the window, to place the shovel on the fire until the salt was burnt. This was done, and when the salt had got white hot, 
the peevish abortion went away, seen of no one, and they found the other baby whole and unscathed at the doorstep. Fire was also made use of in Scotland in order to detect a changeling and force him to quit, see the British Association's Report, 1896, page 650, where Mr. Gom refers to Mr. Gregor's folklore of the northeast of Scotland, pages 8 to 9. In answer to a question of mine with regard to Gossamer, which is called in North Wales a Dave Guan, Guan Yarn, Mr. Jones told me in a letter, dated April, 1881, that it used to be called Rafor Tylwyth Teg, that is to say, the ropes of the fair family, which were associated with the diminutive, mischievous, and wanton kind of fairies who dwelt in marshy and rushy places, or among the fern and the heather. It used to be said that, if a man should lie down and fall asleep in any such a spot, the fairies would come and bind him with their ropes so that he could not move, and that they would then cover him with a sheet made of their ropes which would make him invisible. This was illustrated by him by the following tale he had heard from his mother. Clyways F. Y. Mam Y. N. Adrod Chwedel M. Jab Y. Frid. Year H. W. N. W. R. T. H. Ditchwali de Dref O. Fair Bejlert Y. N. Ryle Adutu Pen C. A. R. Gores A. Welled Beth Afrifed or T. Y. L. W. Y. T. H. Bach Y. N. Nidio A. Francio A. R. Beno Y. Grug. F. A. Estetid I. Lor I. Edric Arnant, A. Death Hun Drosto. Imaling God I Laura Chis God Y N D R W M. A fan ode felly, I'm a so dot your hull Lou Arno or Wimicent E F more dine fell na Alice Simot. Ina highway A I cutisent E F A R tutted guan fell na ally neb E I weld O S digwadi ido la fain im help. Year ode E I dulu Y N E I disquilla dref Y N jinner Y nos hano. A C W R T H E I Weld Y N E D Y N H W I R Ethent Y N N S M with M Dano A C F with I W J F R F O D E T R N I Wheelan Dim Otterthel A C Ed Gon Bell A R Pentref Lee E U H W S P Y S W Y D E I F O D Weddy Mind To Ag Adref Y N Jinner Guide A G W R Halfed Ruffed Feli Ed To R Halfed I Edrica Odino on die wedded G W R here half at E U bod wedi M Wahanu A R bont glan Y gores pob to I fan E I hun Ina chwilawid Y N fanal bob oker I R Ford Adi Eno I R Fridheb well dim Otterthel Buid Y N chwilio year hal Ardle D R W Y Y D Y D D Dranoeth on Y N Ofer Fod bin aga dutu year on Amzer no Dranoeth death Y T W L W Y T H A C A I Ridhasent a C Y N Fuan F a defraud wedi sisku o hano D R W Y Y no se R D Y D D blainerol. A R O L ido defro N I wid A M can dear Y N Malu year ode, a kuidro Y B U hide akra Y gator A R gores for hide ness Y can odd Y celiac, per Y D year adnable Y N Malu year ode, S E F O Fun line not shorter miltier I W gartref. I have heard my mother relating a tale about the son of the farmer of the frid, who, while on his way home from Bedgelert Fair, saw, somewhere near Penn C. A. R. Gores, an endless number of the diminutive family leaping and capering on the heather tops. He sat him down to look at them, and sleep came over him, he let himself down on the ground, and slept heavily. When he was so, the whole host attacked him, and they bound him so tightly that he could not have stirred. Then they covered him with the gossamer sheet, so that nobody could see him in case he called for help. His people expected him home early that evening, and, as they found him delaying till late, they got uneasy about him. They went to meet him, but no trace of him was seen, and they went as far as the village, where they were informed that he had started home in good time with the farmer of Halford Ruffet. So they went to the Halford to see if he was there. But the farmer told them that they had parted on Glan Y. Gore's bridge to go to their respective homes. A minute search was then made on both sides of the road from there to the Frid, but without finding any trace of him. They kept searching the whole neighborhood during the whole of the next day, but in vain. However, about the same time the following night the Tylwyth came and liberated him, and he shortly woke up, after sleeping through the previous night and day. When he woke he had no idea where on earth he was. So he wandered about on the slopes of the gator and near the gore's four until the cock crew, when he found where he was, namely, less than a quarter of a mile from his home. 
The late Mr. Owen, of Seth Musid, has already been alluded to. I have not been able to get at much of the folklore with which he was familiar, but, in reply to some questions of mine, Mr. Robert Isaac Jones of Tremadoc, his biographer, and the publisher of the Brithen, so long as it existed, has kindly ransacked his memory. He writes to me in Welsh to the following effect. I will tell you what I heard from Mr. Owen and my mother when I was a lad, about fifty-seven years ago. The former used to say that the people of Pennant in Iphionid had a nickname, to wit, that of Belsiade Y. Pennant, the Belisians of the Pennant. That, when he was a boy, if anybody called out Belsiade Y. Pennant at the Penmorpha Fair, every man jack of them would come out, and fighting always ensued. The antiquary used to explain it thus. Some two or three hundred years ago, Sir Robert of the Nant, one of Sir Richard Bulkeley's ancestors, had a son and heir who was extravagant and wild. He married a gypsy, and they had children born to them. But, as the family regarded this marriage as a disgrace to their ancient stem, it is said that the father, the next time the vagabonds came round, gave a large sum of money to the father of the girl for taking her away with him. This having been done, the rumor was spread abroad that it was one of the fairies the youth had married, and that she had gone with him to catch a pony, when he threw the bridle at the beast to prevent it passing. And the iron of the bridle touched the wife. Then that she at once disappeared, as the fairies always do so when touched with iron. However, the two children were put out to nurse, and the one of them, who was a girl, was brought up at Plas Y. Pennant, and her name was Pelisha, thirty-eight. Her descendants remain to this day in the Nant, and are called Bellis, who are believed there, to this day, to be derived from the TYLWYTH tag. Nothing offends them more than to be reminded of this. Mr. R. I. Jones goes on to relate another tale as follows. Diweeder fod lia elwer year hafid rugog mun cum anil yn ymlin ydd li y bid i y tylwyth teg yn arferol a minichu, a c y bidn y n trublio ar hen reg m fenthig rybeth nu gilad. Di wedded hitha, such os kania took dao u beth sintaf, i r peth sintaf y sifferdaf a g e f w r t h y d r w s dori, a r peth sintaf y raf f y la arno y n y ti est in hanner laugh. Year od carreg a fail, fell e i gelwer, y n y moor w r t h y d r w s a r e i ford. A C your ode Gandhi definite as war C Y N Glen and Y N R H Y F Y R O Hanner laugh. On Y N and Fotis W R T H dot A I Chal ad Mon I R Ti B U Agos Idi Asertio, Rose E I La A R Ben E I Clun I Amar de Thorod Hano, Achan Faint Y Bowen Sifferdod Y N Y Ti A I T H R W Y N Year H W N A Estenod Hanner laugh. It is said that there was a place called Hafid Rugog in a wild hollow among the mountains, where the fair family were in the habit of resorting, and that they used to trouble the old woman of Hafid for the loan of one thing and another. So she said, One day, you shall have the loan if you will grant me two first things that the first thing I touch at the door break, and that the first thing I put my hand on in the house be lengthened half a yard. There was a grip stone, Karej Afail, as it is called, in the wall near the door, which was in her way, and she had in the house a piece of flannel for a jerkin which was half a yard too short. But, unfortunately, as she came, with her creel full of turf on her back, to the house, she nearly fell down, she put her hand, in order to save herself, to her knee joint, which then broke. And, owing to the pain, when she had got into the house, she touched her nose with her hand, when her nose grew half a yard longer. Mr. Jones went on to notice how the old folks used to believe that the fairies were wont to appear in the marshes near Quellen Lake, not far from Rhyddu, to sing and dance. And that it was considered dangerous to approach them on those occasions lest one should be fascinated. As to the above-mentioned flannel and stone a folklorist asks me, why the old woman did not definitely mention them and say exactly what she wanted. The question is worth asking, I cannot answer it, but I mention it in the hope that somebody else will. 2. Early in the year 189939 I had a small group of stories communicated to me by the Reverend W. Evans Jones, Rector of Dalbanmain, 
who tells me that the neighborhood of the Garn abounds in fairy tales. The scene of one of these is located near the source of a Fon Fok Blain Ycae, a tributary of the Dwyfak. There a shepherd while looking after his flock came across a ring of rushes which he accidentally kicked, as the little people were coming out to dance. They detained him, and he married one of their number. He was told that he would live happily with them as long as he would not touch any instrument of iron. For years nothing happened to mar the peace and happiness of the family. One day, however, he unknowingly touched iron, with the consequence that both the wife and the children disappeared. This differs remarkably from stories such as have been already mentioned at pages 32, 35. But until it is countenanced by stories from other sources, I can only treat it as a blurred version of a story of the more usual type, such as the next one which Mr. Evans Jones has sent me as follows. A son of the farmer of Blaine Pennant married a fairy and they lived together happily for years, until one day he took a bridle to catch a horse, which proved to be rather an obstreperous animal. And in trying to prevent the horse passing, he threw the bridle at him, which, however, missed the animal and hit the wife so that the bit touched her, and she at once disappeared. The tradition goes, that their descendants are to this day living in the Pennant Valley, and if there is any unpleasantness between them and their neighbors they are taunted with being of the Tylwyth Teg family. These are, I presume, the people nicknamed Belsiade, to which reference has already been made. The next story is about an old woman from Garn Dalbanbane who was crossing Y. Greg Gotch, the Red Rock, when suddenly she came across a fairy sitting down with a very large number of gold coins by her. The old woman ventured to remark how wealthy she was, the fairy replied, Will Dak, lo there, and immediately disappeared. This looks as if it ought to be a part of a longer story which Mr. Evans Jones has not heard. The last bit of folklore which he has communicated is equally short, but of a rarer description, a fairy was in the habit of attending a certain family in the Pennant Valley every evening to put the children to bed. And as the fairy was poorly clad, the mistress of the house gave her a gown, which was found in the morning torn into shreds. The displeasure of the fairy at being offered the gown is paralleled by that of the Fenadiri or the Manx Brownie, described in Chapter 4. As for the kind of service here ascribed to the pennant fairy, I know nothing exactly parallel. 3. The next four stories are to be found in Simru Fu at pages 175-9, whence I have taken the liberty of translating them into English. They were contributed by Glassenes, whose name has already occurred so often in connection with these Welsh legends, that the reader ought to know more about him. But I have been disappointed in my attempt to get a short account of his life to insert here. All I can say is, that I made his acquaintance in 1865 in Anglesey, at that time he had a curacy near Holyhead, and he was in the prime of life. He impressed me as an enthusiast for Welsh antiquities, he was born and bred, I believe, in the neighborhood of Snowdon, and his death took place about ten years ago. It would be a convenience to the student of Welsh folklore to have a brief biography of Glassenes, but as yet nothing of the kind seems to have been written. 1. When the people of the Gors Gotch one evening had just gone to bed, they heard a great row and disturbance around the house. One could not comprehend at all what it was that made a noise at that time of night. Both the husband and the wife had waked up, quite unable to make out what it might be. The children also woke, but no one could utter a word, their tongues had all stuck to the roof of their mouths. The husband, however, at last managed to move, and to ask, Who is there? What do you want? Then he was answered from without by a small silvery voice, It is room we want to dress our children. The door was opened, a dozen small beings came in, and began to search for an earthen pitcher with water, there they remained for some hours, washing and titivating themselves. As the day was breaking, they went away, leaving behind them a fine present for the kindness they had received. Often afterwards did the Gors Gotch folks have the company of this family. But once there happened to be there a fine plump and pretty baby in his cradle. The fair family came, and, as the baby had not been baptized, they took the liberty of changing him for one of their own. They left behind in his stead an abominable creature that would do nothing but cry and scream every day of the week. 
The mother was nearly breaking her heart on account of the misfortune, and greatly afraid of telling anybody about it. But everybody got to see that there was something wrong at the Gore's Gotch, which was proved before long by the mother dying of longing for her child. The other children died broken-hearted after their mother, and the husband was left alone with the little elf without anyone to comfort them. But shortly after, one began to resort again to the hearth of the Gore's Gotch to dress children, and the gift, which had formerly been silver money, became henceforth pure gold. In the course of a few years the elf became the heir of a large farm in North Wales, and that is why the old people used to say, Shoe the elf with gold and he will grow, Fe dog wooden yn4 on ei betterly ag or. That is the legend of the Gore's Gotch. 2. Once when William Ellis, of the Gilwern, was fishing on the bank of Coombe Sillan Lake on a dark misty day, he had seen no living Christian from the time when he left Nantle. But as he was in a happy mood, throwing his line, he beheld over against him in a clump of rushes a large crowd of people, or things in the shape of people about a foot in stature, they were engaged in leaping and dancing. He looked on for hours, and he never heard, as he said, such music in his life before. But William went too near them, when they threw a kind of dust into his eyes, and, while he was wiping it away, the little family took the opportunity of betaking themselves somewhere out of his sight. So that he neither saw nor heard anything more of them. 3. There is a similar story respecting a place called Llyn y Finhano. There was no end of jollity there, of dancing, harping, and fiddling, with the servant man of Jelly Friedau and his two dogs in the midst of the crowd, leaping and capering as nimbly as anybody else. At it they were for three days and three nights, without stopping, and had it not been for a skilled man, who lived not far off, and came to know how things were going on, the poor fellow would, without doubt, have danced himself to death. But he was rescued that time. For, the fourth story is one, of which he says, that he heard it from his mother. But he has elaborated it in his usual fashion, and the proper names are undoubtedly his own, once on a time, a shepherd boy had gone up the mountain. That day, like many a day before and after, was exceedingly misty. Now, though he was well acquainted with the place, he lost his way, and walked backwards and forwards for many a long hour. At last he got into a low rushy spot, where he saw before him many circular rings. He at once recalled the place, and began to fear the worst. He had heard, many hundreds of times, of the bitter experiences, in those rings, of many a shepherd who had happened to chance on the dancing place or the circles of the fair family. He hastened away as fast as ever he could, lest he should be ruined like the rest, but, though he exerted himself to the point of perspiring and losing his breath, there he was, and there he continued to be, a long time. At last he was met by an old fat little man, with merry blue eyes, who asked him what he was doing. He answered that he was trying to find his way home. Oh, said he, come after me, and do not utter a word until I bid thee. This he did, following him on and on until they came to an oval stone, and the old fat little man lifted it, after tapping the middle of it three times with his walking stick. There was there a narrow path with stairs visible here and there. And a sort of whitish light, inclining to grey and blue, was to be seen radiating from the stones. Follow me fearlessly, said the fat man, no harm will be done thee. So on the poor youth went, as reluctantly as a dog to be hanged. But presently a fine, wooded, fertile country spread itself out before them, with well-arranged mansions dotting it all over, while every kind of apparent magnificence met the eye and seemed to smile in the landscape. The bright waters of the rivers meandered in twisted streams, and the hills were covered with the luxuriant verdure of their grassy growth, and the mountains with a glossy fleece of smooth pasture. By the time they had reached the stout gentleman's mansion, the young man's senses had been bewildered by the sweet cadence of the music which the birds poured forth from the groves, then there was gold dazzling his eyes and silver flashing on his sight. He saw there all kinds of musical instruments and all sorts of things for playing, but he could discern no inhabitant in the whole place. And, when he sat down to eat, the dishes on the table came to their places of themselves, and disappeared when one had done with them. This puzzled him beyond measure. Moreover, he heard people talking together around him, 
but for the life of him he could see no one but his old friend. At length the fat man said to him, Thou canst now talk as much as it may please thee. But, when he attempted to move his tongue, it would no more stir than if it had been a lump of ice, which greatly frightened him. At this point, a fine old lady, with health and benevolence beaming in her face, came to them and slightly smiled at the shepherd, the mother was followed by her three daughters, who were remarkably beautiful. They gazed with somewhat playful looks at him, and at length began to talk to him, but his tongue would not wag. Then one of the girls came to him, and, playing with his yellow and curly locks, gave him a smart kiss on his ruddy lips. This loosened the string that bound his tongue, and he began to talk freely and eloquently. There he was, under the charm of that kiss, in the bliss of happiness. And there he remained a year and a day without knowing that he had passed more than a day among them, for he had got into a country where there was no reckoning of time. But by and by he began to feel somewhat of a longing to visit his old home, and asked the stout man if he might go. Stay a little yet, said he, and thou shalt go for a while. That passed, he stayed on, but Olwen, for that was the name of the damsel that had kissed him, was very unwilling that he should depart. She looked sad every time he talked of going away. Nor was he himself without feeling a sort of a cold thrill passing through him at the thought of leaving her. On condition, however, of returning, he obtained leave to go, provided with plenty of gold and silver, of trinkets and gems. When he reached home, nobody knew who he was, it had been the belief that he had been killed by another shepherd, who found it necessary to betake himself hastily far away to America, lest he should be hanged without delay. But here is Inai on loss at home, and everybody wonders especially to see that the shepherd had got to look like a wealthy man his manners, his dress, his language, and the treasure he had with him, all conspired to give him the air of a gentleman. He went back one Thursday night, the first of the moon of that month, as suddenly as he had left the first time, and nobody knew whither. There was great joy in the country below when Inayan returned thither, and nobody was more rejoiced at it than Olwen his beloved. The two were right impatient to get married. But it was necessary to do that quietly, for the family below hated nothing more than fuss and noise, so, in a sort of a half-secret fashion, they were wedded. Inayan was very desirous to go once more among his own people, accompanied, to be sure, by his wife. After he had been long entreating the old man for leave, they set out on two white ponies, that were, in fact, more like snow than anything else in point of color. So he arrived with his consort in his old home, and it was the opinion of all that Ainyan's wife was the handsomest person they had anywhere seen. Whilst at home, a son was born to them, to whom they gave the name of Taliesin. Ainyan was now in the enjoyment of high repute, and his wife received due respect. Their wealth was immense, and soon they acquired a large estate. But it was not long till people began to inquire after the pedigree of Ainyan's wife, the country was of opinion that it was not the right thing to be without a pedigree. Inayan was questioned about it, but without giving any satisfactory answer, and one came to the conclusion that she was one of the fair family, Tylwyth Teg. Certainly, replied Inayan, there can be no doubt that she comes from a very fair family. For she has two sisters who are as fair as she, and, if you saw them together, you would admit that name to be a most fitting one. This, then, is the reason why the remarkable family in the land of enchantment and glamour, Hutta Ledrith, is called the Fair Family. The two next tales of Glassenes appear in Simru Fu, at pages 478 to 9. The first of them is to be compared with one already related, pp. 99, 100, while the other is unlike anything that I can now recall. 5. Kumlan was the principal resort of the Fair Family, and the shepherds of Hafid Land used to see them daily in the ages of faith gone by. Once, on a misty afternoon, one of them had been searching for sheep towards Nant Y. Batwus. When he had crossed BWLCH Kumlan, and was hastening laboriously down, he saw an endless number of little folks singing and dancing in a lively and light-footed fashion. While the handsomest girls he had ever seen anywhere were at it preparing a banquet. He went to them and had a share of their dainties, and it seemed to him that he had never in his life tasted anything approaching their dishes. 
When the twilight came, they spread their tents, and the man never before saw such beauty and ingenuity. They gave him a soft bed of yielding down, with sheets of the finest linen, and he went to rest as proud as if he had been a prince. But, alas! Next morning, after all the jollity and sham splendor, the poor man, when he opened his eyes, found that his bed was but a bush of bulrushes, and his pillow a clump of moss. Nevertheless, he found silver money in his shoes, and afterwards he continued for a long time to find, every week, a piece of coined money between two stones near the spot where he had slept. One day, however, he told a friend of his the secret respecting the money, and he never found any more. 6. Another of these shepherds was one day urging his dog at the sheep in Cumlin, when he heard a kind of low noise in the cleft of a rock. He turned to look, when he found there some kind of a creature weeping plenteously. He approached, and drew out a wee lass. Very shortly afterwards two middle-aged men came to him to thank him for his kindness, and, when about to part, one of them gave him a walking stick, as a souvenir of his good deed. The year after this, every sheep in his possession had two ewe lambs, and so his sheep continued to breed for some years. But he had stayed one evening in the village until it was rather late, and there hardly ever was a more tempestuous night than that, the wind howled, and the clouds shed their contents in sheets of rain. While the darkness was such that next to nothing could be seen. As he was crossing the river that comes down from Cumlin, where its flood was sweeping all before it in a terrible current, he somehow let go the walking stick from his hand. And when one went next morning up the coombe, it was found that nearly all the sheep had been swept away by the flood, and that the farmer's wealth had gone almost as it came with the walking stick. The shorter versions given by Glassenes are probably more nearly given as he heard them, than the longer ones, which may be suspected of having been a good deal spun out by him. But there is probably very little in any of them of his own invention, though the question whence he got his materials in each instance may be difficult to answer. In one this is quite clear, though he does not state it, namely the story of the sojourn of Elphod the shepherd in fairyland, as given in Simru Fu, p. 477, it is no other than a second or third-hand reproduction of that recorded by Geraldus concerning a certain Eliodorus, a twelfth-century cleric in the diocese of St. David, s. 40. But the longest tale published by Glassenes is the one about a mermaid, see Simru Fu, pages 434-44 where he got this from I have not been able to find out, but it has probably been pieced together from various sources. I feel sure that some of the materials at least were Welsh, besides the characters known to Welsh mythology as Nefid Naf Neophion, Gwyn of Nud, Gwydion of Don, Dylan, and Seridwen, who have been recklessly introduced into it. He locates it, apparently, somewhere on the coast of Carnarvonshire, the chief scene being called Ogoth Dio or David's Cave, which so far as I know is not an actual name, but one suggested by David Jones Locker as sailor's slang for the sea. In hopes that somebody will communicate to me any bits of this tale that happen to be still current on the Welsh coast, I give an abstract of it here. Once upon a time, a poor fisherman made the acquaintance of a mermaid in a cave on the sea coast. At first she screeched wildly, but, when she got a little calmer, she told him to go off out of the way of her brother, and to return betimes the day after. In getting away, he was tossed into the sea, and tossed out on the land with a rope, which had got wound about his waist, and on pulling at this he got ashore a coffer full of treasure, which he spent the night in carrying home. He was somewhat late in revisiting the cave the next day, and saw no mermaid come there to meet him according to her promise. But the following night he was roused out of his sleep by a visit from her at his home, when she told him to come in time next day. On his way thither, he learned from some fishermen that they had been laboring in vain during the night, as a great big mermaid had opened their nets in order to pick the best fish, while she let the rest escape. When he reached the cave he found the mermaid there combing her hair, she surprised him by telling him that she had come to live among the inhabitants of the land, though she was, according to her own account, a king's daughter. She was no longer stark naked, but dressed like a lady, in one hand she held a diadem of pure gold, and in the other a cap of wonderful workmanship, the former of which she placed on her head, while she handed the latter to Ifan Morgan. With the order that he should keep it. 
Then she related to him how she had noticed him when he was a ruddy boy, out fishing in his father's white boat, and heard him sing a song which made her love him, and how she had tried to repeat this song at her father's court. Where everybody wanted to get it. Many a time, she said, she had been anxiously listening if she might hear it again, but all in vain. So she had obtained permission from her family to come with her treasures and see if he would not teach it her. But she soon saw that she would not succeed without appearing in the form in which she now was. After saying that her name was Nephin, daughter of Nephid Naf Neophion, and niece to Gwyn son of Nud, and Gwydion son of Don, she calmed his feelings on the subject of the humble cottage in which he lived. Presently he asked her to be his wife, and she consented on the condition that he should always keep the cap she had given him out of her sight and teach her the song. They were married and lived happily together, and had children born them five times, a son and a daughter each time, they frequently went to the cave, and no one knew what treasures they had there. But once on a time they went out in a boat pleasuring, as was their wont, with six or seven of the children accompanying them, and when they were far from the land a great storm arose. Besides the usual accompaniments of a storm at sea, most unearthly screeches and noises were heard, which frightened the children and made their mother look uncomfortable. But presently she bent her head over the side of the boat, and whispered something they did not catch, to their surprise the sea was instantly calm. They got home comfortably, but the elder children were puzzled greatly by their mother's influence over the sea, and it was not long after this till they so teased some ill-natured old women. That the latter told them all about the uncanny origin of their mother. The eldest boy was vexed at this, and remembered how his mother had spoken to somebody near the boat at sea, and that he was never allowed to go with his parents to Ogoff Dio. He recalled, also, his mother's account of the strange countries she had seen. Once there came also to Han Morgan's home, which was now a mansion, a visitor whom the children were not even allowed to see. And one night, when the young moon had sunk behind the western horizon, Han and his wife went quietly out of the house, telling a servant that they would not return for three weeks or a month, this was overheard by the eldest son. So he followed them very quietly until he saw them on the strand, where he beheld his mother casting a sort of leather mantle round herself and his father, and both of them threw themselves into the hollow of a billow that came to fetch them. The son went home, broke his heart, and died in nine days at finding out that his mother was a mermaid, and, on seeing her brother dead, his twin sister went and threw herself into the sea. But, instead of being drowned, she was taken up on his steed by a fine-looking knight, who then galloped away over the waves as if they had been dry and level land. The servants were in doubt what to do, now that Nephid Morgan was dead and Ilanwi had thrown herself into the sea. But Tejid, the second son, who feared nothing, said that Nephid's body should be taken to the strand, as somebody was likely to come to fetch it for burial among his mother's family. At midnight a knight arrived, who said the funeral was to be at three that morning, and told them that their brother would come back to them, as Gwydion of Dawn was going to give him a heart that no weight could break. That Ilanwi was soon to be wedded to one of the finest and bravest of the knights of Gwerdon Alion, and that their parents were with Gwyn of Nud in the Gwaylodion. The body was accordingly taken to the beach, and, as soon as the wave touched it, out of his coffin leaped Nephid like a porpoise. He was seen then to walk away arm in arm with Gwydion of Dawn to a ship that was in waiting, and most enchanting music was heard by those on shore, but soon the ship sailed away, hardly touching the tops of the billows. After a year and a day had elapsed Han Morgan, the father, came home, looking much better and more gentlemanly than he had ever done before, he had never spoken of Nephin, his wife, until Tejid one day asked him what about his mother. She had gone, he said, in search of Ailanwi, who had run away from her husband in Gwerdon Alion, with Glanfride of Gloyfraint. She would be back soon, he thought, and described to them all the wonders they had seen. Ifan Morgan went to bed that night, and was found dead in it in the morning. It was thought that his death had been caused by a black knight, who had been seen haunting the place at midnight for some time, and always disappearing, when pursued, into a well that bubbled forth in a dark recess near at hand. The day of Han Morgan's funeral, Nephin, his wife, returned, and bewailed him with many tears, she was never more seen on the dry land. Tejid had now the charge of the family, 
and he conducted himself in all things as behoved a man and a gentleman of high principles and great generosity. He was very wealthy, but often grieved by the thought of his father's murder. One day, when he and two of his brothers were out in a boat fishing in the neighboring bay, they were driven by the wind to the most wonderful spot they had ever seen. The sea there was as smooth as glass, and as bright as the clearest light, while beneath it, and not far from them, they saw a most splendid country with fertile fields and dales covered with pastures, with flowery hedges. Groves clad in their green foliage, and forests gently waving their leafy luxuriance, with rivers lazily contemplating their own tortuous courses, and with mansions here and there of the most beautiful and ingenious description. And presently they saw that the inhabitants amused themselves with all kinds of merriment and frolicking, and that here and there they had music and engaged themselves in the most energetic dancing. In fact, the rippling waves seemed to have absorbed their fill of the music, so that the faint echo of it, as gently given forth by the waves, never ceased to charm their ears until they reached the shore. That night the three brothers had the same dream, namely that the black knight who had throttled their father was in hiding in a cave on the coast, so they made for the cave in the morning. But the black knight fled from them and galloped off on the waves as if he had been riding for amusement over a meadow. That day their sisters, on returning home from school, had to cross a piece of sea, when a tempest arose and sunk the vessel, drowning all on board, and the brothers ascribed this to the black knight. About this time there was great consternation among the fishermen on account of a sea serpent that twined itself about the rocks near the caves, and nothing would do but that Tejid and his brothers should go forth to kill it. But when one day they came near the spot frequented by it, they heard a deep voice saying to them, Do not kill your sister, so they wondered greatly and suddenly went home. But that night Tejid returned there alone, and called his sister by her name, and after waiting a long while she crept towards him in the shape of a sea serpent, and said that she must remain some time in that form on account of her having run away with one who was not her husband. She went on to say that she had seen their sisters walking with their mother, and their father would soon be in the cave. But all of a sudden there came the black knight, who unsheathed a sword that looked like a flame of fire, and began to cut the sea serpent into a thousand bits, which united, however, as fast as he cut it, and became as whole as before. The end was that the monster twisted itself in a coil round his throat and bit him terribly in his breast. At this point a white knight comes and runs him through with his spear, so that he fell instantly, while the white knight went off hurriedly with the sea serpent in a coil round his neck. Tejid ran away for his life, but not before a monster more terrible than anything he had ever seen had begun to attack him. It haunted him in all kinds of ways, sometimes it would be like a sea, but Tejid was able to swim, sometimes it would be a mountain of ice, but Tejid was able to climb it, and sometimes it was like a furnace of intense fire. But the heat had no effect on him. But it appeared mostly as a combination of the beast of prey and the venomous reptile. Suddenly, however, a young man appeared, taking hold of Tejid's arm and encouraging him, when the monster fled away screeching, and a host of knights in splendid array and on proudly prancing horses came to him, among them he found his brothers. And he went with them to his mother's country. He was especially welcome there, and he found all happy and present save his father only, whom he thought of fetching from the world above, having in fact got leave to do so from his grandfather. His mother and his brothers went with him to search for his father's body, and with him came Gwydion of Don and Gwyn of Nut, but he would not be wakened. So Tejid, who loved his father greatly, asked leave to remain on his father's grave, where he remains to this day. His mother is wont to come there to soothe him, and his brothers send him gifts, while he sends his gifts to Nephid Naf Neophion, his grandfather. It is also said that his twin sister, Saridwen, has long since come to live near him, to make the glad gladder and the pretty prettier, and to maintain her dignity and honor in peace and tranquility. The latter part of this tale, the mention of Saridwen, invoked by the bards as the genius presiding over their profession, and of Tejid remaining on his father's grave, is evidently a reference to Llyn Tejid, or Bala Lake. And to the legend of Taliesin in the so-called Haynes or History of Taliesin, published at the end of the third volume of Lady Charlotte Guest's Mabinogen. So the story has undoubtedly been pieced together, but not all invented, 
as is proved by the reference to the curious cap which the husband was to keep out of the sight of his mermaid wife. In Irish legends this cap has particular importance attached to it, of which Glassenes cannot have been aware, for he knew of no use to make of it. The teaching of the song to the wife is not mentioned after the marriage. And the introduction of it at all is remarkable, at any rate I have never noticed anything parallel to it in other tales. The incident of the tempest, when the mermaid spoke to somebody by the side of the boat, reminds one of Undine during the trip on the Danube. It is, perhaps, useless to go into details till one has ascertained how much of the story has been based on genuine Welsh folklore. But, while I am on this point, I venture to append here an Irish tale, which will serve to explain the meaning of the mermaid's cap, as necessary to her comfort in the water world. I am indebted for it to the kindness of Dr. Norman Moore, of St. Bartholomew's Hospital, who tells me, in a letter dated March 7, 1882, that he and the Miss Raynells of Killinan heard it from an old woman named Mrs. Dolan, who lived on the property of the late Mr. Cook of Cooksboro, in Westmeath. The following was her tale, there was a man named Mahone had a farm on the edge of Loch Owl. He noticed that his corn was trampled, and he sat up all night to watch it. He saw horses, colts and fillies rather, come up out of the lake and trample it. He chased them, and they fled into the lake. The next night he saw them again, and among them a beautiful girl with a cap of salmon skin on her head, and it shone in the moonlight. And he caught her and embraced her, and carried her off to his house and married her, and she was a very good housewife, as all those lake people are, and kept his house beautifully. And one day in the harvest, when the men were in the fields, she went into the house, and there she looked on the hurdle for some lard to make call cannon forty-one for the men, and she saw her old cap of fish skin. And she put it on her head and ran straight down into the lake and was never seen any more, and Mahone he was terribly grieved, and he died soon after of a decline. She had had three children, and I often saw them in the Mullingar market. They were farmers, too, on Loch Owl. 4. Let me now return to the freshwater fairies of Snowdon and give a reference to Pennant's tours in Wales, in the edition published at Carnarvon in 1883 we are told, too. 326, How Mr. Pennant learned that, in fairy days, those diminutive gentry kept their revels on the margins of the Snowdon Lake, called Llyn Cock. There is no legend now extant, so far as I can ascertain, about the Llyn Cock fairies. So I proceed to append a legend differing considerably from all the foregoing, I owe it to the kindness of my friend Mr. Howell Thomas, of the local government board. It was written out by Mr. G. B. Gaddy, and I take the liberty of prefixing to it his letter to Mr. Thomas, dated Wallam Grove, London, S.W., April 27, T. 1882. The letter runs as follows. I had quite forgotten the enclosed, which I had jotted down during my recent illness, and ought to have sent you long ago. Of course, the wording is very rough, as no care has been taken on that point. It is interesting, as being another version of a very pretty old legend which my mother used to repeat. She was descended from a very old North Welsh family. Indeed, I believe my esteemed grandfather went so far as to trace his descent from the great patriot, Owen Glendower himself. My mother delighted not only in the ancient folklore legends and fairy tales of the principality, with which she was perfectly familiar, but especially in the lovely national melodies, all of which she knew by heart. And, being highly accomplished, would never tire of playing or singing them. You will see the legend is, in the main, much as related by Professor Rees, though differing somewhat in the singular terms of the marriage contract. The scene of the legend, as related by my late mother, was, of course, a lake, the Welsh name of which I have, unfortunately, forgotten, but it was somewhere, I think, near Lanberis, and the hero a stalwart young farmer. The legend itself reads as follows. One hot day, the farmer, riding by the lake, took his horse into the water to drink, and, whilst looking straight down over his horse's ears into the smooth surface, he became aware of a most lovely face. Just beneath the tide, looking up archly at him. Quite bewildered, he earnestly beckoned, and by degrees the head and shoulders which belonged to the face emerged from the water. 
Overcome with emotion, and nearly maddened by the blaze of beauty so suddenly put before him, he leaped from his horse and rushed wildly into the lake to try to clasp the lovely vision to his heart. As this was a clear case of love at first sight, the poor young man was not, of course, answerable for his actions. But the vision had vanished beneath the waves, to instantly reappear, however, a yard or two off, with the most provoking of smiles, and holding out her beautiful white hands towards her admirer. But slipping off into deep water the moment he approached. For many days the young farmer frequented the lake, but without again seeing the beautiful naiad, until one day he sat down by the margin hoping that she would appear, and yet dreading her appearance. For this latter to him simply meant loss of all peace. Yet he rushed on his fate, like the lovesick shepherd in the old Italian romance, who watched the sleeping beauty, yet dreaded her awakening, io perdero la pace, quando si sfogliera. The young man had brought the remains of his frugal dinner with him, and was quietly munching, by way of dessert, an apple of rare and delicious quality, from a tree which grew upon a neighboring estate. Suddenly the lady appeared in all her rare beauty almost close to him, and begged him to throw her one of his apples. This was altogether too much, and he replied by holding out the tempting morsel, exhibiting its beautiful red and green sides, saying that, if she really wanted it, she must fetch it herself. Upon this she came up quite close, and, as she took the apple from his left hand, he dexterously seized tight hold of her with his right, and held her fast. She, however, nothing daunted, bawled lustily, at the top of her voice, for help, and made such an outrageous noise, that at length the most respectable-looking old gentleman appeared suddenly out of the midst of the lake. He had a superb white beard, and was simply and classically attired merely in a single wreath of beautiful water lilies wound round his loins, which was possibly his summer costume, the weather being hot. He politely requested to know what was the matter, and what the young farmer wanted with his daughter. The case was thereupon explained, but not without the usual amount of nervous trepidation which usually happens to lovesick swains when called into the awful presence of Papa to explain their intentions. After a long parley the lady, at length, agreed to become the young man's wife on two conditions, which he was to solemnly promise to keep. These conditions were that he was never to strike her with steel or clay, earth, conditions to which the young man very readily assented. As these were primitive days, when people were happy and honest, there were no lawyers to encumber the holy estate with lengthy settlements, and to fill their own pockets with heavy fees. Matters were therefore soon settled, and the lady married to the young farmer on the spot by the very respectable old lake deity, her papa. The story goes on to say that the union was followed by two sons and two daughters. The eldest son became a great physician, and all his descendants after him were celebrated for their great proficiency in the noble healing art. The second son was a mighty craftsman in all works appertaining to the manufacture and use of iron and metals. Indeed it has been hinted that, his little coracle of bull's hide having become old and unsafe, he conceived the brilliant idea of making one of thin iron. This he actually accomplished, and, to the intense amazement of the wandering populace, he constantly used it for fishing, or other purposes, on the lake, where he paddled about in perfect security. This important fact ought to be more generally known, as it gives him a fair claim to the introduction of iron shipbuilding, paste the shades of Beaufort and Brunel. Of the two daughters, one is said to have invented the small ten-stringed harp, and the other the spinning wheel. Thus were introduced the arts of medicine, manufactures, music, and woolen work. As the old ballad says, applying the quotation to the father and mother. They lived for more than forty year. Right long and happily. One day it happened that the wife expressed a great wish for some of those same delicious apples of which she was so fond, and of which their neighbor often sent them a supply. Off went the farmer, like a good husband that he was, and brought back, not only some apples, but a beautiful young sapling, seven or eight feet high, bearing the same apple, as a present from their friend. This they at once proceeded to set, he digging and she holding, but the hole not being quite deep enough, he again set to work, with increased energy, with his spade, and stooping very low threw out the last shovelful over his shoulder lass. Without looking full into the breast of his wife. 
She dropped the sapling and solemnly warned him that one of the two conditions of their marriage contract had been broken. Accident was pleaded, but in vain. There was the unfortunate fact he had struck her with clay. Looking upon the sapling as the cause of this great trouble he determined to return it forthwith to his kind neighbor. Taking a bridle in his hand he proceeded to the field to catch his horse, his wife kindly helping him. They both ran up, one on each side, and, as the unruly steed showed no signs of stopping, the husband attempted to throw the bridle over his head. Not having visited Mexico in his travels, and thereby learned the use of the lasso, he missed his horse's head and misfortune of misfortune struck his wife in the face with the iron bit, thus breaking the second condition. He had struck her with steel. She no sooner received the blow than like Esau she cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and bidding her husband a last farewell, fled down the hill with lightning speed, dashed into the lake. And disappeared beneath the smooth and glassy waters. Thus, it may be said that, if an apple indirectly occasioned the beginning of her married life, so an apple brought about its sad termination. Such is Mr. Gaddy's tale, and to him probably is to be traced its literary trimming. But even when it is stripped of that accessory, it leaves us with difficulties of somewhat the same order as those attaching to some of the stories which have passed through the hands of Glassenes. However, the substance of it seems to be genuine, and to prove that there has been a Northwalian tradition which traced the medical art to a lake lady like the Egeria of the physicians of Midfay. V. Allusion has already been made to the Afank story, and it is convenient to give it before proceeding any further. The Cambrian Journal for 1859 pp. 142-6, gives it in a letter of Edward LLWIDs dated 1693, and contributed to that periodical by the late canon Robert Williams, of RHYD Y. Crosa, who copied it from the original letter in his possession 42. And here follows a translation into English of the part of it which concerns LLYN Eurofank 43, a pool on the river Conley, above Betwes Y. Coed and opposite Capel Garman. I suppose it very probable that you have heard speak of LLYN Year Afank. The Afank's pool, and that I therefore need not trouble to inform you where it stands. I think, also, that you know, if one may trust what the country people say, that it was a girl that enticed the Afank to come out of his abode, namely the pool, so as to be bound with iron chains, whilst he slumbered with his head on her knees. And with the grip of one hand on her breast. When he woke from his nap and perceived what had been done to him, he got up suddenly and hurried to his old refuge, taking with him in his claw the breast of his sweetheart. It was then seen that it was well the chain was long enough to be fastened to oxen that pulled him out of the pool. Thereupon a considerable dispute arose among some of the people, each asserting that he had taken a great weight on himself and pulled far harder than anybody else. No, said another, it was I, and and whilst they were wrangling in this way, the report goes that the Afank answered them, and silenced their discontent by saying, Oni bay y die a g a dine. N i ditha r afank b y t h o r l l y n. Had it not been for the oxen pulling, the Afank had never left the pool. You must understand that some take the Afank to be a corporeal demon. But I am sufficiently satisfied that there is an animal of the same name, which is called in English a bever, seeing that the term celiara fank signifies bever stones. I know not what kind of oxen those in question were, but it is related that they were twins, nor do I know why they were called a chain manig or a chain bannock. But peradventure they were called a chain bannock in reference to their having had many a fattening, or fattening on fattening, having been for many a year fattened. Yet the word bannock is not a good, suitable word to signify fattened, as bannock is not else than what has been made exceeding thick by beating, or fulling, as one says of a thick blanket made of coarse yarn, why girth ban two bannock. The thick bannock forty-four blanket. Whilst I was dawdling behind talking about this, the oxen had proceeded very far, and I did not find their footmarks as they came through portions of the parish of Daladilan, Luddog, until I reached a pass called ever since BWLCH Ryar Icon. The pass of the slope of the oxen, between the upper parts of the Littlen and the upper part of Nanhuinen. In coming over this pass one of the oxen dropped one of its eyes on an open spot, 
which for that reason is called Guan Ligad YCH, the more of the ox as I. The place where the eye fell has become a pool, which is by this time known as PWLL Ligad YCH, the pool of the ox as I, which is at no time dry, though no water rises in it or flows into it except when rain falls. Nor is there any flowing out of it during dry weather. It is always of the same depth, that is, it reaches about one's knee joint, according to those who have paid attention to that for a considerable number of years. There is a heart melody, which not all musicians know, it is known as the Achain Manigare, and it has a piteous effect on the ear, being as plaintive as were the groanings of these Achain under the weight of the Afank. Especially when one of the pair lost an eye. They pulled him up to Lly and Kum Fin and Las, the lake of the Dingle of the Green Well, to which he was consigned, for the reason, peradventure, that some believed that there were in that lake uncanny things already in store. In fact, it was but fitting that he should be permitted to go to his kind. But whether there were uncanny things in it before or not, many think that there is nothing good in it now, as you will understand from what follows. There is much talk of Lly and Kum Fin and Las besides the fact that it is always free from ice, except in one corner where the peat water of clear pools comes into it, and that it has also a variety of dismal hues. The cause of this is, as I suppose, to be sought in the various hues of the rock surrounding it, and the fact that a whirlwind makes its water mixed, which is enough to give any lake a disagreeable color. Nothing swims on it without danger, and I am not sure that it would be very safe for a bird to fly across it or not. Throw a rag into its water and it will go to the bottom, and I have with my own ears heard a man saying that he saw a goat taking to this lake in order to avoid being caught, and that as soon as the animal went into the water. It turned round and round, as if it had been a top, until it was drowned. Some mention that, as some great man was hunting in the Snowden district, Ararai, a stag, to avoid the hounds when they were pressing on him, and as is the habit of stags to defend themselves. Made his escape into this lake, the hunters had hardly time to turn round before they saw the stag's antlers, MWNGLWS, coming to the surface, but nothing more have they ever seen. A young woman has been seen to come out of this lake to wash clothes, and when she had done she folded the clothes, and taking them under her arm went back into the lake. One man, whose brother is still alive and well, beheld in a canoe, on this same lake still, an angler with a red cap on his head, but the man died within a few days, having not been in his right mind during that time. Most people regard this as the real truth, and, as for myself, I cannot refuse to believe that such a vision might not cause a man to become so bewildered as to force on a disease ending with his death. The name Lly and Kum Fin and Las would have led one to suppose that the pool meant is the one given in the ordnance maps as Lly and Y Kum Finan, which I presume to be gibberish for Lly and Kum Y Finan. And situated in the mountains between Pen Y G W R Y D and the upper valley of Lanbaris. But from the writer on the parish of Bejlert in the Brithen for 1861, pp. 371 2, it appears that this is not so and that the tarn meant was in the upper reach of Kum Dailai, and was known as Llyn Y Finan Las, Lake of the Green Well. About which he has a good deal to say in the same strain as that of Llwyd in the letter already cited. Among other things he remarks that it is a very deep tan, and that its bottom has been ascertained to be lower than the surface of Llyn Lido, which lies 300 feet lower. And as to the Afank, he remarks that the inhabitants of Nant Conwy and the lower portions of the parish of Dalwithalan, having frequent troubles and losses inflicted on them by a huge monster in the river Conwy, near Bet was Y. Coed, tried to kill it but in vain, as no harpoon, no arrow or spear made any impression whatsoever on the brute's hide. So it was resolved to drag it away as in the LLWID story. I learned from Mr. Pierce, Ellis or Nant, of Dalwithalan, that the lake is variously known as Llyn, Kum, Fin and Las, and Llyn Glass or Glasslin, this last is the form which I find in the maps. It is to be noticed that the Nant Conwy people, by dragging the Afank there, got him beyond their own watershed, so that he could no more cause floods in the Conwy. Here, as promised at p. 74, I append Lewis Glyn Kothai's words as to the Afank in Llyn Safadin. 
The bard is dilating in the poem, where they occur, on his affection for his friend Lywellyn ab Gwilym ab Thomas Vaughan, of Bryn. Half it in the Vale of Toei, and averring that it would be as hard to induce him to quit his friend's hospitable home, as it was to get the Afank away from the Lake of Sifadin, as follows. Year of Ank or EI Oven. WIVYN Lech AR VIN Y LLYN. O Don LLYN Sifadin VO. NITHN WID BAN ETHINO. NIM TINMAN NAG ACHAIN GWAITH. ADIIMA HEDE WIMAITH 45. The Afank am I, who, sought for, bides. In hiding on the edge of the lake. Out of the waters of Sifadin Mir. Was be not drawn, once he got there. So with me, nor wain nor oxen won't to toil. Me today will draw from here forth. From this passage it would seem that the Sifadin story contemplated the Afank being taken away from the lake in a cart or wagon drawn by oxen, but whether driven by who, or by whom, one is not told. However, the story must have represented the undertaking as a failure, and the Afank as remaining in his lake, had it been otherwise it would be hard to see the point of the comparison. 6. The parish of Lanfacrith and its traditions have been the subject of some contributions to the first volume of the Taliesin published at Rithin in 1859-60, pages 132-7, by a writer who calls himself Kofiator. It was Glassenes, I believe, for the style seems to be his, he pretends to copy from an old manuscript of Hugh Biffin's both the manuscript and its owner were fictions of Glassenes as I am told. These jottings contain two or three items about the fairies which seem to be genuine. The bottom of LLYNCYNNWCH, on the Nana estate, is level with the hearthstone of the house of Dole Y. Clockett. Its depth was found out owing to the sweetheart of one of Siwi's girls having lost his way to her from Nana, where he was a servant. The poor man had fallen into the lake, and gone down and down, when he found it becoming clearer the lower he got, until at last he alighted on a level spot where everybody and everything looked much as he had observed on the dry land. When he had reached the bottom of the lake, a short fat old gentleman came to him and asked his business, when he told him how it happened that he had come. He met with great welcome, and he stayed there a month without knowing that he had been there three days, and when he was going to leave, he was led out to his beloved by the inhabitants of the lake bottom. He asserted that the whole way was level except in one place, where they descended about a fathom into the ground, but, he added, it was necessary to ascend about as much to reach the hearthstone of Dole Y. Clockett. The most wonderful thing, however, was that the stone lifted itself as he came up from the subterranean road towards it. It was thus the sweetheart arrived there one evening, when the girl was by the fire weeping for him. Silly had been out some days before, and she knew all about it though she said nothing to anybody. This, then, was the way in which the depth of LLYNCYNNWCH came to be known. Then he has a few sentences about an old house called Seamark. Seamark was an old mansion of considerable repute, and in old times it was considered next to Nana in point of importance in the whole district. There was a deep ditch round it, which was always kept full of water, with the view of keeping off vagabonds and thieves, as well as other lawless folks, that they might not take the inmates by surprise. But, in distant ages, this place was very noted for the frequent visits paid it by the fair family. They used to come to the ditch to wash themselves, and to cross the water in boats made of the bark of the rowan, tree 46, or else birch, and they came into the house to pay their rent for trampling the ground around the place. They always placed a piece of money under a pitcher, and the result was that the family living there became remarkably rich. But somehow, after the lapse of many years, the owner of the place offended them, by showing disrespect for their diminutive family, soon the world began to go against him, and it was not long before he got low in life. Everything turned against him, and in times past everybody believed that he incurred all this because he had earned the displeasure of the fair family. In the Brithen for the year 1862, p. 456, in the course of an essay on the history of the Lordship of Maudwy in Marianeth, considered the best in a competition at an estethvod held at Dinas Maudwy, August 2, 1855. Glassenes gives the following bit about the fairies of that neighborhood. The side of Aaron Fodwy is a great place for the fair family, 
they are ever at it playing their games on the hillsides about this spot. It is said that they are numberless likewise about BWLCHY grows. Once a boy crossed over near the approach of night, one summer eve, from the Gadfa to Maudwi, and on his return he saw near Abba Rilek a swarm of the little family dancing away full pelt. The boy began to run, with two of the maidens in pursuit of him, entreating him to stay, but Robin, for that was his name, kept running, and the two elves failed altogether to catch him, otherwise he would have been taken a prisoner of love. There are plenty of their dancing rings to be seen on the hillsides between Abba Rilek and BWLCHY Groves. Here I would introduce two other Marionetshire tales, which I have received from Mr. E. S. Roberts, master of the Landisilio School, near Langdalen. He has learnt them from one Abel Evans, who lives at present in the parish of Landisilio, he is a native of the parish of Landrillo on the slopes of the Berwyn, and of a glen in the same, known as Coombe Pennant. So called from its being drained by the pennant on its way to join the Dee. Now Coombe Pennant was the resort of fairies, or of a certain family of them, and the occurrence, related in the following tale, must have taken place no less than seventy years ago, it was well known to the late Mrs. Ellen Edwards of Landrillo. RYW Dyernod ETH DOW JIFAIL I HELA DWFRGWNAR HIDE LANA FON PENNANT. A THRA YN CIFERIO EU CAMERA TUAGAT YERA FON GUELSANT RYW GREATER BIKEN LIVGOK YN REDAG YN GYFL YM YON AR DRAWS UN OR DALID YN GYFERIAD YERA FON. IMATHA NHW AR EIOL. GUELSANT EI FOD WETI MIND AUDITAN RAID CO DEN YN OKER YERA FON IM GUTIO. Year ode y dow d d y n y n metal may do for gi i dod, on day r year on p r y d y n methu a deal paham year im dankasai i w ligade y n livgok. Year edent y n demuno e i dow y n f y w, a c im eth year eth un o onent i farm di jirla i ofen im satch, year hana gafwit, or m w y n roy y creter indi. Year ode eno dow d w l l o tan raid y pren, a thra daily i un y satch y n agard a r un t w l l year ode y law y n thuthio fon i r t w l l errol a c y n y man eth y creter i r satch. Year ode y dow d d y n y n metal e u bod wedi dal dufrigi, year h y n a hysteriant y n orchest n i d biken. Cyquinescent gartref y n law n on c y n e u mind hide led c a e. Leferod letier y satch mun tun drist gon diwedded y mayf y mam y n gul m danif, o, mayf y mam y n gul m danif, yer h win a rod dot fra mar i r dow heller. a c y n y man taflicent y satch i lore, a mar od e u rifa dot a u d y c h r y n pen welsent d d y n bok mun gwisk gotch y n redeg or satch tuagat yer afon. Thea de Flaninod O I Gallic Y N M Y S G Y Drisni A R Fin Yerafon. Year Ode Y Dow Wedi E U Brochu Y N Derfor A C Y N Timelo May Do Thatch Ode Mind Gartref Y N Hytrak Nag Emiriath Y N Helic A R T Y L W Y T H Tag. One day, two friends went to hunt otters on the banks of the pennant, and when they were directing their steps towards the river, they beheld some small creature of a red color running fast across the meadows in the direction of the river. Off they ran after it, and saw that it went beneath the roots of a tree on the brink of the river to hide itself. The two men thought it was an otter, but, at the same time, they could not understand why it seemed to them to be of a red color. They wished to take it alive, and off one of them went to a farmhouse that was not far away to ask for a sack, which he got, to put the creature into it. Now there were two holes under the roots of the tree, and while one held the sack with its mouth open over one of them, the other pushed his stick into the other hole, and presently the creature went into the sack. The two men thought they had caught an otter, which they looked upon as no small feat. They set out for home, but before they had proceeded the width of one field, the inmate of the sack spoke to them in a sad voice, and said, My mother is calling for me, oh, my mother is calling for me. This gave the two hunters a great fright, so that they at once threw down the sack, and great was their surprise to see a little man in a red dress running out of the sack towards the river. He disappeared from their sight in the bushes by the river. The two men were greatly terrified, 
and felt that it was more prudent to go home than meddle any further with the fair family. So far as I know, this story stands alone in Welsh folklore. But it has an exact parallel in Lancashire 47. The other story, which I now reproduce, was obtained by Mr. Roberts from the same Abel Evans. He learnt it from Mrs. Ellen Edwards, and it refers to a point in her lifetime, which Abel Evans fixes at ninety years ago. Mr. Roberts has not succeeded in recovering the name of the Kateger of whom it speaks. But he lived on the side of the Berwyn, above Coombe Pennant, where till lately a cottage used to stand. Near which the fairies had one of their resorts. Year OED per Chen Y B W T H Y N Wedi Amithu R H Y W Ran Fiken O R M Y N Y D D Ger Law Y Tai Er M W Y N Plan of Pitaf was Indo. Feli Y Gunneth. Mien Koden Y N Agos I R Fan Kanfidad N Y T H Bran. Fay Fedeli It May Doeth Fwasai Ido Drillio Y N Y T H C Y N Amalhau O R Brain. Faya Eschenad Y Godin A C A Drilliad Y N Y Pitch A C Wedi Dis Gin I Lor Canfidad G Y L C H Glass, Fairy Ring, Adi Amjilk Y Pren, A C A R Y C Y L C H Fay Wellad Hanner Koran Er E I Four Lawnet. W R T H Find Hybio Year Un Fan Y Boru Kanlanol Fay Gaffid Hanner Koran Y N Year Un Man A G Y Kaffid Y D Y D D O R Blame. Hina Fu M Amri Didio. Undyernad di wedded WRTH jai fail mei hap da a dangasad y fan ar li y kosai year hanner koran bob boru. WEL y boru kanlanol nid od eno na hanner koran na de meril ido, o herwid year od wedi tori realal y tilwithian trwy nud eu halioni y nh wesbys. Y may y till with I an or far na di li y laws y y bod year h way an ana y la diha. The occupier of the cottage had tilled a small portion of the mountain side near his home in order to plant potatoes, which he did. He observed that there was a rook's nest on a tree which was not far from this spot, and it struck him that it would be prudent to break the nest before the rooks multiplied. So he climbed the tree and broke the nest, and, after coming down, he noticed a green circle, a fairy ring, round the tree, and on this circle he espied, to his great joy, half a crown. As he went by the same spot the following morning, he found another half a crown in the same place as before. So it happened for several days. But one day he told a friend of his good luck, and showed him the spot where he found half a crown every morning. Now the next morning there was for him neither half a crown nor anything else, because he had broken the rule of the fair folks by making their liberality known, they being of opinion that the left hand should not know what the right hand does. So runs this short tale, which the old lady, Mrs. Edwards, and the people of the neighborhood explained as an instance of the gratitude of the fairies to a man who had rendered them a service, which in this case was supposed to have consisted in ridding them of the rooks. That disturbed their merrymakings in the green ring beneath the branches of the tree. 7. It would be unpardonable to pass away from Marianeth without alluding to the stray cow of Llyn Barfog. The story appears in Welsh in the Brython for 1860, pp. 1834, but the contributor, who closely imitates Glasseny's style, says that he got his materials from a paper by the late Mr. Pug of Aberdovi, by which he seems to have meant an article contributed by the latter to the Archaeologia Cambrensis, and published in the volume for 1853, pages 201 to 5. Mr. Pug dwells in that article a good deal on the scenery of the corner of Marianeth in the rear of Aberdovi, but the chief thing in his paper is the legend connected with Llyn Barfog, which he renders into English as the Bearded Lake 48. It is described as a mountain lake in a secluded spot in the upland country behind Aberdovi, but I shall let Mr. Pug speak for himself. The lovers of Cambrian lore are aware that the triads in their record of the deluge affirm that it was occasioned by a mystic afank Yllyn, Crocodile 49 of the lake, breaking the banks of Llyn Lion, the lake of waters. And the recurrence of that catastrophe was prevented only by Hugadarn, the bold man of power, dragging away the afank by aid of his Achain Banog, or large horned oxen. Many a lakelet in our land has put forward its claim to the location of Llyn Lion, 
amongst the rest, this lake. Be that as it may, King Arthur and his warhorse have the credit amongst the mountaineers here of ridding them of the monster, in place of who the mighty. In proof of which is shown an impression on a neighboring rock bearing a resemblance to those made by the shoe or hoof of a horse, as having been left there by his charger when our British Hercules was engaged in this redoubtable act of prowess. And this impression has been given the name of Cam March Arthur, the hoof of Arthur's horse, which it retains to this day. It is believed to be very perilous to let the waters out of the lake, and recently an aged inhabitant of the district informed the writer that she recollected this being done during a period of long drought. In order to procure motive power for LLYN Pear Mill, and that long continued heavy rains followed. No wonder our bold but superstitious progenitors, awestruck by the solitude of the spot, the dark sepial tint of its waters, unrelieved by the flitting apparition of a single fish and seldom visited by the tenants of the air should have established it as a canon in their creed of terror that the lake formed one of the many communications between this outward world of ours and the inner or lower one of and the unknown world fifty, the dominion of Gwyn A. P. Nod. The mythic king of the fabled realm, peopled by those children of mystery, plant Anne. And the belief is still current amongst the inhabitants of our mountains in the occasional visitations of the graged Anne, or dames of Elfin Land, to this upper world of ours. A shrewd old hill farmer, Thomas Abergrays by name, well skilled in the folklore of the district, informed me that, in years gone by, though when, exactly, he was too young to remember, those dames were wont to make their appearance. Arrayed in green, in the neighborhood of LLYN Bar Fog, chiefly at eventide, accompanied by their kine and hounds, and that on quiet summer nights in particular. These banhounds were often to be heard in full cry pursuing their prey the souls of doomed men dying without baptism and penance along the upland township of Sefnosucha. Many a farmer had a sight of their comely milk-white kine, many a swain had his soul turned to romance and poesy by a sudden vision of themselves in the guise of damsels arrayed in green, and radiant in beauty and grace. And many a sportsman had his path crossed by their white hounds of supernatural fleetness and comeliness, the CWNN. But never had any one been favored with more than a passing view of either, till an old farmer residing at Discernant, in the adjoining valley of DYFFRY and Gwyn, became at last the lucky captor of one of their milk white kine. The acquaintance which the Gwartheg YLLYN, the kine of the lake, had formed with the farmer's cattle, like the loves of the angels for the daughters of men, became the means of capture. And the farmer was thereby enabled to add the mystic cow to his own herd, an event in all cases believed to be most conducive to the worldly prosperity of him who should make so fortunate an acquisition. Never was there such a cow, never such calves, never such milk and butter, or cheese, and the fame of the fuch jifelion, the stray cow, was soon spread abroad through that central part of Wales known as the district of Rhwngyddwyafon. From the banks of the Maudak to those of the Dafwi, 51 from Aberdiswi 52 to Abercorris. The farmer, from a small beginning, rapidly became, like Job, a man of substance, possessed of thriving herds of cattle a very patriarch among the mountains. But, alas! Wanting Job's restraining grace, his wealth made him proud, his pride made him forget his obligation to the elfin cow, and fearing she might soon become too old to be profitable, he fattened her for the butcher. And then even she did not fail to distinguish herself, for a more monstrously fat beast was never seen. At last the day of slaughter came an eventful day in the annals of a mountain farm the killing of a fat cow, and such a monster of obesity. No wonder all the neighbors were gathered together to see the sight. The old farmer looked upon the preparations in self-pleased importance the butcher felt he was about no common feat of his craft, and, bearing his arms, he struck the blow not now fatal, for before even a hair had been injured. His arm was paralyzed the knife dropped from his hand, and the whole company was electrified by a piercing cry that awakened echo in a dozen hills, and made the welkin ring again. And lo and behold! The whole assemblage saw a female figure clad in green, with uplifted arms, standing on one of the crags overhanging LLYN bar fog, and heard her calling with a voice loud as thunder. Dear D. Vilan I Nyan. CYRN Sivalian Braith Y LLYN. AR Voldo Dan. 
Kodwch, Dutch Otter. Come Yellow Anvil, Stray Horns. Speckled One of the Lake. And of the Hornless Dodan. Arise, Come Home 53. And no sooner were these words of power uttered than the original Lake Cow and all her progeny, to the third and fourth generations, were in full flight towards the heights of Llyn and Barfog, as if pursued by the evil one. Self-interest quickly roused the farmer, who followed in pursuit, till breathless and panting he gained an eminence overlooking the lake, but with no better success than to behold the green-attired dame leisurely descending mid-lake. Accompanied by the fugitive cows and their calves formed in a circle around her, they tossing their tails, she waving her hands in scorn as much as to say, You may catch us, my friend, if you can. As they disappeared beneath the dark waters of the lake, leaving only the yellow water lily to mark the spot where they vanished, and to perpetuate the memory of this strange event. Meanwhile the farmer looked with rueful countenance upon the spot where the elfin herd disappeared, and had ample leisure to deplore the effects of his greediness, as with them also departed the prosperity which had hitherto attended him. And he became impoverished to a degree below his original circumstances. And, in his altered circumstances, few felt pity for one who in the noontide flow of prosperity had shown himself so far forgetful of favors received, as to purpose slaying his benefactor. Mr. Pug did a very good thing in saving this legend from oblivion, but it would be very interesting to know how much of it is still current among the inhabitants of the retired district around Llyn Barfog. And how the story would look when stripped of the florid language in which Mr. Pug thought proper to clothe it. Lastly, let me add a reference to the Iolo manuscripts, pp. 85, 475, where a short story is given concerning a certain milk-white sweet-milk cow, why Fuch Lathwen Lefrith, whose milk was so abundant and possessed of such virtues as almost to rival the Holy Grail. Like the Holy Grail also this cow wandered everywhere spreading plenty, until she chanced to come to the Vale of Toei. Where the foolish inhabitants wished to kill and eat her, the result was that she vanished in their hands and has never since been heard of. 8. Here I wish to add some further stories connected with Miria Nefshir which have come under my notice lately. I give them chiefly on the authority of Mr. Owen M. Edwards of Lincoln College, who is a native of Lenuchlin, and still spends a considerable part of his time there. And partly on that of Highwell's essay on the folklore of the county, which was awarded the prize at the National Esthethvod of 1898-54. A story current at Lenuchlin, concerning a midwife who attends on a fairy mother, resembles the others of the same group, for one of them see page 63 above. In the former, however, one misses the ointment, and finds instead of it that the midwife wagged not to touch her eyes with the water with which she washed the fairy baby. But as might be expected one of her eyes happened to itch, and she touched it with her fingers straight from the water. It appears that thenceforth she was able to see the fairies with that eye. At any rate she is represented some time afterwards recognizing the father of the fairy baby at a fair at Bala, and inquiring of him kindly about his family. The fairy asked with which eye she saw him, and when he had ascertained this, he at once blinded it, so that she never could see with it afterwards. Highwell also has it that the TYLWYTH tag formerly used to frequent the markets at Bala, and that they used to swell the noise in the marketplace without anybody being able to see them, this was a sign that prices were going to rise. The shepherds of Ardedwy are familiar, according to Highwell, with a variant of the story in which a man married a fairy on condition that he did not touch her with iron. They lived on the Mulfer and dwelt happily together for years, until one fine summer day, when the husband was engaged in shearing his sheep, he put the gwell, shears, in his wife's hand, she then instantly disappeared. The earlier portions of this story are unknown to me, but they are not hard to guess. Concerning Llyn Erden, between the western slopes of the Lalek, Highwell has a story the like of which I am not acquainted with, walking near that lake you shun the shore and keep to the grass in order to avoid the fairies. For if you take hold of the grass no fairy can touch you, or dare under any circumstances injure a blade of grass. Lastly, Highwell speaks of several caves containing treasure, as for instance a Telenor, or Golden Harp, hidden away in a cave beneath Castel Karn in the parish of Lenuchlin. 
Lewis Morris, in his Celtic Remains, p. 100, calls it Castel Cornican, and describes it as seated on the top of a steep rock at the bottom of a deep valley, it appears to have consisted of a wall surrounding three turrets. And the mortar seems composed of cockle shells, see also the Archaeologia Cambrensis for 1850, p. 204. Highwell speaks also of a cave beneath Castel Dinas Bran, near Langollen, as containing much treasure, which will only be disclosed to a boy followed by a white dog with ligate Aryan, silver eyes. Explained to mean light eyes, every such dog is said to see the wind. So runs this story, but it requires more exegesis than I can supply. One may compare it at a distance with Murden's arrangement that the treasure buried by him at Dinah's Emery's should only be found by a youth with yellow hair and blue eyes. And with the belief that the cave treasures of the Snowden district belong to the GWIDDYL or Goidels, and that Goidels will eventually find them, see Chapter 8. The next three stories are from Mr. Owen Edward Simru for 1897, pages 188-9, where he has published them from a collection made for a literary competition or local esteethvot by his friend J. H. Roberts, who died in early manhood. The first is a blurred version of the story of the lake lady and her dowry of cattle, but enough of the story remains to show that, had we got it in its original form. It would be found to differ somewhat on several points from all the other versions extant. I summarize the Welsh as follows, in ages gone by, as the shepherd of Hafid Y. Garej was looking after his sheep on the shores of the Arenig Lake, he came across a young calf, plump, sleek, and strong, in the rushes. He could not guess whence the beast could have come, as no cattle were allowed to approach the lake at that time of the year. He took it home, however, and it was reared until it was a bull, remarkable for his fine appearance. In time his offspring were the only cattle on the farm, and never before had there been such beasts at Hafid Y. Garaj. They were the wonder and admiration of the whole country. But one summer afternoon in June, the shepherd saw a little fat old man playing on a pipe, and then he heard him call the cows by their names. Mulican, Molican, Malin, Mare. Douch Otterar Orhan Arf Weingare. Mulican, Molican, Malin, and Mare. Come now home at my word. He then beheld the whole herd running to the little man and going into the lake. Nothing more was heard of them, and it was everybody's opinion that they were the Tylwyth Tegs cattle. The next is a quasi-fairy tale, the outcome of which recalls the adventure of the farmer of DRWSY co-ed on his return from Bedgelert Fair, page 99 above. It is told of a young harpist who was making his way across country from his home at YSPYTY Eifen to the neighborhood of Bala, that while crossing the mountain he happened in the mist to lose his road and fall into the Gores 4, the Big Bog. There he wallowed for hours, quite unable to extricate himself in spite of all his efforts. But when he was going to give up in despair, he beheld close to him, reaching him her hand, a little woman who was wondrous fair beyond all his conception of beauty, and with her help he got out of the gores. The damsel gave him a jolly sweet kiss that flashed electricity through his whole nature, he was at once over head and ears in love. She led him to the hut of her father and mother, there he had every welcome, and he spent the night singing and dancing with Olwen, for that was her name. Now, though the harpist was a mere stripling, he thought of wedding at once he was never before in such a heaven of delight. But next morning he was waked, not by a kiss from Olwen, but by the plast drained shepherd's dog licking his lips, he found himself sleeping against the wall of a sheepfold, Corlin, with his harp in a clump of rushes at his feet. Without any trace to be found of the family with whom he had spent such a happy night. The next story recalls Glassini's Einai on Las, as given above, its peculiarity is the part played by the well introduced. The scene was a turbary near the river called Mon Minak, so named from Kum Tir Minak, behind the hills immediately north of Bala ages ago, as a number of people were cutting turf in a place which was then moorland, and which is now enclosed ground forming part of a farm called Nantir, one of them happened to wash his face in a well belonging to the fairies. At dinner time in the middle of the day they sat down in a circle, while the youth who had washed his face went to fetch the food, but suddenly both he and the box of food were lost. 
They knew not what to do, they suspected that it was the doing of the fairies. But the wise man, GWRHYSPYS, came to the neighborhood and told them, that, if they would only go to the spot on the night of full moon in June, they would behold him dancing with the fairies. They did as they were told, and found the moor covered with thousands of little agile creatures who sang and danced with all their might, and they saw the missing man among them. They rushed at him, and with a great deal of trouble they got him out. But oftentimes was I nigh on mist again, until at the time of full moon in another June he returned home with a wondrously fair wife, whose history or pedigree no one knew. Everybody believed her to be one of the TYLWYTH tag. 9. There is a kind of fairy tale of which I think I have hitherto not given the reader a specimen, a good instance is given in the third volume of the Brithen, at page 459, by a contributor who calls himself Ignorth of Gugan, who, I learn from the Rev. Chancellor Sylvan Evans, the editor, was no other than the Reverend Benjamin Williams, best known to Welsh antiquaries by his bardic name of Gwynionid. The preface to the tale is also interesting, so I am tempted to render the whole into English, as follows. The fair family were wonderful creatures in the imaginary world, they encamped, they walked. And they capered a great deal in former ages in our country, according to what we learn from some of our old people. It may be supposed that they were very little folks like the children of Rhys DDWFN, for the old people used to imagine that they were wont to visit their hearths in great numbers in ages gone by. The girls at the farmhouses used to make the hearths clean after supper, and to place a cauldron full of water near the fire. And so they thought that the fair family came there to play at night, bringing sweethearts for the young women, and leaving pieces of money on the hob for them in the morning. Sometimes they might be seen as splendid hosts exercising themselves on our hills. They were very fond of the mountains of Dyft. Travelers between Lampeter and Cardigan used to see them on the hill of Lanwinog, but by the time they had reached there the fairies would be far away on the hills of Landisel. And when one had reached the place where one expected to see the family together in tidy array, they would be seen very busily engaged on the tops of Krug Y Balog. When one went there they would be on Blaine Pant AR Phi, moving on and on to Bryn BWA, and, finally, to some place or other in the lower part of Dyft. Like the soldiers of our earthly world, they were possessed of terribly fascinating music. And in the autumnal season they had their rings, still named from them, in which they sang and danced. The young man of Lech Y. Derwood 55 was his father's only son, as well as heir to the farm. So he was very dear to his father and his mother, indeed he was the light of their eyes. Now, the head servant and the son were bosom friends, they were like brothers together, or rather twin brothers. As the son and the servant were such friends, the farmer's wife used to get exactly the same kind of clothes prepared for the servant as for her son. The two fell in love with two handsome young women of very good reputation in the neighborhood. The two couples were soon joined in honest wedlock, and great was the merrymaking on the occasion. The servant had a suitable place to live in on the farm of Lech Y. Derwood. But about half a year after the son's marriage, he and his friend went out for sport, when the servant withdrew to a wild and retired corner to look for game. He returned presently for his friend, but when he got there he could not see him anywhere, he kept looking around for some time for him, shouting and whistling, but there was no sign of his friend. By and by, he went home to Lech Y. Derwood expecting to see him, but no one knew anything about him. Great was the sorrow of his family through the night, and next day the anxiety was still greater. They went to see the place where his friend had seen him last, it was hard to tell whether his mother or his wife wept the more bitterly, but the father was a little better, though he also looked as if he were half mad with grief. The spot was examined, and, to their surprise, they saw a fairy ring close by, and the servant recollected that he had heard the sound of very fascinating music somewhere or other about the time in question. It was at once agreed that the man had been unfortunate enough to have got into the ring of the TYLWYTH, and to have been carried away by them, nobody knew whither. Weeks and months passed away, and a son was born to the heir of Lech Y. Derwood, but the young father was not there to see his child, which the old people thought very hard. However, the little one grew up the very picture of his father, 
and great was his influence over his grandfather and grandmother, in fact he was everything to them. He grew up to be a man, and he married a good-looking girl in that neighborhood. But her family did not enjoy the reputation of being kind-hearted people. The old folks died, and their daughter-in-law also. One windy afternoon in the month of October, the family of Lech Y. Derwood beheld a tall thin old man, with his beard and hair white as snow, coming towards the house, and they thought he was a Jew. The servant maids stared at him, and their mistress laughed at the old Jew, at the same time that she lifted the children up one after another to see him. He came to the door and entered boldly enough, asking about his parents. The mistress answered him in an unusually surly and contemptuous tone, wondering why that drunken old Jew had come there, because it was thought he had been drinking, and that he would otherwise not have spoken so. The old man cast wondering and anxious looks around on everything in the house, feeling as he did greatly surprised, but it was the little children about the floor that drew his attention most, his looks were full of disappointment and sorrow. He related the whole of his account, saying that he had been out the day before and that he was now returning. The mistress of the house told him that she had heard a tale about her husband's father, that he had been lost years before her birth while out sporting, whilst her father maintained that it was not true, but that he had been killed. She became angry, and quite lost her temper at seeing the old Jew not going away. The old man was roused, saying that he was the owner of the house, and that he must have his rights. He then went out to see his possessions, and presently went to the house of the servant, where, to his surprise, things had greatly changed, after conversing with an aged man, who sat by the fire, the one began to scrutinize the other more and more. The aged man by the fire told him what had been the fate of his old friend, the heir of Lech Y. Derwood. They talked deliberately of the events of their youth, but it all seemed like a dream. In short, the old man in the corner concluded that his visitor was his old friend, the heir of Lech Y. Derwood, returning from the land of the Tylwyth Teg after spending half a hundred years there. The other old man, with the snow-white beard, believed in his history, and much did they talk together and question one another for many hours. The old man by the fire said that the master of Lech Y. Derwood was away from home that day, and he induced his aged visitor to eat some food, but, to the horror of all, the eater fell down dead on the spot 56. There is no record that an inquest was held over him, but the tale relates that the cause of it was, that he ate food after having been so long in the world of the fair family. His old friend insisted on seeing him buried by the side of his ancestors. But the rudeness of the mistress of Lech Y. Derwood to her father-in-law brought a curse on the family that clung to it to distant generations, and until the place had been sold nine times. A tale like this is to be found related of Idwal of Nantkuid, in Simru Fu, page 85. I said, a tale like this, but, on reconsidering the matter, I should think it is the very same tale passed through the hands of Glassenes or some one of his imitators. Another of this kind will be found in the Brithen, too. 170, and several similar ones also in Wirt Sykes' book, pages 65 to 90, either given at length, or merely referred to. There is one kind of variant which deserves special notice, as making the music to which the sojourner in Fairy listens for scores of years to be that of a bird singing on a tree. A story of the sort is located by Howells, in his Cambrian Superstitions, pages 127-8, at Pant Shan Shenson, near Penketer, in Cardiganshire, this latter kind of story leads easily up to another development, namely, to substituting for the birds. Warble the song and felicity of heaven, and for the simple shepherd a pious monk. In this form it is located at a place called Llwiny Neff, or Heaven's Grove, near Selenog 4, in Carnarvonshire. It is given by Glassenes in Simru Fu, pp. 183-4, where it was copied from the Brithen, 3. 111, in which he had previously published it. Several versions of it in rhyme came down from the 18th century, and Sylvan Evans has brought together 26 stanzas in Point in St. David's College Magazine for 1881, pages 191 to 200, where he has put into a few paragraphs all that is known about the song of the hen W.R. or Coed, or the old man of the wood, in his usually clear and lucid style. 
A tale from the other end of the tract of country once occupied by a sprinkling, perhaps, of Celts among a population of Picts, makes the man, and not the fairies, supply the music. I owe it to the kindness of the Rev. Andrew Clark, Fellow of Lincoln College, Oxford, who heard it from the late sexton of the parish of Dollar, in the county of Clackmannan. The sexton died some twelve years ago, aged seventy, he had learnt the tale from his father. The following are Mr. Clark's words. Glendavon is a parish and village in the Ochils in County Perth, about five miles from Dollar as you come up Glen Queech and down by Gloomhill. Glen Queech is a narrowish glen between two grassy hills at the top of the glen is a round hill of no great height, but very neat shape, the grass of which is always short and trim, and the ferns on the shoulder of a very marked green. This, as you come up the glen, seems entirely to block the way. It is called the Maiden Castle. Only when you come quite close do you see the path winding round the foot of it. A little further on is a fine spring bordered with flat stones, in the middle of a neat, turfy spot, called the Maiden's Well. This road, till the new toll road was made on the other side of the hills, was the thoroughfare between Dollar and Glendavon. The following is the legend, as told by the Bethrel Colon, a piper, carrying his pipes, was coming from Glendavon to Dollar in the grey of the evening. He crossed the Garchel, a little stream running into the Queech Burn, and looked at the Maiden Castle, and saw only the grey hillside and heard only the wind suffing through the bent. He had got beyond it when he heard a burst of lively music, he turned round, and instead of the dark knoll saw a great castle, with lights blazing from the windows, and heard the noise of dancing issuing from the open door. He went back incautiously, and a procession issuing forth at that moment, B was caught and taken into a great hall ablaze with lights, and people dancing on the floor. He had to pipe to them for a day or two, but he got anxious, because he knew his people would be wondering why he did not come back in the morning as he had promised. The fairies seemed to sympathize with his anxiety, and promised to let him go if he played a favorite tune of his, which they seemed fond of, to their satisfaction. He played his very best, the dance went fast and furious, and at its close he was greeted with loud applause. On his release he found himself alone, in the grey of the evening, beside the dark hillock, and no sound was heard save the purr of the burn and the suffing of the wind through the bent. Instead of completing his journey to Dollar, he walked hastily back to Glendavon to relieve his folk's anxiety. He entered his father's house and found no Kent face there. On his protesting that he had gone only a day or two before, and waxing loud in his bewildered talk, a grey old man was roused from a doze behind the fire. And told how he had heard when a boy from his father that a piper had gone away to Dollar on a quiet evening, and had never been heard or seen since, nor any trace of him found. He had been in the castle for a hundred years. The term plant Reese DDWFN has already been brought before the reader, it means the children of Reese DDWFN, and Reese DDWFN means literally Reese the Deep, but the adjective in Welsh connotes depth of character in the sense of shrewdness or cunning. Nay, even the English deep is often borrowed for use in the same sense, as when one colloquially says undip yon YWE, he is a very calculating or cunning fellow. The following account of Rhys and his progeny is given by Gwynionid in the first volume of the Brithen, p. 130, which deserves being cited at length, there is a tale current in Dyfed, that there is, or rather that there has been, a country between Semis, the northern hundred of Pembrokeshire, and a Berteran in Lane. The chief patriarch of the inhabitants was Rhys Ddwfn, and his descendants used to be called after him the children of Rhys Ddwfn. They were, it is said, a handsome race enough, but remarkably small in size. It is stated that certain herbs of a strange nature grew in their land, so that they were able to keep their country from being seen by even the most sharp-sighted of invaders. There is no account that these remarkable herbs grew in any other part of the world excepting on a small spot, about a square yard in area, in a certain part of Semis. If it chanced that a man stood alone on it, he beheld the whole of the territory of Plant Reese DDWFN, but the moment he moved he would lose sight of it altogether, and it would have been utterly vain for him to look for his footprints. In another story, as will be seen presently, 
the requisite platform was a turf from St. David's churchyard. The Risians had not much land they lived in towns. So they were wont in former times to come to market to Cardigan, and to raise the prices of things terribly. They were seen of no one coming or going, but only seen there in the market. When prices happened to be high, and the corn all sold, however much there might have been there in the morning, the poor used to say to one another on the way home, oh. They were there today, meaning plant Reese DDWFN. So they were dear friends in the estimation of Shown Phil Highwell, the farmer, but not so high in the opinion of Daffod, the laborer. It is said, however, that they were very honest and resolute men. A certain gruffy to buy none was wont to sell them more corn than anybody else, and so he was a great friend of theirs. He was honored by them beyond all his contemporaries by being led on a visit to their home. As they were great traders like the Phoenicians of old, they had treasures from all countries under the sun. Gruffied, after feasting his eyes to satiety on their wonders, was led back by them loaded with presents. But before taking leave of them, he asked them how they succeeded in keeping themselves safe from invaders, as one of their number might become unfaithful, and go beyond the virtue of the herbs that formed their safety. Oh! replied the little old man of shrewd looks, just as Ireland has been blessed with a soil on which venomous reptiles cannot live, so with our land, no traitor can live here. Look at the sand on the seashore, perfect unity prevails there, and so among us. Rhys, the father of our race, bade us, even to the most distant descendant, honor our parents and ancestors. Love our own wives without looking at those of our neighbors, and do our best for our children and grandchildren. And he said that if we did so, no one of us would ever prove unfaithful to another, or become what you call a traitor. The latter is a wholly imaginary character among us. Strange pictures are drawn of him with his feet like those of an ass, with a nest of snakes in his bosom, with a head like the devil's, with hands somewhat like a man's, while one of them holds a large knife. And the family lies dead around the figure. Goodbye. When Gruffied looked about him he lost sight of the country of Plant Reese, and found himself near his home. He became very wealthy after this, and continued to be a great friend of Plant Reese as long as he lived. After Gruffied's death they came to market again, but such was the greed of the farmers, like Gruffied before them, for riches, and so unreasonable were the prices they asked for their corn. That the Risians took offense and came no more to Cardigan to market. The old people used to think that they now went to Fishguard Market, as very strange people were wont to be seen there. On the other hand, some Fishguard people were lately of opinion that it was at Haverford West the fairies did their marketing, I refer to a letter of Mr. Farrer Fenton's, in the Pembroke County Guardian of October 31, 1896, in which he mentions a conversation he had with a fish guard woman as to the existence of fairies, there are fairies, she asserted. For they came to Harward West Market to buy things, so there must be. With this should be compared pp. 9 to 10 of Wirt Sykes' British Goblins, where mention is made of sailors on the coast of Pembrokeshire and Camarthenshire, who still talk of the green meadows of enchantment lying in the Irish Channel to the west of Pembrokeshire. And of men who had landed on them, or seen them suddenly vanishing. The author then proceeds to abstract from Howell's Cambrian Superstitions, page 119, the following paragraph, The fairies inhabiting these islands are said to have regularly attended the markets at Milford Haven and Laffarne. They made their purchases without speaking, laid down their money and departed, always leaving the exact sum required, which they seemed to know without asking the price of anything. Sometimes they were invisible. But they were often seen by sharp-eyed persons. There was always one special butcher at Milford Haven upon whom the fairies bestowed their patronage instead of distributing their favors indiscriminately. The Milford Haven folk could see the green fairy islands distinctly, lying out a short distance from land, and the general belief was that they were densely peopled with fairies. It was also said that the latter went to and fro between the islands and the shore, through a subterranean gallery under the bottom of the sea. Another tale given in the Brithen, too. 20, by a writer who gives his name as B. Davies 57, will serve to show, short though it be, 
that the term plant reese ddwfn was not confined to those honestly dealing fairies, but was used in a sense wholly synonymous with that of tylwyth tag, as understood in other parts of Wales. The story runs as follows, and should be compared with the dyffrynmymbyr1 given above, pp. 100-3, one calm hot day, when the sun of heaven was brilliantly shining, and the hay in the dales was being busily made by lads and lasses, and by grown-up people of both sexes. A woman in the neighborhood of Emlyn placed her one-year-old infant in the gator, or chair, as the cradle is called in these parts, and out she went to the field for a while, intending to return, when her neighbor, an old woman overtaken by the decrepitude of eighty summers, should call to her that her darling was crying. It was not long before she heard the old woman calling to her, she ran hurriedly, and as soon as she set foot on the kitchen floor she took her little one in her arms as usual, saying to him, O oh my little one! Thy mother's delight art thou! I would not take the world for thee, and k. But to her surprise he had a very old look about him, and the more the tender-hearted mother gazed at his face, the stranger it seemed to her. So that at last she placed him in the cradle and told her trouble and sorrow to her relatives and acquaintances. And after this one and the other had given his opinion, it was agreed at last that it was one of Reese DDWFN's children that was in the cradle, and not her dearly loved baby. In this distress there was nothing to do but to fetch a sorcerer, as fast as the fastest horse could gallop. He said, when he saw the child, that he had seen his like before, and that it would be a hard job to get rid of him, though not such a very hard job this time. The shovel was made red-hot in the fire by one of the Sefnarth 58 boys, and held before the child's face. And in an instant the short little old man took to his heels, and neither he nor his like was seen afterwards from Aberkooch to Aberbargod at any rate. The mother, it is said, found her darling and scathed the next moment. I remember also hearing that the strange child was as old as the grandfather of the one that had been lost. As I see no reason to make any profound distinction between lake maidens and sea maidens, I now give Gwynyanid's account of the mermaid who was found by a fisherman from Landydock or St. Dogmeal, S. 59, near Cardigan, see the Brithen, I. 82. One fine afternoon in September, in the beginning of the last century, a fisherman, whose name was Pergrin Sixty, went to a recess in the rock near Pen Semis, where he found a sea maiden doing her hair. And he took the water lady prisoner to his boat. We know not what language is used by sea maidens, but this one, this time at any rate, talked, it is said, very good Welsh. For when she was in despair in Pergrin's custody, weeping copiously, and with her tresses all dishevelled, she called out, Pergrin, if thou wilt let me go, I will give thee three shouts in the time of thy greatest need. So, in wonder and fear, he let her go to walk the streets of the deep, and visit her sweethearts there. Days and weeks passed without Pergrin seeing her after this. But one hot afternoon, when the sea was pretty calm, and the fisherman had no thought of danger, behold his old acquaintance showing her head and locks, and shouting out in a loud voice, Pergrin. 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 Take up thy nets, take up thy nets, take up thy nets. Pergrin and his companion instantly obeyed the message, and drew their nets in with great haste. In they went, past the bar, and by the time they had reached the PWLL cam the most terrible storm had overspread the sea, while he and his companion were safe on land. Twice nine others had gone out with them, but they were all drowned without having the chance of obeying the warning of the water lady. Perhaps it is not quite irrelevant to mention here the armorial bearings which Drayton ascribes to the neighbouring county of Cardigan in the following couplet in his Batale of Agincourt, London, 1631, p. 23. As Cardigan the next to them that went. Came with a mermaid sitting on a rock. A writer in the Brithen, 4. 194, states that the people of Nefin in Lane claim the story of the fisher and the mermaid as belonging to them, which proves that a similar legend has been current there, add to this the fact mentioned in the Brithen, 3. 133, that a red mermaid with yellow hair, on a white field, figures in the coat of arms of the family resident at Glasfrin in the parish of Langibi, in Ifeanid, or the southern portion of Carnarvonshire. 
and we have already suggested that Glasseny's story, pages 117 to 25, was made up, to a certain extent, of materials found on the coasts of Carnarvonshire. A small batch of stories about South Wales mermaids is given by a writer who calls himself Abnadol 61, in the Brithen, for 310, as follows. A few rock men are said to have been working, about eighty years ago, in a quarry near Porth Y. Raw. When the day was calm and clear, with nature, as it were, feasting, the flowers shedding sweet scent around, and the hot sunshine beaming into the jagged rocks. Though an occasional wave rose to strike the romantic cliffs, the sea was like a placid lake. With its light coverlet of blue attractive enough to entice one of the ladies of Reese DDWFN forth from the town seen by Daniel Hus off Trey Finn as he was journeying between Fishguard and St. David's in the year 1858, to make her way to the top of a stone and to sit on it to disentangle her flowing silvery hair. Whilst she was cleaning herself, the rock men went down, and when they got near her they perceived that, from her waist upwards, she was like the lasses of whales, but that, from her waist downwards, she had the body of a fish. And, when they began to talk to her, they found she spoke Welsh, though she only uttered the following few words to them, reaping in Pembrokeshire and weeding in Camodonshire. Off she then went to walk in the depth of the sea towards her home. Another tale is repeated about a mermaid, said to have been caught by men below the land of Lanunda, near the spot, if not on the spot, where the French made their landing afterwards, and three miles to the west of Fishguard. It then goes on to say that they carried her to their home, and kept her in a secure place for some time, before long, she begged to be allowed to return to the brine land, and gave the people of the house three bits of advice. But I only remember one of them, he writes, and this is it, skim the surface of the pottage before adding sweet milk to it, it will be whiter and sweeter, and less of it will do. I was told that this family follow the three advices to this day. A somewhat similar advice to that about the pottage is said to have been given by a mermaid, under similar circumstances, to a manxman. After putting the foregoing bits together, I was favored by Mr. Benjamin Williams with notes on the tales and on the persons from whom he heard them, they form the contents of two or three letters, mostly answers to queries of mine, and the following is the substance of them, Mr. Williams is a native of the Valley of Trode Year or 62, in the Cardiganshire parish of that name. He spent a part of his youth at Verwig, in the angle between the northern bank of the TFI and Cardigan Bay. He heard of Rhys DDWFN's children first from a distant relative of his father's, a Catherine Thomas, who came to visit her daughter, who lived not far from his father's house, that would now be from forty-eight to fifty years ago. He was very young at the time, and of Reese. DDWFN's progeny he formed a wonderful idea, which was partly due also to the talk of one James Davies or Siams Mosin, who was very well up in folklore, and was one of his father's next-door neighbors. He was an old man, and nephew to the musician, David Jenkin Morgan. The only spot near Mr. William's home, that used to be frequented by the fairies, was Sefn Y. Siru, the Stag's Ridge, a large farm, so called from having been kept as a park for their deer by the Lewises of Abernant Bikin. He adds that the late Mr. Phillips, of Aberglasney, was very fond of talking of things in his native neighborhood, and of mentioning the fairies at Sefn Y. Siru. It was after moving to Verwig that Mr. Williams began to put the tales he heard on paper, then he came in contact with three brothers, whose names were John, Owen, and Thomas Evans. They were well-to-do and respectable bachelors, living together on the large farm of Halford Ruffid. Thomas was a man of very strong common sense, and worth consulting on any subject, he was a good arithmetician, and a constant reader of the Baptist periodical, Saren Gomer, from its first appearance. He thoroughly understood the bardic meters, and had a fair knowledge of music. He was well versed in scripture, and filled the office of deacon at the Baptist chapel. His death took place in the year 1864. Now, the eldest of the three brothers, the one named John, or Shown, was then about seventy-five years of age, and he thoroughly believed in the tales about the fairies, as will be seen from the following short dialogue. Shown, Williams Bach. Mayan raid I bought NHWI gal, 
Year W I N Kofia Y N Amzer Bone Fod March Nad Abertiafi Y N Lawn O Laffer Y N Y Board Igon Eno M Fison C I N Pen Hanner or R Odd Y C W B W L Wedi Darfod. N I D Odd Passe by Gweld Nui, Ma Gita Nui Faint a Finan Nui O Arian. Williams, Silt Na Feist Dinian Y N I Gweld Nui Int Shown. Shown, O Ma Gita Nui Dinian Fel Nin Y N Prini Drostin Nui. A G Y Mun we fell year hen siomin ina y n jelly nade pop trick. John, my dear Williams, it must be that they exist, I remember Cardigan Market, in the time of Bonaparte, full of corn in the morning enough for a month but in less than half an hour it was all gone. It was impossible to see them, they have as much money as they like. Williams, how is it, then, that men did not see them, John? John, oh, they have men like us to do the buying for them. And they can, like those old showmen, do every kind of trick. At this kind of display of simplicity on the part of his brother, Thomas used to smile and say, My brother John believes such things as those, for he had no belief in them himself. Still it is from his mouth that Mr. Williams published the tales in the Brithen, which have been reproduced here, that of Pergrin and the Mermaid, and all about the heir of Lech Y. Derwitt, not to mention the ethical element in the account of Rhys DDWFN's country and its people. The product probably of his mind. Thomas Evans, or as he was really called, Tom Mose Iphen, was given rather to grappling with the question of the origin of such beliefs, so one day he called Mr. Williams out, and led him to a spot about four hundred yards from Bull Y. Fron, where the latter then lived, he pointed to the setting sun, and asked Mr. Williams what he thought of the glorious sunset before them. It is all produced, he then observed, by the reflection of the sun's rays on the mist, one might think, he went on to say, that there was there a paradise of a country full of fields, forests, and everything that is desirable. And before they had moved away the grand scene had disappeared, when Thomas suggested that the idea of the existence of the country of Reese DDWFN's children arose from the contemplation of that phenomenon. One may say that Thomas Evans was probably far ahead of the Welsh historians who try to extract history from the story of Cantor Arguelet, the bottom hundred, beneath the waves of Cardigan Bay. But what was seen was probably an instance of the mirage to be mentioned presently. Lastly, besides Mr. Williams' contributions to the Brithen, and a small volume of poetry, entitled Briallan Glan Carey, some tales of his were published by Lalog in Bygone some years ago. And he had the prize at the Cardigan Estethvod of 1866 for the best collection in Welsh of the folklore of Dyfed, his recollection was that it contained in all thirty-six tales of all kinds. But since the manuscript, as the property of the committee of that Estethvod, was sold, he could not now consult it, in fact he is not certain as to who the owner of it may now be, though he has an idea that it is either the Rev. Rees Williams, vicar of Whitchurch, near Solva, Pembrokeshire, or R. D. Jenkins, E. S. Q., of Silbrana, Cardiganshire. Whoever the owner may be, he would probably be only too glad to have it published, and I mention this merely to call attention to it. The Estethvod is to be commended for encouraging local research, and sometimes even for burying the results in obscurity, but not always. X. Before leaving Dyfed, I wish to revert to the extract from Mr. Sykes, page 161 above. He had been helped partly by the article on Gavron, in the Cambrian Biography, by William Owen, better known since as William Owen Pug and Dr. Pug, and partly by a note of Southey's on the following words in his Maddock, London, 1815, I, 3. Where are the sons of Gavron? Where his tribe? The faithful? Following their beloved chief? They the green islands of the ocean sought? Nor human tongue hath told, nor human ear. Since from the silver shores they went their way. Hath heard their fortunes. The Gavron story, I may premise, is based on one of the Welsh triads I, 34, 2. V, 3. 80, and Southey cites the article in the Cambrian biography. But he goes on to give the following statements without indicating on what sources he was drawing the reader has, however, been made acquainted already with the virtue of a blade of grass, 04, 
by the brief mention of Llyn Erden above, p. 148. Of these islands, or green spots of the floods, there are some singular superstitions. They are the abode of the Tylwyth Teg, or the fair family, the souls of the virtuous druids, who, not having been Christians, cannot enter the Christian heaven, but enjoy this heaven of their own. They however discover a love of mischief, neither becoming happy spirits, nor consistent with their original character, for they love to visit the earth, and, seizing a man, inquire whether he will travel above wind, mid-wind, or below wind. Above wind is a giddy and terrible passage, below wind is through bush and brake, the middle is a safe course. But the spell of security is, to catch hold of the grass, for these beings have not power to destroy a blade of grass. In their better moods they come over and carry the Welsh in their boats. He who visits these islands imagines on his return that he has been absent only a few hours, when, in truth, whole centuries have passed away. If you take a turf from a steep David's churchyard, and stand upon it on the sea shore, you behold these islands. A man once, who thus obtained sight of them, immediately put to sea to find them, but they disappeared, and his search was in vain. He returned, looked at them, again from the enchanted turf, again set sail, and failed again. The third time he took the turf into his vessel, and stood upon it till he reached them. A correspondent signing himself, the Antient Mariner, and writing, in the Pembroke County Guardian, from Newport, Pembrokeshire, October. 26, 1896, cites Southey's notes, and adds to them the statement, that some fifty years ago there was a tradition amongst the inhabitants of Trevine, Trefin, in his county, that these islands could be seen from Man Non, or Egelwys Non. In that neighborhood. To return to Maddock, Southey adds to the note already quoted a reference to the inhabitants of Aaron Moor, on the coast of Galway, to the effect that they think that they can on a clear day see Highbrestle. The enchanted island supposed to be the paradise of the pagan Irish. Compare the phantom city seen in the same sea from the coast of Clare. Then he asks a question suggestive of the explanation, that all this is due to, that very extraordinary phenomenon, known in Sicily by the name of Morgan Le Fay's works. In connection with this question of mirage I venture to quote again from the Pembroke County Guardian. Mr. Farrer Fenton, already mentioned, writes in the issue of November. 1, 1896 giving a report which he had received one summer morning from Captain John Evans, since deceased. It is to the effect that once when trending up the channel, and passing Grahome Island, in what he had always known as deep water, he was surprised to see to windward of him a large tract of land covered with a beautiful green meadow. It was not, however, above water, but just a few feet below, say two or three, so that the grass waved and swam about as the ripple flowed over it, in a most delightful way to the eye, so that as watched it made one feel quite drowsy. You know, he continued, I have heard old people say there is a floating island off there, that sometimes rises to the surface, or nearly, and then sinks down again fathoms deep, so that no one sees it for years. And when nobody expects it comes up again for a while. How it may be, I do not know, but that is what they say. Lastly, Mr. E. Perkins, of Penisquorn, near Fishguard, wrote on November. 2, 1896, as follows, of a changing view to be had from the top of the Garn, which means the Garn 4, one of the most interesting prehistoric sites in the county. And one I have had the pleasure of visiting more than once in the company of Henry Owen and Edward Laws, the historians of Pembrokeshire. May not the fairy islands referred to by Professor Rees have originated from mirages? During the glorious weather we enjoyed last summer, I went up one particularly fine evening to the top of the garn behind Penisquorn to view the sunset. It would have been worth a thousand miles travel to go to see such a scene as I saw that evening. It was about half an hour before sunset the bay was calm and smooth as the finest mirror. The rays of the sun made a golden path across the sea, and a picture indescribable. As the sun neared the horizon the rays broadened until the sheen resembled a gigantic golden plate prepared to hold the brighter sun. No sooner had the sun set than I saw a striking mirage. To the right I saw a stretch of country similar to a landscape in this country. 
A farmhouse and outbuildings were seen, I will not say quite as distinct as I can see the upper part of a tea. David's perish from this garn, but much more detailed. We could see fences, roads, and gateways leading to the farmyard, but in the haze it looked more like a panoramic view than a veritable landscape. Similar mirages may possibly have caused our old to think these were the abode of the fairies. To return to Mr. Sykes, the rest of his account of the Pembrokeshire fairies and their green islands, of their Milford butcher, and of the subterranean gallery leading into their home, comes, as already indicated, for the most part from Howells. But it does not appear on what authority Southey himself made departed druids of the fairies. One would be glad to be reassured on this last point, as such a hypothesis would fit in well enough with what we are told of the sacrosanct character of the inhabitants of the isles on the coast of Britain in ancient times. Take, for instance, the brief account given by Plutarch of one of the isles explored by a certain Demetrius in the service of the Emperor of Rome, see Chapter 8. 11. Mr. Craig Fryn Hughes, the author of a Welsh novel at 63 with its scene laid in Glamorgan, having induced me to take a copy, I read it and found it full of local colouring. Then I ventured to sound the author on the question of fairy tales, and the reader will be able to judge how hearty the response has been. Before reproducing the tale which Mr. Hughes has sent me, I will briefly put into English his account of himself and his authorities. Mr. Hughes lives at the Quaker's Yard in the neighbourhood of Puntypred, in Glamorganshire. His father was not a believer 64 in tales about fairies or the like, and he learned all he knows of the traditions about them in his father's absence, from his grandmother and other old people. The old lady's name was Rachel Hughes. She was born at Pandy Pont Y. Simmer, near Pontypool, or Pont A. P. Highwell as Mr. Hughes analyses the name, in the year 1773, and she had a vivid recollection of Edmund Jones of the Tranch, of whom more anon, coming from time to time to preach to the independents there. She came, however, to live in the parish of Lanthabon, near the Quaker's yard, when she was only twelve years of age. And there she continued to live to the day of her death, which took place in 1864, so that she was about ninety-one years of age at the time. Mr. Hughes adds that he remembers many of the old inhabitants besides his grandmother, who were perfectly familiar with the story he has put on record. But only two of them were alive when he wrote to me in 1881, and these were both over ninety years old, with their minds overtaken by the childishness of age. But it was only a short time since the death of another, who was, as he says, a walking library of tales about corpse candles, ghosts, and bendeth why mamma 65, or, the mother's blessing, as the fairies are usually called in Glamorgan. Mr. Hugh's father tried to prevent his children being taught any tales about ghosts, corpse candles, or fairies, but the grandmother found opportunities of telling them plenty, and Mr. Hughes vividly describes the effect on his mind when he was a boy, how frightened he used to feel, how he pulled the clothes over his head in bed. And how he half suffocated himself thereby under the effects of the fear with which the tales used to fill him. Then, as to the locality, he makes the following remarks There are few people who have not heard something or other about the old graveyard of the Quakers, which was made by Lydia Phil, a lady who lived at a neighboring farmhouse. Called Seth and Y Forest. This old graveyard lies in the eastern corner of the parish of Merthyr Tidfil, on land called Pantanas, as to the meaning of which there is much controversy. Some will have it that it is properly Pantyr Arrows, or the hollow of the stain, because travellers were sometimes stopped there overnight by the swelling of the neighbouring river. Others treat it as Pantyr Hanes, the hollow of the legend, in allusion to the following story. But before the graveyard was made, the spot was called Rhydy Grug, or the Ford of the Heather, which grows thereabouts in abundance. In front of the old graveyard towards the south the rivers Taff and Bargod, which some would make into Burgode or Shortwood, meet with each other, and thence rush in one over terrible cliffs of rock. In the recesses of which lie huge Sirwiny or cauldron-like pools, called respectively the Gerwen Fock, the Gerwen Four, and the Gerwen Gannel, where many a drowning has taken place. As one walks up over Terran Y C R W Y R, the Quakers rift, until Pantanas is reached, 
and proceeds northwards for about a mile and a half, one arrives at a farmhouse called Pen Craig Daff 66, the top of the Taff Rock. The path between the two houses leads through fertile fields, in which may be seen, if one has eyes to observe, small rings which are greener than the rest of the ground. They are, in fact, green even as compared with the greenness around them these are the rings in which Bendith Y. Mamau used to meet to sing and dance all night. If a man happened to get inside one of these circles when the fairies were there, he could not be got out in a hurry, as they would charm him and lead him into some of their caves, where they would keep him for ages, unawares to him. Listening to their music. The rings vary greatly in size, but in point of form they are all round or oval. I have heard my grandmother, says Mr. Hughes, reciting and singing several of the songs which the fairies sang in these rings. One of them began thus. Can you, can you, drwyy nos? Don Cio, Don Cio, A.R. Wayne Y. Rose. Why Ngoluniar Luad blows? Hapus. Why do I am I? Pa Bahanam Sydydyn Lan. Hebun Gofid Dan Ei Fran. Can you, Don Cio, A.R. Y. Tun 67. Deadwood Why do I am I? Singing, singing through the night. Dancing, dancing with our might. Where the moon the more doth light. Happy ever we. One and all of merry mean. Without sorrow are we seen. Singing, dancing on the green. Gladsome ever we. Here follows, in Mr. Hugh's own Welsh, a remarkable story of revenge exacted by the fairies. Why an un or canrafod a ethent hybio, Preswilei Amathur Yn Nhydyn Pantanus, R. Amzer H. W. N. N. W. Year Ode Bendith Y. Mamau Y. N. Imel Were A. M. L. A. G. Amri Go Perthanol Ido E. F. A fine lion tau grin gasineb Y. N. E. I. Finwis at Year, Atris Fustrog, Lesiac, a Chinawinic, Fel Y. Gal Y. H. W. Antic. M N Y C H Y Hiri Thai M L U Di Fod O Hi Di R Y W L W Y B R or K L E U Guard Adino or Di H W S B Y S W Y D E F Gon Hen Riabreg Fod Y Ford I Gale E U Guard Y N Digan Hod A C on Ido E F Rodi Gadro on H W Y R Aboru Idi Hi Year Hispisai Y Ford Ido Jirid Year H Y N A Ford Dimunai. Bodlanat I W Thelarau a Derbiniat in Tau Y Sifarwadid, Year H W N I Dod Fel Y Kenlin. E I Fod I R Dig Year Hall Go I B A Rai Year Od E U Hof and Gurchfan, A C on Idden Highway Unwaith Golly Y Tun Glass, Y Digiant, A C Na Dunt B Y T H M W Y I W Bini D R W Y E U Himweliadau A R Lee. Dilanad Year Amathur E I Kaifarwadid I R Litherin, a Coronwid E I Waith O Widiant. NID od year on o onant i w weld a dutu y co y n or a c y n li sane c u kanayada sonieris a glywood bob amzer y n dirtu o wain y rose nid o dim on y distor with trilwaraf y n ternasu o g y l c h e u hen a u hof and gurchfan hod year amather weneth and y n y co a C year old Y Guanwen Gwardla's Wedi Guthio Y Gawaf Adir E I said, A C M Dangasai Y Mesid Y N Arterchog Y N E U Lifrai Gwardlesion A Guanwenol. Andun Pridnon, R O L I R Hall M Gilio I Y S T Fellowed Y Gorlwen, Tri Year Ode Amathur Pantanas Y N Dyquilid Tua E I Gartref, Sifarfit with A G E F Gon Fod Biken A R Firth Dine, Y N Gwisco Hugen Gotch. A fan death jiferbin a g e f dadwiniad e i gled biken, don jiferio e i flane at year amather, a diwadid. Dial a daw. Y mat jerlaw. Seasiad year amather chwerthen, on year od rybeth y n adrikiad sarug a l l y m y g w r biken a g a barad ido daimlo y n hynad o animunol. Ikadig o nuswathio y n diwederak. Pen ode y tulu a r m e il juo i w gorf wisliod d y c h r wen w y d highway y n four yon gon d r w s t fell p e bid i y ti y n serthio i lor bendermwoku a c y n union a r o l r t w r f bidio.
Clywent y girio bijithiol a ganlin a dim y n ragar y n kale e u parablu y n yukal. Da dial. Pan od yir y d wedi kale e i fadi a c y n barret i gale e i jiwain i r iskibor, y n s y du y n r y w nasweth losquid e f fel nad od yir un diwisen na gwelten i w gale y n un man or co. ACNIS Galasai Neb Fod Wedi Gosad Year Y D A R Dan on Bendeth Y Mamau. Fel A G Y May Y N Naturial I N I Fetal Time Lod Year Amathur Y N for O Herwid Y Tiro, A C Ediferhood Y N E I Galen Darfod Ido Ariod Rando A Guthither Y N O L Cipharwitted Year Hen Reabrate, A C Feli D D W Y N Arno Digafaint A Chaseneb Bendeth Y Mamau. Dranoeth I R Nasweth Y Losquid Year Y D Fell Year Ode Y N Aralagu Y Difrod Akoswid Gon Y Tan. Wheelar G W R Biken A G I Dod Wedi E I Jifarfod Ikadig O Darnododal Y N Flaneral Y N E I Jifarfod Islewath A Chida Threm Herfiedial Pointiat E I Gledif Otto Gon Di Wedded. N I D Y W On Decro. Trod Gwineb Year Amathur C Y N Wind A R Marmor. A Safid Gon Al Y G W R Biken Y N O L, on B U Y C R Y N Hynet O W Y D N A C Anuliskar I Droy Otto, on A R O L Here Erfin Arno Trod Y N E I O L Gon Ofen Y N Sarug Beth Year Ode Year Amathur Y N E I Geisio. Year H W N A Hisbisod Ido E I Fod Y N Burfith Fodlin I A Dale Y Co Lee Year Ode E U Hoff and Gerchfan I Dife U Y N Don Islewaith. Aradi Kaniatad in I Difod in Pryd Y Duizent, on Yn Unig in Bideo Dial EU Lid Yn Helic Arno EF. Na, Od Yer a Tbiad Pender Final, Y Megair Y Brennan Wedi EI Roy Y Byd Ido Indial Arnet Hide It Half EI Alu A C N I D O E S Dim Un Galu A R Y Neb Y Gradigath A Bear Ido Gale EI Dinu Y W O L. D Croad Yer Amathur Ylo A R H Y N, on Y N Hen Ikadig Hisbisad Y G W R Biken Y Bid I Ido E F Syrat A I Beneth A R Y Mater A C Y Cos I F Y Bod Y Can Liniad On Ido Difod I W Jifarfod E F Y N Y Fan Hano Amzer Makludiad Hall Drenit. Adawad Year Amathur Difod I W Jifarfod A Fan Death Year Amzer Apwintidig O Amgilk Ido J Jifarfod A R Biken Kafid E F Eno Y N E I Aros a C his besod ito fod y peneth wedi istorid e i guys y n differfall. On gon fod e gair bob amzer y n angifen widiel y boisai y dialed bijathedig y n r h w y m o jimerid li a r y tolu, on a r jifrif e i edifurch e f na chasai digwid y n e i amzer e f n a c ido e i blant. Lonid dot h when n y grin lar a r fetal turfus glid your amather. A de Croad bendeth y mamau dalut e u him weliadau a r li ilwaitha m y n y c h y clywid sain e u serdoriath felisper y n kodi or co angel kainal y n istad y nos. Paziad canrif hybio heb i r dialed bijathetic gale e i gaiflani, a c er fod tolu pantanas y n kale e u had gofio y n or a c ilwaith, y boisai y n sik o digwid h w y r new y rack. Edo WRTH your glywed y wade. Da dial. Imgen affinicent a high ness eu bod yn barred i greed na fwasai dim yn difod or by githiad byth. Year od edifed pantanas yn keru a merch i derfedianid simidogithal a braswilii mun tyddyn or enw pen craig daf. Year od priotas y par deadwit i jimrid li y n hen ikadig with nasa a c im dangus i reini y c w p l uink y n hynid o fodlan i r immuniat tuluel a g od a r jimrid li. Year od y n amzer y nataligae thalid y darpar reg uink im wiliat a tholu e i darpar w r, a c year od eno led o w i d d rostidig y n baratodig gogifer a r akleser. Istad I Y Cumni A Dutu Y Tan I Adrod R H Y W Chwedlo Diferis or M W Y N Paseo Year Amzer, Per Y D Y Causant E U Dicrinu Y N Forgone Lays Tradegar Y N Dircha Fumigis O Wheelie Year Afon Y N Gwedi. Death Amzer Imdial. Ethent Al Allen I Rando A Glywent Y Lefred Islewaith, 
on NIDO DIM IW GLIWED on BROSHUES DRWST Y for WRTH RIADRO DROS GLOGWINI ERUTHRAL Y SERWINI. On den I chosen aros I rando yn here yon cyn in glywed year unlefred isle with yn derchifu I fini yn uch na swn y dwfr pan yn berlamu dros esquida y greg a c yn gwedi. Death year amzer. Nis gallant difulu beth year ode yn eir widow, a kymaint idod eu bra, au sindad fel nad allent lefer a year unger au gillet. Yn hen enid diquelicent ir ty a chyn idn isted credent yn dios fod year adialad yn kale ei ysgwyd idd ei sylfini gan r y w d w r f y 2 allen. Pan year od year all wedi kale eu parlizio gan fra, will feni fashion yn guthathur ei himdangosiad a r y b w r d d o u blame, year h w n od yn sefil yn agos ir fenestra. Beth year wyt yn ei geizio yma, y peth biken hager, holi un oer gwid fidolian. nid oes genif unrai negs a t, y gwr her defad, od a tibiad y feni fashion. On year wyf wedi kale fy anfon yma i adrod rhyw betho ag sydd ar digwit ir tolu hwn, a tholu erol or jamido geeth ag a daikon fad o did dordabidant, on gan i me durban y fath sarhat adir law y gwr du ag sydd y n eisted y n y cornel. ni fydd i me godi y len ag od y n cutio y daifadol alan o u galak. Atalog osoes y n dy fediant r y w y badith parth difidol re o onam a g a fid i y n diderol i n i gale e i glywed d w g hi allen a by un erol or gwid fidolian. Na naf, on y n unig hisbisu, fod kalen g w y r y f fell long a r y traith y n methu sirid y porthlet o herwid digalondid y pilot. A chida ei bod yn lefer y ger diwed daf di flanet o u g w y d d, na wid a neb i b a lo na fa fad. Dr w y is dot ei him wiliat hi, pediat y wed a goddess i o r a fon, on yn fuan a r o l idi de flanu, de croat isle with a kaihoedi. Death amzer dial. A c n i fidiat am here amzer. Year old y sinuliad wedi kale eu medianu a gormit o fra i fedru lefer year un ger, a c year old len o brother y n dean dig dros y neb pob un o anant. Death amzer idn i am wahanu, a c eth ridderch y mab i hebun gwerfil e i geriat firch to a fen craig daf, o b a sirni n i dyquelid bych. C y n imital d fun diweeder idn dingu bythal fidland ab i w gilid, P E heb weld y nail y lol b y t h on h when n y a c nat o dim a lie berry idn and gofio y e u gillet may y n debigal i r lank ridderch pan y n dyquilid gartref gale e i hun adafun i un o jilcode bendeth y mamau a c ina in e i hud denu i mun i un o u hogofa y n heron y sigfrain a c eno y b u Y may y n lawn bride i n i droy e i n gwineba y n o l tua fantanas a fen craig daf. Year old reini y bok gen and fotis y n mron gwalgofi. N i d od gandint year on drich fedel i b a lo i find i chwilio m dano, a c er chwilio y n mob man a fob li methwid y n glur a di fod o hydido, na chale ger o i hames. Ikadig i fini y n y cum mun ogof dandier al trig fani hen fudwi o adranus, yer h w n hefit a estirid y n duin, or e n w gwirid. Ethent y n mhen ikadig with nasa i ofen it o e f, a fed rai rodi idn't r y w y badith parth i w mab kaldagond i ikadig burpus. N i nath yer h y n a adradad h w n n w w r t h wenta on difnha y c l w y f a roy galic f w y n o b e t h i a l f y h a r yer m jilkiat. A r o l idn't e i hispisu y n g h y l c h m dangosiad y feni fashion y n g h y d a r lays wylifus a glyvesent y n derchifu o r afen y nos yer eth a r gal. His besod f idn't my wife farn fijethidig a r y tolu gon fendeth y mamau od wedi gada wedded y lank.
AC nat od o un diben idin fetal kale ei well bythh myak. On filai y gunalai ei im dangosiad yn hen osa, on dim yn eu hamzer highway. Pasi a year amzer hybio, a twitted year with nasa i fisod, er misod i flinidod, a chaskal with tat a mam ridderch at eu tadao. Year od y li o hide yn parho year on, on y priest will were yn nud yn barhouse, a c year od year at gofian m e i galetigeth yn darfod yn gyfl ym, under h when n y year od un yn disquil e i diquiliad yn ol yn barhouse. A C Y N Gobithio Mejus Y N Urban Gobath M Gale E I Weld Ilwaith. Bob Boru Guida Bod Doro Y War Y N Immigr Dros Garig Finadud Y Dwyrain Gwelid High Bob T Y W Y D D Y N Redag I Ben Bryn Bikin. A Chida Ligade Y N Orlon O Dograu Hyrethlon Silai I Bob Cypheriad I Edric Aganfid I R Y W Argol Fod E I Hanwilid Y N Dyquilid. On I Dim, Purpose. Canal dydd gwelid high isle with yn year un man, a fan in the lie year hall fell pelen irius gok o dan dros y terfinjilk, year od high eno. Edric i nes yn agos bod yn dal, a c y li e i henaid allen o ddydd i ddydd a r o l n wilden e i challen. Or dimed eth y ray s y dd y n edric dr w y y finestri i omd e u guasaneth idi, a c year old y pren almond y n coroni e i fen a i flager guerifol, on par high high i edric, on n i d od neb y n d o d. y n lawn o didio a c y n ed fed i r bed rod with turfin a r e i hollow bathian a i disquiliadal gon anju, a cludwid e i guadillion marwell i fin went hen gapple y fan. Pasi i blinadod hybio fell m w g, a c osa fell siscodian y boru, a c n i d od neb y n f y w a g od y n kofio ridderch, on the drotted e i galia disim with y n a m l. Dilas m finigo na wellwid year un offendeth y mamaua dutu y jimidogeth wedi e i galiat, a fideat sane e u serdoriath or nos hano allen. Year old Riddich Wedi Kale E I Hud Denu, I find Guida Bendeth Y Mamawe C F and A G E F I F F W R D D I W Hogoff. A R O L Ido Arozino Dros Ikadig O Darnodo Dao Fell Y Tibii, Gofanad M Ganiatad I Ditchwalid, Year H Way N A R W Y D D Ganiatad Ido Gon Y Brennan. Death Alan O R Ogoff, A C Year Old Y N Ganel D Y D D Braff. Er hall y n luyuchu odier finwis furfufin digumo. Serdad y n mlain o darren y sigfrain hide nes ido difod i olig capel y fan, on jimaint od e i sindad pan y gwelid nad od year un capel eno. Paulo year od wedi bod, a fa faint o amzer. Gaida thymlid au simusgetic cypheriat e i gamrau to a fen craig daf, cartriflu e i anwilid, on n i d od hi eno, a c n i d o d y n ad when year un dine a g o d eno chweth. n i fedrai gale gare o hanes e i gariad a chimerad y ray a brisuilliant eno my gwalgoft an i dod. Prisherad ilwaith tua fantanas, a c year od e i sindad y n f w y f y t h eno. n i d o d y n ad when year un o onant, a c n i wouldn't with a dim m dano in tau. Or dive death g w r y ti i fun, a c year od h w n n w y n kofio clywed e i dad c u y n adrod m lank a g od wedi mind y n disim with i gal or y s peth canod o flinidod y n o l, on na wid a neb i b a lo. Rifod new gilid terawu g w r y ti e i fon y n urban ridderch, Pa ana de flananad mun cod o l w c h a c n i c h l y w y d air o sun beth death o hano mwayak. In one of the centuries gone by, there lived a husbandman on the farm of Pantanas. And at that time the fairies used to pay frequent visits to several of the fields which belonged to him. He cherished in his bosom a considerable hatred for the noisy, boisterous, and pernicious tribe, as he called them and often did he long to be able to discover some way to rid the place of them. At last he was told by an old witch that the way to get rid of them was easy enough, 
and that she would tell him how to attain what he so greatly wished, if he gave her one evening's milking sixty-eight on his farm, and one morning's. He agreed to her conditions, and from her he received advice, which was to the effect that he was to plough all the fields where they had their favourite resorts, and that, if they found the green sward gone, they would take offence and never returned to trouble him with their visits to the spot. The husbandman followed the advice to the letter, and his work was crowned with success. Not a single one of them was now to be seen about the fields, and, instead of the sound of their sweet music, which used to be always heard rising from the coarse meadow land, the most complete silence now reigned over their favorite resort. He sowed his land with wheat and other grain, the verdant spring had now thrust winter off its throne, and the fields appeared splendid in their vernal and green livery. But one evening, when the sun had retired to the chambers of the west, and when the farmer of Pantanas was returning home, he was met by a diminutive being in the shape of a man, with a red coat on. When he had come right up to him, he unsheathed his little sword, and, directing the point towards the farmer, he said, Vengeance cometh. Fast it approacheth. The farmer tried to laugh, but there was something in the surly and stern looks of the little fellow which made him feel exceedingly uncomfortable. A few nights afterwards, as the family were retiring to rest, they were very greatly frightened by a noise, as though the house was falling to pieces. And, immediately after the noise, they heard a voice uttering loudly the threatening words and nothing more. Vengeance cometh. When, however, the corn was reaped and ready to be carried to the barn, it was, all of a sudden, burnt up one night, so that neither an ear nor a straw of it could be found anywhere in the fields. And now nobody could have set the corn on fire but the fairies. As one may naturally suppose, the farmer felt very much on account of this event, and he regretted in his heart having done according to the witch's direction, and having thereby brought upon him the anger and hatred of the fairies. The day after the night of the burning of the corn, as he was surveying the destruction caused by the fire, behold the little fellow, who had met him a few days before, met him again, and, with a challenging glance. He pointed his sword towards him, saying, It but beginneth. The farmer's face turned as white as marble, and he stood calling the little fellow to come back, but the dwarf proved very unyielding and reluctant to turn to him. But, after long entreaty, he turned back, asking the farmer, in a surly tone, what he wanted, when he was told by the latter that he was quite willing to allow the fields, in which their favourite resorts had been, to grow again into a green sward. And to let them frequent them as often as they wished, provided they would no further wreak their anger on him. No, was the determined reply, the word of the king has been given, that he will avenge himself on thee to the utmost of his power, and there is no power on the face of creation that will cause it to be withdrawn. The farmer began to weep at this, and, after a while, the little fellow said that he would speak to his lord on the matter, and that he would let him know the result, if he would come there to meet him at the hour of sunset on the third day after. The farmer promised to meet him. And, when the time appointed for meeting the little man came, he found him awaiting him, and he was told by him that his lord had seriously considered his request, but that, as the king's word was ever immutable. The threatened vengeance was to take effect on the family. On account, however, of his repentance, it would not be allowed to happen in his time or that of his children. That calmed the disturbed mind of the farmer a good deal. The fairies began again to pay frequent visits to the place, and their melodious singing was again heard at night in the fields around. A century passed by without seeing the threatened vengeance carried into effect. And, though the Pantanas, family were reminded now and again that it was certain sooner or later to come, nevertheless, by long hearing the voice that said, Vengeance cometh. They became so accustomed to it, that they were ready to believe that nothing would ever come of the threat. The heir of Pantanas was paying his addresses to the daughter of a neighboring landowner who lived at the farmhouse called Pen Craig Daff, and the wedding of the happy pair was to take place in a few weeks. And the parents on both sides appeared exceedingly content with the union that was about to take place between Tile two families. It was Christmas time, and the intended wife paid a visit to the family of her would-be husband. There they had a feast of roast goose prepared for the occasion. The company sat round the fire to relate amusing tales to pass the time, 
when they were greatly frightened by a piercing voice, rising, as it were, from the bed of the river 69, and shrieking. The time for revenge is come. They all went out to listen if they could hear the voice a second time, but nothing was to be heard save the angry noise of the water as it cascaded over the dread cliffs of the Kerwini. They had not long, however, to wait till they heard again the same voice rising above the noise of the waters, as they boiled over the shoulders of the rock, and crying. The time is come. They could not guess what it meant, and so great was their fright and astonishment, that no one could utter a word to another. Shortly they returned to the house, when they believed that beyond doubt the building was being shaken to its foundations by some noise outside. When all were thus paralyzed by fear, behold a little woman made her appearance on the table, which stood near the window. What dost thou, ugly little thing, want here? asked one of those present. I have nothing to do with thee, O man of the meddling tongue, said the little woman, but I have been sent here to recount some things that are about to happen to this family and another family in the neighborhood. Things that might be of interest to them. But, as I have received such an insult from the black fellow that sits in the corner, the veil that hides them from their sight shall not be lifted by me. Pray, said another of those present, if thou hast in thy possession any knowledge with regard to the future of any one of us that would interest us to hear, bring it forth. No, I will but merely tell you that a certain maiden's heart is like a ship on the coast, unable to reach the harbor because the pilot has lost heart. As soon as she had cried out the last word, she vanished, no one knew whither or how. During her visit, the cry rising from the river had stopped, but soon afterwards it began again to proclaim. The time of vengeance is come. Nor did it cease for a long while. The company had been possessed by too much terror for one to be able to address another, and a sheet of gloom had, as it were, been spread over the face of each. The time for parting came, and Riddich the heir went to escort Gwerfil, his lady love, home towards Pen Craig Daff, a journey from which he never returned. Before bidding one another goodbye, they are said to have sworn to each other eternal fidelity, even though they should never see one another from that moment forth, and that nothing should make the one forget the other. It is thought probable that the young man Riddich, on his way back towards home, got into one of the rings of the fairies, that they allured him into one of their caves in the raven's rift, and that there he remained. It is high time for us now to turn back towards Pantanas and Pen Craig Daff. The parents of the unlucky youth were almost beside themselves, they had no idea where to go to look for him, and, though they searched every spot in the place, they failed completely to find him or any clue to his history. A little higher up the country, there dwelt, in a cave underground, an aged hermit called Gwyrid, who was regarded also as a sorcerer. They went a few weeks afterwards to ask him whether he could give them any information about their lost son. But it was of little avail. What that man told them did but deepen the wound and give the event a still more hopeless aspect. When they had told him of the appearance of the little woman, and the doleful cry heard rising from the river on the night when their son was lost. He informed them that it was the judgment threatened to the family by the fairies that had overtaken the youth, and that it was useless for them to think of ever seeing him again, possibly he might make his appearance after generations had gone by. But not in their lifetime. Time rolled on, weeks grew into months, and months into years, until Riddich's father and mother were gathered to their ancestors. The place continued the same, but the inhabitants constantly changed, so that the memory of Riddich's disappearance was fast dying away. Nevertheless there was one who expected his return all the while, and hoped, as it were against hope, to see him once more. Every morn, as the gates of the dawn opened beyond the castellated heights of the east, she might be seen, in all weathers, hastening to the top of a small hill, and, with eyes full of the tears of longing, gazing in every direction to see if she could behold any sign of her beloved's return. But in vain. At noon, she might be seen on the same spot again, she was also there at the hour when the sun was wont to hide himself, like a red-hot ball of fire, below the horizon. She gazed until she was nearly blind, and she wept forth her soul from day to day for the darling of her heart. At last they that looked out at the windows began to refuse their service, and the almond tree commenced to crown her head with its virgin bloom. 
she continued to gaze, but he came not. Full of days, and ripe for the grave, death put an end to all her hopes and all her expectations. Her mortal remains were buried in the graveyard of the old chapel of the fan. 70. Years passed away like smoke, and generations like the shadows of the morning, and there was no longer anybody alive who remembered Ritterch, but the tale of his sudden missing was frequently in people's mouths. And we ought to have said that after the event no one of the fairies was seen about the neighborhood, and the sound of their music ceased from that night. Ritterch had been allured by them, and they took him away into their cave. When he had stayed there only a few days, as he thought, he asked for permission to return, which was readily granted him by the king. He issued from the cave when it was a fine noon, with the sun beaming from the bosom of a cloudless firmament. He walked on from the raven's rift until he came near the site of the fan chapel, but what was his astonishment to find no chapel there? Where, he wondered, had he been, and how long away? So with mixed feelings he directed his steps towards Pen Craig Daff, the home of his beloved one, but she was not there nor any one whom he knew either. He could get no word of the history of his sweetheart, and those who dwelt in the place took him for a madman. He hastened then to Pantanas, where his astonishment was still greater. He knew nobody there, and nobody knew anything about him. At last the man of the house came in, and he remembered hearing his grandfather relating how a youth had suddenly disappeared, nobody knew whither, some hundreds of years previously. Somehow or other the man of the house chanced to knock his walking stick against Ritterch, when the latter vanished in a shower of dust. Nothing more was ever heard of him. Before leaving Glamorgan, I may add that Mr. Sykes associates fairy ladies with Crymlyn Lake, between Britain Ferry and Swansea, but, as frequently happens with him, he does not deign to tell us whence begot the legend. It is also believed, he says at p. 35, that a large town lies swallowed up there, and that the graged and have turned the submerged walls to use as the superstructure of their fairy palaces. Some claim to have seen the towers of beautiful castles lifting their battlements beneath the surface of the dark waters, and fairy bells are at times heard ringing from these towers. So much by the way, we shall return to Crymlyn in Chapter 7. 12. The other day, as I was going to Gwent, I chanced to be in the Golden Valley in Herefordshire, where the names in the churchyard seem largely to imply a Welsh population, though the Welsh language has not been heard there for ages. Among others I noticed Joneses and Williamses in abundance at Abbey Door, Evanses and Bevans, Morgans, Prossers and Prices, not to mention Saces that is to say. Welshmen of English extraction or education a name which may also be met with in Little England in Pembrokeshire, and probably on other English-Welsh borders. Happening to have to wait for a train at the Abbey Door station, I got into conversation with the tenants of a cottage hard by, and introduced the subject of the fairies. The old man knew nothing about them, but his wife, Elizabeth Williams, had been a servant girl at a place called Pen Poach, which she pronounced with the Welsh guttural ch, she said that it is near Landilo Cresceny in Monmouthshire. It was about forty years ago when she served at Pen Poach, and her mistress' name was Evans, who was then about fifty years of age. Now Mrs. Evans was in the habit of impressing on her servant girls' minds, that, unless they made the house tidy before going to bed, and put everything in its place overnight, the little people the fairies. She thinks she called them would leave them no rest in bed at night, but would come and pinch them like. If they put everything in its place, and left the house tidy like, it would be all right, and nobody would do anything to them like. That is all I could get from her without prompting her which I did at length by suggesting to her that the fairies might leave the tidy servant's presence, a shilling on the hearth or the hob-like. Yes, she thought there was something of that sort, and her way of answering me suggested that this was not the first time she had heard of the shilling. She had never been lucky enough to have had one herself, nor did she know of anybody else that I had got it like. During a brief but very pleasant sojourn at Lenova in May, 1883, I made some inquiries about the fairies, and obtained the following account from William Williams, who now, in his seventieth year, works in Lady Lenova's garden. I know of a family living a little way from here at, or as they would now call it in English, whose ancestors, 
for generations ago, used to be kind to Bendith Y Mamau. And always welcomed their visits by leaving at night a basin full of bread and milk for them near the fire. It always used to be eaten up before the family got up in the morning. But one night a naughty servant man gave them instead of milk a bowlful of urine 71. They, on finding it out, threw it about the house and went away disgusted. But the servant watched in the house the following night. They found him out, and told him that he had made fools of them, and that in punishment for his crime there would always be a fool, i.e. an idiot, in his family. As a matter of fact, there was one among his children afterwards, and there is one in the family now. They have always been in a bad way ever since, and they never prosper. The name of the man who originally offended the fairies was. And the name of the present fool among his descendants is, Dot. For evident reasons it is not desirable to publish the names. William spoke also of a sister to his mother, who acted as servant to his parents. There were, he said, ten stepping stones between his father's house and the well, and on every one of these stones his aunt used to find a penny every morning, until she made it known to others, when, of course, the pennies ceased coming. He did not know why the fairies gave money to her, unless it was because she was a most tidy servant. Another Lenova gardener remembered that the fairies used to change children, and that a certain woman called Nanny Fock in that neighborhood was one of their offspring. And he had been told that there were fairy rings in certain fields not far away in Lenova Parish. A third gardener, who is sixty-eight years of age, and is likewise in Lady Lenova's employ, had heard it said that servant girls about his home were wont to sweep the floor clean at night. And to throw crumbs of bread about on it before going to bed. Lastly, Mrs. Gardner of Tile Chaff Lenova, who is ninety years of age, remembers having a field close to Capel Nuid near Blaine Mon, in Lenova Uchaf, pointed out to her as containing fairy rings. And she recollects hearing, when she was a child, that a man had got into one of them. He remained away from home, as they always did, she said, a whole year and a day, but she has forgotten how he was recovered. Then she went on to say that her father had often got up in the night to see that his horses were not taken out and ridden about the fields by Bendith Y. Mamau. For they were wont to ride people's horses late at night round the four comers of the fields, and thereby they often broke the horse's wind. This, she gave me to understand, was believed in the parish of Lenova and that part of the country generally. So here we have an instance probably of confounding fairies with witches. I have not the means at my command of going at length into the folklore of Gwent, so I will merely mention where the reader may find a good deal about it. I have already introduced the name of the credulous old Christian, Edmund Jones of the Tranch, he published at Trefeca in the year 1779 a small volume entitled, A Geographical, Historical, and Religious Account of the Parish of Aberystruth in the County of Monmouth, to which are added memoirs of several persons of note who lived in the said parish. In 1813, by which time he seems to have left this world for another, where he expected to understand all about the fairies and their mysterious life, a small volume of his was published at Newport, bearing the title. A Relation of Apparitions of Spirits in the County of Monmouth and the Principality of Wales, with other notable relations from England, together with observations about them, and instructions from them. Designed to confute and to prevent the infidelity of denying the being and apparition of spirits, which tends to irreligion and atheism. By the late Reverend Edmund Jones, of the Tranch. Naturally those volumes have been laid under contribution by Mr. Sykes, though the tales about apparitions in them are frequently of a ghastly nature, and sometimes loathsome, on the whole. They remind me more than anything else I have ever read of certain Breton tales which breathe fire and brimstone, all such begin to be now out of fashion in Protestant countries. I shall at present only quote a passage of quite a different nature from the earlier volume, p. 72, it is an interesting one, and it runs thus, it was the general opinion in times past, when these things were very frequent, that the fairies knew whatever was spoken in the air without the houses, not so much what was spoken in the houses. I suppose they chiefly knew what was spoken in the air at night. It was also said that they rather appeared to an uneven number of persons, to one, three, five, and, and oftener to men than to women. Thomas William Edmund, of Havadavil, 
an honest pious man, who often saw them, declared that they appeared with one bigger than the rest going before them in the company. With the notion that the fairies heard everything uttered out of doors may be compared the faculty attributed to the great magician king, Math of Mathenly, of hearing any whisper whatsoever that met the wind, see the Oxford Mabinogen, p. 60, and guests Mabinogen, 3. 219, see also this book, as to the same faculty belonging to the fairy people of the Koranians, and the strange precautions taken against them by the brothers Lud and Leavelys. Chapter 3. Fairy Ways and Words. Heavens defend me from that Welsh fairy. Shakespeare. I in the previous chapters, the fairy lore of the principality was hastily skimmed without any method. And I fear that, now I have to reproduce some of the things which I gleaned somewhat later, there will be, if possible, still less method. The general reader, in case he chances on these pages, will doubtless feel that, as soon as he has read a few of the tales, the rest seem to be familiar to him, and exceedingly tiresome. It may be, however, presume that all men anxious to arrive at an idea as to the origin among us of the belief in fairies, will agree that we should have as large and exhaustive a collection as possible of facts on which to work. If we can supply the data without stint, the student of anthropology may be trusted in time to discover their value for his inductions, and their place in the history of the human race. I. In the course of the summer of 188272 I was a good deal in Wales, especially Carnarvonshire, and I made notes of a great many scraps of legends about the fairies, and other bits of folklore. I will now string some of them together as I found them. I began at Trefry 73, in Nant Conwy, where I came across an old man, born and bred there, called Morris Hughes. He appears to be about seventy years of age, he formerly worked as a slater, but now he lives at Lanawest and tries to earn a livelihood by angling. He told me that fairies came a long while ago to Cowlid Farm, near Cowlid Lake, with a baby to dress, and asked to be admitted into the house, saying that they would pay well for it. Their request was granted, and they used to leave money behind them. One day the servant girl accidentally found they had also left some stuff they were in the habit of using in washing their children. She examined it, and, one of her eyes happening to itch, she rubbed it with the finger that had touched the stuff, so when she went to Lanoist Fair she saw the same fairy folks there stealing cakes from a standing, and asked them why they did that. They inquired with what eye she saw them, she put her hand to the eye, and one of the fairies quickly rubbed it, so that she never saw any more of them. They were also very fond of bringing their children to be dressed in the houses between Trefry and Lanawest, and on the flat land bordering on the Conwy they used to dance, frolic, and sing every moonlight night. Evan Thomas of Skubor Garrig used to have money from them. He has been dead, Morris Hughes said, over sixty years, he had on his land a sort of cowhouse where the fairies had shelter, and hence the pay. Morris, when a boy, used to be warned by his parents to take care lest he should be stolen by the fairies. He knew Thomas Williams of Bryn Syllty, or, as he was commonly called, T. W. M. Bryn Syllty, who was a changeling. He was a sharp, small man, afraid of nothing. He met his death some years ago by drowning near Egoe's Fock, when he was about sixty-three years of age. There are relatives of his about Lanois still, that is, relatives of his mother, if indeed she was his mother, O.S. Ode High End Fam Ido F.O., Int. Lastly, Morris had a tale about a mermaid cast ashore by a storm near Conway. She entreated the fishermen who found her to help her back into her native element, and on their refusing to comply she prayed them to place her tail at least in the water. A very crude rhyme describes her dying of exposure to the cold, thus. Why for forwin a r y traith? Creo gweduen a r w nath. Often why do I drice in dranoeth? Yer hin why an oer a rui nath. The stranded mermaid on the beach. Did sorely cry and sorely screech. Afraid to bide the morrow's breeze. The cold it came, and she did freeze. But before expiring, the mermaid cursed the people of Conway to be always poor, and Conway has ever since, so goes the tale, labored under the curse. So that when a stranger happens to bring a sovereign there, the Conway folk, 
if silver is required, have to send across the water to Lansenfraid for change. My next informant was John Duncan McLaren, who was born in 1812, and lives at Trefry. His father was a Scotsman, but McLaren is in all other respects a Welshman. He also knew the Skubor Garrig people, and that Evan Thomas and Laurie his wife had exceeding great trouble to prevent their son Roger from being carried away by the fairies. For the fairy maids were always trying to allure him away, and he was constantly finding fairy money. The fairy dance, and the playing and singing that accompanied it, used to take place in a field in front of his father's house. But Lori would never let her son go out after the son had gone to his battlements, A-R-O-L-I-R Holfendi Lori Gera. The most dangerous nights were those when the moon shone brightly, and pretty wreaths of mist adorned the meadows by the river. McLaren had heard of a man, whom he called Shaun Catron of Tin Twit, finding a penny every day at the pistil or water spout near the house, when he went there to fetch water. The flat land between Trefry and Lonawist had on it a great many fairy rings, and some of them are, according to McLaren, still to be seen. There the fairies used to dance, and when a young man got into one of the rings the fairy damsels took him away. But he could be got out unharmed at the end of a year and a day, when he would be found dancing with them in the same ring, he must then be dexterously touched by some one of his friends with a piece of iron and dragged out at once. This is the way in which a young man whom my notes connect with a place called Bringlass was recovered. He had gone out with a friend, who lost him, and he wandered into a fairy ring. He had Nushusanath time, and his friends brought him out at the end of the interval of a year and a day. But he could not be made to understand that he had been away more than five minutes, until he was asked to look at his new shoes, which were by that time in pieces. McLaren had also something to say concerning the history and habitat of the fairies. Those of Nant Conwy dress in green, and his mother, who died about sixty-two years ago, aged forty-seven, had told him that they lived seven years on the earth, seven years in the air, and seven years underground. He also had a mermaid tale, like that of Pergrin from Dyft. A fisherman from Mandrifto Yn Rose, between Colwyn and Landudno, had caught a mermaid in his net. She asked to be set free, promising that she would, in case he complied, do him a kindness. He consented, and one fine day, a long while afterwards, she suddenly peeped out of the water near him, and shouted, Shaun Ifen, C W I D D Y Rwida, a T H Y N Tuar Ian, John Evans, take up thy nets and make for the shore. He obeyed, and almost immediately there was a terrible storm, in which many fishermen lost their lives. The River Conwy is the chief haunt of the mysterious Afank, already mentioned, and McLaren stated that its name used to be employed within his memory to frighten girls and children, so much was it still dreaded. Perhaps I ought to have stated that McLaren is very fond of music, and that he told me of a gentleman at Conway who had taken down in writing a supposed fairy tune. I have made inquiries of the latter's son, Mr. Hennessy Hughes of Conway. But his father's papers seem to have been lost, so that he cannot find the tune in question, though he has heard of it. Whilst on this question of music let me quote from the LLWID letter in the Cambrian Journal for 1859, pp. 145-6, on which I have already drawn, pages 130-3, above. The passage in point is to the following effect. I will leave these tales aside whilst I go as far as the Ogo do, the Black Cave, which is in the immediate vicinity of Crixieth 74, and into which the musicians entered so far that they lost their way back. One of them was heard to play on his pipe, and another on his horn, about two miles from where they went in, and the place where the piper was heard is called Break Y Bib, and where the man with the horn was heard is called Break Y Corner. I do not believe that even a single man doubts but that this is all true, and I know not how the airs called Far Will Die, Why Pivot, Dick the Piper's Farewell, and Far Will D. W. M. Bach, Little Tom's Farewell, had those names. Only 4s it was from the musicians above mentioned. Nor do I know that Ned Pugh may not have been the third, and that the air called Far Will Ned Pugh, Ned Pugh's Farewell, may not have been the last he played before going into the cave. I cannot warrant this to be true, as I have only heard it said by one man, and he merely held it as a supposition, 
which had been suggested by this heir of Farwell die Y. Pibbet. A story, however, mentioned by Sindel in the Brithen for 1860, p. 57, makes Ned Pugh enter the cave of Tal Y. Kledger, which the writer in his article identifies with Ness Cliff, near Shrewsbury. In that cave, which was regarded as a wonderful one, he says the musician disappeared, while the air he was playing, Farwell Ned Pugh, Ned Pugh's farewell, was retained in memory of him. Some account of the departure of Ned Pugh and of the interminable cave into which he entered, will be found given in a rambling fashion in the Cambrian Quarterly Magazine, London, 1829, Volume 1, pp. 40-5, where the minstrel's Welsh name is given as Lolo A. P. Hu. There we are told that he was last seen in the twilight of a misty Halloween, and the notes of the tune he was last heard to play are duly given. One of the surmises as to Iolo's ultimate fate is also recorded, namely, that in the other world he has exchanged his fiddle for a bugle, and become huntsman-in-chief to Gwyn of Nudd, so that every Halloween he may be found cheering CWNN. The Hounds of the Other World, over Catteldris. 75. The same summer I fell in with Mr. Morris Evans, of Sarig Man, near Amlu. He is a mining agent on the Gwider estate in the Vale of Conwy, but he is a native of the neighborhood of Perry's Mountain, in Anglesey, where he acquired his knowledge of mining. He had heard fairy tales from his grandmother, Grace Jones, of LLWYN Isga near MYNYDD Mechelt, between Amlu and Holyhead. She died, nearly ninety years of age, over twenty years ago. She used to relate how she and others of her own age were wont in their youth to go out on bright moonlight nights to a spot near LLYNYBWCH. They seldom had to wait there long before they would hear exquisite music and behold a grand palace standing on the ground. The diminutive folks of Fairyland would then come forth to dance and frolic. The next morning the palace would be found gone, but the grandmother used to pick up fairy money on the spot, and this went on regularly so long as she did not tell others of her luck. My informant, who is himself a man somewhat over fifty-two, tells me that at a place not far from LLYNYBWCH there were plenty of fairy rings to be seen in the grass, and it is in them the fairies were supposed to dance seventy-six. From Lonoist I went up to see the bard and antiquary, Mr. Gethin Jones. His house was prettily situated on the hillside on the left of the road as you approached the village of Penmachno. I was sorry to find that his memory had been considerably impaired by a paralytic stroke from which he had suffered not long before. However, from his room he pointed out to me a spot on the other side of the Machno, called Wyworden, which means the green land, or more literally, the greenery, so to say. It was well known for its green, grassy fairy rings, formerly frequented by the TYLWYTH tag, and he said he could distinguish some of the rings even then from where he stood. The Worden is on the Benner, and the Bamar is the high ground between Penmachno and Dalwadellen. The spot in question is on the part nearest to the Conwy Falls. This name, Y. Worden, is liable to be confounded with I. Worden, Ireland, which is commonly treated as if it began with the definite article, so that it is made into Y. Worden and Worden. The fairy Worden, in the radical form Gwerden, not only recalls to my mind the green isles called Gwerden a lion, but also the saying, common in North Wales, that a person in great anxiety sees Y. Worden. Thus, for instance, a man who fails to return to his family at the hour expected, and believes his people to be in great anxiety about him, expresses himself by saying that they will have seen the workton on my account, me fidden, weddy gweld Y. Worden and Danae. Is that Ireland, or is it the land of the fairies, the other world, in fact? If the latter, it might simply mean they will have died of anxiety, but I confess I have not so far been able to decide. I am not aware that the term occurs in any other form of expression than the one I have given, if it had, and if the worden were spoken of in some other way, that might possibly clear up the difficulty. If it refers to Ireland, it must imply that sighting Ireland is equivalent to going astray at sea, meaning in this sort of instance, getting out of one's senses, but the Welsh are not very much given to nautical expressions. It reminds me somewhat of Gerald Griffin's allusion to the Phantom City. And the penalty paid by those who catch a glimpse of its turrets as the dividing waves expose them for a moment to view on the western coast of Ireland. 
soon closed the white waters to screen it. And the bodement, they say, of the wonderful sight, is death to the eyes that have seen it. The fairy glen above Betwes White Coed is called in Welsh foes Nodden, the sink of the abyss, but Mr. Gethin Jones told me that it was also called Glen Ytylwyth Teg, which is very probable, as some such a designation is required to account for the English name, the Fairy Glen. People on the Capel Garmin side used to see the Tylwyth playing there, and descending into the foes or glen gently and lightly without occasioning themselves the least harm. The Fairy Glen was, doubtless, supposed to contain an entrance to the world below. This reminds one of the name of the pretty hollow running inland from the railway station at Bangor. Why should it be called Nantufern, or, the hollow of hell? Can it be that there was a supposed entrance to the fairy world somewhere there? In any case, I am quite certain that Welsh place names involve allusions to the fairies much oftener than has been hitherto supposed. And I should be inclined to cite, as a further example, Mole Ilio 77, or Mole Elian, from the personal name Eilion, to be mentioned presently. Mole Eilion is a mountain under which the fairies were supposed to have great stores of treasure. But to return to Mr. Gethin Jones, I had almost forgotten that I have another instance of his in point. He showed me a passage in a paper which he wrote in Welsh some time ago on the antiquities of YSPYTY Eifen. He says that where the Sir joins the Conwy there is a cave, to which tradition asserts that a harpist was once allured by the Tylwyth Teg. He was, of course, not seen afterwards, but the echo of the music made by him and them on their harps is still to be heard a little lower down, under the field called to this day Guireglod y Telenorian. The Harper's Meadow, compare the extract from Edward Llwyd's correspondence above. Mr. Gethin Jones also spoke to me of the lake called Llwyn Pencraig, which was drained in hopes of finding lead underneath it, an expectation not altogether doomed to disappointment, and he informed me that its old name was Llyn Liffin. So the moor around it was called Gwain Liffin. It appears to have been a large lake, but only in wet weather, and to have no deep bed. The names connected with the spot are now Nant Gwain Liffin and the Gwaith, or mine, of Gwain Liffin, they are, I understand, within the township of Trefry. The name Llyn Liffin is of great interest when taken in connection with the triadic account of the cataclysm called the bursting of Llyn Lee, F. On. Mr. Gethin Jones, however, believed himself that Llyn Lion was no other than Bala Lake, through which the D makes her way. 2. One day in August of the same year, I arrived at Dinah Station, and walked down to Landrog in order to see Dinah's Danil, and to ascertain what traditions still existed there respecting Kair Arianrod, Lulagifs, Dylan Ileton, and other names that figure in the Mabinogi of Math of Mathenly. I called first on the schoolmaster, and he kindly took me to the clerk, Hugh Evans, a native of the neighborhood of Langefni, in Anglesey. He had often heard people talk of some women having once on a time come from Tregar Anthreg to C.A.R. Loda, a place near the shore, to fetch food or water and that when they looked back they beheld the town overflowed by the sea, the walls can still be seen at low water. Gwen Nan was the name of one of the women, and she was buried at the place now called Bed Gwen Nan, or Gwenin's grave. He had also heard the fairy tales of Wayne Four and Nant Y. Batus, narrated by the antiquary, Owen Williams of the former place. For instance, he had related to him the tale of the man who slept on a clump of rushes, and thought he was all the while in a magnificent mansion, see page 100, above. Now I should explain that Tregar Anthreg is to be seen at low water from Dinah's Dinl as a rock not far from the shore. The Caranthreg which it implies is one of the modern forms to which Kair Arianrod has been reduced. And to this has been prefixed a synonym of Kair, namely, Trafe, reduced to Tre, just as Carmarthen is frequently called Tre Gaferden. C.R. Loda, is explained as C.A.R. Elida, the field of the limbs. But I am sorry to say that I forgot to note the story explanatory of the name. It is given, I think, to a farm, and so is Bed Gwennan likewise the name of a farmhouse. The tenant of the latter, William Roberts, was at home when I visited the spot. He told me the same story, but with a variation, 
three sisters had come from Tregan Anraheg to fetch provisions, when their city was overflowed. Gwen fled to the spot now called Bed Gwen Nan, Elon to Tyddyn Elon, or Elon's Holding, and Malon to Rose Malon, or Malon's Moor, all three are names of places in the immediate neighborhood. From Dinah's Din Lai was directed across Lord Newborough's grounds at Glenillifon to Pen Y Gro Station, but on my way I had an opportunity of questioning several of the men employed at Glenlafon. One of these was called William Thomas Solomon, an intelligent middle-aged man, who works in the garden there. He said that the three women who escaped from the submerged city were sisters, and that he had learned in his infancy to call them Gwen Nan by Don, Elon by Don, and Malon by Don. Lastly, the name of the city, according to him, was Tregan Anthrod. I had the following forms of the name that day, Tregar Anraheg, Tregar Anthreg, Tregan Anraheg, Tregan Anthreg, and Tregan Anthrod. All these are attempts to reproduce what might be written Tregar Arianrod. The modification of NRH into NTHR is very common in North Wales, and Tregar Anarheg seems to have been fashioned on the supposition that the name had something to do with Anarheg, a gift. Tregan Anthrod is undoubtedly the Caer Arianrod, or Fortress of Arianrod, in the Mabinogi, and it is duly marked as such in a map of speeds at the spot where it should be. Now the Arianrod of the Mabinogi of Math could hardly be called a Lady of Rude Virtue, and it is the idea in the neighborhood that the place was inundated on account of the wickedness of the inhabitants. So it would appear that Gwen Nan, Elon, and Melon, Arianrod sisters, were the just ones allowed to escape. Arianrod was probably drowned as the principal sinner in possession. But I did not find, as I expected, that the crime which called for such an expiation was in this instance that of playing cards on Sunday. In fact, this part of the legend does not seem to have been duly elaborated as yet. I must now come back to Solomon's by Don, which puzzles me not a little. Arianrod was daughter of Don, and so several other characters in the same Mabinogi were children of Don. But what is by Dion? I have noticed that all the Welsh antiquaries who take Don out of books invariably call that personage Don or Don with a short O, which is wrong, and this has saved me from being deceived once or twice so I take it that by Don is. As Solomon asserted, a local expression of which he did not know the meaning. I can only add, in default of a better explanation, that by Don recalled to my mind what I had shortly before heard on my trip from Aberdaran to Bardsey Island. My wife and I, together with two friends, engaged, after much eloquent haggling, a boat at the former place, but one of the men who were to row us insinuated a boy of his, aged four, into the boat. An addition which did not exactly add to the pleasures of that somewhat perilous trip amidst incomprehensible currents. But the Aberdaran boatman always called that child by Don, which I took to have been a sort of imitation of an infantile pronunciation of Baby John, for his name was John. Which Welsh infants as a rule first pronounced Don, I can well remember the time when I did. This, applied to Gwen Nan by Don, would imply that Solomon heard it as a piece of nursery lore when he was a child, and that it meant simply Gwenon, baby, or child of Don. Lastly, the only trace of Dylan I could find was in the name of a small promontory, called variously by the Glenlafon men Pwn Main Tylan, which was Solomon's pronunciation, and Pwn Main Dullan. It is also known, as I was given to understand, as Pwn Y Wig, I believe I have seen it given in maps as Main Dylan Point. Solomon told me the following fairy tale, and he was afterwards kind enough to have it written out for me. I give it in his own words, as it is peculiar in some respects. Me r o g w r a greg y n b y w y n y garth dorwin 78 r y w jifnod maith y n o l a g ethent i gayer narfon i jiflogi morwin a r d d y d d fair glangief. A G year old Y N R period gone Phoebe and emerged Y per Y D H when N Y I R Ray old Y N Cephal Allen M Lefid Aros Y N top Y Maze Presenal W R T H Bon Can Loss old Y N Y Fan Y Lee Safe Y Post Office Presenal Eth year hen W R A R hen Ray get Y Fan Y M A a Gwellant and Eth Lon a Gwalt Melon Y N Cephal Chidegor Neil do I Bob Errol Eth year hen Ray A T I a Gofanat I R and Eth old Arnie Izio Lee. Eight bod fod, 
AG Feli Siflog would year in F Y N diode a death I W Li I R Amzer Penedidig. Me fit I Y N R period year adag H N N Y O Nidu A R O L Super Y N Hernos Y Gawaf, A G Fe fit I Y four one Y N M Y and I R Weirglad I Nidu W R T H Oliu Y lower. A G Fe fit I T Well W Y T H Teg Y N Dwad A T I Hi I R Weirglad I Ganu Adoncio. A R Y W Bride Y N Y Guanwin Pan S Dinod Y D Y D D Dian Got Ilian G Y D A R Tilwithian Teg I F F W R D D A G N I Wellwood M O N I M Y A K. May Y C A E Y Gwellwood High Dive Thaf Y N K L E I O Hide Y D Y D D Hedu Y N G Ilian A R Weirglod Y N Weirglod Y Forwin. Me R O D Hen Rag Y Garth Dorwin Y N R for Roy Graged Y N E U Gula. A bit I pob y n searchu and Danny o bob cypheriot. A r h y w bride dima w r bondig a r e i jeffel at y d r w s a r nasweth lower gan loat, a hitha y n glawio, chidig a g y n no braid, i nal year hen rigan at e i rag, a g felly eth y n skill y g w r diarth a r jeff and y march i rose y cart. A R Ganel Y Rose P R Y D H N N Y R Ode Ponkin Led Yukal Y N D Big I Hen Amdefinfia A Lar O Garig Marion A R E I Fen A Charn Four O Garig Y N Year Akur Ogle Dal Eighty A G May High I W Gweld Hide Y D Y D D Hedu Dan Year E N W Brin Y Pibian Pan Jirhadesan Y Li Ethan I Ogo Four A G Ethan I Staffel Li R Ode Y Rag Y N E I Gweli A R Li Crandia a welled year hen reg iriod. A G fe roth y reg y n e i gweli a g eth at y tan i dream y bobby. A G a r o l idi orphan dina y g w r y n d o d a fotel i r hen reg i hero ligade y bobby a g orphan arni by d o a i g w f f w r a i ligade e i hun. On R Y W Fod A R O L Roy Y Botel Hybio Fe Death Kosfa A R Ligade Year Hen Rag or Rubiad E I Ligade A R Un Bice A G Od Wedi Bod Y N Rubio Ligad Y Babin A Gwelet Hefo R Ligad H W N N W Y Rag Y N Gorft A R Dosen O F R W Y N A Redden Crinian Mun Ogo For O Garig Mar O Bob Two Idi A Chidic Bok O Dan Mun Rai Gornel a gwelled my eilian ode high, e i hen forwin, a g hefo r ligad arrow y n gweld y li crandia, a welled iriod. a g y n hen ikadik a r o l h n n y eth i r farchnad i gayer narfon a gwelled y g w r a gofanad idopa sub may edian. o y may hi y n bur da, med a i w r t h your hen rag, a fa ligad your y d y c h y n f y n gweld. Hifo H W N Med Di Hitho. Simarad Babwiran A G A I Tynet Allen A R Unwaith. An old man and his wife lived at the Garth Dorwin in some period a long while ago. They went to Carnarvon to hire a servant maid at the All Hallows 79 Fair. The custom then for young men and women who stood out for places to station themselves at the top of the present maze, by a little green eminence which was where the present post office stands. The old man and his wife went to that spot, and saw there a lass with yellow hair, standing a little apart from all the others, the old woman went to her and asked her if she wanted a place. She replied that she did, and so she hired herself at once and came to her place at the time fixed. In those times it was customary during the long winter nights that spinning should be done after supper. Now the maid servant would go to the meadow to spin by the light of the moon, and the TYLWYTH tag used to come to her to sing and dance. But some time in the spring, when the days had grown longer, Eileen escaped with the TYLWYTH tag, so that she was seen no more. The field where she was last seen is to this day called Eileen's Field, and the meadow is known as the Maid's Meadow. The old woman of Garth Dorwin was in the habit of putting women to bed, and she was in great request far and wide. Some time after Eileen's escape there came a gentleman on horseback to the door one pite when the moon was full, while there was a slight rain and just a little mist, to fetch the old woman to his wife. So she rode off behind the stranger on his horse, and came to Rose Wycart. Now there was at that time, 
in the center of the rows, somewhat of a rising ground that looked like an old fortification, with many big stones on the top, and a large cairn of stones on the northern side, it is to be seen there to this day. And it goes by the name of Bryn Y. Pibian, but I have never visited the spot. When they reached the spot, they entered a large cave, and they went into a room where the wife lay in her bed, it was the finest place the old woman had seen in her life. When she had successfully brought the wife to bed, she went near the fire to dress the baby, and when she had done, the husband came to the old woman with a bottle of ointment 80 that she might anoint the baby's eyes. But he entreated her not to touch her own eyes with it. Somehow after putting the bottle by, one of the old woman's eyes happened to itch, and she rubbed it with the same finger that she had used to rub the baby's eyes. Then she saw with that eye how the wife lay on a bundle of rushes and withered ferns in a large cave, with big stones all round her, and with a little fire in one corner. And she saw also that the lady was only Eileen, her former servant girl, whilst, with the other eye, she beheld the finest place she had ever seen. Not long afterwards the old midwife went to Carnarvon to market, when she saw the husband, and said to him, How is Eileen? She is pretty well, said he to the old woman, but with what eye do you see me? With this one, was the reply. And he took a bulrush and put her eye out at once. That is exactly the tale, my informant tells me, as he heard it from his mother, who heard it from an old woman who lived at Garth Dorwin when his mother was a girl, about eighty-four years ago, as he guessed it to have been. But in his written version he has omitted one thing which he told me at Glenlafon, namely, that, when the servant girl went out to the fairies to spin, an enormous amount of spinning used to be done. I mention this as it reminds me of the tales of other nations, where the girl who cannot spin straw into gold is assisted by a fairy, on certain conditions which are afterwards found very inconvenient. It may be guessed that in the case of Eileen the conditions involved her becoming a fairy's wife, and that she kept to them. Lastly, I should like the archaeologists of Carnarvonshire to direct their attention to Bryn Y. Pibian. For they might be expected to come across the remains there of a barrow or of a fort. 3. The same summer I happened to meet the Rev. Robert Hughes, of Uchlaw Arfinan, near Lanel Helhern, a village on which Treyar Siri, or the town of the Kiri, looks down in its primitive grimness from the top of one of the three heights of the Eiffel, or rivals as English people call them. The district is remarkable for the longevity of its inhabitants, and Mr. Hughes counted fifteen farmers in his immediate neighborhood whose average age was eighty-three. And four years previously the average age of eighteen of them was no less than eighty-five. He himself was, when I met him, seventy-one years of age, and he considered that he represented the traditions of more than a century and a half. As he was a boy of twelve when one of his grandfathers died at the age of ninety-two, the age reached by one of his grandmothers was all but equal, while his father died only a few years ago, after nearly reaching his ninety-fifth birthday. Storytelling was kept alive in the parish of Lanel Helhern by the institution known there as the Pilnos, or Peeling Night, when the neighbors met in one another's houses to spend the long winter evenings dressing hemp and carding wool. Though I guess that a Pilnos was originally the night when people met to peel rushes for rushlights. When they left these merry meetings they were ready, as Mr. Hughes says, to see anything. In fact, he gives an instance of some people coming from a tilhose across the mountain from Nant Gerthian to Lithfine. And finding the fairies singing and dancing with all their might, they were drawn in among them and found themselves left alone in the morning on the heather. Indeed, Mr. Hughes has seen the fairies himself, it was on the Poolhelly Road, as he was returning in the grey of the morning from the house of his fiancée when he was twenty-seven. The fairies he saw came along riding on wee horses, his recollection is that he now and then mastered his eyes and found the road quite clear, but the next moment the vision would return. And he thought he saw the diminutive cavalcade as plainly as possible. Similarly, a man of the name of Solomon Evans, when, thirty years ago, making his way home late at night through Glenlafon Park, found himself followed by quite a crowd of little creatures, which he described as being of the size of guinea pigs and covered with red and white spots. He was an ignorant man, who knew no better than to believe to the day of his death, some eight or nine years ago, that they were demons. 
This is probably a blurred version of a story concerning CWN and Hellhounds, such as the following, published by Mr. O. M. Edwards in his Simru for 1897, page 190, from Mr. J. H. Roberts' essay mentioned above at p. 148 ages ago as a man who had been engaged on business, not the most creditable in the world, was returning in the depth of night across Sefton Craney, and thinking in a downcast frame of mind over what he had been doing. He heard in the distance a low and fear-inspiring bark. Then another bark, and another, and then half a dozen and more. Ere long he became aware that he was being pursued by dogs, and that they were CWNN. He beheld them coming, he tried to flee, but he felt quite powerless and could not escape. Nearer and nearer they came, and he saw the shepherd with them, his face was black and he had horns on his head. They had come round him and stood in a semicircle ready to rush upon him, when he had a remarkable deliverance, he remembered that he had in his pocket a small cross, which he showed them. They fled in the greatest terror in all directions, and this accounts for the proverb, Mwy nar sithral at y grows, any more than the devil to the cross, dot. That is Mr. Robert's story, but several allusions have already been made to CWNN. It would be right probably to identify them in the first instance with the pack with which Aron, King of Anne, is found hunting by PWILT, King of Dyft, when the latter happens to meet him in Glen Cooch in his own realm. Then in a poem in the Black Book of Carmarthen we find Gwyn of Nudd with a pack led by Dormarth, a hound with a red snout which he kept close to the ground when engaged in the chase. Similarly in the story of Lolo of who the dogs are treated as belonging to Gwyn. But on the whole the later idea has more usually been, that the devil is the huntsman, that his dogs give chase in the air, that their quarry consists of the souls of the departed, and that their bark forebodes a death. Since they watch for the souls of men about to die. This, however, might be objected to as pagan, so I have heard the finishing touch given to it in the neighborhood of Istrad Murik, by one who, like Mr. Pug, explained that it is the souls only of notoriously wicked men and well-known evil livers. With this limitation the Pack 81 seems in no immediate danger of being regarded as poaching. To return to Lanel Helhern, it is right to say that good spirits too, who attend on good Calvinists, are there believed in. Morris Hughes, of Coombe Corin, was the first Calvinistic Methodist at Lanel Helhern. Hugh is great-grandfather to Robert Hugh's wife, and he used to be followed by two pretty little yellow birds. He would call to them, WRYD, WRYD. And they would come and feed out of his hand, and when he was dying they came and flapped their wings against his window. This was testified to by John Thomas, of Mulfer Bach, who was present at the time. Thomas died some twenty-five years ago, at the age of eighty-seven. I have heard this story from other people, but I do not know what to make of it, though I may add that the little birds are believed to have been angels. In Mr. Rees Welsh Saints, pages 305-6, GWRYD is given as the name of a friar who lived about the end of the 12th century, and has been commemorated on November, T, and the author adds a note referring to the Cambrian Register for 1800, Volume 3. P. 221 where it is said that GWRYD relieved the bard Inion of Gwalchmai of some oppression, probably mental, which had afflicted him for seven years. Is one to suppose that GWRYD sent two angels in the form of little birds to protect the first Lanel Helhern Methodist? The call, WRYD, WRYD, would seem to indicate that the name was not originally GWRYD, but WRYD, to be identified possibly with the Pictish name Uord in an inscription at St. Vigians, near our broth, and to be distinguished from the Welsh word GWRYD, valor, and from the Welsh name Gryad, representing what in its Gaulish form was Viriatus. We possibly have the name WRYD in half a WRYD, a place in the Machno Valley above Bet was Y Coed, otherwise one would have expected half a Y GWRYD, making colloquially, half a GWRYD. Mr. Hughes told me a variety of things about Nant Gerthian, one of the spots where the Vortigern story is localized. The Nant is a sort of a cul-de-sac hollow opening to the sea at the foot of the Eiffel. 
There is a rock there called Wyfarches, and the angle of the sea next to the old castle, which seems to be merely a mound, is called Ylwncln, or the Whirlpool, and this is perhaps an important item in the localizing of Vortigern city there. I was informed by Mr. Hughes that the grave of Alfin is in this Nant, with a raised church close by, both are otherwise quite unknown to me. Coming away from this weird spot to the neighborhood of Selenog, one finds that the pennard of the Mabinogi of Math is now called Penarth, and has on it a well-known cromlech. Of course, I did not leave Mr. Hughes without asking him about Kaer Arianrod, and I found that he called it Trey Geir Anerheg, he described it as a stony patch in the sea, and it can, he says, be reached on foot when the ebb is at its lowest in spring and autumn. The story he had heard about it when he was a boy at school with David Thomas, better known by his bardic name of Daphid Ddu Arari, was the following. Traeger Anerheg was inhabited by a family of robbers. And among other things they killed and robbed a man at Glen Irch, near the further wall of Glenidifon Park, this completed the measure of their lawlessness. There was one woman, however, living with them at Traeger Anerheg, who was not related to them, and as she went out one evening with her pitcher to fetch water, she heard a voice crying out, Dos I ben y brin I weft rifidot, that is. Go up the hill to see a wonder. She obeyed, and as soon as she got to the top of the hill, whereby was meant Dinah's dintel, she beheld Traeger Anerheg sinking in the sea. As I have wandered away from the fairies I may add the following curious bit of legend which Mr. Hughes gave me, when St. Buno lived at Selenog, he used to go regularly to preach at Landwin on the opposite side of the water, which he always crossed on foot. But one Sunday he accidentally dropped his book of sermons into the water, and when he had failed to recover it a jilfin here, or curlew, came by, picked it up, and placed it on a stone out of the reach of the tide. The saint prayed for the protection and favor of the Creator for the GYLFN here, it was granted, and so nobody ever knows where that bird makes its nest. 4. One day in August of the same summer I went to have another look at the old inscribed stone at Jessail Jifark 82, near Tremadoc, and, instead of returning the same way, I walked across to Cricket Station. But on my way I was directed to call at a farmhouse called LLWINY Mafanuchaf, where I was to see Mr. Edward Llewellyn, a bachelor then seventy-six years of age. He is a native of the neighborhood, and has always lived in it. Moreover, he has now been for some time blind. He had heard a good many fairy tales. Among others he mentioned John Roberts, a slater from the Garn, that is Carn Dalbanmain, as having one day, when there was a little mist and a drizzling rain, heard a crowd of fairies talking together in great confusion near a sheepfold on Whitmore Mountain. But he was too much afraid to look at them. He also told me of a man at Istam Sejid, a farm not far off, having married a fairy wife on condition that he was not to touch her with any kind of iron on pain of her leaving him forever. Then came the usual accident in catching a horse in order to go to a fair at Carnarvon, and the immediate disappearance of the wife. At this point Mr. Lulan's sister interposed to the effect that the wife did once return and address her husband in the rhyme, OSBYDD and with Arfi Mab, and, see pages 44, 55 above. Then Mr. Lulan enumerated several people who are of this family, among others a girl, who is, according to him, exactly like the fairies. This made me ask what the fairies are like, and he answered that they are small unprepossessing creatures, with yellow skin and black hair. Some of the men, however, whom he traced to a fairy origin are by no means of this description. The term there for men of fairy descent is Belsiade, and they live mostly in the neighboring parish of Pennant, where it would never do for me to go and collect fairy tales, as I am told, and Mr. Lulan remembers the fighting that used to take place at the fairs at Penmorpha if the term Belsiade once began to be heard. Mr. Lulan was also acquainted with the tale of the midwife that went to a fairy family, and how the thieving husband had deprived her of the use of one eye. He also spoke of the fairies changing children, and how one of these changelings, supposed to be a baby, expressed himself to the effect that he had seen the acorn before the oak, and the egg before the chick, but never anybody who brewed ale in an eggshell, cp. 62 above. 
As to modes of getting rid of the changelings, a friend of Mr. Lulin's mentioned the story that one was once dropped into the Glasslin River, near Bedgelert. The sort of children the fairies liked were those that were unlike their own. That is, bairns whose hair was white, or inclined to yellow, and whose skin was fair. He had a great deal to say of a certain Ellis Bach of Nant Gerthian, who used to be considered a changeling. With the exception of this changing of children the fairies seem to have been on fairly good terms with the inhabitants, and to have been in the habit of borrowing from farmhouses a padel and grattle for baking. The grattle is a sort of round flat iron, on which the dough is put, and the padel is the patella or pan put over it, they are still commonly used for baking in North Wales. Well, the fairies used to borrow these two articles, and by way of payment to leave money on the hob at night. All over lane the TYLWYTH are represented as borrowing padel a grattle. They seem to have never been very strong in household furniture especially articles made of iron. Mr. Llewellyn had heard that the reason why people do not see fairies nowadays is that they have been exorcised, wedi eu hafermu, for hundreds of years to come. About the same time I was advised to try the memory of Miss Jane Williams, who lives at the Greg, Tremadoc, she was then, as I was told, seventy-five, very quick-witted, but by no means communicative to idlers. The most important information she had for me was to the effect that the TYLWYTH tag had been exorcised away, wedi frimu, and would not be back in our day. When she was about twelve she served at the jelly between Tremadoc and Pont Aberglaslin. Her master's name was Shaun Ifen, and his wife was a native of the neighborhood of Carnarvon. She had many tales to tell them about the TYLWYTH, how they changed children, how they allured men to the fairy rings, and how their dupes returned after a time in a wretched state, with hardly any flesh on their bones. She heard her relate the tale of a man who married a fairy, and how she left him. But before going away from her husband and children she asked the latter by name which they would like to have, a dirty cowyard, butch's futter, or a clean cowyard, butch's lawn. Some gave the right answer, a dirty cowyard, but some said a clean cowyard, the lot of the latter was poverty, for they were to have no stock of cattle. The same question is asked in a story recorded by the late Rev. Elias Owen, in his Welsh folklore, page 8283, his instance belongs to the neighborhood of Pentrevilas, in Denbyshire. V. When I was staying at Pultholy the same summer, I went out to the neighboring village of Four Crosses, and found a native of the place, who had heard a great many curious things from his mother. His name was Lewis Jones, he was at the time over eighty, and he had formerly been a saddler. Among other things, his mother often told him that her grandmother had frequently been with the fairies, when the latter was a child. She lived at Place du, and once she happened to be up near Carn Benterch when she saw them. She found them resembling little children, and playing in a brook that she had to cross. She was so delighted with them, and stayed so long with them, that a search was made for her, when she was found in the company of the fairies. Another time, they met her as she was going on an errand across a large bog on a misty day, when there was a sort of a drizzle, which one might call either dew or rain, as it was not decidedly either, but something between the two. Such as the Welsh would call Glithlaw, du rain. She loitered in their company until a search was made for her again. Lewis Jones related to me the story of the midwife he pronounced it in Welsh, midwife who attended on a ferry. As in the other versions, she lost the sight of one eye in consequence of her discovering the gentleman ferry thieving, but the fair at which this happened was held in this instance at Nephim. He related also how a farmer at Pennant had wedded a fairy called Bella. This tale proceeded like the other versions, and did not even omit the fighting at Penmorpha, see pages 89, 93, 220. He had likewise the tale about the two youths who had gone out to fetch some cattle, and came, while returning about dusk, across a party of fairies dancing. The one was drawn into the circle, and the other was suspected at length of having murdered him, until, at the suggestion of a wizard, he went to the same place at the end of a year and a day, then he found him dancing, and managed to get him out. He had been reduced to a mere skeleton, but he inquired at once if the cattle he was driving were far ahead. 
Jones had heard of a child changed by the fairies when its mother had placed it in some hay while she worked at the harvest. She discovered he was not her own by brewing in an eggshell, as usual. Then she refused to take any notice of him, and she soon found her own baby returned, but the latter looked much the worse for its sojourn in the land of the TYLWYTH tag. My informant described to me Ellis Bach of Nant Gerthiern, already mentioned, page 221, who died somewhat more than forty years ago. His father was a farmer there, and his children, both boys and girls, were like ordinary folks, excepting Ellis, who was deformed, his legs being so short that his body seemed only a few inches from the ground when he walked. His voice was also small and squeaky. However, he was very sharp, and could find his way among the rocks pretty well when he went in quest of his father's sheep and goats, of which there used to be plenty there formerly. Everybody believed Ellis to have been a changeling, and one saying of his is still remembered in that part of the country. When strangers visited Nant Gerthiern, a thing which did not frequently happen, and when his parents asked them to their table, and pressed them to eat, he would squeak out drilly, Buta, Nina Buta R C W B W L, that is to say, Eating that means eating all we have. He told me further that the servant girls used formerly to take care to bring a supply of water indoors at the approach of night, that the fairies might find plenty in which to bathe their children, for fear that they might use the milk instead. If water was wanting. Moreover, when they had been baking, they took care to leave the fairies both padel and graddle, that they might do their baking in the night. The latter used to pay for this kindness by leaving behind them a cake of fairy bread and sometimes money on the hob. I have, however, not been able to learn anything about the quality or taste of this fairy food. He had also a great deal to say about the making of bonfires about the beginning of winter. A bonfire was always kindled on the farm called Cromlech on the eve of the winter kalends or nos gallen geef, as it is termed in Welsh. And the like were to be seen in abundance towards Lithfine, Carnguch, and Lanel Helhern, as well as on the Marioneth side of the bay. Besides fuel, each person present used to throw into the fire a small stone, with a mark whereby he should know it again. If he succeeded in finding the stone on the morrow, the year would be a lucky one for him, but the contrary if he failed to recover it. Those who assisted at the making of the bonfire watched until the flames were out, and then somebody would raise the usual cry, when each ran away for his life, lest he should be found last. This cry, which is a sort of equivalent, well known over Carnarvonshire, of the English saying, The devil take the hindmost, was in the Welsh of that county. Year HWCH, DDU Gouda 84. Agipio R. Ola. That is to say, may the black sow without a tail seize the hindmost. The cutty black sow is often alluded to nowadays to frighten children in Arfon, and it is clearly the same creature that is described in some parts of North Wales as follows. HWCHDDU Gouda. AR Bob Kampha. YN Nidu Achardio. Bob Nos Glengia. A cutty black sow. On every style. Spinning and carding. Every All Hallows Eve. In Cardiganshire this is reduced to the words. Nos Galangia. Watch A.R. Bob Kampha. On All Hallows Eve. A bogey on every style. Welsh people speak of only three Kalans Kalanmai, or the first of May, Kalangief, the Kalans of winter, or All Hallows. And why Kalan, or the Kalans par excellence, that is to say, the first day of January, which last is probably not Celtic but Roman. The other two most certainly are, and it is one of their peculiarities that all uncanny spirits and bogies are at liberty the night preceding each of them. The HWCHDDU Gouda is at large on All Hallows' Eve, and the Scottish Gaels have the name, Samanac, for any All Hallows' demon, formed from the word Samhain, All Hallows. The eve of the first of May may be supposed to have been the same, as may be gathered from the story of Rhiannon's baby and of Ternan's colt, both of which were stolen by undescribed demons that night I allude to the Mabinogi of Poole. Prince of Dyft. 6. At Nefin, in Lane 85, I had some stories about the TYLWYTH tag from Lori Hughes, the widow of John Hughes, who lives in a cottage at Pen Isar Dref, 
and is over seventy-four years of age. An aunt of hers, who knew a great many tales, had died about six years before my visit, at the advanced age of ninety-six. She used to relate to Lori how the TYLWYTH were in the habit of visiting Singrug, a house now in ruins on the land of Pen Isar Dref. And how they had a habit of borrowing a padel and grattle for baking, they paid for the loan of them by giving their owners a loaf. Her grandmother, who died not long ago at a very advanced age, remembered a time when she was milking in a corner of the land of Karnbudwan, and how a little dog came to her and received a blow from her that sent it rolling away. Presently, she added, the dog reappeared with a lame man playing on a fiddle, but she gave them no milk. If she had done so, there was no knowing, she said, how much money she might have got. But, as it was, such singing and dancing were indulged in by the TYLWYTH around the lame fiddler that she ran away as fast as her feet could carry her. Lori's husband had also seen the TYLWYTH at the break of day, near Madron Mill, where they seemed to have been holding a sort of conversazione. But presently one of them observed that he had heard the voice of the hen's husband, and off they went instantly then. The fairies were in the habit also of dancing and singing on the headland across which the, the old earthworks called Din Lane. When they had played and enjoyed themselves enough, they used to lift a certain bit of sod and descend to their own land. My informant had also heard the midwife story, and she was aware that the fairies changed people's children. In fact, she mentioned to me a farmhouse not far off where there was a daughter of this origin then, not to mention that she knew all about Ellis Bach. Another woman whom I met near Porth Dintland said, that the Dintland fairies were only seen when the weather was a little misty. At Neffin, Mr. John Williams, a law lane, got from his mother the tale of the midwife. It stated that the latter lost the sight of her right eye at Neffin Fair, owing to the fairy she there recognized, pricking her eye with a green rush. During my visit to Aberdaran, my wife and I went to the top of MYNYD Analog, and on the way up we passed a cottage, where a very illiterate woman told us that the TYLWYTH tag formerly frequented the mountain when there was mist on it. That they changed people's children if they were left alone on the ground, and that the way to get the right child back was to leave the fairy urchin without being touched or fed. She also said that, after baking, people left the grattle for the fairies to do their baking, they would then leave a cake behind them as pay. As for the fairies just now, they have been exorcised, Weddy Frimo, for some length of time. Mrs. Williams, of PWTT Deaf Aid, told me that the rock opposite, called Clip Y Gilfanir, on Bodwi Dog Mountain, a part of MYNYDY Rai, was the resort of the TYLWYTH Teg, and that they reveled there when it was covered with mist. She added that a neighboring farm, called Badermud ISA, was well known at one time as a place where the fairies came to do their baking. But the most remarkable tale I had in the neighborhood of Aberdaran was from Evan Williams, a smith who lives at Year Ark Loss, on Rose Herwin. If I remember rightly, he is a native of Laneyeston, and what he told me relates to a farmer's wife who lived at the Nant, in that parish. Now this old lady was frequently visited by a fairy who used to borrow Padel a grattle from her. These she used to get, and she returned them with a loaf borne on her head in acknowledgement. But one day she came to ask for the loan of her troll bock, or wheel for spinning flax. When handing her this, the farmer's wife wished to know her name, as she came so often, but she refused to tell her. However, she was watched at her spinning, and overheard singing to the whir of the wheel. Bike in a widow, hi. My silly go DWT. YWFENWI. Little did she know. That silly go DWT. Is my name. This explains to some extent the silly frit sung by a Korean fairy when she came out of the lake to spin, see page 64 above. At first I had in vain tried to make out the meaning of that bit of legend, but since then I have also found the Laneyeston rhyme a little varied at Lamberis, it was picked up there, I do not exactly know how, by my little girls this summer. The words as they have them run thus. Bike in a widow, hi. My TRWT Wantraton. YWFENWI. 
Here, instead of silly go DWT or silly frit, the name is TRWT Wantraten, and these doggerels at once remind one of the tale of Rumpelstiltchen. But it is clear that we have as yet only the merest fragments of the whole, though I have been thus far unable to get any more. So one cannot quite say how far it resembled the tale of Rumpelstiltchen, there is certainly one difference, which is at once patent, namely, that while the German Rumpelstiltchen was a male fairy. Our Welsh silly frit or silly go DWT is of the other sex. Probably, in the Laneyeston tale, the borrowing for baking had nothing to do with the spinning, for all fairies in Lane borrow a padel and a grattle, while they do not usually appear to spin. Then may we suppose that the spinning was in this instance done for the farmer's wife on conditions which she was able to evade by discovering the fairy helper's name. At any rate one expects a story representing the farmer's wife laid under obligation by the fairy, and not the reverse. I shall have an opportunity of returning to this kind of tale in chapter 10. The smith told me another short tale, about a farmer who lived not long ago at Dunant, close to Aberdaran. The latter used, as is the wont of country people, to go out a few steps in front of his house every night to before going to bed. But once on a time, while he was standing there, a stranger stood by him and spoke to him, saying that he had no idea how he and his family were annoyed by him. The farmer asked how that could be, to which the stranger replied that his house was just below where they stood, and if he would only stand on his foot he would see that what he said was true. The farmer complying, put his foot on the other's foot, and then he could clearly see that all the slops from his house went down the chimney of the other's house, which stood far below in a street he had never seen before. The fairy then advised him to have his door in the other side of his house, and that if he did so his cattle would never suffer from the CLWY BYR 86. The result was that the farmer obeyed, and had his door walled up and another made in the other side of the house, ever after he was a most prosperous man, and nobody was so successful as he in rearing stock in all that part of the country. To place the whole thing beyond the possibility of doubt, Evan Williams assured me that he had often seen the farmer's house with the front door in the back. I mention this strange story in order to compare it, in the matter of standing on the fairy's foot, with that of standing with one's foot just inside a fairy ring. Compare also standing on a particular sod in Dyfed in order to behold the delectable realm of Rhys DDWFN's children, see page 158 above. 7. Soon afterwards I went to the neighborhood of Abersock and Leningan, where I was lucky enough to find Professor Owen of St. David's College, Lampeter, since appointed Bishop of St. David's, on a visit to his native place. He took me round to those of the inhabitants who were thought most likely to have tales to tell, but I found nothing about the fairies except the usual story of their borrowing Padella Grattle, and of their changing children. However, one version I heard of the process of recovering the stolen child differs from all others known to me, it was given us by Margaret Edwards, of Pentre Bach, whose age was then eighty-seven. It was to the effect that the mother, who had been given a fairy infant, was to place it on the floor, and that all those present in the house should throw a piece of iron at it. This she thought was done with the view of convincing the TYLWYTH tag of the intention to kill the changeling, and in order to induce them to bring the right child back. The plan was, we are told, always successful, and it illustrates, to my thinking, the supposed efficacy of iron against the fairies. On the way to Abersock I passed by an old-fashioned house which has all the appearance of having once been a place of considerable importance. And on being told that its name is Castlemarch, I began thinking of March of Merchant mentioned in the triads. He, I had long been convinced, ought to be the Welsh reflex of Labraid Lork, or the Irish king with horse's ears. And the corresponding Greek character of Midas with ass's ears is so well known that I need not dwell on it. So I undertook to question various people in the neighborhood about the meaning of the name of Castlemarch. Most of them analyzed it into Castel Y March, the Castle of the Steed, and explained that the knight of the shire or some other respectable obscurity kept his horses there. This treatment of the word is not very decidedly countenanced by the pronunciation, which makes the name into one word strongly accented on the middle syllable. It was further related to me how Castlemarch was once upon a time inhabited by a very wicked and cruel man, 
one of whose servants, after being very unkindly treated by him, ran away and went on board a man of war. Some time afterwards the man of war happened to be in Cardigan Bay, and the runaway servant persuaded the captain of the vessel to come and anchor in the Tudwell Roads. Furthermore he induced him to shell his old master's mansion. And the story is regarded as proved by the old bullets now and then found at Castlemarch. It has since been suggested to me that the bullets are evidence of an attack on the place during the Civil War, which is not improbable. But having got so far as to find that there was a wicked, cruel man associated with Castlemarch, I thought I should at once hear the item of tradition which I was fishing for, but not so, it was not to be wormed out in a hurry. However, after tiring a very old blacksmith, whose memory was far gone, with my questions, and after he had in his turn tired me with answers of the kind I have already described. I ventured to put it to him at last whether he had never heard some very silly tale about the Lord of Castlemarch, to the effect that he was not quite like other men. He at once admitted that he had heard it said that he had horse's ears, but that he would never have thought of repeating such nonsense to me. This is not a bad instance of the difficulty which one has in eliciting this sort of tradition from the people. It is true that, as far as regards Castlemarch, nothing, as it happens, would have been lost if I had failed at Aversock, for I got the same information later at Sarnfiltiern. Not to mention that after coming back to my books, and once more turning over the leaves of the Brithen, I was delighted to find the tale there. It occurs at page 431 of the volume for 1860. It is given with several other interesting bits of antiquity, and at the end the editor has put Edward LLWID, 1693, so I suppose the whole comes from letters emanating from the great LHWID, for so, or rather Lloyd, he preferred to write his name. It is to the following effect. One of Arthur's warriors, whose name was March or Parch, M. Herkian 87, was Lord of Castlemarch in Lane. This man had horse's ears, resembling Midas, and lest anybody should know it, he used to kill every man he sought to shave his beard, for fear lest he should not be able to keep the secret. And on the spot where he was wont to bury the bodies there grew reeds, one of which somebody cut to make a pipe. The pipe would give no other sound than, March M. Herkian has horse's ears. When the warrior heard this, he would probably have killed the innocent man on that account, if he had not himself failed to make the pipe produce any other sound. But after hearing where the reed had grown, he made no further effort to conceal either the murders or his ears. This story of Edward LLWIDs clearly goes back to a time when some kind of a pipe was the favorite musical instrument in North Wales, and not the harp. 8. Some time ago I was favored with a short but interesting tale by Mr. Evan Lloyd-Jones, of Dinerwig, near Lanbaris. Mr. Lloyd-Jones, I may here mention, publicified not long ago, in Lays Y Lad, Bangor, North Wales, and in the DRYCH, Utica, United States of North America. A series of articles entitled Len Y Wherein Y N Sir Gernerfon or the Folklore of Carnarvonshire. I happened to see it at a friend's house, and I found at once that the writer was passionately fond of antiquities. And in the habit of making use of the frequent opportunities he has in the Dinerwood quarries for gathering information as to what used to be believed by the people of Arfon and Anglesey. The tale about to be given relates to a lake called Marchlin Mar, or the Great Horse Lake, for there are two lakes called Marchlin, they lie near one another, between the Frontwid, in the parish of Landagai, and the Elider. In the parishes of Lanthanielen and Lanbaris. Mr. Lloyd Jones shall tell his tale in his own words. Am Jilkiner y Marchlin Mar gone Gregian Urchil year Oligarnant. A diwed tre dodiad diarfad i un o phibian y rywan eighty eight unwaith tra y en sin orthwyo daffid o e d, wedi serthio i r cryjo i diodio dino, darganfad o gof anfirth, eeth i fun edi a gwelet e i bod y en fawn o dreiserau a c r fau gwerth for. On gan e i bod y en de krutai willu, a dringo i finu y en orchwil an hod hide y en nod y en goli war d y d, eeth a dref y nauswaith hano, a boru dranoeth a r laziad y d y d saichfnod ilwaith i r ogof, a c heb lar o drafferth death o hide edi, eeth i jun. 
A decruad edric o i am gilk a r y tricerau od eno a r ganel year ogaf year od b w r d in four o or per a c a r y b w r d d goran o or a furlo d lod y n y fan my koran a thrisarau arthur edin nesset at y b w r d. A fan ect y n estin e i la i jimerid gayful y n y goran d y c h r wan w y d e f gan d r w s t urchil. TRWST Megis Mill O Darren A Y N M Y Go H E I Ben A C Ethier Hall O Can Die Wild A R A Fagdu. Seziat M Bafalu O Dino Jint A G Y Galai. Han Y. I Jirid I Ganel Y Cryjo Taflot E I Oleg A R Y L L Y N. Yer H W N O E D Wedi E I Jin Haifu Droid O D Dana Brigwinian Y N K L E U Lukio T R W Y Dan Diskithrog Y Cryjo Hide Y Men Yer O E D F Y N Cephalarno. On try your old Y N Parho I Silu A R Ganel Y L L Y N Gwilai G W R W G L Other Or Benewad Pridforthaf Y Disjainad Ligad Unrai Dine Arnant Iriad Indo Y N Ked E I Rwifo Y N Bricer Tuag Ad In Naw Yer Ogaf. On dock. Year OED Gallic off Nadwi year HWN OED YN Wifo YN Digon Iberi Isa O Fra Trui Y Dine Cryfaf. Gallad Y Lank Rifad Dyank Adref on Den I Fu Yechid YN EI Jifan Sadiat A R O L H Wen N Y A Bai Dai Hide YN Nod C R Y B W Y L L E N W Y March Lin YN EI Glywedigeth YN Digon I W Yuru YN Walgoff. The Marchlin Mar is surrounded by rocks terrible to look at, and tradition relates how one of the sons of the farmer of Rywin, once on a time, when helping a sheep that had fallen among the rocks to get away, discovered a tremendous cave there. He entered, and saw that it was full of treasures and arms of great value. But, as it was beginning to grow dark, and his clambering back was a difficult matter even in the light of day, he went home that evening, and next morning with the grey dawn he set out again for the cave, when he found it without much trouble. He entered, and began to look about him at the treasures that were there. In the center of the cave stood a huge table of pure gold, and on the table lay a crown of gold and pearls. He understood at once that they were the crown and treasures of Arthur. He approached the table, and as he stretched forth his hand to take hold of the crown he was frightened by an awful noise, the noise, as it were, of a thousand thunders bursting over his head, and the whole place became as dark as Tartarus. He tried to grope and feel his way out as fast as he could. When he had succeeded in reaching to the middle of the rocks, he cast his eye on the lake, which had been stirred all through, while its white-crested waves dashed through the jagged teeth of the rocks up to the spot on which he stood. But as he continued looking at the middle of the lake he beheld a coracle containing three women, the fairest that the eye of man ever fell on. They were being quickly rowed to the mouth of the cave. But the dread aspect of him who rowed was enough to send thrills of horror through the strongest of men. The youth was able somehow to escape home, but no health remained in his constitution after that, and even the mere mention of the March Lynn in his hearing used to be enough to make him insane. Mr. Lloyd Jones appends to the tale a note to the following effect There is a small eminence on the Thor of the March Lynn Mar, in the parish of Landegai called Bryn C W R W G L, or the Hill of the Coracle. And Ogoff Y March Lynn, or the March Lynn Cave, is a name familiar enough to everybody in these neighborhoods. There were some unless he ought to say that there still are some who believed that there was abundance of treasure in the cave. Several young men from the quarries, both of the CAE and of Dinerwick, have been in the midst of the March Lynn rocks, searching for the cave, and they succeeded in making their way into a cave. They came away, however, without the treasures. One old man, Robert Edwards, Iowarth Sardis, used to tee him that he and several others had, brought ropes from the quarry to go into the cave, but that they found no treasure. So far, I have given the substance of Mr. Jones' words, to which I would add the following statement, which I have from a native of Dinerwig about seventy years ago. When the gentry were robbing the poor of these districts of their houses and of the lands which H. the latter had enclosed out of the commons. An old war nan called Sion William of the Garn was obliged to flee from her house with her baby the latter was known later in life as the Rev. Robert Ellis, of Iscoldy in her arms. 
It was in one of the Marchland caves that she found refuge for a day and night. Another kind of tale connected with the March Lynn Mar is recorded in the Poes Land Club's collections, History and Arch, Volume 15, p. 137, by the Reverend Elias Owen, to the effect that a man who was fishing in the lake found himself enveloped in the clouds that had descended from the hills to the water. A sudden gust of wind cleared a road through the mist that hung over the lake, and revealed to his sight a man busily engaged in thatching a stack. The man, or rather the fairy, stood on a ladder. The stack and ladder rested on the surface of the lake. 9. Mr. E. S. Roberts, of Landicilio School, near Langolton, has sent me more bits of legends about the fairies. He heard the following from Mr. Thomas Perry, of Tan Y. Coed Farm, who had heard it from his father, the late Evan Perry, and the latter from Thomas Morris, of Egoiseg who related it to him more than once, Thornas Morris happened to be returning home from Langollen very late on one Saturday night in the middle of the summer, and by the time he reached near home the day had dawned. When he saw a number of the TYLWYTH tag with a dog walking about hither and thither on the declivity of the Egoiseg rocks, which hung threateningly overhead. When he had looked at them for some minutes, he directed his steps towards them, but as they saw him approaching they hid themselves, as he thought, behind a large stone. On reaching the spot, he found under the stone a hole by which they had made their way into their subterranean home. So ends the tale as related to Mr. Roberts. It is remarkable as representing the fairies looking rather like poachers. But there are not wanting others which speak of their possessing horses and greyhounds, as all gentlemen were supposed to. One of Mr. Roberts' tales is in point, he had it from Mr. Hugh Francis 89 of Holyhead House, Rithin, and the latter heard it from Robert Roberts, of Amlo, who has now been dead about thirty years, about one hundred and five years ago there lived in the parish of Landifrydog, near Lanarch Y. Med, in Anglesey. A man named Ifan Gruffied, whose cow happened to disappear one day. Han Gruffied was greatly distressed, and he and his daughter walked up and down the whole neighborhood in search of her. As they were coming back in the evening from their unsuccessful quest, they crossed the field called after the Diferdog thief, C.A.E. Lay de Diferdog, where they saw a great number of little men on ponies quickly galloping in a ring. They both drew nigh to look on, but Han Gruffy T.S. daughter, in her eagerness to behold the little knights more closely, got unawares within the circle in which their ponies galloped, and did not return to her father. The latter now forgot all about the loss of the cow, and spent some hours in searching for his daughter, but at last he had to go home without her, in the deepest sadness. A few days afterwards he went to Minidwin to consult John Roberts, who was a magician of no mean reputation. That wise man told Han Gruffig to be no longer sad, since he could get his daughter back at the very hour of the night of the anniversary of the time when he lost her. He would, in fact, then see her riding round in the company of the TYLWYTH tag whom he had seen on that memorable night. The father was to go there accompanied by four stalwart men, who were to aid him in the rescue of his daughter. He was to tie a strong rope round his waist, and by means of this his friends were to pull him out of the circle when he entered to seize his daughter. He went to the spot, and in due time he beheld his daughter riding round in great state. In he rushed and snatched her, and, thanks to his friends, he got her out of the fairy ring before the little men had time to think of it. The first thing Ifan's daughter asked him was, if he had found the cow, for she had not the slightest reckoning of the time she had spent with the fairies. Whilst I am about it, I may as well go through Mr. Robert's contributions. The next is also a tale related to him by Mr. Hugh Francis, and, like the last, it comes from Anglesey. Mr. Francis' great-grandfather was called Robert Francis, and he had a mill at Aberfraw about one hundred years ago. And the substance of the following tale was often repeated in the hearing of Mr. Robert's informant by his father and his grandfather, in winter Robert Francis used to remain very late at work drying corn in his kiln. As it was needful to keep a steady fire going, he used to go backwards and forwards from the house, looking after it not unfrequently until it was two o'clock in the morning. Once on a time he happened to leave a cauldron full of water on the floor of the kiln, and great was his astonishment on returning to find two little people washing themselves in the water. 
he abstained from entering to disturb them, and went back to the house to tell his wife of it. Oh, said she, I they are fairies. He presently went back to the kiln and found that they were gone. He fancied they were man and wife. However, they had left the place very clean, and to crown all, he found a sum of money left by them to pay him, as he supposed, for the water and the use of the kiln. The ensuing night many more fairies came to the kiln, for the visitors of the previous night had brought their children with them, and the miller found them busy bathing them and looking very comfortable in the warm room where they were. The pay that night was also more considerable than the night before, as the visitors were more numerous. After this the miller never failed to leave a vessel full of water in the kiln every night, and the fairies availed themselves of it for years, until, in fact, they took offense at the miller telling the neighbors of the presence of money which had been left him in the kiln. Thenceforth no fairies were known to frequent the kiln belonging to the Aberfra mill. The last tale communicated to me by Mr. Roberts is the following, which he elicited from Margaret Davies, his housekeeper, by reading to her some of the fairy legends published in the Simrador a short while ago probably the Corian series, one of which bears great resemblance to hers. Mrs. Davies, who is sixty-one years of age, says that when her parents, Edward, Anne and Williams, lived at Rosladen, near Bryngelwise, in Yale, some seventy-five years ago. The servant man happened one day in the spring to be ploughing in a field near the house. As he was turning his team back at one end of the field, he heard someone calling out from the other end, Why may I use your whole NYNY pill, or, the peel wants a nail. For pill is the English peel, a name given to a sort of shovel provided with a long handle for placing loaves in an oven, and for getting them out again. When at length the ploughman had reached the end of the field whence he guessed the call to have proceeded, he there saw a small peel, together with a hammer and a nail, under the hedge. He saw that the peel required a nail to keep it together, and as everything necessary for mending it were there ready to hand, he did as it had been suggested. Then he followed at the plough tail until he came round again to the same place, and there he this time saw a cake placed for him on the spot where he had previously found the peel and the other things, which had now disappeared. When the servant related this to his master, he told him at once that it was one of the TYLWYTH tag of that locality that had called out to him. With this should be compared the story of the man who mended a fairy's plough vice, see above. X. Early this year I had occasion to visit the well-known Hangert Library at Peniarth, and during my stay there Mr. Wynne very kindly took me to see such of the Lanegren people as were most likely to have somewhat to say above the fairies. Many of the inhabitants had heard of them, but they had no long tales about them. One man, however, told me of a William Pritchard, of Pentre Bach, near LLWINGWRYL, who died at sixty, over eighty years ago, and of a Reese Williams, the clerk of Langelinen, how they were going home late at night from a cockfight at Lanegrin. And how they came across the fairies singing and dancing on a plot of ground known as Gwastad Mirianid, the plain of Marianeth, on the way from LLWINGWR 3RL to Lanegrin. It consists, I am told by Mr. Robert Roberts of Lanegrin, of no more than some twenty square yards, outside which one has a good view of Cardigan Bay and the heights of Marianeth and Carnarvonshire, while from the Gwastad itself neither sea nor mountain is visible. On this spot, then, the belated cockfighters were surrounded by the fairies. They swore at the fairies and took to their heels, but they were pursued as far as Claude do. Also I was told that Elan Egrin, the authoress, some sixty years ago, of some poetry called Telen Egrin, had also seen fairies in her youth, when she used to go up the hills to look after her father's sheep. This happened near a little brook, from which she could see the sea when the sun was in the act of sinking in it, then many fairies would come out dancing and singing, and also crossing and recrossing the little brook. It was on the side of Rifelin, and she thought the little folks came out of the brook somewhere. She had been scolded for talking about the fairies, but she firmly believed in them to the end of her life. This was told me by Mr. W. Williams, the tailor, who is about sixty years of age, and also by Mr. Rollins, the ex-bailiff of Peniarth, who is about seventy-five. I was moreover much interested to discover at Lanegrin a scrap of Kelpie story, 
which runs as follows, concerning Llyn Guernan. Situated close to the old road between Dolgetli and Lanegrin. As a man from the village of Lanegrin was returning in the dusk of the evening across the mountain from Dolgetli, he heard, when hard by Llyn Guernan, a voice crying out from the water. Death year or on den I ithith why dine. The hour is come but the man is not. As the villager went on his way a little distance, what should meet him but a man of insane appearance, and with nothing on but his shirt. As he saw the man making full pelt for the waters of the lake, he rushed at him to prevent him from proceeding any further. But as to the sequel there is some doubt, one version makes the villager conduct the man back about a mile from the lake to a farmhouse called Differden, which was on the former's way home. Others seem to think that the man in his shirt rushed irresistibly into the lake, and this I have no doubt comes nearer the end of the story in its original form. Lately I have heard a part of a similar story about LLYNCYNNWCH, which has already been mentioned, page 135 above. My informant is Miss Lucy Griffith, of Glenmalden, near Dolgelty, a lady deeply interested in Welsh folklore and Welsh antiquities generally. She obtained her information from a Dolgety ostler, formerly engaged at the Ship Hotel, to the effect that on GWIL Gallon, the eve of New Year's Day, a person is seen walking backwards and forwards on the strand of CYNNWCH Lake. Crying out. May our or Wedi Daifod AR Dine Heb Typhod. The hour is come while the man is not. The ostler stated also that lights are to be seen on Kader Idris on the eve of New Year's Day, whatever that statement may mean. The two lake stories seem to suggest that the lake spirit was entitled to a victim once a year, whether the sacrifice was regarded as the result of accident or design. By way of comparison, one may mention the notion, not yet extinct, that certain rivers in various parts of the kingdom regularly claim so many victims, for some instances at random see an article by Mr. J. M. McKinley, on traces of river worship in Scottish folklore, a paper published in the preceding S of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, 31895-6, pages 69-76. Take for example the following rhyme. Bloodthirsty D. Each year needs three. But Bonnie Dawn. She needs none. Or this. Tweed said to Till. What gars you rin sae still? Till said to Tweed I drun twa. Though ye tin y speed. An I rin slaw. Yet war ye drun a e man. I drun twa. 11. In the neighborhood of Istrad Murig, between the TFI and the YSTWYTH basins, almost everybody can relate tales about the fairies. But not much that is out of the ordinary run of such stories elsewhere. Among others, Isaac Davies, the smith living at Istrad Murig, had heard a great deal about fairies, and he said that there were rings belonging to them in certain fields at Tan Y. Greg and at Lanifan. Where the rings were, there the fairies danced until the ground became red and bare of grass. The fairies were, according to him, all women, and they dressed like foreigners, in short cotton dresses reaching only to the knee joint. This description is somewhat peculiar, as the idea prevalent in the country around is, that the fairy ladies had very long trains, and that they were very elegantly dressed. So that it is a common saying there, that girls who dress in a better or more showy fashion than ordinary look like TYLWYTH tag, and the smith confessed he had often heard that said. Similarly Howells, pp. 113, 121-2, finds the dresses of the fairies dancing on the Frenny, in the northeast of Pembrokeshire, represented as indescribably elegant and varying in color. And those who, in the month of May, used to frequent the prehistoric encampment of Moden 90 or Moden from which a whole canter takes its name in central Cardiganshire as fond of appearing in green. While blue petticoats are said, he says, to have prevailed in the fairy dances in North Wales 91. Another showed me a spot on the other side of the TFI, where the TYLWYTH tag had a favorite spot for dancing. And at the neighboring village of SWYDD Finnan, another meadow was pointed out as their resort on the farm of Dole Bidey. According to one account I had there, the fairies dressed themselves in very long clothes, 
and when they danced they took hold of one another's enormous trains. Besides the usual tales concerning men enticed into the ring and retained in fairy for a year and a day, and concerning the fairy's dread of Prince Serdingen or Mountain Ash, I had the midwife tale in two or three forms. Differing more or less from the versions current in North Wales. For the most complete of them I am indebted to one of the young men studying at the grammar school, Mr. D. Ledrodrian Davies. It used to be related by an old woman who died some thirty years ago at the advanced age of about one hundred. She was Polly, mother of old Rachel Evans, who died seven or eight years ago, when she was about eighty. The latter was a curious character, who sometimes sang masswed, or rhymes of doubtful propriety, and used to take the children of the village to see fairy rings. She also used to see the TYLWYTH, and had many tales to tell of them. But her mother, Polly, had actually been called to attend at the confinement of one of them. The beginning of the tale is not very explicit, but, anyhow, Polly one evening found herself face to face with the fairy lady she was to attend upon. She appeared to be the wife of one of the princes of the country. She was held in great esteem, and lived in a very grand palace. Everything there had been arranged in the most beautiful and charming fashion. The wife was in her bed with nothing about her but white, and she fared sumptuously. In due time, when the baby had been born, the midwife had all the care connected with dressing it and serving its mother. Polly could see or hear nobody in the whole place but the mother and the baby. She had no idea who attended on them, or who prepared all the things they required, for it was all done noiselessly and secretly. The mother was a charming person, of an excellent temper and easy to manage. Morning and evening, as she finished washing the baby, Polly had a certain ointment given her to rub the baby with. She was charged not to touch it but with her hand, and especially not to put any near her eyes. This was carried out for some time, but one day, as she was dressing the baby, her eyes happened to itch, and she rubbed them with her hand. Then at once she saw a great many wonders she had not before perceived, and the whole place assumed a new aspect to her. She said nothing, and in the course of the day she saw a great deal more. Among other things, she observed small men and small women going in and out, following a variety of occupations. But their movements were as light as the morning breeze. To move about was no trouble to them, and they brought things into the room with the greatest quickness. They prepared dainty food for the confined lady with the utmost order and skill, and the air of kindness and affection with which they served her was truly remarkable. In the evening, as she was dressing the baby, the midwife said to the lady, You have had a great many visitors today. To this she replied, How do you know that? Have you been putting the ointment to your eyes? Thereupon she jumped out of bed, and blew into her eyes, saying, Now you will see no more. She never afterwards could see the fairies, however much she tried, nor was the ointment entrusted to her after that day. According, however, to another version which I heard, she was told, on being found out, not to apply the ointment to her eyes any more. She promised she would not. But the narrator thought she broke that promise, as she continued to see the fairies as long as she lived. Mr. D. L. L. Davies has also a version like the North Wales ones. He obtained it from a woman of seventy-eight at Bronant, near Aberystwyth, who had heard it from one of her ancestors. According to her, the midwife went to the fair called Fair Rose, which was held between Istrad Murig and Pont Rhyd Fendigade 92 there she saw a great many of the TYLWYTH very busily engaged, and among others the lady she had been attending upon. That being so, she walked up to her and saluted her. The fairy lady angrily asked how she saw her and spat in her face, which had the result of putting an end forever to her power of seeing her or anybody of her race. The same aged woman at Bronant has communicated to Mr. D. L. L. Davies another tale which differs from all those of the same kind that I happen to know of. On a certain day in spring the farmer living at, Mr. Davies does not remember the name of the farm, lost his calves, and the servant man and the servant girl went out to look for them, but as they were both crossing a marshy flat, the man suddenly missed the girl. He looked for her, and as he could not see her he concluded that she was playing a trick on him. However, after much shouting and searching about the place, 
he began to think that she must have found her way home, so he turned back and asked if the girl had come in, when he found to his surprise that nobody had seen her come back. The news of her being lost caused great excitement in the country around, since many suspected that he had for some reason put an end to her life, some accounted for it in this way, and some in another. But as nothing could be found out about her, the servant man was taken into custody on the charge of having murdered her. He protested with all his heart, and no evidence could be produced that he had killed the girl. Now, as some had an idea that she had gone to the fairies, it was resolved to send to, the wise man, Y dine HYSBYS. This was done, and he found out that the missing girl was with the fairies, the trial was delayed, and he gave the servant man directions of the usual kind as to how to get her out. She was watched at the end of the period of twelve months and a day coming round in the dance in the fairy ring at the place where she was lost, and she was successfully drawn out of the ring. But the servant man had to be there in the same clothes as he had on when she left him. As soon as she was released and saw the servant she asked about the calves. On the way home she told her master, the servant man, and the others, that she would stay with them until her master should strike her with iron but they went their way home in great joy at having found her. One day, however, when her master was about to start from home, and whilst he was getting the horse and cart ready, he asked the girl to assist him, which she did willingly. But as he was bridling the horse, the bit touched the girl and she disappeared instantly, and was never seen from that day forth. I cannot explain this story, unless we regard it as made up of pieces of two different stories which had originally nothing to do with one another, consistency, however, is not to be expected in such matters. Mr. D. L. L. Davies has kindly given me two more tales like the first part of the one I have last summarized, also one in which the missing person, a little boy sent by his mother to fetch some barn for her, comes home of himself after being a Y a year or more playing with the TYLWYTH tag, whom he found to be very nice, pleasant people. They had been exceedingly kind to him, and they even allowed him to take the bottle with the barn. Home at the last. This was somewhere between SWYDD Finnan and Carmarthen. Mr. D. I. L. Davies finds, what I have not found anywhere else, that it was a common idea among the old people in Cardiganshire, that once you came across one of the fairies you could not easily be rid of him. Since the fairies were little beings of a very devoted nature. Once a man had become friendly with one of them, the latter would be present with him almost everywhere he went, until it became a burden to him. However, popular belief did not adopt this item of faith without another to neutralize it if necessary, so if one was determined to get rid of the fairy companion, one had in the last resort only to throw a piece of rusty iron at him to be quit of him forever. Nothing was a greater insult to the fairies. But though they were not difficult to make friends of, they never forgave those who offended them, forgiveness was not an element in their nature. The general account my informant gives of the outward appearance of the fairies as he finds them in the popular belief, is that they were a small handsome race, and that their women dressed gorgeously in white. While the men were content with garments of a dark grey colour, usually including knee breeches. As might be expected, the descriptions differ very much in different neighbourhoods, and even in different tales from the same neighbourhood, this will surprise no one. It was in the night they came out, generally near water, to sing and dance, and also to steal whatever took their fancy, for thieving was always natural to them, but no one ever complained of it, as it was supposed to bring good luck. 12. Mr. Richard L. Davies, teacher of the board school at Estelifera, in the Taw Valley, has been kind enough to write out for me a budget of ideas about the Coombe Taw Fairies. As retailed to him by a native who took great delight in the traditions of his neighborhood, John Davies, Sean Orbant, who was a storekeeper at Estelifra. He died an old man about three years ago. I give his stories as transmitted to me by Mr. Davies, but the reader will find them a little hazy now and then. As when the fairies are made into ordinary conjurer's devils. Rybeth Rift Y W Year Hen Gastel Ina Don Oligu Craig Wynys Janon Year Wyf Yn Kofia Year Amzer Pan Y Bida I Yn Dyc Hryn Gon Bobble Fine Yn Agos Otto Yn and Wedig Ynos 
Year OED YN DRA Faraglis Rag I Dine Gale EI Gymerit at Bendeth EU Mamau. Fe Diweeter Fod Word OR Rhini Ina, Er Na WN IPA Lo Y Ment YN CAD. Our OED Year Hen Babble YN Arforal O Dwade Fod PWLL YN Ryle Bron Canal Y Castell, To Alathan O Lead, ACYN Bump New Chwech Lath O Diffender, A Charreg To A Their Tinnel O Bwysa AREI YNEB E. A bod for Dan Y Dear Gandon or PWLL HNN Y Bob Cam I Ogoff Tan Year Ogoff, Bron Blaine Y Coom, Y Anagos I Ballas Adelina Patty, SEF Kastel. Craig Y Nos, My Eno Y Mate Y N Trulio E U Hamzer Y N Y D Y D, A C Y N Difod Lore Y M A I Chweru E U Transio Y X Y Nos. May Gandant, Mead N H W, Iskal or O un new DWI AR Hugine OFF, AR Hide Hano Y Mate Y N Tramwe I Fine A C I Lore. May Gandant Air Bach, A Demond I R Blaine F A R Year Iskal Diwoded Y Gar H N N Y, May Y Garreg Y N Cody O Honi E I Hunan, A Gar Errol, On I R Olaf W R T H Find I Lore E I Diwoded, May Y N Cod A R E U Hole. Diweeder I was un or firmit Sifagos WRTH Twilio M Ningit Y N Y Greg, D Y G W Y D D Diwade Y Gare Pan A R B W Y S Y Garreg, E D Agar, A C Edo in Tau Find I Lore Yer Iskal, Ant M Na Wide A Y Gare I God A R E I O L. Fay Adnabo Y T Y L W Y T H W R T H Y Draft Y N Diffid Y Canwalau Fod Rybeth O Lu, Deathant M E I Draws, Simarisant E F Atint, a BU guide a HWN YN BYW AC YN BOD and Seth Mind. Imhen Y Seth Mind Fay Dian God Alon DI Het O Guineas Gando. Year Od F Urban HYN Wedi Disku Y Dao Air, AC YN Gwai Bod Lar M EU Kutches NHW. Fay Diwadot HWN Y CWBL WRTH Farmer or Jimdegeeth, Fay ETH HWN NW Drachef Ni Lore, a C year old Ray Y N Diwade Edo Difod a Thry Lond Conan Halen O Guineas, Hanner Guineas, a Darno Sethe, Chwech, O Dino Year on Dyernot. On Eth Y N R H Y Traquantus, A C Fell Lar on Traquantus O I Flame, B U E I Bichad Y N Anju Edo. Canis Fay Eth I Lore Y Bedward Way Thingwell Y Nos, on Fay Death Y T Well W Y T H M E I Ben, A C N I Well with B Y T H O Hano. Diweeder Fod E I Bed War Quarter E, Y N Hungian Munistafel O Dan Y Castle, on P W Y Fu Eno I W Gweld N H W, W N I Dim. May Y N were E I Walla I R Farmer Cryquildig Find A R Gal, A C Na C H L Y B W Y D B Y T H M Dano, a C more were a H N N Y I W D Y L W Y T H Di Fuddy A B L Yon, Bron A R Unwaith Year Amzer H N N Y. A Chi Y Doc Gistel A Finna, E U Bod N H W Y N Di Wooded Fod F F Y R D Tandir All Gandon I Ogafa Istrad Feli, Y N Agos I Benderin. A Dina Y Garn Gotch A R Y Drum, Amawin Y N Or, Mate Y N Dwade Fod Canode O Dinelli O or Y N Stor Gandon Dino. A chi glysok m y story m un or gethings y n mind eno i glodio y n y garn, a c edo gale e i drosferfio gan y t y l w y t h i alvin o dan, a c edo fetha kale lonid gandant, hide ness edo e u danfin i nade raf o sand. Fei fu jint hen feni y n b y w mun tai biken jirla i wan y s janon, a c year old hi y n galu ribo, mead n h w. A C year old son E I bod Y N Trulio Seth Dyernot Seth Or. A Seth M N Y D Gaida Y T Y L W Y T H Teg Bob B L W Y D Y N Y N Ogoff Y Castell Year O E D Y Gred Y N Led Jeffredinol E I bod High Y N Kale H Y N A H Y N O Or M Bob Plenton A Ally High Ladrada Iden Highway A Dodi Un O I Hen Griffith Highway Y N E I Lu Did H W N N W B Y T H Y N Sinadu. Y Ford Y Bai Dai Hai Y N Gunid O E D Mind I R Tai Dan Year Eskis O Ofen Carded, A Hen Glogen L L W Y D Du Ma A R E I Shefen, A C O Dan H W N, Un O Blant Bendeth Y Mamau.
A Bob Amzer OS by Dai Plenton Bok Greg Y Kai Y N Y K Well, Hyg Mer I Y S W I D O Siglo Y K Well, A Dimon I R Fam Droy E I Sheffin M F N Y D New D W I, Hyg De Fly Y Ledrith I R K Well, A I M Math A R Plenton Y N Jintaf B Y T H Y Gao Lai Hai. Fei Fu Plenton Gon Dine or Jim Dogeth Y N Ling Ran M Fly Nidao Heb Jinida Dim, a barn pa bo e di my weddy kale e i nuid gon yer hen reg yer ode. Fay eth lad y plentin i f y g w t h y g w r h w s b y s arni, fay de eth yer hen reg eno em seth nyernod i eskis bado y bok gen bok mund fur oer, er seeth fed bor c y n e i bod y n oleu, hi a gas gen ad i find a g e f dan r h y w bistil, meet hi. On med er g m dojin. Mind a g e f i knew it a nath. And, Beth Binag, Fe wet lotty plan, v n fell c y w year wid o h n n y i maze. And gorfu i fam e, nade sistel a f f w w r t h year hen rag, y ni e i duko mund for oer bob board dros gorder b l w y d y n, a c y n hen y chwarter h n n y, dude dim brafic plantin y n y coom. That is a wonderful thing. That old castle there, he would say, pointing to the YNYS Jainan Rock. I remember a time when people would be terrified to go near it, especially at night. There was considerable danger that one might be taken to Bendith EU Mamaru. It is said that there are a great many of them there, though I know not where they abide. The old folks used to say that there was a pit somewhere about the middle of the castle, about a yard wide and some five or six yards deep with a stone about three tons in weight over the mouth of it. And that they had a passage underground from that pit all the way to the cave of Tanyer Ogoff, near the top of the coom, that is, near Adelina Patty's residence at Craig Wynos Castle, there, it was said, they spent their time during the day. While they came down here to play their tricks at night. They have, they say, a gold ladder of one or two and twenty rungs, and it is along that they pass up and down. They have a little word, and it suffices if the foremost on the ladder merely utters that word, for the stone to rise of itself. While there is another word, which it suffices the hindmost in going down to utter so that the stone shuts behind him. It is said that a servant from one of the neighboring farms, when looking for rabbits in the rock, happened to say the word as he stood near the stone, that it opened for him, and that he went down the ladder. But that because he was ignorant of the word to make it shut behind him, the fairies discovered by the draft putting out their candles that there was something wrong. So they found him out and took him with them. He remained living with them for seven years, but at the end of the seven years he escaped with his hat full of guineas. He had by this time learnt the two words, and got to know a good deal about the hiding places of their treasures. He told everything to a farmer in the neighborhood, so the latter likewise went down, and some used to say that he brought thence thrice the fill of a salt chest of guineas, half guineas, and seven and sixpenny pieces in one day. But he got too greedy, and like many a greedy one before him his crime proved his death, for he went down the fourth time in the dusk of the evening, when the fairies came upon him, and he was never seen any more. It is said that his four quarters hang in a room under the castle, but who has been there to see them I know not. It is true enough that the above-mentioned farmer got lost, and that nothing was heard respecting him. And it is equally true that his family became very well to do almost at once at that time. You know as well as I do that they say, that the fairies have underground passages to the caves of Istrafel, near Penderin. There is the Garn Gotch also on the drum, now called Alwyn. They say there are hundreds of tons of gold accumulated by them there, and you have heard the story about one of the Gethings going thither to dig in the Garn, and how he, sick, was transformed by the fairies into a wheel of fire. And that he could get no quiet from them until he sent them to manufacture a rope of sand. A more intelligible version of this story has been given at pages 19 to 20 above. There was formerly an old woman living in a small house near Wynys Janon. And she had the power of bewitching, people used to say, there was a rumor that she spent seven days, seven hours, and seven minutes with the fairies every year in the cave at the castle. It was a pretty general belief that she got such and such a quantity of gold for every child she could steal for them, 
and that she put one of those old urchins of theirs in its place, the latter never grew at all. The way she used to do it was to enter people's houses with the excuse of asking for alms, having a large dark grey old cloak on her back, and the cloak concealed one of the children of Bendith Eu Mamaru. Whenever she found the little child of the good woman of the house in its cradle, she would take upon herself to rock the cradle, so that if the mother only turned her back for a minute or two, she would throw the sham child into the cradle and hurry away as fast as she could with the baby. A man in the neighborhood had a child lingering for years without growing at all, and it was the opinion of all that it had been changed by the old woman. The father at length threatened to call in the aid of, the wise man, when the old woman came there for seven days, pretending that it was in order to bathe the little boy in cold water. And on the seventh day she got permission to take him, before it was light, under a certain spout of water, so she said, but the neighbors said it was to change him. However that was, the boy from that time forth got on as fast as a gosling. But the mother had all but to take an oath to the old woman, that she would duck him in cold water every morning for three months, and by the end of that time there was no finer infant in the coombe. Mr. Davies has given me some account also of the annual pilgrimage to the Fan Mountains to see the Lake Lady, these are his words on the subject they recall pp. 15 to 16 above. It has been the yearly custom, for generations, as far as I can find, for young as well as many people further advanced in years to make a general excursion in carts, gambos, and all kinds of vehicles, to LLYNY Fan. In order to see the water nymph, who appeared on one day only, viz. The first Sunday in August. This nymph was said to have the lower part of her body resembling that of a dolphin. While the upper part was that of a beautiful lady, this anomalous form appeared on the first Sunday in August, if the lake should be without a ripple, and combed her tresses on the reflecting surface of the lake. The yearly peregrination to the abode of the fan deity is still kept up in this valley Kumta, but not to the extent that it used to formerly. 13. Mr. Craig Fryn Hughes has sent me another tale about the fairies, it has to do with the parish of Lanthabon, near the eastern border of Glamorganshire. Many traditions cluster round the church of Lanthabon, beginning with its supposed building by St. Mabon, but which of the Mabons of Welsh legend he was, is not very certain. Not very far is a place called Pant Y Dons, or the Dance Hollow, in allusion to the visits paid to the spot by Bendith Y Mamau, as the fairies are there called. In the same neighborhood stand also the ruins of Castel Y Nos, or the Castle of the Night 93, which tradition represents as uninhabitable because it had been built of stones from Lanthabon Church. And on account of the ghosts that used to haunt it. However, one small portion of it was usually tenanted formerly by a wise man or by a witch. In fact, the whole country round Lanthabon Church teemed with fairies, ghosts, and all kinds of uncanny creatures. Mun Amoth D-A-G-S-Y-D-D-Y-N-R-O's Y-N-Y-P-L-W-I-F A Elwer Y Birth Gran, Trigian I Gwed Wyunk A I Flenton Bikin. Year Ode Wedi Kali E I G W R A I Hunig Jiser Y N E I Hamdafadruid A I Hunigruid Ode Gruff E I Mab. Year Ode E F Year Amzer H W N A Dutu Tear B L W Y D D O E D A C Y N Blenton Braff A R E I Odrin. Year old Y P L W Y F R Y P R Y D Y N Orlon O Fendith Y Mamau A C A R M Zerlon Lower Biden Y N Cad Dinian Y N F R O A U Sir Doriath Hyde Doriad Gore Ray Hynet A R Jifrif E U Hagrech Ode Bendith Lanfaban A C Year Un More Hynet A R Jifrif E U Castio Ladrada Plant O R Call Out Y N Absinold of E U Mamau a denu dinyan trwy eu swino a cheridoriath i ryw gores a fiak a diff faith a imdangus i yn grin difer a chident. nid rifed fod y mamau bunid ar eu gwili adriath rag often kali eu plant. Year od y wed o dan swail wyn hynid ophilus mei mab, jimate nes tinu re orc my dojin i diwited with i i bod yn rhy or ophilus, a C Y bid I I R Y W N luck or die I map. And N I the lie unrise whale W I W die 
Imden Gozai Fad Ei Hal H Way Far Y D W C H A I Chiser Wen G H Y D A I Gobithian Y N Siji Farfad Y N E I Map. Mod Bin Ag, Un Dyernod, Cly Wad R Y W Lays Quin Fanis Y N Cody O Jimido Geeth Y Beauty. A Rag Bod Rybeth Wedi Digvid I Un O R Gwart Heg Redded Y N Tuag Eno, Donna Dale Y D R W S Heb E I Gao, A I Mab Biken Y N Y Tai. On PWI a Fedder Deskenfio EI Gofit AR EI Gwaith YN Difod PRB, WRTH Weld IZO EI Mab. Twiliad Bob Man M Dano, on YN Afawidianus. Odutu Maklut Hall, Will Lensen Biken YN Guthather EI M Dangosiat OI Blaine, AC YN Diwited, YN Groy, Mam. Edricod Y Fam YN Janel Arno, a Diwadad or Diwd. NIDFY MLENTIN IWITTI LU YN SIKR 8 BY Y BIKEN NID IMDANGASI Y FAM YN FODLIN NA I BOD YN CREDU MY EI FLENTIN HI IDOD YEROD RIBETH YN SIGIL YN BARHOUSE RITH I MY NID EI MAB HI IDOD ON BETH BINAG BU GUIDA HI MFLWIDDYN JIFIN AC NID IMDANGASI EI FOD YN NIDA DIM Try your ode gruff, EI Mab high, YN Blenlin Sinit for yon. Year ode YGWR Biken YN Mind YN FWY Hagr Bob DYDD Hefit. Or Dive Pender Finot Find at Y, Dine HOSBYS, Ur Kale RHYW Ybadith A Galuni AR Y Mater. Year ode YN Dickwit Bod AR Y Per YD YN Trick Fanu YN Gastel Y Nos. W R A G O D Y N Hynet A R Jifrif E I Imwi Bidieth Dwyadal O Jifrinian Y Fall R O L E D O Sod E I Hachos Gur E I Fran A C and Low E I Holy Silwat Crimble Y D Y W A C Y May D Y Blenton D G Y D A R Hen Fendeth Y N Ryle On I T I D Island F Y N Guy Farwadiada I Y N Fidlin Amanal Fay Ad for a D Y Blenton I T I Y N Fuan YN or, a duta canal dydd y foro, tor wyyn y canal, a thaful unhanner imaith otterthid, a chad y law yn dy law, a decru gymysg ei gin wisiad yn ol a blame. Kofi afad y gwr biken jir law yn guthathur aswail w or hyn ag a fiddy yn ei nuther. On Kofi D a Fidio Gal E I Swale W Raid Inil E I Swale W at Y Withered Heb E I O A C Oded Four Nao Finna I T I Beth Fidi Y N E I Nuther. A Di Wed Ritho My C Y M Y S G Past I R Fed L Year W I T. A Row Y Bod I Me Beth F Y D D E I Ateb. Di Quelled Y Rake A Thranoeth Dilanad Jifarwitted Y Dine Sinel I R Litheran. Year old Y G W R Biken Y N Sefil Y N E I H M Y L A C Y N S Y Slash Y R N I Y W Fanel Y M Hen Ikadig Gofinod Mam Beth I Chi Nuther C Y M Y S G Past I R Fedel Mach Gen I O Feli Me Glyways Gone F Y N Had Fay Glywad H W N N W Gone E I Dad A H W N N W Gone E I Dad In Low Fod Mezen Cyn Derwin, a Derwin Mun Dar 94. And Ni Chlyways I Nog Wield Neb Yn Unman Yn Cym Ysg Past Ir Fedel Mun Moscow Wyr. Silwad Y Regi I Fod Yn Edric Yn Hynet O Sarug Arni Pan Yn Syrad, A C Year Ode H Wen N Y Yn Ichwanagu at E I Hagruch, Ness E I Nuther with an I R Pen. Y Prignon H W N N W L Y Reg at Y Dine Sinel, Ur E I Hispisu or H Y N a Leferwid Gone Y Cor O E by H W N N W on O R Hen Frid Y D Y W Y N or B Y D D Mon Fiber Nesafim Hen Pedwar Dyernot May Y N Raid I T I Find I Ben Y Pedair Heel S Y D D Sigi Farfad W R T H Ben R H Y D Y Glock M Dudeg or Glock Y Nos Y B Y D D Y Luad Y N Long. Kofia Gudio D Y Hun Mun Man A G Y C E I Lon Oleg A R Beno Y Crossford A C O S Gwili Rybeth A Bear I T I Jin Herfu Kofia Fod Y N Phonid 
A C Imital Rag Rock D F F R W I N T H Daimler L New Fay Dispy Wer Y Nilan A C N I Ch D Y Fab Y N O L B Y T H N I S Q I D A Y Fam and Fotis Beth Ode I W D L W R T H A Story Rift Y Dine Sinel Year Ode Mun Simaint O D Y W Y L L W C H A G Ariod Or Dive Death Year Amzer I Ben a C error or a painted a cure at an imgudio y n ophilus lu sefni lu in mar y n y m y l o b a lu y kafi alag a r bob beth o g y l c h. Buam here amzer eno y n guilio heb dim i w glywed na i well dim on distorwit d w f n a frugalwifus year hanner nos y n ternasu. Or di dwe sane serdorial y n dinisu a t i o herbit. NIS, NIS your Odi Sane Felisper YN Difod O Hide. A grand away hit high guide a Dikobadeb Arni. CYN here your Ode YN EIHMYL a Dilod my Gorum Daith O, Fendeth Y Mamau, Edent YN Mind I Ryle. Year Edent YN Ganod Mun Riff. Tua Shanol year Orum Daith Canfidod O Ligfa AG a Drywanod EI Chalan, AC a Birad IW Gwade Sefil YN EI Redwellio. YN certed RHWNG Pedwar or Bendith, Year Ode EI Flenton Biken Anwil EI Hun. Bubrana LLWIR Angofio EI Hun, Alemu Tuag Otto Ur EI Gipio Emeth Audiernan, Trui Dres OS Kafai. On Pan AR Nidio Alan D. Himguktfan IR Dibin HWNNW Metaliad M. Jinger Y. Dine Sinel. SEF Y by Dai I Unrai Jin Herfiad O I Hido Destrywio Y C W B L A C Na Bikli E D Gad E I Filland Y N O L B Y T H A R O L I Rorum Daith Derwin I R Pen A C I Sain E U Serdorieth Distui Y N Y Pefter Death Aflin O I H Wem Gudfin Don Jifirio E I Shamro Tua I Chartref O S Ode Y N Hyrethal O R Blaine A R O L E I Mab Year Ode YN Lar MWY Urban HYN. AI Hadgisters Vide at YCR Biken Ode YN Holio EI Fod YN Fab ED Wedi Sinadu YN 4 Yon, Waith Year Ode YN Sicker YN or YN EI Metal My Unor Henford I Dode. NIS Gwid Dai Pa Fod I W Adef M Finad YN Highway YN Year Untai A High, Trait Hack God Def Edo O Y Mam Arni High. On Beth Binag. Kafid Digon O Ras Italial I Y M D D W Y N Y N Wed Aid at Y G W R Biken Hagger Ect Gaida Hi Y N Tai. Dranoeth Eth A R E I Hanayan at Y Dine Sinel I Adrod Year H Y N Year Ode Wedi Bod Y N Ligad D Y S T O Hano Y Nosan Jint A C I Ofen M Jifar Wedid Pelek. Year Ode Y G W R Sinel Y N E I Disguil. A C A R E I Gwaith Y N Difot I R Tai Adnabited with I E I Bod Wedi Gwield Rybeth Ode Wedi E I Shifrot. Adrotted with a year H Y N A G Ode Wedi E I Ganfot A R Ben Y Crossford. A C Wedi Edo Glywed H Y N Y Agarod L Y F R Mar A G Ode Gando A C Wedi Here Silu Arno Hisbisot Hi Fod Y N Anginer Hydeal E D C Y N K L E I Flenton Y N O L Gale I J D U Heb Unpluffin Gin N A C O Unlive Errol Arni D Lad A C A R O L E I Lad E I Gosod O Flane Tan Coed Pluff A C H W B L Er E I Phobi More Jint A G Y Boisai Y N E I Gosod O Flane Y Tan Edigau Pob TWLL a Minedfa YN year Adialad on Dun, a Theidio a Dallas Whale W Manol AROLY, Crimbo, Hyde, Nes Bidai Y year YN Digon, AR Pluff I Serthio a Maith Odiarni Baban. AC Ina I Edric YM Malu year ODF. Ermor Rifed Ode Sifarwitted Y, GWR, Penderfinod ETG when NYG. A thranoeth eth I twilio y m lith y year od eno m un or descrified engine hydeal, under e i siometagath method a chad year un. Etho ar nail firm di i r lol i twilio, on dem dangus i fod fell y n, as gu arniwaith method a chad year un pan y m ron digaloni gon e i halfawidiant death a r draws un mun ameth di ing n g h w r y pliv f, a frynod hi y n diedi. A r o l diquilit a dref, 
Gosodad y ten mien trefn, aladadad yer eid, don ei gosod o plain y ten disclare alaskai ar yer alch. Pan y en edric arni y en pobi, ango fiocti, crimble, y en hoffel, a c yer od wedi surthio i rifath o brutalwig, pier y d y swen en wy d hi gon sane sir doriel y two alton tr ti, y n d big i r h y n a glywacht y dick nas y thiasy c y n h y n y a r ben y crossfer. Year eddy pluff urban h y n weddy surthio a maith audier y yar, a c urban edric year eddy curtain bill, weddy diflan you. Edric i y fam y n w y f f t o i dutu, a c ur e i fogged clyway lays e i mab coftedic y n g a one w arni y two a fun. Reddit i w rafad, Gon ei go fleetio y n resog, a fan oftenad im maulu yer od wedi bod c y h y d, n i d od gando jifrif y n y bid p w rodi and my y n grando a r ganet h w f r y d yer od wedi bod. Yer od y n denul a thrill yudig yon ei wed pan ad for wid e f. Dina estori, y plentin kaldig. At a farmhouse still remaining in the parish of Lanthoban, which is called the birth gran, there lived once upon a time a young widow and her infant child. After losing her husband her only comfort in her bereavement and solitary state was young Griff, her son. He was about three years old and a fine child for his age. The parish was then crammed full of Bendith y Mamau, and when the moon was bright and full they were wont to keep people awake with their music till the break of day the fairies of Lanthaban were remarkable on account of their ugliness and they were equally remarkable on account of the tricks they played. Stealing children from their cradles during the absence of their mothers, and luring men by means of their music into some pestilential and desolate bog, were things that seemed to afford them considerable amusement. It was no wonder then that mothers used to be daily on the watch lest they should lose their children. The widow alluded to was remarkably careful about her son, so much so, that it made some of the neighbors say that she was too anxious about him and that some misfortune would overtake her child. But she paid no attention to their words, as all her joy, her comfort, and her hopes appeared to meet together in her child. However, one day she heard a moaning voice ascending from near the cowhouse, and lest anything had happened to the cattle, she ran there in a fright, leaving the door of the house open and her little son in the cradle. Who can describe her grief on her coming in and seeing that her son was missing? She searched everywhere for him, but it was in vain. About sunset, behold a little lad made his appearance before her and said to her quite distinctly, Mother. She looked minutely at him, and said at last, Thou art not my child. I am truly, said the little one. But the mother did not seem satisfied about it, nor did she believe it was her child. Something whispered to her constantly, as it were, that it was not her son. However, he remained with her a whole year, but he did not seem to grow at all, whereas Griff, her son, was a very growing child. Besides, the little fellow was getting uglier every day. At last she resolved to go to the wise man, in order to have information and light on the matter. There happened then to be living at Castel y Nos, Castle of the Night, a man who was remarkable for his thorough acquaintance with the secrets of the evil one. When she had laid her business before him and he had examined her, he addressed the following remark to her, It is a crimble, ninety-five and thy own child is with those old bendeth somewhere or other, if thou wilt follow my directions faithfully and minutely thy child will be restored to thee soon. Now, about noon tomorrow cut an egg through the middle, throw the one half away from thee, but keep the other in thy hand, and proceed to mix it backwards and forwards. See that the little fellow be present paying attention to what thou art doing, but take care not to call his attention to it his attention must be drawn to it without calling to him and very probably he will ask what thou wouldst be doing. Thou art to say that it is mixing a pasty for the reapers that thou art. Let me know what he will then say. The woman returned, and on the next day she followed the cunning man, S96 advice to the letter. The little fellow stood by her and watched her minutely, presently he asked, Mother, what are you doing? Mixing a pasty for the reapers, my boy. Oh, that is it. I heard from my father he had heard it from his father and that one from his father that an acorn was before the oak, and that the oak was in the earth. 
but I have neither heard nor seen anybody mixing the pasty for the reapers in an eggshell. The woman observed that he looked very cross as he spoke, and that it so added to his ugliness that it made him highly repulsive. That afternoon the woman went to the cunning man in order to inform him of what the dwarf had said. Oh, said he, he is of that old breed. Now the next full moon will be in four days thou must go where the four roads meet above RHYDY Glock 97, at twelve o'clock the night the moon is full. Take care to hide thyself at a spot where thou canst see the ends of the crossroads. And shouldst thou see anything that would excite thee take care to be still and to restrain thyself from giving way to thy feelings, otherwise the scheme will be frustrated and thou wilt never have thy son back. The unfortunate mother knew not what to make of the strange story of the cunning man, she was in the dark as much as ever. At last the time came, and by the appointed hour she had concealed herself carefully behind a large bush close by, whence she could see everything around. She remained there a long time watching. But nothing was to be seen or heard, while the profound and melancholy silence of midnight dominated over all. At last she began to hear the sound of music approaching from afar. Nearer and nearer the sweet sound continued to come, and she listened to it with rapt attention. Ere long it was close at hand, and she perceived that it was a procession of Bendith Y Mamau going somewhere or other. They were hundreds in point of number, and about the middle of the procession she beheld a sight that pierced her heart and made the blood stop in her veins walking between four of the Bendith she saw her own dear little child. She nearly forgot herself altogether, and was on the point of springing into the midst of them violently to snatch him from them if she could. But when she was on the point of leaping out of her hiding place for that purpose, she thought of the warning of the cunning man, that any disturbance on her part would frustrate all, so that she would never get her child back. When the procession had wound itself past, and the sound of the music had died away in the distance, she issued from her concealment and directed her steps homewards. Full of longing as she was for her son before, she was much more so now. And her disgust at the little dwarf who claimed to be her son had very considerably grown, for she was now certain in her mind that he was one of the old breed. She knew not how to endure him for a moment longer under the same roof with her, much less his addressing her as, mother. However, she had enough restraining grace to behave becomingly towards the ugly little fellow that was with her in the house. On the morrow she went without delay to the wise man to relate what she had witnessed the previous night, and to seek further advice. The cunning man expected her, and as she entered he perceived by her looks that she had seen something that had disturbed her. She told him what she had beheld at the crossroads, and when he had heard it he opened a big book which he had. Then, after he had long pored over it, he told her, that before she could get her child back, it was necessary for her to find a black hen without a single white feather. Or one of any other color than black, this she was to place to bake before a wood ninety-eight fire with its feathers and all intact. Moreover, as soon as she placed it before the fire, she was to close every hole and passage in the walls except one. And not to look very intently after the crimbo until the hen was done enough and the feathers had fallen off at every one, then she might look where he was. Strange as the advice of the wise man sounded, she resolved to try it, so she went the next day to search among the hens for one of the requisite description. But to her disappointment she failed to find one. She then walked from one farmhouse to another in her search, but fortune appeared to scowl at her, as she seemed to fail in her object. When, however, she was nearly disheartened, she came across the kind of hen she wanted at a farm at the end of the parish. She bought it, and after returning home she arranged the fire and killed the hen, which she placed in F.O.N.T. of the bright fire burning on the hearth. Whilst watching her the hen baking she altogether forgot the crimble. And she fell into a sort of swoon, when she was astonished by the sound of music outside the house, similar to the music she had heard a few nights before at the crossroads. The feathers had by this time fallen off the hen, and when she came to look for the crimble he had disappeared. The mother cast wild looks about the house, and to her joy she heard the voice of her lost son calling to her from outside. She ran to meet him, and embraced him fervently. But when she asked him where he had been so long, he had no account in the world to give but that he had been listening to pleasant music. He was very thin and worn in appearance when he was restored. 
such is the story of the lost child. Let me remark as to the urchin's exclamation concerning the cooking done in the eggshell, that Mr. Hughes, as the result of further inquiry, has given me what he considers a more correct version. But it is no less inconsequent, as will be seen. Me glyways gone f wine had a c in tau gone e i dad, a h w n n w gone e i dad in tau. Fod mezen c y n denven a i flanu m w n d d r. N i chlyways y n unman m g m y s g y batai y n moscal w y eater. I heard from my father and he from his father, and that one from his father. That the acorn exists before the oak and the planting of it in the ground. Never anywhere have I heard of mixing the pasty in the shell of a hen's egg. In Dewey Glen Fridla's story from the Ogwen Valley, in Carnarvonshire, above, it is not the cooking of a pasty but the brewing of beer in an eggshell. However what is most remarkable is that the eggshell is similarly used in stories from other lands. Mr. Hartland cites one from Mecklenburg and another from Scandinavia. He also mentions stories in which the imp measures his own age by the number of forests which he has seen growing successively on the same soil, the formula being of the following kind, I have seen the forest of Ardennes burnt seven times. Seven times have I seen the wood fall in Lesso Forest, or, I am so old, I was already in the world before the Kamschen wood, in Lithuania, was planted, wherein great trees grew, and that is now laid waste again ninety-nine. From these and the like instances it is clear that the Welsh versions here in question are partially blurred, as the fairy child's words should have been to the effect that he was old enough to remember the oak when it was yet but an acorn. And an instance of this explicit kind is given by Howells it comes from Landrigam in Anglesey where his words run thus, I can remember yon oak and acorn, but I never saw in my life people brewing in an eggshell before. I may add that I have been recently fortunate enough to obtain from Mr. Lywarch Reynolds another kind of estimate of the fairy urchin's age. He writes that his mother remembers a very old Merthyr woman who used to tell the story of the eggshell cookery, but in words differing from all the other versions known to him, thus. Win hin y d y d hedi. A g y n b y w c y n y ang me. Iriad n i well as fur we. B W I D I R fetal M W N C W C W L L one hundred W Y I D. I call myself old this day, and living before my birth. Never have I seen food boiled for the reapers in an eggshell. As to the urchin's statement that he was old and had lived before, it is part of a creed of which we may have something to say in a later chapter. At this point let it suffice to call attention to the same idea in the book of Taliesin, Poem 9. Heinaf with dine pan honor. A I E U in pop amzer. A man is wont to be oldest when born. And younger and younger all the time. 14. Before closing this chapter, I wish to touch on the question of the language of the fairies, though fairy tales hardly ever raise it, as they usually assume the fairies to speak the same language as the mortals around them. There is, however, one well-known exception, namely, the story of Eliodorus, already mentioned, as recorded by Geraldus Cambrensis, who relates how Eliodorus, preferring at the age of twelve to play the truant to undergoing a frequent beating by his teacher, fasted two days in hiding in the hollow of a river bank and how he was then accosted by two little men who induced him to follow them to a land of sports and other delights. There he remained long enough to be able, years later, to give his diocesan, the second Menavian bishop named David 101, a comprehensive account of the people and realm of fairy. After Eliodorus had for some time visited and revisited that land of twilight, his mother desired him to bring her some of the gold of the fairies. So one day he tried to bring away the gold ball with which the fairy king's son used to play. But he was not only unsuccessful, but subjected to indignities also, and prevented from evermore finding his way back to fairyland. So he had to go again to school and to the studies which he so detested. But in the course of time he learned enough to become a priest, and when, stricken in years, he used to be entreated by Bishop David to relate this part of his early history, he never could be got to unfold his tale without shedding tears. Among other things which he said of the fairies' mode of living, he stated that they ate neither flesh nor fish, 
but lived for the most part on various kinds of milk food cooked after the fashion of stirabout, flavored as it were with saffron 102. But one of the most curious portions of Eliodoru's yarn was that relating to the language of the fairies, for he pretended to have learnt it and to have found it to resemble his own Britannica lingua, Britanneg, or Welsh. In the words instance Geraldus perceived a similarity to Greek 103, which he accounted for by means of the fabulous origin of the Welsh from the Trojans and the supposed sojourn made in Greece by those erring Trojans on their way to Britain. Geraldus displays quite a pretty interest in comparative philology, and talks glibly of the lingua Britannica. But one never feels certain that he knew very much more about it than the author of the Germania, the first to refer to it under that name. Tacitus, however, had the excuse that he lived at a distance and some eleven centuries before the advent of Gerald the Welshman. Geraldus' words prove, on close examination, to be of no help to us on the question of language. But on the other hand I have but recently begun looking out for stories bearing on it. It is my impression that such are not plentiful. But I proceed to subjoin an abstract of a phantom funeral tale in point from Isin Sionade, Aberystwyth, 1882, pages 8 to 16. Isin Sionade, I ought to explain, consists of a number of stories collected and edited in Welsh by the Rev. Chancellor Sylvan Evans, though he has not attached his name to it, the harvest of 1816 was one of the wettest ever known in Wales. And a man and his wife who lived on a small farm in one of the largest parishes in the hundred of Modin, see above, in the Domitian part of Cardiganshire went out in the evening of a day which had been comparatively dry to make some reaped corn into sheaves. As it had long been down. It was a beautiful night, with the harvest moon shining brightly, and the field in which they worked had the parish road passing along one of its sides, without a hedge or a ditch to separate it from the corn. When they had been busily at work binding sheaves for half an hour or more, they happened to hear the hum of voices, as if of a crowd of people coming along the road leading into the field. They stopped a moment, and looking in the direction whence the sounds came, they saw in the light of the moon a number of people coming into sight and advancing in their direction. They bent them again to their work without thinking much about what they had seen and heard, for they fancied it was some belated people making for the village, which was about a mile off. But the hum and confused sounds went on increasing, and when the two binders looked up again, they beheld a large crowd of people almost opposite and not far from them. As they continued looking on they beheld quite clearly a coffin on a bier carried on the shoulders of men, who were relieved by others in turns, as usual in funeral processions in the country. Here is a funeral, said the binders to one another, forgetting for the moment that it was not usual for funerals to be seen at night. They continued looking on till the crowd was right opposite them, and some of them did not keep to the road, but walked over the corn alongside of the bulk of the procession. The two binders heard the talk and whispering, the noise and hum as if of so many real men and women passing by, but they did not understand a word that was said, not a syllable could they comprehend, not a face could they recognize. They kept looking at the procession till it went out of sight on the way leading towards the parish church. They saw no more of them, and now they began to feel uneasy and went home leaving the corn alone as it was. But further on the funeral was met by a tailor at a point in the road where it was narrow and bounded by a fence, clawed, on either side. The procession filled the road from hedge to hedge, and the tailor tried to force his way through it, but such was the pressure of the throng, that he was obliged to get out of their way by crossing the hedge. He also failed to understand a word of the talk which he heard. In about three weeks after this sham funeral 104, there came a real one down that way from the upper end of the parish. Such, in brief, is the story so charmingly told by Sylvan Evans, which he got from the mouths of the farmer and his wife, whom he considered highly honest and truthful persons, as well as comparatively free from superstition. The last time they talked to him about the incident they were very advanced in years, and both died within a few weeks of one another early in the year 1852. Their remains, he adds, lie in the churchyard towards which they had seen the Toeli slowly making its way. For Toeli is the phonetic spelling in YSTN Sionade of the word which is Tolu in North Cardiganshire and in North Wales, for Old Welsh Tolu. The word now means family, though literally it should mean, house army or, house troops, 
and it is practically a synonym for TYLWYTH, family, or household, literally, house tribe. Now the Toeli or Tolu is such an important institution in Domitian Cardiganshire and some parts of Dyfed proper, that the word has been confined to the phantom. And for the word family in its ordinary significations one has there to have recourse to the non-dialect form Tolu 105. In North Cardiganshire and North Wales the Toeli is called simply a Clodletigeth, burial, or Onglad, funeral, in the latter also Sinhabrung is a funeral. I may add that when I was a child in the neighborhood of Ponterwood, on the upper course of the Rydal, hardly a year used to pass without somebody or other meeting a phantom funeral. Sometimes one got entangled in the procession, and ran the risk of being carried off one's feet by the throng. There is, however, one serious difference between our phantom funerals and the Domitian Toeli, namely, that we recognize our neighbors' ghosts as making up the processions, and we have no trouble in understanding their talk. At this point a question of some difficulty presents itself as to the Toeli, namely, what family does it mean? Is it the family and friends of the departed on his way to the grave, or does it mean the family in the sense of TYLWYTH tag, fair family, as applied to the fairies? I am inclined to the latter view, but I prefer thinking that the distinction itself does not penetrate very deeply, seeing that a certain species of the TYLWYTH tag, or fairies, may, in point of origin, be regarded as deceased friends and ancestors of the TYLWYTH in the ordinary sense of the word. In fact all this kind of rehearsal of events seems to have been once looked at as friendly to the men and women whom it concerned. This will be seen, for instance, in the Domitian account of the Canwell Gorf or Corpse Candle, as granted through the intercession of Saint David to the people of his special care, as a means of warning each to get ready in time for his death. That is to say, to prevent death finding him unprepared. It is hard to guess why it was assumed that the Canwell Gorf was unknown in other parts of Wales. One or two instances in point occur in Owen's Welsh folklore, pages 298 to 301. And I have myself heard of them being seen in Anglesey, while they were quite well known to members of Mrs. Rees' mother's family, who lived in the parish of Wayne Four, in the neighborhood of Carnarvon. Nor does it appear that phantom funerals were at all confined to South Wales. Proof to the contrary is supplied to some extent in Owen's folklore, p. 30l. But there is no doubt that in recent times the belief in them, as well as in the Canwellgorf, has been more general and more vivid in South Wales than in North Wales, especially Gwynedd. I have not been fortunate enough to come across anything systematic or comprehensive on the origin and meaning of ghostly rehearsals like the Welsh phantom funeral or coffin making. But the subject is an interesting one which deserves the attention of our leading folklore philosophers, as does also the cognate one of Second Sight, by which it is widely overlapped. Quite recently at the end of 1899 in fact I received three brief stories, for which I am indebted to the further kindness of Allah Lane, p. 228, who lives at Binhadlog near Edirne in Lane, and two out of the three touch on the question of language. But as the three belong to one and the same district, I give the substance of all in English as follows. 1. There were at a small harbour belonging to Nefin some houses in which several families formerly lived. The houses are there still, but nobody lives in them now. There was one family there to which a little girl belonged, they used to lose her for hours every day, so her mother was very angry with her for being so much away. I must know, said she, where you go for your play. The girl answered that it was to pin Y wig, the wig point, which meant a place to the west of the Neffin headland, it was there, she said, she played with many children. I whose children? Asked the mother. I don't know, she replied, they are very nice children, much nicer than I am. I must know whose children they are, was the reply. And one day the mother went with her little girl to see the children, it was a distance of about a quarter of a mile to Pin Y Wig, and after climbing the slope and walking a little along the lop they came in sight of the pin. It is from this pin that the people of Pen Year Alt got water, and it is FROM, there they get it still. Now after coming near the pin the little girl raised her hands with joy at the sight of the children. Oh mother, said she, their father is with them today, he is not with them always, it is only sometimes that he is. 
the mother asked the child where she saw them. There they are, mother, running down to the pin, with their father sitting down. I see nobody, my child, was the reply, and great fear came upon the mother, she took hold of the child's hand in terror, and it came to her mind at once that they were the TYLWYTH tag. Never afterwards was the little girl allowed to go to pin Y wig, the mother had heard that the TYLWYTH tag exchanged people's children. Such is the first story, and it is only remarkable, perhaps, for its allusion to the father of the fairy children. Two, there used to be at Edirne an old woman who occupied a small farm called Glan Y Gors, the same family lives there still. One day this old woman had gone to a fair at Krikyeth, whence she returned through Poolheli. As she was getting above Gors Gurch, which was then a turbary in a pretty considerable bog, a noise reached her ears, she sto, ped, and heard the sound of much talking. By and by she beheld a great crowd of men and women coming to meet her. She became afraid and stepped across the fence to let them go by. There she remained a while listening to their chatter, and when she thought that they had gone far enough she returned to the road and began to resume her way home. But before she had gone many steps she heard the same sort of noise again, and saw again the same sort of crowd coming, so she recrossed the fence in great fear, saying to herself, Here I shall be all night. She remained there till they also had gone, and she wondered what they could be, and whether they were people who had been to visit Plas Madrun, afterwards, on inquiry, she found that no such people had been there that day. Now the old woman was near enough to the passers-by to hear them talking, Clebron, and chattering, Bregliac, but not a word could she understand of what they uttered, it was not Welsh and she did not think that it was English it is, however. Not supposed that she knew English. She related further that the last crowd shouted all together to the other crowd in advance of them why, and that the latter replied why way or something like that. This account a law Lane has got, he says, from a great granddaughter of the old woman, and she heard it all from her father, Bard Lechog, who always had faith in the fairies, and believed that they will come again to be seen of men and women. For he thought that they had their periods, a belief which I have come across elsewhere, and more especially in Carnarvonshire now what are we to make of such a story? I recollect reading somewhere of a phantom wedding in Scotland, but in Wales we seem to have nothing more closely resembling this than a phantom funeral. Nevertheless what the old woman of Glan Y Gores thought she saw looks by no means unlike a Welsh wedding marching on foot, especially when, as I have seen done. One party tried seemingly in good earnest to escape the other and to take the bride away from it. Moreover, that the figures making up the two crowds in her story are to be regarded as fairies is rendered probable by the next story, which describes the phantoms therein expressly as little men and little women. 3. The small farm of Perth Y. Selen in Edirn used to be held by an old man named Griffith Griffiths. In his best days he stood six foot, and he has left behind him a double reputation for bodily strength and great piety. My informant can well remember him walking to chapel with the aid of his two sticks. The story goes that one day, when he was in his prime, he set out from Perth Y. Selen at two in the morning to walk to Carnarvon to pay his rent, there was no talk in those days of a carriage for anybody. After passing through Neffin and Pistilt, he came in due time to BWLCHTRWINSWNCWLL106, he writes this name also BWLCHDRWSWNCWL, with the suggestion that it ought to be BWHDRWS in Sill. And that the place must have been of importance in the wars of the ancient Kimri. The high road, he goes on to say, runs through the BWLCH, and as Griffith was entering this gap what should he hear but a great deal of talking. He stopped and listened, when to his surprise he saw coming towards him, devoid of all fear, a crowd of little men and little women. They talked aloud, but he could not understand a single word they said, he thought that it was neither Welsh nor English. They passed by him on the road, but he moved aside to the ditch lest they should knock against him. But no feeling of fear came upon him. The old man believed them to have been the TYLWYTH tag. In the story of the Modin funeral the language of the Toeli was not intelligible to the farmer and his wife, or to the tailor, and here in two stories from Lane we have it clearly stated that it was neither Welsh nor, probably, English. 
Since the fairies are always represented as old-fashioned in their ways, it is quite possible that they were once regarded as talking a more ancient language of the country. Which was it? An early version of these legends might perhaps have supplied the answer, and told us that it was Gwydelig or Goidelic, if not an earlier idiom. To wit that of the Aborigines before they learned Goidelic from the Celts of the first wave of Aryan invasion, whether it was in the region of the Eiffel or in the Domitian half of Ceredigion. As to the former it is worthy of note that when Griffith had reached BWHTRWINSWNCWL he was in the outskirts of the Eiffel Mountains, on one of whose heights, not very far off, is the extensive prehistoric fortress of Treyar Siri. Or the town of the Kiri, a vocable which may be provisionally rendered by, giants. In any case it dissociates that stronghold from the Brythonic people of Wales. We shall find, however, that a goidel, or picked, buried in a cairn on Snowdon, is known as Rydagor, Rida the giant. And it is possible that in the Kiri of Treyar Siri we have no other race than that of mixed goidels and picts whom the encroaching Brythons found in possession of the west of our island. Nay, one may say that this is rendered probable by the use made of the word Siri in medieval Welsh, thus in some poetry composed by a certain daffod of Firiad, and copied by Thomas Williams of Trefry. We have a line alluding to Britain in the words. Koyan wen ys y sezairai 107. The crown of the giant's island. Here wen ys y sefiri inevitably recalls the fact that Britain is called wen ys y kedern, or island of the mighty, in the Mabinogen, and also, in effect, in the story of Coolhuch and Olwen. But such stories as these, which enabled Geoffrey to say, I. 16. When he introduced his banal brood of Trojans, that up to that time Britain had only been inhabited by a few giants, are the legends, as will be pointed out later, of the Brythonicized goidels of Wales. So one may infer that their ancestors had given this country the name of the Island of the Mighty, unless it should prove more accurate to suppose them to have somehow derived the term from the Aborigines. This last surmise is countenanced by the fact that in the Coolwich story, the British Isles as a group are called Islands of the Mighty. The words are Tyr Wen Ys Y Keren Ae their Rac Yn Ys. That is, the three islands of the Mighty and their three outpost islands. That is not all, for in the same story the designation is varied thus, Tyr Wen Ys Prydian Ae their Rac Yn Ys 108, or Prydian's three islands and Prydian's three outpost islands. And the substantial antiquity of the designation I the islands of Prydain, is proved by its virtual identity with that used by ancient Greek authors like Ptolemy, who calls both Britain and Ireland a new sigma omicron pyro epsilon tau alpha nu iota kappa. Where Prytanic and Prydain are closely related words. Now our Prydain had in medieval Welsh the two forms Prydian and Prydyn. But some time or other they're set in a tendency to desynonymize them so as to make YNYSPRJ, Dine, the Picts Island, mean Great Britain, and PRYDYN mean the Pict Land of the North. But just as Cynery meant the plural Welshmen and the singular Wales, so PRYDYN meant Picts 109 and the country of the Picts. Now the plural PRYDYN has its etymological goidelic equivalent in the vocable Cretifni, which is well known to have meant the Picts or the descendants of the Picti of Roman historians. Further, this last name cannot be severed from that of the Pictons 110 in Gaul, and it is usually supposed to have referred to their habit of tattooing themselves. At all events this agrees with the apparent meaning of the names Prydyn and Cruithni, from Bride and Cruth, the words in Welsh and Irish respectively for form or shaft. The designation being supposed to refer to the forms or pictures of various animals punctured on the skins of the Picts. So much as to the practical identity of the terms Prydyn, Cruithni, and the Greeks Pritanic, but how could Sedern and Prydian correspond in the terms Yns Y Kedern and Yns Prydian? This one is enabled to understand by means of Suri or Siri as a middle term. Now Kedarn means strong or valiant, and makes the plural Sedern. But there is another Welsh word Kadr 111 which has also the meaning of valiant or powerful, and may have yielded some such a medieval form as cedar in the plural. Now this cadre is proved by its cognates 112 not to have always had the meaning of valiant or strong, its original signification was more nearly fine, beautiful, 
or beautified. Thus what seems to have happened is, that Kadarn, strong, powerful, mighty, influenced the meaning of Kadr, beautiful, and eventually usurped its place in the name of the island, which from being Yansy Cedar became Yansy Cedar. But the former meant the island of the fine or beautiful men, which was closely enough the meaning also of the words Pridane, Kruithni, and Picts. As names of a people who delighted to beautify their persons by tattooing their skins and making themselves distangue in that savage fashion. That is not all, for on examination it turns out that the word Siri, which has been treated up to this point as meaning giants, is but a double, so to say, of the word Kadr in the plural, both as to etymology and original meaning of beautiful. It is a word in constant use in Carnarvonshire, where it is ironically applied to pretentious men fond of showing themselves off, especially in the matter of clothes. D E D N H W N Giri. Aren't they swells? Dina I Chi Gore. There's a fine fellow for you, and so also with the feminine cores. Of course the core of standard Welsh is familiar enough in the sense of giant to Carnarvonshire people, so the meaning can be best ascertained in the case of the plural Siri, which they hardly ever meet with in print. And, so far as I have been able to ascertain, by Siri they mean in an ironical sense it is true fine fellows, with reference not to great stature or strength but to their get-up. Thus one arrives at the true interpretation of the name Treyar Siri as the town of the Pryydyn or Kruithni, that is to say, the town of the Picts or the Aborigines, who showed themselves off decorated with pictures. So far also from Ynysy Siri being an echo of Ynysy Sedern, it turns out to be really the more original of the two. Such names, when they are closely examined, are apt to prove old beyond all hastily formed expectation. Chapter 4 Manx Folklore Be it remembered that one man Amon Mac Clear, a Paynim, was the first inhabitant of the Isle of Man, who by his necromancy kept the same. That when he was assailed or invaded he would raise such mists by land and sea that no man might well find out the island and he would make one of his men see me to be in Nombre a hundred. The Lands Down MSS The following paper exhausts no part of the subject, it simply embodies the substance of my notes of conversations which I have had with Manx men and Manx women, whose names, together with such other particulars as I could get, are in my possession. I have mostly avoided reading up the subject in printed books but those who wish to see it exhaustively treated may be directed to Mr. Arthur W. Moore's book on the folklore of the Isle of Man, to which may now be added Mr. C. Roder's contributions to the folklore of the Isle of Man in the Lyre Mananac for 1897, pages 129-91. For the student of folklore the Isle of Man is very fairly stocked with inhabitants of the imaginary order. She has her fairies and her giants, her mermen and brownies, her kelpies and water bulls. The water bull or taru ushti, as he is called in Manx, is a creature about which I have not been able to learn much, but he is described as a sort of bull disporting himself about the pools and swamps. For instance, I was told at the village of Andreas, in the flat country forming the northern end of the island, and known as the air. That there used to be a taru ushti between Andreas and the sea to the west, it was before the ground had been drained as it is now. And an octogenarian captain at Peel related to me how he had once when a boy heard a taru ushli, the bellowings of the brute made the ground tremble, but otherwise the captain was unable to give me any very intelligible description. This bull is by no means of the same breed as the bull that comes out of the lakes of Wales to mix with the farmer's cattle, for there the result used to be great fertility among the stock, and an overflow of milk and dairy produce. But in the Isle of Man the Taru Ushti only begets monsters and strangely formed beasts. The Kelpie, or, rather, what I take to be a Kelpie, was called by my informants the Glashton, and Kelly, in his Manx Dictionary, describes the object meant as, a goblin, an imaginary animal which rises out of the water. One or two of my informants confuse the Glashton with the Manx Brownie. On the other hand, one of them was very definite in his belief that it had nothing human about it, but was a sort of grey colt, frequenting the banks of lakes at night, and never seen except at night. Mermen and mermaids disport themselves on the coasts of man, 
but I have to confess that I have made no careful inquiry into what is related about them, and my information about the giants of the island is equally scanty. To confess the truth, I do not recollect hearing of more than one giant, but that was a giant, I have seen the marks of his huge hands impressed on the top of two massive monoliths. They stand in a field at Balakiel Ferrick, on the way down from the Slock to Colby. I was told there were originally five of these stones standing in a circle, all of them marked in the same way by the same giant as he hurled them down there from where he stood, miles away on the top of the mountain called Kronk Wyanirila. Here I may mention that the Manx word for a giant is for, in which a vowel flanked M has been spirited away, as shown by the modern Irish spelling, Fomer. This, in the plural in Old Irish, appears as the name of the Fomori, so well known in Irish legend, which, however, does not always represent them as giants, but rather as monsters. I have been in the habit of explaining the word as meaning submarini, but no more are they invariably connected with the sea. So another etymology recommends itself, namely, one which comes from Dr. Whitley Stokes, and makes the moor in Fomori to be of the same origin as the mare in the English nightmare, French cauchemar, German mar, an elf, and cognate words. I may mention that with the Fomori of mythic origin have doubtless been confounded and identified certain invaders of Ireland, especially the Dumnonians from the country between Galloway and the mouth of the Clyde. Some of whom may be inferred to have coasted the north of Ireland and landed in the west, for example in Eris, the northwest of Mayo, called after them Eris, or Eris, Domnan. The Manx brownie is called the Fenadiri, and he is described as a hairy and apparently clumsy fellow, who would, for instance, thrash a whole barnful of corn in a single night for the people to whom he felt well disposed. And once on a time he undertook to bring down for the farmer his weathers from Snaefell. When the Fenadiri had safely put them in an outhouse, he said that he had some trouble with the little ram, as it had run three times round Snaefell that morning. The farmer did not quite understand him, but on going to look at the sheep, he found, to his infinite surprise, that the little ram was no other than a hare, which, poor creature, was dying of fright and fatigue. I need scarcely point out the similarity between this and the story of Pereter, who, as a boy, drove home two hinds with his mother's goats from the forest, he owned to having had some trouble with the goats that had so long run wild as to have lost their horns, a circumstance which had greatly impressed him 113. To return to the Fenadiri, I am not sure that there were more than one in man I have never heard him spoken of in the plural, but two localities at least are assigned to him, namely, a farm called Balacrink, in Colby, in the south, and a farm called Langigan, in the parish of Conchon, near Douglas. Much the same stories, however, appear to be current about him in the two places, and one of the most curious of them is that which relates how he left. The farmer so valued the services of the Fenadiri, that one day he took it into his head to provide clothing for him. The Fenadiri examined each article carefully, and expressed his idea of it, and specified the kind of disease it was calculated to produce. In a word, he found that the clothes would make head and foot sick, and he departed in disgust, saying to the farmer, Though this place is thine, the great glen of Russian is not. Glen Russian is one of the most retired glens in the island, and it drains down through Glen Mayay to the coast, some miles to the south of Peel. It is to Glen Russian, then, that the Fenadiri is supposed to be gone. But on visiting that valley in 1892114 in quest of Manx speaking peasants, I could find nobody there who knew anything of him. I suspect that the spread of the English language even there has forced him to leave the island altogether. Lastly, with regard to the term Fenadiri I may mention that it is the word used in the Manx Bible of 1819 for Satyr in Isaiah 34. 14115, where we read in the English Bible as follows, The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the Satyr shall cry to his fellow. In the Vulgate the latter clause reads, E. pylosus clamabit alter ad alterum. The term Fenadiri has been explained by Cregeen in his Manx Dictionary to mean one who has hair for stockings or hose. That answers to the description of the hairy satyr, and seems fairly well to satisfy the phonetics of the case, the words from which he derives the compound being Finney 116, 
hair, and osher, a stocking. But as osher seems to come from the Old Norse hoser, the plural of hosa, hose, or stocking, the term fenadiri cannot date before the coming of the Norsemen, and I am inclined to think the idea more Teutonic than Celtic. At any rate I need not point out to the English reader the counterparts of this hairy satyr in the hobgoblin Lob Lie by the Fire, and Milton's Lubber Fiend, whom he describes as one that basks at the fire his hairy strength, and crop full out of doors he flings, ere the first cock his madden rings. Lastly, I may mention that Mr. Roder has a great deal to say about the Fenadiri under the name of Glashton. For it is difficult to draw any hard and fast line between the Glashton and the Fenadiri, or even the water bowl, so much alike do they seem to have been regarded. Mr. Roder's items of folklore concerning the Glashtins, see the Lyre Mananac, 3. 139, show that there were male and female Glashtins, and that the former were believed to have been too fond of the women at Balakrink, until one evening some of the men, dressed as women, arranged to receive some youthful Glashtins. Whether the Fenadiri is of Norse origin or not, the Glashtin is decidedly Celtic, as will be further shown in Chapter 7. Here it will suffice to mention one or two related words which are recorded in Highland Gaelic, namely, Glastig, a shegoblin which assumes the form of a goat, and Glesric, a female fairy or a goblin, half human, half beast. The fairies claim our attention next, and as the only other fairies tolerably well known to me are those of Wales, I can only compare or contrast the Manx fairies with the Welsh ones. They are called in Manx, Slay Beggy, or Little People, and Farishin, from the English word fairies, as it would seem. Like the Welsh fairies, they kidnap babies. And I have heard it related how a woman in Dalby had a struggle with the fairies over her baby, which they were trying to drag out of the bed from her. Like Welsh fairies, also, they take possession of the hearth after the farmer and his family are gone to bed. A man in Dalby used to find them making a big fire in his kitchen, he would hear the crackling and burning of the fire when nobody else could have been there except the fairies and their friends. I said, friends, for they sometimes take a man with them, and allow him to eat with them at the expense of others. Thus, some men from the northernmost parish, Kirk Bride, went once on a time to Port Aaron, in the south, to buy a supply of fish for the winter, and with them went a Kirk Michael man who had the reputation of being a persona grata to the fairies. Now one of the Port Aaron men asked a man from the north who the Michael man might be, he was curious to know his name, as he had seen him once before. And on that O.C., Cassion the Michael man was with the fairies at his house the Port Aaron man's house helping himself to bread and cheese in company with the rest. As the fairies were regaling themselves in this instance on ordinary bread and cheese at a living manxman's expense. The story may perhaps be regarded as not inconsistent with one mentioned by coming 117 to the following effect a man attracted one night as he was crossing the mountains, by fairy music, entered a fairy hall where a banquet was going on. He noticed among them several faces which he seemed to know, but no act of mutual recognition took place till he had some drink offered him. When one of those whom he seemed to know warned him not to taste of the drink if he had any wish to make his way home again. If he partook of it he would become like one of them. So he found an opportunity for spilling it on the ground and securing the cup, whereupon the hall and all its inmates instantaneously vanished. On this I may remark that it appears to have been a widely spread belief, that no one who had partaken of the food for spirits, 08, would be allowed to return to his former life. And some instinct es will be found mentioned by Professor Tyler in his Primitive Culture, too. 50-2. Like the Welsh fairies, the Manx ones take men away with them and detain them for years. Thus a Kirk Andreas man was absent from his people for four years, which he spent with the fairies. He could not tell how he returned, but it seemed as if, having been unconscious, he woke up at last in this world. The other world, however, in which he was for the four years was not far away, as he could see what his brothers and the rest of the family were doing every day, although they could not see him. To prove this, he mentioned to them how they were occupied on such and such a day, and, among other things, how they took their corn on a particular day to Ramsey. 
He reminded them also of their having heard a sudden sharp crack as they were passing by a thorn bush he named, and how they were so startled that one of them would have run back home. He asked them if they remembered that, and they said they did, only too well. He then explained to them the meaning of the noise, namely, that one of the fairies with whom he had been galloping the whole time was about to let fly an arrow at his brothers, but that as he was going to do this. He, the missing brother, raised a plate and intercepted the arrow, that was the sharp noise they had heard. Such was the account he had to give of his sojourn in fairy. This representation of the world of the fairies, as contained within the ordinary world of mortals, is very remarkable. But it is not a new idea, as we seem to detect it in the Irish story of the abduction of Conla, 09, Road 118, the fairy who comes to fetch him tells him that the folk of Tethra, whom she represents, behold him every day as he takes part in the assemblies of his country and sits among his friends. The commoner way of putting it is simply to represent the fairies as invisible to mortals at will. And one kind of Welsh story relates how the mortal midwife accidentally touches her eyes, while dressing a fairy baby, with an ointment which makes the fairy world visible to her, see pages 63213, above. Like Welsh fairies, the Manx ones had, as the reader will have seen, horses to ride, they had also dogs, just as the Welsh ones had. This I learn from another story, to the effect that a fisherman, taking a fresh fish home, was pursued by a pack of fairy dogs, so that it was O.N.L. with great trouble he reached his own door. Then he picked up a stone and threw it at the dogs, which at once disappeared, but he did not escape, as he was shot by the fairies, and so hurt that he lay ill for fully six months from that day. He would have been left alone by the fairies, I was told, if he had only taken care to put a pinch of salt in the fish's mouth before setting out, for the Manx fairies cannot stand salt or baptism. So children that have been baptized are, as in Wales, less liable to be kidnapped by these elves than those that have not. I scarcely need add that a twig of corn 119 or rowan is also as effective against fairies in man as it is in Wales. Manx fairies seem to have been musical, like their kinsmen elsewhere, for I have heard of an Oresdale man crossing the neighboring mountains at night and hearing fairy music, which took his fancy so much that he listened, and tried to remember it. He had, however, to return, it is said, three times to the place before he could carry it away complete in his mind, which he succeeded in doing at last just as the day was breaking and the musicians disappearing. This air, I am told, is now known by the name of the Bolon Bane, or White Wort. As to certain Welsh airs similarly supposed to have been derived from the fairies, see above. So far I have pointed out next to nothing but similarities between Manx fairies and Welsh ones, and I find very little indicative of a difference. First, with regard to salt, I am unable to say anything in this direction, as I do not happen to know how Welsh fairies regard salt, it is not improbable that they eschew salt as well as baptism. Especially as the Church of Rome has long associated salt with baptism. There is, however, one point, at least, of difference between the fairies of man and of Wales, the latter are, so far as I can call to mind, never supposed to discharge arrows at men or women, or to handle a bow 120 at all. Whereas Manx fairies are always ready to shoot. May we, therefore, provisionally regard this trait of the Manx fairies as derived from a Teutonic source. At any rate English and Scotch elves were supposed to shoot, and I am indebted to the kindness of my colleague, Professor Napier, for calling my attention to the leechdoms of early England 121 for cases in point. Now that most of the imaginary inhabitants of man and its coasts have been rapidly passed in review before the reader, I may say something of others whom I regard as semi-imaginary real human beings to whom impossible attributes are ascribed, I mean chiefly the witches, or, as they are sometimes called in Manx English, Butches 122, 10. That term I take to be a variant of the English word which, produced under the influence of the verb bewitch, which was reduced in Manx English to a form butch, especially if one bear in mind the Cumbrian and Scottish pronunciation of these words. As wooch and bewatch. Now witches shift their form, and I have heard of one old witch changing herself into a pigeon. But that I am bound to regard as exceptional, the regular form into which Manx witches pass at their pleasure being that of the hare, 
and such a swift and thick-skinned hair that no greyhound, except a black one without a single white hair, can catch it, and no shot, except a silver coin, penetrate its body. Both these peculiarities are also well known in Wales. I notice a difference, however, between Wales and man with regard to the hair witches, in Wales only the women can become hares, and this property runs, so far as I know, in certain families. I have known many such, and my own nurse belonged to one of them, so that my mother was reckoned to be rather reckless in entrusting me to Waigata, or, the cutty one, as she might run away at any moment, leaving her charge to take care of itself. But I have never heard of any man or boy of any such family turning himself into a hare, whereas in the Isle of Man the hare witches may belong, if I may say so, to either sex. I am not sure, however, that a man who turns himself into a hare would be called a wizard or witch. And I recollect hearing in the neighborhood of Ramsey of a man nicknamed the Gomwaf, that is to say, the hare smith, the reason being that this particular smith now and then assumed the form of a hare. I am not quite sure that Gomwaf is the name of a class, though I rather infer that it is. If so, it must be regarded as a survival of the magic skill associated with smiths in ancient Ireland, as evidenced, for instance, in St. Patrick's hymn in the 11th or 12th century manuscript at Trinity College, Dublin, known as the Liber Hymn Norum, in which we have a prayer. Friday Brichta ban Aucus Gobind Aucus Druad. Against the Spells of Women, of Smiths and Magicians 123. The persons who had the power of turning themselves into hares were believed to be abroad and very active, together with the whole demon world, on the eve of May Day of the Old Style. And a middle-aged man from the parish of Andreas related to me how he came three or four times across a woman reputed to be a witch, carrying on her evil practices at the junction of crossroads, or the meeting of three boundaries. This happened once very early on old May morning, and afterwards he met her several times as he was returning home from visiting his sweetheart. He warned the witch that if he found her again he would kick her, that is what he tells me. Well, after a while he did surprise her again at work at four crossroads, somewhere near Lazare. She had a circle, he said, as large as that made by horses in threshing, swept clean around her. He kicked her and took away her besom, which he hid till the middle of the day. Then he made the farm boys fetch some dry gorse, and he put the witch's besom on the top of it. Thereupon fire was set to the gorse, and, wonderful to relate, the besom, as it burned, crackled and made reports like guns going off. In fact, the noise could be heard at Andreas Church that is to say, miles away. The besom had on it seventeen sorts of knots, he stated, and the woman herself ought to have been burned, in fact, he added that she did not long survive her besom. The man who related this to me is hale and strong, living now in the parish of Michael, and not in that of Andreas where he was born. There is a tradition at Esti. John's, which is overlooked by the mountain called Sleo Wallian, that which is used at one time to be punished by being set to roll down the steep side of the mountain in spiked barrels. But, short of putting them to death, there were various ways of rendering the machinations of witches innocuous, or of undoing the mischief done by them. For the charmers supply various means of meeting them triumphantly, and in case an animal is the victim. The burning of it always proves an effective means of bringing the offender to book, I shall have occasion to return to this under another heading. There is a belief that if you can draw blood, however little, from a witch, or one who has the evil eye, he loses his power of harming you, and I have been told that formerly this belief was sometimes acted upon. Thus, on leaving church, for instance, the man who fancied himself in danger from another would sidle up to him or walk by his side, and inflict on him a slight scratch, or some other trivial wound, which elicited blood. But this must have been a course always attended with more or less danger. The persons able to undo the witch's work, and remove the malignant influence of the evil eye, are known in Manx English as charmers, and something must now be said of them, they have various ways of proceeding to their work. A lady of about thirty-five, living at Peel, related to me how, when she was a child suffering from a swelling in the neck, she had it charmed away by an old woman. This charmer brought with her no less than nine pieces of iron, 
consisting of bits of old pokers, old nails, and other odds and ends of the same metal, making in all nine pieces. After invoking the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, she began to rub the girl's neck with the old irons, nor was she satisfied with that, for she rubbed the doors, the walls, and the furniture likewise, with the metal. The result, I was assured, was highly satisfactory, as she has never been troubled with a swelling in the throat since that day. Sometimes a passage from the Bible is made use of in charming, as, for instance, in the case of bleeding. One of the verses then pronounced is Ezekiel 16. 6, which runs thus, And when I passed by thee, and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee when thou wast in thy blood, live, yeah, I said unto thee when thou wast in thy blood, live. This was told me by a laxy man, who is over seventy years of age. The methods of charming away warts are various. A woman from the neighborhood of St. John's explained to me how a charmer told her to get rid of the warts on her hands. She was to take a string and make a knot on it for every wart she had, and then tie the string round her hand, or fingers forget which. And I think my informant, on her part, forgot to tell me a vital part of the formula, namely, that the string was to be destroyed. But however that may be, she assured me that the warts disappeared, and have never returned since. A lady at Andreas has a still simpler method of getting rid of warts. She rubs a snail on the warts, and then places the snail on one of the points of a blackthorn, and, in fact, leaves the snail to die, transfixed by the thorn. And as the snail dies the warts disappear. She has done this in the case of her niece with complete success, so far as the wart was concerned, but she had forgotten to notice whether the snail had also succumbed. The lady who in this case applied the remedy cannot be in any sense called a charmer, however much one may insist on calling what she did a charm. In fact, the term charmer tends to be associated with a particular class of charm involving the use of herbs. Thus there used to be at one time a famous charmer living near Kirk Michael, to whom the fishermen were in the habit of resorting. And my informant told me that he had been deputed more than once by his fellow fishermen to go to him in consequence of their lack of success in the fishing. The charmer gave him a packet of herbs, cut small, with directions that they should be boiled, and the water mixed with some spirits rum, I think and partly drunk in the boat by the captain and the crew and partly sprinkled over the boat and everything in it. The charmer clearly defined his position in the matter to my informant. I cannot, he said, put the fish in your nets for you, but if there is any mischief in the way of your luck, I can remove that for you. The fishermen themselves had, however, more exaggerated notions of the charmer's functions, for once on a time my informant spent on drink for his boon companions the money which he was to give the charmer. And then he collected herbs himself it did not much matter what herbs and took them to his captain, who, with the crew, went through the proper ritual, and made a most successful haul that night. In fact, the only source of discontent was the charmers not having distributed the fish over two nights, instead of endangering their nets by an excessive haul all in one night. They regarded him as able to do almost anything he liked in the matter. A lady at Andreas gave me an account of a celebrated charmer who lived between there and the coast. He worked on her husband's farm, but used to be frequently called away to be consulted. He usually cut up wormwood for the people who came to him, and if there was none to be had, he did not scruple to rob the garden of any small sprouts it contained of cabbage or the like. He would chop them small, and give directions about boiling them and drinking the water. He usually charged any one leaving him to speak to nobody on the way, lest he break the charm, and this mysteriousness was evidently an important element in his profession. But he was, nevertheless, a thriftless fellow, and when he went to Peel, and sent the crier round to announce his arrival, and received a good deal of money from the fishermen, he seldom so conducted himself as to bring much of his earnings home. He died miserably some seven or eight years ago at Ramsey, and left a widow in great poverty. As to the present day, the daughter of a charmer now dead is married to a man living in a village on the southern side of the island, and she appears to have inherited her father's reputation for charming. As the fishermen from all parts are said to flock to her for luck. Incidentally, 
I have heard in the South more than once of her being consulted in cases of sudden and dangerous illness, even after the best medical advice has been obtained, in fact, she seems to have a considerable practice. In answer to my question, how the charmer who died at Ramsey used to give the sailors luck in the fishing, my informant at Andreas could not say, except that he gave them herbs as already described. And she thought also that he sold them wisps to place under their pillows. I gather that the charms were chiefly directed to the removal of supposed impediments to success in the fishing, rather than to any act of a more positive nature. So far as I have been able to ascertain, charming is hereditary, and they say that it descends from father to daughter, and then from daughter to son, and so on a remarkable kind of descent. On which I should be glad to learn the opinion of anthropologists. One of the best Manx scholars in the island related to me how some fishermen once insisted on his doing the charmer for them because of his being of such and such a family, and how he made fools of them. It is my impression that the charming families are comparatively few in number, and this looks as if they descended from the family physicians or druids of one or two chieftains in ancient times. It is very likely a question which could be cleared up by a local man familiar with the island and all that tradition has to say on the subject of Manx pedigrees. In the case of animals ailing, the herbs were also resorted to. And, if the beasts happened to be milch cows, the herbs had to be boiled in some of their milk. This was supposed to produce wonderful results, described as follows by a man living at a place on the way from Castletown up South Barrule. A farmer in his parish had a cow that milked blood, as he described it. And this in consequence of a witch's ill will. He went to the charmer, who gave him some herbs, which he was to boil in the ailing cow's milk, and the charmer charged him, whatever he did, not to quit the concoction while it was on the fire, in spite of any noises he might hear. The farmer went home and proceeded that night to boil the herbs as directed, but he suddenly heard a violent tapping at the door, a terrible lowing of the cattle in the cowhouse and stones coming down the chumley, the end of it was that he suddenly fled and sprang into bed to take shelter behind his wife. He went to the charmer again, and related to him what had happened, he was told that he must have more courage the next time, unless he wished his cow to die. He promised to do his best, and this time he stood his ground in spite of the noises and the creaking of the windows until, in fact, a back window burst into pieces and bodily let a witch in, who craved his pardon and promised never more to molest him or his. This all happened at the farm in question in the time of the present farmer's grandfather. The boiling of the charmer's herbs in milk always produces a great commotion and lowing among the cattle, and it invariably cures the ailing ones, this is firmly believed by respectable farmers whom I could name. In the north of the island in particular, and I am alluding to men whom one might consider fairly educated members of their class. In the last mentioned instance not only is the requisite cure effected, but the witch who caused the mischief is brought on the spot. I have recently heard of a parallel to this in a belief which appears to be still prevalent in the Channel Islands, more especially Guernsey. The following incidents have been communicated to me by an ardent folklorist, who has friends in the islands. An old woman in Tortval became ill, and her two sons were told that if they tried one of the charms of divination, such as boiling certain weeds in a pot, the first person to come to the house would prove to be the one who had cast a spell over their mother. Accordingly they made their bulladerie, and who should come to the door but a poor, unoffending Breton onion seller, and as he was going away he was waylaid by the two sons, who beat him within an inch of his life. They were prosecuted and sentenced to terms of imprisonment, but the charming did not come out in the evidence, though it was generally known to have been the reason for the assault. This account was given my informant in 1898, and the incident appears to have happened not very long before. Another is related thus, a certain family suffered from a plague of lice, which they regarded as the consequence of a spell. They accordingly made their boiling of herbs and looked for the first comer. He turned out to be a neighbor of theirs who wished to buy some turnip seeds. The family abused him roundly. He went away, but he was watched and caught by two of the sons of the house, who beat him cruelly. They, on being prosecuted, had to pay him, five pound damages. This took place in the summer of 1898, in the narrator's own parish, in Guernsey. I have also another case of recent date, to the effect that a young woman, 
whose churning was so unsuccessful that the butter would not come, boiled herbs in the prescribed way. She awaited the first comer, and, being engaged, her intended husband was not unnaturally the first to arrive. She abused him so unsparingly that he broke off the engagement. These instances go far enough to raise the question why the boiling of herbs should be supposed to bring the culprit immediately on the spot, but they hardly go any further, namely, to help us to answer it. Magic takes us back to a very primitive and loose manner of thinking. So the marvelously easy way in which it identifies any tie of association, however flimsy, with the insoluble bond of relationship which educated men and women regard as connecting cause and effect. Renders even simpler means than I have described quite equal to the undoing of the evils resulting from the activity of the evil eye. Thus, let us suppose that a person endowed with the evil eye has just passed by the farmer's herd of cattle, and a calf has suddenly been seized with a serious illness. The farmer hurries after the man of the evil eye to get the dust from under his feet. If he objects, the farmer may, as has sometimes been actually done, throw him down by force, take off his shoes, and scrape off the dust adhering to their soles, and carry it back to throw over the calf. Even that is not always necessary, as it appears to be quite enough if he takes up dust where he of the evil eye has just trod the ground. There are innumerable cases on folk record of both means proving entirely efficacious, and they remind one of a story related in the Itinerarium Cambri, I. 2. By Geraldus, as to the Archbishop when he was preaching in the neighborhood of Haverford West. A certain woman had lost her sight, but had so much faith in that holy man that she sent her son to try and procure the least bit of the fringe of his clothing. The youth, unable to make his way through the crowd that surrounded the preacher, waited till it dispersed, and then took home to his mother the sod on which he had stood and on which his feet had left their mark. That earth was applied by her to her face and eyes, with the result that she at once recovered her sight. A similar question of psychology presents itself in a practice intended as a preservative against the evil eye rather than as a cure. I allude to what I have heard about two maiden ladies living in a Manx village which I know very well, they are natives of a neighboring parish, and I am assured that whenever a stranger enters their house they proceed, as soon as he goes away, to strew a little dust or sand over the spot where he stood. That is understood to prevent any malignant influence resulting from his visit. This tacit identifying of a man with his footprints may be detected in a more precarious and pleasing form in a quaint conceit familiar to me in the lyrics of rustic life in Wales, when, for example, a coy maiden leaves her lovesick swain hotly avowing his perfect readiness to kusanu olei thrade, that is, to do on his knees all the stages of her path across the meadow, kissing the ground wherever it has been honored with the tread of her dainty foot. Let me take another case, in which the court of association is not so inconceivably slender, namely, when two or more persons standing in a close relation to one another are mistakenly treated a little too much as if mutually independent. The objection is heard that it matters not whether it is A or B, that it is, in fact, all the same, as they belong to the same concern. In Welsh this is sometimes expressed by saying, Your un YW who glyn AI glocks, that is, Hugh of the Glen and his clogs are all one. Then, when you speak in English of a man standing in another's shoes, I am by no means certain, that you are not employing an expression which meant something more to those who first used it than it does to us. Our modern idioms, with all their straining after the abstract, are but primitive man's mental tools adapted to the requirements of civilized life. And they often retain traces of the form and shape which the Neolithic workers chipping and polishing gave them. It is difficult to arrange these scraps under any clearly classified, headings, and now that I have led the reader into the midst of matters magical. Perhaps I may just as well go on to the mention of a few more, I alluded to the boiling of the herbs according to the charmer's order, with the result, among other things, of bringing the witch to the spot. This is, however, not the only instance of the importance and strange efficacy of fire. For when a beast dies on a farm, of course it dies, according to the old-fashioned view of things as I understand it, from the influence of the evil eye or the interposition of a witch. So if you want to know to whom you are indebted for the loss of the beast, 
you have simply to burn its carcass in the open air and watch who comes first to the spot or who first passes by, that is the criminal to be charged with the death of the animal, and he cannot help coming there such is the effect of the fire. A Michael woman, who is now about thirty, related to me how she watched while the carcass of a bewitched colt was burning, how SBE saw the witch coming, and how she remembers her shriveled face, with nose and chin in close proximity. According to another native of Michael, a well-informed middle-aged man, the animal in question was oftenest a calf, and it was wont to be burnt whole, skin and all. The object, according to him, is invariably to bring the bewitcher on the spot, and he always comes, but I am not clear what happens to him when he appears. My informant added, however, that it was believed that, unless the bewitcher got possession of the heart of the burning beast, he lost all his power of bewitching. He related, also, how his father and three other men were once out fishing on the west coast of the island, when one of the three suddenly expressed his wish to land. As they were fishing successfully some two or three miles from the shore, they would not hear of it. He, however, insisted that they must put him ashore at once, which made his comrades highly indignant. But they soon had to give way, as they found that he was determined to leap overboard unless they complied. When he got on shore they watched him hurrying away towards where a beast was burning in the corner of a field. Manx stories merge this burning in a very perplexing fashion with what may be termed a sacrifice for luck. The following scraps of information will make it clear what I mean. Respectable farmer from Andreas told me that he was driving with his wife to the neighboring parish of Jerby some years ago. And that on the way they beheld the carcass of a cow or an ox burning in a field, with a woman engaged in stirring the fire. On reaching the village to which they were going, they found that the burning beast belonged to a farmer whom they knew. They were further told it was no wonder that the said farmer had one of his cattle burnt, as several of them had recently died. Whether this was a case of sacrifice or not I cannot say. But let me give another instance, a man whom I have already mentioned, saw at a farm nearer the center of the island a live calf being burnt. The owner bears an English name, but his family has long been settled in man. The farmer's explanation to my informant was that the calf was burnt to secure luck for the rest of the herd, some of which were threatening to die. My informant thought there was absolutely nothing the matter with them except that they had too little food. Be that as it may, the one calf was sacrificed as a burnt offering to secure luck for the rest of the cattle. Let me here also quote Mr. Moore's note in his Manx surnames, page 184, on the place named Cabbal Yn Aro Lasht, or the Chapel of the Burnt Sacrifice. This name, he says, records a circumstance which took place in the 19th century, but which, it is to be hoped, was never customary in the Isle of Man. A farmer, who had lost a number of his sheep and cattle by Murren, burned a calf as a propitiatory offering to the deity on this spot, where a chapel was afterwards built. Hence the name. Particulars, I may say, of time, place, and person, could be easily added to Mr. Moore's statement, excepting, perhaps, as to the deity in question, on that point I have never been informed, but Mr. Moore was probably right in the use of the capital D, as the sacrificer was, according to all accounts, a devout Christian. I have to thank Sir Frederick Pollock for calling my attention to a parallel this side of the sea, he refers me to Worth's History of Devonshire, London, 1886, p. 339, where one reads the following singular passage, living animals have been burnt alive in sacrifice within memory to avert the loss of other stock. The burial of three puppies, Brandeis wise, in a field is supposed to rid it of weeds. The second statement is very curious, and the first seems to mean that preventive sacrifices have been performed in Devonshire within the memory of men living in the author's time. One more Manx instance, an octogenarian woman, born in the parish of Bride, and now living at Kirk Andreas, saw, when she was a lump of a girl of ten or fifteen years of age, a live sheep being burnt in a field in the parish of Andreas. On May Day, whereby she meant the first of May reckoned according to the old style. She asserts 124 very decidedly that it was son Aurel, for a sacrifice, as she put it, and, for an object to the public, those were her words when she expressed herself in English. Further, 
she made the statement that it was a custom to burn a sheep on Old May Day for a sacrifice. I was fully alive to the interest of this evidence, and cross-examined her so far as her age allows of it, and I find that she adheres to her statement with all firmness, but I distinguish two or three points in her evidence. 1. I have no doubt that she saw, as she was passing by a certain field on the borders of Andreas Parish, a live sheep being burnt on. Old May Day. 2. But her statement that it was sun aural, or as a sacrifice, was probably only an inference drawn by her, possibly years afterwards, on hearing things of the kind discussed. 3. Lastly, I am convinced that she did hear the May Day sacrifice discussed, both in Manx and in English, her words, for an object to the public. Are her imperfect recollection of a phrase used in her hearing by somebody more ambitious of employing English abstract terms than she is? And the formal nature of her statement in Manx, that it was customary on May Day to burn as a sacrifice one head of sheep, La Bolden V.A. Clyde D.Y. Losty Sun Aural and Bag Kiraf, produces the same impression on my mind. That she is only repeating somebody else's words. I mention this more especially as I have failed to find anybody else in Andreas or Bride, or indeed in the whole island, who will now confess to having ever heard of the sheep sacrifice on Old May Day. The time assigned to the sheep sacrifice, namely May Day, leads me to make some remarks on the importance of that day among the Celts. The day meant is, as I have already said, Old May Day, in Manx Shen La Bolden, the Belton of Cormac's Glossary, Scotch Gaelic Bealtuin. This was a day when systematic efforts were made to protect man and beast against elves and witches. For it was then that people carried crosses of Rowan, eleven, in their hats and placed mayflowers over the tops of their doors and elsewhere as preservatives against all malignant influences. With the same object in view crosses of Rowan were likewise fastened to the tails of the cattle, small crosses which had to be made without the help of a knife. I exhibited a tiny specimen at one of the meetings of the Folklore Society. Early on May morning one went out to gather the dew as a thing of great virtue, as in other countries. At Kirk Michael one woman, who had been out on this errand years ago, told me that she washed her face with the dew in order to secure luck, a good complexion, and safety against witches. The break of this day is also the signal for setting the ling or the gorse on fire, which is done in order to burn out the witches won't to take the form of the hare, and guns, I am told, were freely used to shoot any game met with on that morning. With the proper charge some of the witches were now and then hit and wounded, whereupon they resumed the human form and remained cripples for the rest of their lives. Fire, however, appears to have been the chief agency relied on to clear away the witches and other malignant beings. And I have heard of this use of fire having been carried so far that a practice was sometimes observed as, for example, in Lazare of burning gorse, however little. In the hedge of each field on a farm in order to drive away the witches and secure luck. The man who told me this, on being asked whether he had ever heard of cattle being driven through fire or between two fires on May Day, replied that it was not known to him as a Manx custom, but that it was an Irish one. A cattle dealer whom he named used on May Day to drive his cattle through fire so as to singe them a little, as he believed that would preserve them from harm. He was an Irishman, who came to the island for many years, and whose children are settled in the island now. On my asking him if he knew whence the dealer came, he answered, from the mountains over there, pointing to the Mourne Mountains looming faintly in the mists on the western horizon. The Irish custom known to my Manx informant is interesting both as throwing light on the Manx custom, and as being the continuation of a very ancient rite mentioned by Cormac. That writer, or somebody in his name, says that Belton, May Day, was so called from the lucky fire, or the two fires, which the Druids of Erin used to make on that day with great incantations. And cattle, he adds, used to be brought to those fires, or to be driven between them, as a safeguard against the diseases of the year. Cormac 125 says nothing, it will be noticed, as to one of the cattle or the sheep being sacrificed for the sake of prosperity to the rest. However, Scottish 126 May Day customs point to a sacrifice having been once usual, and that possibly of human beings, and not of sheep as in the Isle of Man. I have elsewhere 127 tried to equate these Celtic May Day practices, 
with the Thargelia 128 of the Athenians of antiquity. The Thargelia were characterized by peculiar rites, and among other things then done, two adult persons were led about, as it were scapegoats, and at the end they were sacrificed and burnt, so that their ashes might be dispersed. Here we seem to be on the track of a very ancient Aryan practice, although the Celtic season does not quite coincide with the Greek one. Several items of importance for comparison here will be found passed under careful review in a most suggestive paper by Mr. Lawrence Gom, on the method of determining the value of folklore as ethnological data, in the fourth report of the Ethnographical Survey Committee. 129. It is probably in some ancient Mayday custom that we are to look for the key to a remarkable place name occurring several times in the island, I allude to that of Kronk Wayaniri La, which probably means the Hill of the Rise of Day. This is the name of one of the mountains in the south of the island, but it is also borne by one of the knolls near the eastern end of the range of low hills ending abruptly on the coast between Ramsey and Bride Parish. And quite a small knoll bears the name, near the church of Jerby 130. I have heard of a fourth instance, which, as I learn from Mr. Philip Kermode, editor of the Liar Mananac, is on Clay Head, near Laxey. It has been attempted to explain it as meaning the hill of the watch by day, in reference to the old institution of watch and ward on conspicuous places in the island. But that explanation is inadmissible as doing violence to the phonetics of the words in question 131. I am rather inclined to think that the name everywhere refers to an eminence to which the surrounding inhabitants resorted for a religious purpose on a particular day in the year. I should suggest that it was to do homage to the rising sun on May morning, but this conjecture is offered only to await a better explanation. The next great day in the pagan calendar of the Celts is called in Manx La Lunis, in Irish Lugnasad, the assembly, or fair, which was associated with the name of the god Lug. This should correspond to Lammas, but, reckoned as it is according to the old style, it falls on the 12th of August, which used to be a great day for business fairs in the Isle of Man as in Wales. But for holiday making the 12th only suited when it happened to be a Sunday, when that was not the case, the first Sunday after the twelfth was fixed upon. It is known, accordingly, as the first Sunday of harvest, and it used to be celebrated by crowds of people visiting the tops of the mountains. The kind of interference to which I have alluded with regard to an ancient holiday, is one of the regular results of the transition from Roman Catholicism to a Protestant system with only one fixed holiday, namely, Sunday. The same shifting has partly happened in Wales, where Lammas is GWIL Ost, or the festival of Augustus, since the birthday of Augustus, auspiciously for him and the celebrity of his day, fell in with the great day of the god Lug in the Celtic world. Now the day for going up the Fan Fock mountain in Camarthenshire was Lammas, but under a Protestant church it became the first Sunday in August. And even modified in that way it could not long survive under a vigorous Sabbatarian regime either in Wales or Man. As to the latter in particular, I have heard it related by persons who were present, how the crowds on the top of South Barul on the first Sunday of harvest were denounced as pagans by a preacher called William Jick, some seventy years ago. And how another man called Perrick Begg, or Little Patrick, preaching to the crowds on Snaefell in milder terms, used to wind up the service with a collection. Which appears to have proved a speedier method of reducing the dimensions of these meetings on the mountain tops. Be that as it may, they seem to have dwindled since then to comparative insignificance. If you ask the reason for this custom now, for it is not yet quite extinct, you are told, first, that it is merely to gather ling berries. But now and then a quasi-religious reason is given, namely, that it is the day on which Jephthah's daughter went forth to bewail her virginity, upon the mountains, somehow some Manx people make believe that they are doing likewise. That is not all for people who have never themselves thought of going up the mountains on the first Sunday of harvest or any other, will be found devoutly reading at home about Jephthah's daughter on that day. I was told this first in the south by a clergyman's wife, who, finding a woman in the parish reading the chapter in question on that day, asked the reason for her fixing on that particular portion of the Bible. She then had the Manx view of the matter fully explained to her, and she has since found more information about it, and so have I. It is needless for me to say that I do not quite understand how Jephthah's daughter came to be introduced, 
perhaps it is vain to look for any deeper reason than that the mention of the mountains may have served as a sort of catchword. And that as the Manx people began to cease from visiting the tops of the mountains annually, it struck the women as the next best thing for them to read at home of one who did go up and down upon the mountains, they are great readers of the Bible generally. In any case we have here a very curious instance of a practice, originally pagan, modifying itself profoundly to secure a new lease of life. Between May Day and November Eve, there was a day of considerable importance in the island. But the fixing on it was probably due to influence other than Celtic, I mean Midsummer Eve, or St. John's. However, some practices connected with it would seem to have been of Celtic origin, such as, the bearing of rushes to certain places called Warfield and Maine on Midsummer Even. Warfield was made in Manx into Barrule, but Maine, the Jugum or Ridge, has not been identified. The Barrule here in question was South Barrule, and it is to the top of that mountain the green rushes were carried, according to Manx tradition, as the only rent or tax which the inhabitants paid, namely, to Man N. And Mac Lyre, called in Welsh Manawak Tan of LLYR, whom the same tradition treats as father and founder, as king and chief wizard of the Isle of Man. The same Man Annan who is quaintly referred to in the illiterate passage at the head of this chapter 132. As already stated, the payment of the annual rent of rushes is associated with Midsummer Eve, but it did not prevent the top of South Barul from being visited likewise later in the year. Perhaps it may also be worth while mentioning, with regard to most of the mountains climbed on the first Sunday of harvest, that they seem to have near the summit of each a well of some celebrity, which appears to be the goal of the visitors' peregrinations. This is the case with South Barul, the spring near the top of, which cannot, it is said, be found when sought a second time, also with Snaefell and with Mackled Head, which boasts one of the most famous springs in the island. When I visited it last summer in company with Mr. Kermode, we found it to contain a considerable number of pins, some of which were bent, and many buttons. Some of the pins were not of a kind usually carried by men, and most of the buttons decidedly belonged to the dress of the other sex. Several people who had resorted many years ago to St. Mackelt's well, told me that the water is good for sore eyes, and that after using it on the spot, or filling a bottle with it to take home, one was wont to drop a pin or bead or button into the well. But it had its full virtue only when visited the first Sunday of harvest, and that only during the hour when the books were open at church, which, shifted back to Roman Catholic times, means doubtless the hour when the priest was engaged in saying Mass. Compare the passage in the Mabinogi of Math, where it is said that the spear required for the slaying of Lulagifs had to be a whole year in the making, the work was to be pursued only so long as one was engaged at the sacrifice on Sunday, A.R. Year of Birth do six slow see the Oxford Mabinogian. P. 76. To return to man, the restriction, as might be expected, is not peculiar to St. Mackelt's well, I have heard of it in connection with other wells, such as Chibber Lanch in Lazare Parish, and with a well on Show Magal, in which some Kirk Michael people have a great belief. But even sea water was believed to have considerable virtues if you washed in it while the books were open at church. As I was told by a woman who had many years ago repeatedly taken her own sister to divers' wells and to the sea during the service on Sunday, in order to have her eyes cured of a chronic weakness. The remaining great day in the Celtic year is called Sawin or Lahone, in Irish, Sawin, genitive Samna. The Manx call it in English Hollandtide, a word derived from the English All Hollow and Tide, the season of All Saints 133. This day is also reckoned in man according to the old style, so that it is our twelfth of November. That is the day when the tenure of land terminates, and when servant men go to their places. In other words, it is the beginning of a new year. And Kelly, in his Manx English Dictionary, has, under the word Blaine, year, the following note, Valency says the Celts began their year with January. Yet in the Isle of Man the first of November is called New Year's Day by the Mummers, who, on the eve, begin their petition in these words, Tonight is New Year's Night, Hoguna 134 and It is a pity that Kelly, whilst he was on this subject, did not give the rhyme in Manx, and all the more so, as the Mummers of the present day, 
if he is right, must have changed their words into not oihone, that is to say. Tonight is Sawin night or Halloween. So I had despaired of finding anybody who could corroborate Kelly in his statement, when I happened last summer to find a man at Kirk Michael who was quite familiar with this way of treating the year. I asked him if he could explain Kelly's absurd statement I put my question designedly in that form. He said he could, but that there was nothing absurd in it. He then told me how he had heard some old people talk of it, he is himself now about sixty-seven. He had been a farm servant from the age of sixteen till he was twenty-six to the same man, near Rigabi, in the parish of Andreas. And he remembers his master and a near neighbor of his discussing the term New Year's Day as applied to the first of November, and explaining to the younger men that it had always been so in old times. In fact, it seemed to him natural enough, as all tenure of land ends at that time, and as all servant men begin their service then. I cross-examined him, without succeeding in any way in shaking his evidence. I should have been glad a few years ago to have come across this piece of information, or even Kelly's note, when I was discussing the Celtic year and trying to prove 135 that it began at the beginning of winter. With May Day as the beginning of its second half. One of the characteristics of the beginning of the Celtic year with the commencement of winter was the belief that indications can be obtained on the eve of that day regarding the events of the year. But with the calendar year gaining ground it would be natural to expect that the calends of January would have some of the associations of the calends of winter transferred to them, and vice versa. In fact, this can, as it were, be watched now going on in the Isle of Man. First, I may mention that the Manx mummers used to go about singing, in Manx, a sort of Hogmanay Psalm 136, reminding one of that usual in Yorkshire and other parts of Great Britain, and now known to be of Romance origin. 137. The time for it in this country was New Year's Eve, according to the ordinary calendar, but in the Isle of Man it has always been Hollandtide Eve, according to the old style. And this is the night when boys now go about continuing the custom of the old mummers. There is no hesitation in this case between Hollandtide Eve and New Year's Eve. But with the prognostications for the year it is different, and the following practices have been usual. I may, however, premise that as a rule I have abstained from inquiring too closely whether they still go on, but here and there I have had the information volunteered that they do. 1. I may mention first a salt prognostication, which was described to me by a farmer in the north, whose wife practices it once a year regularly. She carefully fills a thimble with salt in the evening and upsets it in a neat little heap on a plate, she does that for every member of the family, and every guest, too, if there happen to be any. The plate is then left undisturbed till the morning, when she examines the heaps of salt to see if any of them have fallen for whoever is found represented by a fallen heap will die during the year. She does not herself, I am assured, believe in it, but she likes to continue a custom which she has learned from her mother. 2. Next may be mentioned the ashes being carefully swept to the open hearth, and nicely flattened down by the women just before going to bed. In the morning they look for footmarks on the hearth, and if they find such footmarks directed towards the door, it means, in the course of the year, a death in the family, and if the reverse, they expect an addition to it by marriage. Point 138. 3. Then there is an elaborate process of eavesdropping recommended to young women curious to know their future husbands' names, a girl would go with her mouth full of water and her hands full of salt to the door of the nearest neighbor's house or rather to that of the nearest neighbor but one I have been carefully corrected more than once on that point. There she would listen, and the first name she caught would prove to be that of her future husband. Once a girl did so, as I was told by a blind fisherman in the south, and heard two brothers quarreling inside the house at whose door she was listening. Presently the young man's mother exclaimed that the devil would not let Tom leave John alone. At the mention of that triad the girl burst into the house, laughing and spilling the mouthful of water most incontinently. The end of it was that before the year was out she married Tom, the second person mentioned, the first either did not count or proved an unassailable bachelor. 4. There is also a ritual for enabling a girl to obtain other information respecting her future husband, vessels placed about the room have various things put into them, such as clean water, earth, meal, a piece of a net. 
or any other article thought appropriate. The candidate for matrimony, with her eyes bandaged, feels her way about the house until she puts her hand in one of the aforesaid vessels. If what she lays her hand on is the clean water, her husband will be a handsome man 139, if it is the earth, he will be a farmer, if the meal, a miller, if the net, a fisherman. And so on into as many of the walks of life as may be thought worthy of consideration. 5. Lastly, recourse may be had to a ritual of the same nature as that observed by the druid of ancient Aaron, when, burdened with a heavy meal of the flesh of a red pig, he laid him down for the night in order to await a prophetic dream as to the manner of man the nobles of Aaron assembled at Terra were to elect to be their king. The incident is given in the story of Cuchulain's sick bed, and the reader, doubtless, knows the passage about Brian and the Tagaran in the fourth canto of Scott's Lady of the Lake. But the Manx girl has only to eat a salt herring, bones and all, without drinking or uttering a word, and to retire backwards to bed. When she sleeps and dreams, she will behold her future husband approaching to give her drink. Probably none of the practices which I have enumerated, or similar ones mentioned to me, are in any sense peculiar to the Isle of Man, but what interests me in them is the divided opinion as to the proper night for them in the year. I am sorry to say that I have very little information as to the blind man's buff ritual, number four, what information I have, to wit, the evidence of two persons in the South, fixes it on Hollandtide Eve. But as to the others, nos. One, two, three, five, they are observed by some on that night, and by others on New Year's Eve, sometimes according to the old style 140 and sometimes the new. Further, those who are wont to practice the salt heap ritual, for instance, on Hollandtide Eve, would be very indignant to hear that anybody should think New Year's Eve the proper night, and vice versa. So by bringing women bred and born in different parishes to compare notes on this point. I have witnessed arguing hardly less earnest than that which characterized the ancient controversy between British and Italian ecclesiastics as to the proper time for keeping Easter. I have not been able to map the island according to the practices prevalent at Hollandtide and the beginning of January, but local folklorists could probably do it without much difficulty. My impression, however, is that January is gradually acquiring the upper hand. In Wales this must have been decidedly helped by the inhuance of Roman rule and Roman ideas. But even there the adjuncts of the winter calends have never been wholly transferred. To the calends of January. Witness, for instance, the women who used to congregate in the parish church to discover who of the parishioners would die during the year. 141 That custom, in the neighborhoods reported to have practiced it, continued to attach itself to the last, so far as I know, to the beginning of November. In the Isle of Man the fact of the ancient Celtic year having so firmly held its own, seems to point to the probability that the year of the pagan Norsemen pretty nearly coincided with that of the Celts 142. For there are reasons to think, as I have endeavored elsewhere to show, that the Norse Yule was originally at the end of summer or the commencement of winter, in other words, the days afterwards known as the Feast of the Winter Nights. This was the favorite date in Iceland for listening to soothsayers prophesying with regard to the winter then beginning. The Late Dar Vigfussen had much to say on this subject, and how the local Sibyl, resuming her elevated seat at the opening of each successive winter, gave the author of the Velaspa his plan of that remarkable poem which has been described by the same authority as the highest spiritual effort of the heathen muse of the North.